In my hometown, there are loads of restored Victorian houses. The city is very strict with them. Any renovation in certain parts of town has to be approved by a historical preservation committee. So it raised questions when I saw that this house was a duplex. We lived in the lower unit. It was freaking gorgeous. The house was over a hundred years old with hand carved wood molding and mostly original floors. You could tell that what was part of the original structure and what was added on to make the duplex. Josh's room, the full bathroom and my room were the addition. My room would have been built into the closet underneath the stairs. The living room and dining room had all original wood floors. They restored them the best they could, but there was a five foot dark stain in the living room and a similar mark in a large corner of the dining room. The landlord told us there's only so much you can do with these old houses and we understood. We were lucky to get such a lovely place with a modest rent in a cool part of town. I was the first one to notice the weird vibe in the house. When friends would come over, I would ask if they felt it too, and most of them agreed. Whenever I was in the kitchen, I felt like I was being watched from behind. Watched hard, stared down. Every time I turned to look, my eye would get drawn to the same spot in the doorway, directly above the big dark stain in the dining room. I tried to tell myself that it was probably not real, but it felt like my brain was picking up on stimuli that couldn't be detected by my eyes. The only knowledge of dealing with the paranormal is to not let them push you around, take strict dominance. You have to establish boundaries since you truly don't know what you're dealing with and the fear gives them the upper hand. I said out loud that I acknowledge their presence and I'm allowing them to exist in the same space as I do. That could always be revoked. I paid rent, so I had seniority. That feeling of being watched started showing up at random times when I would be in my room soon after. It wasn't just that anymore either. You know how sometimes you can tell a person is nearby before they make any indication that they're there? It was like that. I stared at the spot where it originated from, but there was nothing there. It felt like someone was peeking their head around the corner, just like in the kitchen. This would happen for short periods before fading away behind the wall. It would happen like that every so often throughout the night. Every night. And every time it happened, I was reflexively skeptical and told myself, nah, that's not real. I repeated that mantra more and more often in the coming months. In October, it finally got cold enough for us to turn the central heating on. My roommate mentioned making sure our vents were open. I looked in my room and saw mine was shut. Once I realized this, a pit opened up at the bottom of my stomach. They spent all the times I saw my Christmas lights hanging up around my room, gently swaying. It wasn't caused by the air moving through the vents. Also, we had no air conditioner that could have been moving them. It was caused by something else. The presence continued to emerge off and on. I chalked it up to my active imagination since it didn't seem like my other roommates were affected by it. At some point, I even talked to the neighbors upstairs who told me they also felt a weirdness about the place. One night, when I had a friend over in my room, I was walking through the living room turning all the lights off. I turned the final one off and started back towards my room in the dark. As I was passed over the stain in the living room, I heard a voice behind me. It was gentle and subtle, with an upward inflection, like it was asking a question. I whipped around to see nothing, but heard firm footsteps approaching me from the corner. I nope, nope, noped into my room, where my friend was sitting. He asked what my problem was, and I told him the house might be haunted. He laughed at me, and told me to get real. About two minutes later, he goes, did you see that? And I asked, see what, buddy? He said my hula hoop jumped off the wall where it was hanging. He stared at it intensely, trying to formulate a rational explanation for what he saw. I don't think he ever found one. This was one of the most witnessed events in that house. We had a crew of people watching something engaging when we heard glass shatter in the kitchen. A handful of us stood up and went into the kitchen where the light fixture above the sink was shattered in the sink basin. Out of seemingly nowhere, it had detached itself from the ceiling and exploded. 
we passed it off as a freak accident. One of us got in touch with the landlord and we carried on with the night. I kept feeling the presence studying me, so I tried to figure out what kind of entity I was dealing with. Granted, I had no experience or understanding of the paranormal, only what I had seen in the media. When I opened my mind and tried to be receptive, I got some tentative information. It was a girl, a younger girl, possibly a preteen. The number 14 was something that was coming to mind. She was blonde with curly hair, wearing an old school sailor outfit. She may have lived in the house before it became two units. The personality I got was a timid, curious child who suffered greatly and died in fear. I was dying to learn the history of that place, but I had no idea where to start. In my casual research on it, I was disappointed my state has no laws stating you have to disclose someone dying in a house. Strange occurrences started to become routine. I thought we reached the peak of activity and I didn't have to have my guard up. One night, as I was on my laptop, the Christmas lights hanging right next to my bed lifted drastically off the wall for a split second. It looked like an invisible force playfully tossed it upward. At that moment, I decided to revoke her access to my space. I said out loud that she was no longer welcome in my room. Thinking in haste, I scrolled through my minimal mental archive of the subject to remember what can be used against ghosts on TV. Salt. I needed salt. As quickly as possible, I retrieved the salt from the kitchen and poured it on the doorframe above the threshold. I felt more comfortable that I had a defensive barrier, but also wasn't sure if it would work. It was difficult to sleep that night. After I placed the salt, I stopped experiencing unexplainable things in my room. I still felt like I was being watched, but only in the kitchen. Things were mild now, and I thought I had nothing to worry about. This has been a learning experience for me, and I wanted to document what happened, so I could explain to people why I believe in ghosts. I took my notebook into the living room and started to write. As usual, I felt something peeking around the corner, but this time it was more pronounced than any previous instance. Did she know I was writing about her? My roommate sat down next to me and I told him what I was doing. As I was in mid-sentence, directly behind where I sat, the couch under us moved. It felt like someone slowly picked it up by the corner and put it down. I immediately jumped up and ran outside. A few months after our lease was up, I was hanging out with one of my former roommates. The topic of the creepy feeling in our house came up in conversation. That's when she told me there was a fire long ago. I'm not sure how she learned this, but a lot of things made sense. Like the fact that it's a duplex and the burn marks on the floor. Is it possible that those burn marks were caused by burning flesh? Did the spirit who remained there die before their time? Was this just a series of coincidences? Will I ever get answers to my questions? My partner and I were driving to a friend's house to visit for a little while. It's a very short, maybe five to 10 minute drive through busy suburbs that are usually very well lit. However, as we came upon what we call the halfway point between our houses, we stopped at a red light and I noticed that the street lights seemed to be dimmed on the other side of the intersection. Not all of them, but a series of three or four lights on either side of the street, creating a very shadowy stretch of road about 40 feet long. I'm not insinuating that the lights being dimmed was in itself paranormal. I know nothing of how such public utilities work, and I'm sure it was some sort of power saving procedure or some such. But in this instant, it was strange as we've gone through the same route many times at the same time of night, and I've never noticed them being dimmed. Whatever the case, the lights were dimmed, and though it was dark, I could make out the figure of a person shuffling across the street. I believe I could even see the outlines of clothing on this person, they were wearing very baggy pants and a large coat, like a trench coat or cowboy duster. The person shuffled across the street from right to left, about 75 feet ahead of us, and seemed to turn to walk towards us as they reached the other side. I said to my partner, it's so dark I could barely see them up there, to which my partner said, see who? 
which is normal for her, as she doesn't have the best night vision, and I was actually expecting this response. So when the light turned green, I intended to point them out as we were passing them, but as we passed by the bit of sidewalk this person should have been walking on, there was absolutely nothing. The headlights should have briefly passed over them with the angle of the road as we left the red light, but the lights shone through the couple low-hanging branches hanging across the sidewalk and revealed no one. It was as if whatever it was just melted into the sidewalk once they got across. I was more confused than anything at first. This person that I clearly saw just seemingly popped out of existence. I just sat there and said, huh? And what the fuck was that? The rest of the way there, it wasn't particularly frightening or even remotely threatening or direct. It was just a moment that made me stop and actually ask myself what I saw. As a child growing up in the backwoods of Maine, I've had my fair share of strange things in the night. Typically, it will be coyotes hunting, or the prowl of another nocturnal creature. As a child, I was never particularly afraid of the dark, but I knew dangers lurked in the absence of light, so at night, I played indoors. During the daytime, however, there were never any restrictions. On one summer afternoon, I was riding my bike down the street that branched off my dead-end road. Our only neighbours being a relative and a couple of decent folk just down the way. Otherwise, quiet woods. I would make this ride quite often, as there was no town, but this stretch was fun to ride, because I could pedal my heart out without having to slow down in order to veer. On this day, I made my normal round up the road, only to turn around and head back. I had an uneasy feeling on the ride up, which was the only abnormality. I felt like I was being watched. Something told me to look towards the woods on my right, and I did so reluctantly. Deep in the woods amongst the pines, I saw a black, almost liquid thing peer out from behind a tree. My heart dropped. I took off pedalling as fast as my feet would take me, keeping a steady eye on the woods to my right. This thing kept pace effortlessly, darting from tree to tree like a primordial ooze. It was either playing or stalking prey. I wasn't about to stop and find out. Pedalling so hard I thought my chain would snap. I knew my uncle's house was approaching on the left. I spun out in the dirt, ditched the bike and ran to his door, frantically knocking. I turned around to see if whatever it was would be making its way towards me. I didn't see anything. My uncle opened the door, cigarette in his mouth, asking me what's wrong. I explained to him what I saw. He grabbed a rifle and said, probably just a deer, with slight concern in his voice. I've never seen a deer move like that. I said out of breath. Yep, they'll do that, he said as he peered through the blinds. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but something tells me my uncle sure did. It's been 20 years, and I've since lost contact with my uncle. Maybe someday I'll reach out and ask. As a child, you're more susceptible to the supernatural, and there's always the adults that don't listen. I get it. Kids have wild imaginations. This house was no imagination, though. This house was dated with what felt like the longest hallway. Also, to make matters worse, there was an old family cemetery in the woods behind the house. But of course, I was never told that until we had already moved out of the house because my mom didn't want to scare me. With that being said, you would think she would have taken my experiences that I had there to heart and not brushed me off. But hey, I was just a kid. Here are two of the most startling experiences I and my brother had. I turned off my Walkman and removed my headphones, gathered my towel and headed to the bathroom. The shower was warm, the steam was rolling, the bathroom was painted white, and all the appliances in the bathroom were white, down to the white shower curtain. It made me feel safe because it was so bright. I was humming BSB and thinking about what song I wanted to listen to when I was done showering, suds all over my hair and face, eyes closed. 
I turned towards the shower head and rinsed my head, then turned away from the shower head, and just as I was turning, I saw a hand imprint that scraped the shower curtain on the outside. An adult sized hand. I called out to my mom and told her that I'm almost done, because I used to get fussed at for taking long showers. She didn't answer me, but I knew I'd better hurry my butt up. I finished rinsing off and turned off the shower. I opened the shower curtain and the bathroom was still so steamy and the door was shut. I thought that was odd, considering my mom had just come in there and I didn't hear the door close back. Also, the steam would have escaped. So I got a little panicked and hurried up and wrapped my towel around me. I sprinted out of the bathroom and into my room, right across the hall, and quickly shut my bedroom door. I got dressed real fast, and just as I was about to go out of my bedroom, I heard footsteps outside my bedroom door. I backed up, and then I heard my brother say my name, so I opened my door, and he was at my door. He saw the panicked look on my face, and I told him what happened, and as a big brother normally would, told me I was just imagining things. That line he told me soon changed course over the next experience. One night, I'm listening to my Walkman and my brother busts in my room, panicked, and he looks at me and says, that's very funny, you must have ran fast to get back in here. And I, with the most confused look on my face, said, what are you talking about? I haven't been out of my room since we ate dinner. He told me that he was sitting in his room and he heard footsteps approach his door and then someone knock on his door very loudly. So I reminded him that mom and dad were home and it might have been them just trying to see what he was up to. But he said that as soon as the knock happened, he jumped out of his bed and ran towards the door and opened it because it startled him. But no one was there. His room and my parents' room were at the end of the hallway and my bedroom and the bathroom were at the front of the hallway. This hallway was long. So I told him that there was no way I could have run that far to my room, shut my door, throw on my headphones and be that settled into my bed. We both walked out to my room and walked to the front of the house to find both of our parents sleeping in the living room. Dad in his chair and mom on the couch with a blanket on top of her. We didn't go back to our rooms until we both woke up the mop and they walked with us back to that hallway. What scared me most about this house was the mirror at the very end of the hallway. I asked my mom to take that down but she just jiggled every time. I saw a woman in that mirror behind me one night. My brother was never fond of that mirror either. After that night he had experienced it. It was a creepy house. I've lived in a few haunted houses in North Carolina. The house has two stories. Honestly, a beautiful house. It had a big yard and even clotheslines in the backyard. Downstairs was shaped really cool. It was a big circle, basically. The kitchen was massive, and the area where the bedrooms downstairs were was open with an access point to upstairs. Upstairs was where our parents' room was and a guest bedroom. My parents chose the room to the left, leaving the room to the right unoccupied. The house felt safe, up until one night. I was sitting in my bedroom with my bedroom door open, and I could see into my brother's room across the way. I was reading a book sitting Indian style in my bed when I saw out of the corner of my eye someone running straight across the front of my bedroom door and into the bathroom. I jumped and looked up and I saw my brother still sitting at his desk who looked undisturbed. I yelled out to him, did you see that? He looked up and said, whatever it was, I don't even want to think about it. So we never spoke of that again, but we started closing our bedroom doors. After a while, my mom's friend needed a place to stay, so she opened the doors to her. She stayed in the guest bedroom upstairs. She was a really cool woman and stayed to herself mostly. After a few weeks, she started to hang out downstairs more often and she seemed like she was tired all the time. But we got close and she would watch my brother and me when our parents weren't home. One night, I was in her room and we were talking about stuff. And I told her about that one night my brother and I saw something run across the way. And she froze up and said that there was something in this house. And that she doesn't like to sleep in this room. And that the room she was staying in was always cold. So we stopped talking about scary stuff 
and just ended up watching some TV and actually passed out in her bed with her. I woke up and it was dark, freezing cold, and there over the top of me was a very dark figure that seemed so angry. I nudged her and she said very lightly, I see it. Close your eyes, it'll go away. I closed my eyes and started crying, but as fast as it appeared, it also disappeared. She jumped out of the bed, flipped the light on, and we ran downstairs to my room. She slept in my room with me that night. The next morning, I went to my mom, and we told her what happened. This time, she believed me and told me that she's felt a presence in the house. And then she proceeded to tell me her and a friend that the last owner committed suicide in the bedroom that a friend was staying in. She told us that the bullet hole is still visible in the wall. My colour left my face and I told her that I saw the mark on the wall last night when I was in the room with her friend. So her friend left the house. Completely understandable. It wasn't even the next week yet when me and my brother were playing outside. It was dark but we had a very bright street light that lit up the yard and you can see the whole side of the house. I told my brother what mom told me and said that that explained a lot of the things that he seen and heard. I had my back turned to the house, picking up the ball that we were tossing back and forth. And when I turned around, he was staring up, up at a guest bedroom window, stone cold still. I looked up and saw what had him so frightened. It was a dark figure of a man standing in the window with his hand up to his head, holding a gun. We ran inside, panicked. Our mom took us to my brother's room because our dad wasn't happy with our antics. She told us that she will do everything she can to convince our dad to move. Months passed. One night, we were all sitting in the living room and my dad's chair was the closest to the side of the house. He was sitting in his chair and something caught his eye to his right. And he turned his head really fast, jumped out of his chair and swung the door open. No one was there. He swore up and down that he saw a man standing at the door outside, but there simply wasn't. We moved out of that house two weeks later and never looked back. Here's a little backstory for you. My wife and I were married after a five year courtship on January 1st, 2010. There were good times and there were some bad ones too. I won't go into many details, but during the course of our relationship, she suffered a major back injury. While she was recovering from this, she got addicted to opioids. Hydromorphone to be exact. She got addicted hard. It overtook her life for several years. I tried to be understanding, and I tried to help her myself. But when it became too much for me to handle on my own, or deal with at all anymore... I demanded that she either seek professional help for her problem, or our marriage was done. She did the typical addict things. She denied, she got mad, but she finally accepted. She checked herself into a detox facility for a month. She struggled, but she succeeded. She left that facility and went straight into a full-blown rehab. 28 days later, she was home, clean and sober for the first time in years. We re-established our relationship and fell in love all over again. Things were great for the next several months. We got to know each other all over again. It was great. Until it wasn't. On May 2nd, 2018, she relapsed. I learned the following from reading her personal journals after she passed away. She had been having some back pains again and had been fighting the urge to start using drugs for the pain again. She had been fighting silently for a couple weeks. When she broke down and relapsed, the drug she relapsed with was fentanyl. She died within moments of her relapse. That was the only thing that was found in her system at the time of her passing. I was devastated. I spent the next months running on autopilot, but there's no need to get into that here. One thing I failed to mention was that my wife was an incredible cook and baker. I've been keeping in close contact with her family ever since her passing. One of the common themes during the holidays was how much they missed her baking and knowing that they would never get her treats during the holidays again. So this year I decided to try my hand at it. 
I'm not a kitchen adept at all, not even close. But I had her recipes and figured, what the fuck, let's try it. So off to the store I go. I load up on all the ingredients and as per her recipes and fire up the stove. I spent two days making treats and dropping them off with her parents, brother and two sisters. Everyone was happy with the treats. There were some good conversations and a couple tears. After everything, I went home and started cleaning up the mess. As I was standing in front of the sink doing the last of the dishes, I felt a hand. Not an object, a hand, a palm and five separate fingers on my lower back. It startled me so much that I screamed and took a jump back and looked around. There was nobody there, but I was suddenly overtaken with a sense of calm. I just felt right. I've never had something like that happen to me before. A few days later, I was laying in bed, just dozing off. Almost asleep, when I felt something crawl into bed with me. I felt it crawl in right beside me. I swung my hand back, thinking it was our cat. Nothing there. Nothing at all. I lay there awake for a while, hoping for something more, but still feeling that same calming warmth I had days earlier in the kitchen. Before I fell asleep, I whispered thank you. I miss you, and I love you. I haven't had any more experience since, but I'm no longer a skeptic. For a little while, my eight-year-old life seemed pretty happy. Normal. That is, until my mother fell very ill with breast cancer. My stubborn eight-year-old mind hadn't realised the danger my mother was in. I wish I had. Maybe then I could have understood what was happening a little better. Mom was too weak to walk up to the second floor of our house to get to her bedroom. So naturally, my dad moved their bed downstairs into the family room. As my mother lay bedridden, unconscious and ill, strange things would happen as I lay with her. I would feel a presence, like I was being watched. Even as a little kid, I'd always been terrified of anything to do with ghosts. I was always afraid of being anywhere alone in the house. So when I felt that strange feeling, I began to cry. I cried quietly, I remember. I didn't want to wake mum up as she was resting, but strangely, a wave of warmth overtook my body and I suddenly felt very tired. I'd stopped crying. It was almost as if something were there comforting me. Now that I'm older, I have a strong feeling that the warm presence was my late grandmother, who I was close to. Mom eventually went into hospice care and she passed away there. There was a thick heaviness on our last visit. Do you know who Jesus is? My aunt would ask. That day, in the waiting room with all my family, when my aunt asked me that question, I knew what was next. Ever since my mom passed, I've always felt a different kind of presence in my house. As I lay in the empty cold bed, I think of her as I fall asleep. Not long after I've fallen asleep, I awoke to the feeling of my hair being tucked behind my ear. In my drowsiness, I had forgotten all about Mom's passing. It was her. I saw her face and I felt her warmth and I went back to sleep. It wasn't until I was fully awake and aware later that day that I realised what had happened. I knew she was still with me. Fast forward a few years later, I'm 12 and living in that same house. I'm asleep in my room when something wakes me up, a tapping sound on my door. I jolted out of bed and opened my door as fast as I could. Nothing but a cold draft met me. You see, that tapping was how my mum knocked on my door to get my attention when I shut myself in my room when I'd get upset. It was her gentle way of telling me that she was there if I needed to talk. I never did when I was upset and she was still alive. I wish I had. I've moved out of that house since and I haven't had any paranormal experiences. I'm almost sad that it's over because I know that that presence was my mom. I know she was telling me she was still there. I know she's still in that house with grandma. I grew up in a haunted house, rather a haunted neighbourhood. It's an old air force base that has since been recommissioned for college students and families 
that go to school on the outskirts of town. Growing up there, I experienced many strange things, many of which I cannot explain besides it being paranormal. Even though I know a good bit about the paranormal or the occult, some of these entities proved out of my main knowledge base. I've seen my little sister's double, seen multiple shadows in the house with a friend present. He quickly left after they all moved away at once. Had things move around, knocks on doors when no one else was home or asleep, footsteps up and down the hallway, conversations that would mute when you got close to them, and many other things. However, one of the creepiest ones always happened in the main bathroom. It had a small hallway branching from the main hallway. It wasn't very long, but I never felt safe there. During the night, even as a grown adult, I would run as best as I could at night because I feared what was behind me. I slowly stopped doing so because I knew that whatever it was got some kind of pleasure from it. It slowly started to not feel a presence near as much, but it was still there. One evening, as I'm taking a shower, getting ready for bed, I hear a knock, but not from the door. It came from the medicine cabinet, so being the curious fucker I am, I peeled back the shower curtain to see some of the fog having been wiped off the mirror. I started to take a closer look, when I saw a black slanted eye with no skin around it start to peek its way into my line of sight. I quickly hopped back in the shower and sat there, back against the wall, not knowing what to do. I eventually turned the shower off and hauled ass out of there, still dripping wet. The next time I saw this thing, I was walking down the hall after getting home from school, and I'm the only one home. So I start to do what male teenagers do when no one is around. I hear some scuffling, like dogs running around and a door open. I ready myself for someone to be at home, and as I walk out my bedroom door, I hear a, hey, but muted, and not a voice I knew. So I started to make my way towards the front door with my back to the wall as I felt I might need to dash back to my room for safety. My mistake here was that I was facing the hallway that leads to the bathroom. I move, I move over bit by bit, and I hear another voice, which seems to be coming from the living room, so I take another step. Then I see something in the corner of my eye, like a hand pulling back from a corner. I couldn't make it out at the time, but it didn't freak me out enough until I got in full view of the hallway with this thing standing there in a grotesque way. Black slanted eyes, no skin anywhere, black claws, and smelled something awful. More of rotting meat than rotten eggs. I froze for a second before I saw it flinch a little, like it was coming for me, and I dashed back to my room, slamming the door behind me, only to get three knocks every few seconds. I don't remember what I said, but it was along the lines of, I'm not going to be afraid of you. You can't get past this door and then it stopped. I waited there until someone got home, to which I went outside for the rest of the day, making sure I didn't have to use the restroom at night for any reason. A few months go by, and I'm still uncomfortable in this bathroom and hallway, but not much has happened since, so my guard starts to slip. One night, I believe it was a Friday night, I was taking a late night shower. Everything's going as normal. Wash the hair, face, body, when suddenly... The lights go out. There was a storm going on in the town and we were getting the weak part of it, so I didn't think much of it. I stepped out to turn on the lights and see if the house had power. Sure enough, the house had power, but the bathroom wasn't turning on, yet the exhaust fan was still on. That's when I started to get really worried and turn the lights on one more time, to no avail. Decided to keep my shower going in the dark. As I got back into the shower, I could feel something breathing on me, the back of my neck, my shoulders, felt a few brushes of what I hoped was just my towel and not something else. As I'm getting out of the shower, I'm drying my hair off when the lights come on. Awesome, I'm thinking, as I start to dry my face. When I pull off the towel, I look up and the mirror once again doesn't have fog, but the whole lot of it, not just the corner. I looked up a little more and just saw the thing there, right behind me, making a smile of sorts, but its mouth was sewn shut, or so it seemed. I stood there for about five seconds, unable to move, before feeling its claw on my shoulder, closer to my neck. 
I was suddenly able to move and again left the bathroom dripping wet, running to my door. I slam it shut, shaken and trying to gather my nerves. I hear a deep and high-pitched laughter and hear the bathroom door close. Went to bed that night with the lights on, all while hearing more footsteps than usual in the hallway. I've seen the thing thrice more, but thankfully none as scary as mentioned above, since I've learned to deal with it and how to protect myself. Haven't heard much of skinless humanoids, so this is one that has always stuck with me. Scariest besides being held against a wall from a vengeful ghost. About 10 to 12 years ago, my closest friend and I were staying the nights at one of their houses. This is an old Air Force base that had many suicides and other things happen, to which we still know not much of, even though it's come to be apparent with things we went through. One of my friends is also into the supernatural and occult and meditation and in tune with nature. We all were sitting in the living room, TV off, when we heard a noise at the back glass door that so happens to slide, like so many do. We all moved cautiously over to check it out since, you know, robbers or whatnot. One of my friends pulled the curtains away and we all froze. For what seemed like an eternity, we sat there in disbelief and finally the question came, do you all see what I'm looking at right now? To which we all asked, what exactly? The girl with her face cut up. Yeah, I see her, one by one answers. The friend lifting the curtain cuts back and asks what we should do. I said we don't have many resources to help out, but let's see if she's still there. We pull the curtains back once more to see that she's moved backwards towards the end of the patio, then slowly turns towards us, but not moving. We all freak out a little, or a lot rather, and try to relax on the living room furniture, discussing the situation. Next thing we know, a huge noise comes from the front door, and we gather in a stupid formation, from sitting to half sitting, ready to take on whatever was coming for us. The friend's house we were staying at comes through the front door with a giant dog that comes to lick our faces while his mother looks at us like we're crazy. After this dog met us, he stood still, just like we had sooner, and jumped towards the back door. We knew what he was going at. He didn't bark, but only growled and moved from side to side of the door like he was ready to pounce on something. The mother scowled him a little while putting a leash on and once again leaving after grabbing a few of her things. Once she left, everything felt a little more normal. It was always a little weird, especially at night growing up at this place. It was a full moon, so I and my other intuitive friend decided to kind of meditate on the patio to see if we could feel or find what was going on. No one felt or saw the girl since the dog showed up, so we felt it was a good time to do it. As we're doing our thing, I hear scurrying behind this back fence that sounds like a bunny. Makes sense, since we live outside the city and have a lot of wildlife around. Then I hear it again, but this time, I see the shadow of it moving through the fence. I don't say anything, since my friend seems to have been alright and not heard anything. I hear and see it move a few more times, and then my friend asks me suddenly, Did you hear that? Yeah, I have for a while now. Just didn't think you did or want to distract you. I was doing the same thing. You see that dark spot on the other side of the fence? Sure enough, there was a dark spot that just zipped away once we got up to investigate. So we both noticed something was around, but didn't want to tell each other for some reason. Yet when we both came to the conclusion that there was definitely something, we both looked over the fence into the alley. Again, this was a night of a full moon, so we can see a good bit, especially being outside for the last 20-30 minutes. In the middle of the valley, we saw nothing. As in, we saw a big, blacker than black spot. It had a centre of more than black, and it had a shadow of sorts that radiated off of it. Frozen for a second, we turned to each other, asking if we're seeing the same thing. Sure enough, that spot is there, surrounded by moonlight and other things, with nothing to give that kind of shadow. My friend asks me to keep an eye on it, while he grabs a garden towel. It moves a little, and I see a very little shape to it. 
It's still a black mass at this point. When my friend returns, he makes the note of it moving a little and asks if it changed shape. I told him it had moved, but there was a funky shape but returned to a black mass. Suddenly, my friend throws the garden towel at it and darts away. I've never seen something move so fast in my life, and it zigzagged away from what I could tell. Next thing we know, all of the dogs in the alley are going absolutely crazy. That's when we know we weren't the only ones to see or feel this. We quickly ran inside after about 10 seconds of listening to angry dogs and the scurrying of whatever it was. We returned to retrieve the trowel to find it sticking head first in the ground, but nothing was on it. Then, we presumed that whatever it was, was not of the normal world we know. It flared as it did, though made us believe it was something paranormal. And that we should find it again. Never have I seen that again, but I would like to, just so I could find out what it was. However, I've never seen such a dark mass in the midst of a full moon, especially with nothing to give it any shadow. It's a black mass I've seen before though, but this time it was out in the open, and I don't think it was related to what I saw before. We didn't sleep that night. And the next morning when we went exploring, we kept hearing voices following us. We all went to our own places, but still struck with some kind of awe, and for me, and that one friend, a kind of inspiration to find out what that was we saw that night. We hope to find out in, but it may remain a mystery for a while. Until then, we shall discover other things and explore other places. It was summer of 2012. Life was good. And I was up at 2am watching Teen Nick in my house's den. The whole house was always fascinating to me. One of the first houses built in our small town in Kansas during the prohibition as a moonshiner's party house. The whole house is a colonial style full of Victorian features. From the outside, it looks like a two-story, but there are actually three floors and half a basement. The architecture was always confusing as to how this was accomplished, but wedged between the top and main floor is a log cabin themed room, our family room or den. It was a glorified bar room fitted with a monstrous fireplace, an Alaskan moose head from around 1920, and a salvaged chandelier from the former Douglas Opera House. I hated being alone in that room at night because I always got a weird sensation, like someone standing over me when I would try to sleep on the couch after a long night of TV. My best friend and I also felt like this from time to time, sleeping in my own bed, which used to be the master suite. Never could get the cat or the dog to hang out in the den though. Its door was an inch thick of solid wood and had a very complex lock that remained tucked inside its latch, as no previous owners had the key. We never bothered to close it. It would get stuck in the frame because it was so heavy. There was a nursery on the top floor that shared a wall with this room. It was sold to us with no doorknob to the small 4x10 room. It became our home office. There was a brand new computer and all-in-one printer fax that remained unplugged, rarely used. My bedroom was right next to it and I always slept with my door open. In the middle of the night, I could often see the computer light up and paper would cycle through the printer. Could never get myself to check it until the morning. When we looked at the sheets, there was nothing on them, and we'd load them back inside. It was my sister and I's favourite place to pirate scary movies. We would close the door so as not to disturb mum and dad, because it didn't latch. But one night, she left me in the room to go get a snack, and when she came back, she couldn't open the door. I was trapped inside. My mum had to use a butter knife to force the handle. I was shook, given the timing. But back to the den. I'm minding my teen Nick business when out of the blue, I get a call from my friend. She tells me she's doing a Ouija board, which I've always done my part to stay far from. She says that her presence told her to call me. She informed me that I was wearing a black shirt, which I was, and I only own one. I hung up the call and immediately went up to my bedroom to wait out the next few hours to daylight. That same summer, my mom, grandma, sister and I 
went on one of our late night drives where we'd blast oldies, cruising the back roads. As we were driving, an unidentifiable creature ran in front of our car and across the road. None of us agreed on what we saw. We thought it was a very large white rabbit, cat or small dog. It was moving unthinkably fast for any of those animals. It made it across the road in two hops. At the time, we joked about it and kept on our way. When we got home and stopped into the foyer, heavy work boots start down the upstairs hall and down the stairs. They stop at the den level. From the foyer, you can see the part of the staircase that leads to the den. No one is there. We're all looking at each other, waiting for my father to continue his trip down the stairs. He then comes up from the basement, followed by our dog. The cat is chilling in a window on the main floor. We sent him upstairs to investigate. He checked everywhere, even the attic. Nothing. Could all be coincidence. When we moved into an apartment that fall, nothing else strange seemed to happen. I'm tempted to ask the family who lives there now if they've ever experienced anything. The original owners are buried in the morgue just down the street. So throughout my entire life, I've had many encounters with ghosts, shadow people, etc. This includes voices calling out to me, seeing faces in the windows of my childhood home, seeing and sometimes interacting with multiple different ghosts. There's a lot more, but I need to talk about a very specific event that happened when I was around the age of six or seven. My brother, two sisters, myself and my dad were all sleeping in the living room together. My dad was on the couch, one sister was on the love seat, and the other two were on the floor with me. I couldn't sleep that night, so I watched the disco ball I had for a nightlight spin. But at some point, the entire house became eerily quiet. I couldn't hear any noises from outside or anyone breathing around me. But all of a sudden, I heard the deepest voice I've ever heard speak to me. There was nobody. Just a voice that came from all around me. The voice told me something and warned me to never tell a soul what he said to me. I didn't sleep that night. Fast forward to May of 2020, I'm working in Texas. I had my first nightmare since I was a kid and I woke up to sleep paralysis. I can feel a heartbeat or a chest moving from breathing against my back and a familiar fear comes over me. I try to scream but nothing comes out and I slowly watch a long, dark hand move its way towards my neck. The hand stops though, and I can see a silhouette leave the room. As soon as it leaves my body, it shoots straight up, finally awake, and I'm drenched in a cold sweat. I've assumed it was the same entity from before, but I'm not sure. I've never told anyone what he said to me, and he hasn't spoken to me since. I haven't actually had contact with him until last year, but I always feel like he's never too far away. Does anyone know what he may be? I also have other stories. A friend of mine think I'm connected to the spirit world somehow. This happened in 2020. I had a grand uncle who lived in a different country than mine and was very fond of my immediate family. I had, however, never had the opportunity to meet him in person and had only ever interacted with him through emails and Facebook. I only knew what he looked like through family photos and his pictures on social media. He had, however, often expressed wishes for me to visit him in his country so we could go out to some of his favourite restaurants. He could cook for me, etc. The chance never arose. One night, I was having a pretty random dream. But among other things, I remember seeing my granduncle in that dream, and this was weird, because not only do I rarely, if ever, dream of family, but I'd never, ever dreamt about him before. And I'd never, ever dreamt of any family whom I hadn't met in person. In the dream, it was Christmas already, though my dream was in early September. I was walking down a long, dark road, lit only by the light of a row of cottages on the side. Which, by the way, is not the style of housing and architecture in my country. So I was clearly not walking in my own country. Despite the road being dark and empty, I wasn't afraid. I was pretty relaxed while walking. 
A car drove past me slowly, and again, I didn't feel the slightest fear. The window rolled down, and I saw my granduncle sitting near the window. He glanced at me, looking just like himself in family photos. He seemed calm as I called out to him. Then he looked ahead, and the car went on far ahead. I continued walking, feeling just fine. The next day, our family got news of his passing. I wonder if the dream had been his way of saying goodbye to me and making peace with not having had the chance to meet me in real life. My family and I had moved to a different state and bought a house. I no longer live there, but I definitely remember a few odd things that happened while living there. Our house was built in the 70s and was a fixer-upper. A husband and wife had lived there, and a few years prior to us moving in, the wife had died of cancer. I didn't know this until after I had first paranormal experience in the house, because my parents thought my sister and I would be scared if we knew someone had died in the house. My first experience was when I was in the basement doing my makeup. We were renovating the upstairs bathroom, so I had to use the one downstairs. When I was putting on mascara and was close to the mirror, I saw a black figure in the corner of my eye. It was like a person was standing right behind me and it felt like there was a dark presence. I turned around and there was literally nothing behind me. Does anyone know the significance of this dark figure? I'm still not sure what it was to this day. The second experience I had was when I was sleeping in the basement because we had family visiting and my grandma was sleeping in my bed. It was past midnight, and I swear I could hear running back and forth in the hallway upstairs. I have two cats, but both of them were sleeping downstairs with me. I went upstairs to check, and everyone was dead asleep. I continued to hear the stomping for about an hour, and I remember it being really hard to fall asleep that night. The last experience I had was the scariest. My sister and I had a friend over, and we were chatting about how we thought our house was haunted. My sister always complained to me about how she hears footsteps in her room, which was weird to me because I had never heard any specifically in my room. We all decided to lay in my bed and see if we could hear anything. We were silent for a few minutes on end. And then we heard a huge sound like someone had thrown something off my nightstand. It was the craziest thing. None of us had moved a muscle, and we heard that huge sound out of the blue. We looked on the floor, and nothing had been knocked onto the ground. It made absolutely no sense whatsoever. My dad never believed us when we said we thought it was haunted. However, there was one time he was inside the house alone, and said he heard the cupboards in the kitchen opening and closing while he was in the basement. He then came outside to ask us if any of us were doing dishes. We said no and he thought it was weird, but dismissed the whole thing. These were weird experiences, but I never felt unsafe. Maybe some spirits were mad we were renovating the house. Not sure. Let me know if you've had similar experiences. I've tried living with each of my parents, but things didn't really work out. So I started looking for a place to live. And the only place that was available at the time was a room in a guest house on the outskirts of town. I got a bike to cycle to work, got help to move my things and I settled in. I felt independent, all grown up and pleased as punch. I'd been living there for a couple of weeks, maybe months, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. But one night, things changed. I was tired and went to bed early, had no problem falling asleep but woke up at some point in the night unexpectedly. I assumed nature had called, so I went to the bathroom, got back in bed and drifted off again. I was having a perfectly normal dream when suddenly I heard a noise in the real world that woke me up. I found myself lying flat on my back and with the duvet folded neatly halfway down the bed. I can't see properly without my glasses, but I thought I could see someone standing by my bed. I put on my glasses and to my horror, realized that there was someone in my room. Standing over me beside my bed, looking down at me and making this terrible noise that had woke me. Then I realized that I could see the light from outside through this thing. 
I slipped off the end of my bed to run for the door, only to realise that it was locked and the keys were on the bedside cabinet. I looked back to find the thing looking back at me. It was a dark shape, and although I could barely make out features, I could see its mouth gaping open. The noise was like a long and loud gasping sound, as if the thing was trying to draw a breath to speak, but it was incessant. I turned on the main light on the wall beside the door out of my room. The shape was still there, but it began to fade and the noise began to drop. Eventually, the shape was gone. The noise continued after, but stopped, and the room, which was icy cold, despite me being against the radiator, started to warm up. I stood there for an hour or more, trying to explain away what I had just seen and heard, but I couldn't. I did get back into bed at some stage, but I felt all the lights on and didn't sleep. The next day, the landlord complained to me for leaving all the lights on, but I didn't tell him why, and I swore I'd never tell anyone. I must have looked terrible, as everyone in work asked if I was okay, and when I saw my dad later that day, he even said, you look like you've seen a ghost. That's when I broke down. I told him what had happened and expected him to laugh or get angry, but instead, he told me about things that he and other family members had seen in their lives, then asked if I was okay. So the next experience in what turned out to be a haunted guest house I was living in goes as follows. A night or two after the first experience with what I believe was an adult male, but possibly something far more malevolent, I awoke to hear noise in my room and I put on my glasses to investigate. As I sat up in bed with them on, I could see a small figure standing at the end of my bed facing the wardrobe and looking up at a poster I had on the wardrobe door. I could make out a kind of fringe, nose and chin as the light from behind was coming through the window behind him. I sat upright with my glasses on and just watching him quietly. I didn't feel threatened, like I had with the other ghost or entity, and it just seemed curious about the poster. I turned on the bedside lamp to see if I'd still be able to see him, but he was gone and that was that. The poster, by the way, was for a Japanese manga-style video game called Oni, which oddly is Japanese for ghost and demon. As I later learned, I still have the poster in the original cardboard tube. It was posted in from the UK, but I've never had it up on any wall in my room since, and I never will. When I was young, my family and I moved to a small former mining village in Leeds, West Yorkshire, and the house was small but didn't have any adverse history that we could find. Nor did we hear anything from the neighbours. We settled in comfortably, but noticed that pictures wouldn't stay hung up on the wall, and the house was a pain to heat up. On two occasions, I experienced what I presumed to be ghosts in that house. First, my parents were downstairs watching TV, and so I went upstairs to watch a video in their room. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I saw three dresses dancing on their own without hangers. I stepped into the room, and it felt really cold, and then the dresses fell to the floor. That was terrifying. I was only about eight or nine. The second event, I was in my bedroom falling asleep, and I think I was ill at the time. A woman came to my bedroom door, looking in on me to make sure I was okay. She was wearing glasses and had a kind face, and I was so out of it, I didn't pay much attention to her at first, until she walked into the room properly, and I saw she was in an Edwardian dress, and looked very transparent and blue. The house was built around the turn of the century, and was on a row of mine manager's cottages, so this fits. She smiled at me and walked back to the doorway, then through the wardrobe opposite into the house next door. I asked my neighbours if anyone in the street knew who she was, and all they knew was other children had seen her before, and she checked in on all of them at night, walking through the walls into the next house. When I was a teenager, I would go to summer camp for a week. At this camp, 
you weren't allowed a cell phone and there were no computers or any other form of outside contact allowed. After dropping off kids, parents could go write postcards that the camp staff would hand out throughout the week to make younger kids feel like they were hearing from their parents throughout the week. But in reality, all the postcards were written the first day at camp. All this to say, while at camp, I had zero outside contact, even with my parents. I had a great week, and soon enough, it was time for my mom to pick me up. We walked to the car, casually catching up about my week and hers. She then, very excitedly, brings up a rotary meeting she had attended on Tuesday of that week. She starts saying that they had a guest speaker, and I, annoyed, cut her off because she had already told me this. Being a moody teenager, I was annoyed and grumpily said something like, Mom, you already told me about your guest speaker who studied abroad in Israel and how you think I should apply for the program she did. My mom stared at me clearly freaked out. She then reiterated that this meeting had occurred while I was at camp. Therefore, I couldn't possibly have known about it. When we got home, we looked through all our texts and her emails to see if there had been any mention of the guest speaker, and there hadn't. She was a last minute addition to the meeting, so my mom didn't know she was coming until that day. We still have no explanation, and since that event, my mom has told me that as a kid, I would do stuff like that a lot. My dad's side of the family is Cherokee, and have always had really good intuition. My grandpa, for example, knew his mom had died before being told. Going back further, that mother had apparently predicted things all the time. When I was about five was the first time I remember. My parents had claimed that toys would play without batteries, and my mom was paralysed in bed with a skeleton leaning over her. But that was after they changed rooms with me because I can still remember clearly a giant white face coming out of my wall and speaking garbled language. I couldn't understand, so I asked my mom, and of course, she was freaking out. Next is a more recent one. A year or two ago, I was in the bathroom at about 3.46, and then there was a banging on the bathroom door, and being the scaredy cat I was, I left it open just a crack. So I peeked through and saw a freaking tentacle slithering away. The next morning I called my grandma and she said the night before, my five-year-old cousin said he saw a big statue with tentacles coming out of the ceiling above his bed. When I went to Colorado, they had us use dowsing rods on a ghost tour and I asked if Slender Manor was real. I don't want anyone to freak out because this is real, but so is Slender Man, fellas. Another that is one or two years is my baby sisters would start screaming when we tried to go in the hallway because of the black dogs in there. That's too much for me. Final story. My mom said it's an ancient Indian demon. And I know this all happened because my great, great, great grandma got cursed by a witch. The demon that I like to think was a Wendigo would always call my name. Spooky. Or if it wanted me to come to it, it would sound like my mum or grandma. When I was waiting to get picked up outside of school, I was the last one, when I heard my mom yell my name. I was glad she was there, but she wasn't. This also happens in my house. I brought this up to my 7th grade Spanish teacher who believes that stuff, and she said 100% Wendigo. She's like, they live in the woods, and thinking back, the school I went to that happened had woods right by it. My house, same scenario. I shared a room with two of my brothers when I was a child. I must have been around seven or eight, when I suddenly saw something odd at night. There were multiple dark green figures, somewhat human shaped, but without facial features. They walked in a circle, they went through the wall. They never interacted with me or went outside of that circle, but every night they came back. The pacing was different, sometimes fast, sometimes almost at a standstill. On the other side of the wall they were walking through was my parents' bedroom. 
They had a picture of Maria hanging on their wall on that exact spot. Because I kept seeing them, I moved to my parents' bedroom, never seeing them again. My second experience was a few years later. I was 11 and we moved to another house. Still sharing the room with my brothers, one night I woke up. I could barely move. And across the room, I saw this white large figure of a man. It had an orange chicken-like beak and angry orange eyes. He was looking at my brother sleeping. I crawled underneath my blanket and closed my eyes. When I looked back up, it was still there. It turned towards the wall. Every time I looked again, it moved close to the wall furthest away from me and eventually went through it. Now I've had sleep paralysis throughout my life, but this felt different. My last experience came two years ago. My mother fell ill with cancer and I took her in. Because she was having some issues due to the chemo, she was taken into the hospital. During the time she was there, I suddenly felt something during the night. It was this presence. I didn't see anything or hear anything, but just felt someone was in her room. It felt like death, and it felt like it was searching. Every night it was the same, and this went on for weeks. Suddenly, it was gone. Two days later, my mother passed away. I always thought it was death looking for her, and it had finally found her. What does worry me is that recently, I felt a likewise presence again during the night. It doesn't feel like death, but evil. I'll start this off by saying that I've never personally experienced anything paranormal, nor do I ever want to. Something about it bothers me, so I'm thankful that I have no personal stories to relate here. The story I've decided to share is one that I heard from a family friend at a New Year's Eve party in 2011, on a private beach in Sydney, Australia, as the sun was going down. She was a middle-aged lady who had begun to discuss this house that her friend lived in, which was supposedly haunted. She described a number of things that her friend and her friend's family members had experienced on a regular basis there. The details of most of those stories escape my mind now, and because this is third hand, I'll only share this single story that sticks vividly in my mind that she told me that evening. Her friend had an infant child, and that child would always sleep in a cot in the same room, where the child would be left alone during the night. The cot was always positioned parallel to one of the walls in the room, but not so that it rested against the wall. It was instead placed a few feet away from it. The mother became concerned when she discovered that each morning, when she would come to check on the baby, the cot had moved so that it was touching the wall. The baby was too small to be capable of moving it, and the cot was not on wheels. She would always pull the cot back to where it should have been, a few feet away from it, and each morning, she would find it against the wall in the exact same way. Well, just for the sake of it, either out of curiosity or frustration, the mother decided to move the cot much further away from the wall this time, into the very centre of the room. Of course, when she came back the next morning, she found the cot had once again been moved so that it was resting against that very same wall. The activity is ramping up tenfold. I'm weary of sharing any actual names, including my own. And you might see why. And before you go off immediately writing this off as someone high off crack, trying to make a piss poor ghost story, I assure you I'm not. This is my story that myself and three others know of. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm only here for two reasons. To see if anyone has had the same experience and or can help with me in, in writing this thing away from me. So with all that out of the way, let's start. I will name myself A. I was 21 at the time of this incident. I'm now 22. I worked many different jobs, mainly the food industry. My father was part of the HQ staff of a security company that still operates today. I eventually decided to try my hand in something completely different. Security, of course. 
I worked for the company for about eight months as a level two officer. And after about one year, I moved up to level three officer. Level three is someone who is authorized to carry and handcuff according to the company's policies and the client's policies. I was moved to my first ever post as a level three, a hospital located in San Antonio, Texas. I won't give out the name. Anyways, I worked at said hospital for about three months until I was told there was an abandoned section of the hospital. I was offered a tour. Before I go further, I should explain who was with me upon entering the abandoned section. First up is Agent Y. Agent Y was a former Secret Service agent who retired and eventually ended up in the security company I was in. Next up is Marine 1 and 2. As the names suggest, these two were former Marines. One was an infantry who was in the Battle of Fallujah and continued to see more action for another six years before leaving. Marine 2 was a former drill instructor. I'm saying this as a point of reference to show you that these people were not some wannabe thugs taken off the street to become lousy security officers. In fact, 70% of the company are of military or law enforcement background. Anyways, Agent Y was my supervisor of the site. Each site needed a supervisor. Agent Y also happened to be the hospital's main security supervisor. Agent Y and Marine 1 and 2 all went with me to the abandoned section. We all had our own flashlights. We explored essentially the whole building without any incident. Until we reached the ICU. This will haunt me until I die. We reached the ICU. We were stopped as there was a three-way fork. Each hall had a miniature hall connecting to the next. All three hallways were parallel to each other. We decided on the far left one and continued down. The plan was to go down all the way and circle back and take the next hallways. If it weren't for what I was about to experience, it was almost entrancing to see all the equipment and whatnot left there to rot. We reached the end of the first hallway when before all of us could turn around, Agent Y was first to notice that Marine 2 was fixated on a doorway. When we all turned in the direction of Marine 2, I immediately felt sick, like I was going to vomit violently. It started to smell like rotten meat. This all took within a span of three seconds. When we all faced the doorway, we all immediately noticed it. It was fucking peeking at us from the top of the doorway. It stared at us from the top of the doorway. I was more immediately drawn to its eyes. I would have expected normal eyes, but was instead met with inky blackness. There were voids where its eyes should have been. Marine 1 was first to run, followed by Marine 2. I then ran next, my heart shitting itself. As I was running, I noticed Agent Y outrunning me. For some god-awful reason, I was compelled to turn around to see if it was chasing us. The damn thing was floating towards us. From here, I'm not sure what happened as my brain blacked out. But what I do know is that a few months later, the abandoned building was destroyed. I genuinely wish it would stop here, but it gets worse. Agent Y, three weeks after the building's de demolition, committed suicide. A few days later, Marine One died under unknown circumstances. I tried to live my life without acknowledgement of what I saw, but I still see that godforsaken thing in the corner of my eye. I fear on next. Any advice would be of genuine help. Me and my roommates moved into one of my mom's apartments in April of this year. It's a duplex and we're on the bottom. The previous owners owned this place for about 20 years or so. The house was built around 1915. The lady upstairs has been there for maybe about seven. But anyways, ever since we moved in, shit has been absolutely fucked. Me and my roommates have had our fair share of creepy occurrences as kids, but nothing like this. The first thing we bought a nice rose gold knife set and we put it in our stove. We heard some weird noises one night, so we both went out to check. We live right in the middle of the town, and at the time, our windows didn't lock. My roommate jokingly grabbed one of the rose gold knives, and I put it back in the knife block. 
The next day, I did all the dishes and I noticed that the knife I put back last night was missing. I sent her a pic and asked if she knew where it was. She didn't. This knife had never been used. About three days later, we find it in the bottom drawer with our fucking laundry pins. I have so many more things to say that happened to us, so if you want to know, let me know. But me and my roommate both worked this morning, and we got home around the same time. When she got out of the shower, there was a mangled rat body of some sort on a freshly clean bed. We have a camera in our kitchen, out the front door and back door. No one has been in our house. We're so shocked, disgusted, just physically ill. Please, we just need someone's insight. This is escalating. This happened to me over 50 years ago. In Northeast Ohio, my aunt owed a huge three-story plus full suite attic Civil War era mansion. I would often visit and play with my cousin in this house. As an adult, I realized the house was set up like the house in the movie Clue. It had secret passages connecting certain rooms on opposite sides of the building. My aunt used to rent out the rooms and suites to random people, and some of the long dark halls had sounds of people, but I wasn't allowed to go past a certain point, and I never saw anyone coming in or out, so I'm not sure there really were other people there. I have a bunch of crazy stuff that happened there, but this is about my last day. I guess I should also tell you that my aunt practiced witchcraft. All these people have since passed away. I do not practice witchcraft. I'm a Christian, but I've seen too much to not believe in evil and the paranormal. Anyway, the layout of the front entrance was that you stepped into a huge room that off to your left was a huge staircase that went upstairs. If you went past that on the other side of the wall, was a small servant staircase that went both upstairs and down into the basement. If you kept going in that direction, you entered a room used as a schoolroom with a wrong map covering one wall and windows that looked to the front yard. And if you went further, you'd be in the kitchen. This was the most evil feeling house I'd ever been in then or since. On the last day I was ever in there, no one else was in the place, or at least as usual. I didn't hear anyone talking, and it was eerily quiet. I was in my early teens and had stayed the weekend. My aunt and cousin had to go out and told me they'd be back shortly. I was standing in the school room window, watching them both get in the car in the driveway. Then, I heard my cousin's voice say from the basement, Hey Sarah, come here for a minute. Now I'm looking at the voice of the owner outside, getting in the car. But this was clearly her, and clearly loud enough not to be my imagination. There was no other sound that it could have been mistaken for, and there was such a feeling of dread and evil, even though it didn't particularly sound in an evil tone. I was terrified. Frozen stiff for a minute while I figured out what to do, I was never going to go down there, but my only two routes out were past that stairwell, or through the passage in the kitchen to the dining room in the back of the house, and then back through to the front stairwell. As I had to go up to get my money and overnight bank. I closed my eyes and took off running past the basement stairs. Upstairs, back down and out the front door. I did close it but it wasn't locked. I figured out how to catch the city bus home and I never went back. I never told my family why I wouldn't go back and as far as I can remember they never pushed the issue. The house has long ago been torn down and was a vacant lot for years. Then a major medical facility in the area purchased the land in the whole few city blocks. It looks nothing like it did then, but I always wonder if I would have died, gone missing or gone insane, had I gone down there. I also wonder if the current medical facility on the property is haunted. I live 3,000 miles away now. We moved in there as a family when I was around seven. It was a semi-detached UK house with two bedrooms and a loft. The bedroom my brother and I shared had access to the loft via a standard door and a staircase leading up to a large loft. My father used to sleep and work there before he moved out 
as my parents were separated for a long time before their divorce. While he still lived there, however, I became accustomed to the sounds of him walking in the loft and down the stairs to my brother's bedroom. This is important for later. Again, I knew inside out what footsteps sounded like when someone was in the loft or walking down the stairs to the bedroom. Anyway, before my father moved out, a lot of shit happened between him and my mother. So I remember starting to feel a deeply troubling energy whenever I was in the house. After he had left, I still continued to hear footsteps of someone pacing up and down the loft and sometimes down the staircase to the door where my brother and my bedroom was. My mother would often go up there to use the ensuite, so there were many occasions where I heard the pacing and went up thinking I'd find my mother there, but the loft would be empty. I heard these footsteps a lot in the evenings, all the way downstairs in the living room. They were heavy and sometimes would slow down or speed up. I dreaded when my mother would send me up there to get some wrapping paper or something other. I distinctly remember walking up to a landing where the main bathroom, master bedroom and my bedroom were, while still hearing these footsteps going back and forth. I'd reach the attic door and the minute I would open it, they would stop. Sometimes, when I felt brave, I'd do a thorough check of the loft space and ensuite, again finding no one there. This went on for months, maybe a year, and to add to the footsteps, the door which led to the loft began to sometimes open slightly and then slam shut. I put it down to the draft despite no windows being open and despite the force in which it would slam. I also deeply considered that I, an eight-year-old, was going crazy. I thought maybe the divorce and the negative experiences in the house were making me see and hear things, and I resolved to confide in my mother for help, which I didn't. One day, my mother wanted to go food shopping. There was a safe way about a 40-minute walk away from the house, but on that specific day, I was too tired to do the 40-minute walk and threw a tantrum, adamant I was going to stay home by myself. My brother and mum left and I sat down on the sofa to watch TV. The sofa was against the wall of the staircase leading up to the landing with the bedrooms. After about 20 minutes, I began to hear the footsteps pacing in the loft and started getting spooked. I remember thinking, it's all good, they'll stop soon, or if they don't, nothing bad will happen, there's nothing up there. And then they started coming down the loft stairs. At this point, I turned the TV volume way up. I consoled myself again with the idea that this was a usual thing and I remember telling myself it's okay, they'll stay there, but they didn't. I started hearing them heavier walking across my room. That feeling was like absolute horror, like someone was up there and now knew I was alone. Again I thought, okay, as long as they stay a floor above, I'll be good. I calculated in my head that the steps should have reached the top of the staircase leading to my floor by now. I held my breath, heard nothing, and was about to dismiss it all as stupidity. But then, it started walking slowly but loudly down the stairs just behind me. To the right of me was the door entering the living room, and I made the decision that I was not going to look. Because there was something there, and I could hear that there was something there. Anyway, I started singing to myself. I sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star so loudly over and over again, and to be honest, I don't remember much after that, apart from hearing a knock at the door after what felt like literally only a minute, and then opening it to see both my mother and brother back with the shopping. The footsteps continued after like they did before this day, as well as the door slamming. I never told anyone, and we moved shortly after. I never brought it up again, until I was about 11. By then, I had chalked these events down to my life at that house, having a neg negative effect on my mental health. So my brother and I had gone to dinner with my dad at Pizza Express, and we must have been talking about spooky things. I thought, oh, why not tell them what I experienced in the house? I told the story in a brief way, with not much detail, and I looked up and saw my brother literally go pale. All he said was, I heard them too. And he went on to describe the sound, the speed, and the heaviness of the footsteps. The change of direction, the door slamming, all of it. 
My father suggested it was the neighbours due to the house being semi-detached. But even as an eight-year-old, I was thorough. I made sure I could differentiate. I often heard neighbours running or going up and down the stairs. And that wasn't it. Before I start telling the story, I want to tell you about the dog my grandparents had. Her name was Billy, and we were one soul. She died at a really young age due to kidney failure. And to understand how close we were, we did everything together. I even understood when she wanted to tell me something. I've never experienced something like that with an animal, but she was very special. And the most important thing that has to do with the story is that she always wanted to protect me. Now to the story. As a child, I practiced handball for many years. I always walked to my practices and to get there, I had to cross the street. I crossed the street thousands of times before. Sadly, a lot of people don't care about the speed limit and go a lot faster. My mother made me very paranoid about crossing streets and getting hit by a car. So I always checked multiple times if a car was coming or not. So little me, checked if it was safe to go. And when I was sure no car was coming, I went my way. As soon as I stepped foot on the road, a car was racing towards me at very high speed. My seven or eight year old self honestly thought at this moment, okay, that's it, I'm gonna die. Until I felt two strong arms wrap around my stomach and a tug on my leg. I was now back on the sidewalk and the car flew by. Someone saved me, I thought in my head. With tears in my eyes, I turned around to thank the person that just saved me from death. But there was nobody, not a single soul. The weird thing is that normally there are always people walking by or cars driving past the street, but not this time. I was very confused and went home totally forgetting where I was originally heading. As I walked into my flat, my mother looked at me and said something about me looking like I've seen a ghost. Well, I guess, kind of. I told my mother what happened, and she said that one of my guardian angels must have saved me. She told me about my great-grandfather that passed away before my birth. That night, I dreamt about a man with big bushy eyebrows and my dog Billy next to him. So I went up to him to say hi and thank him for taking care of my dog. Some years later, I finally saw a picture of my great-grandfather for the first time ever, and I was shocked. He was the man I saw in my dream that night. I truly believe that they saved me that day. My family and I came back late at night from a family gathering. Everybody went to sleep, since it was late. To be clear, back then I had a room in the basement. Next to my room was my sister's room, and next to her room was my parents' bedroom. If you want to go to the parents' bedroom, you've got to go through my sister's room. Then there's a tiny floor, which leads to my room, as well as a bathroom and a stairway. My room also leads to our main floor. After you open the door, there's a stairway going up. So just as I was getting comfy, I heard strange noises from my parents' bedrooms, like something slowly approaching, but not steps, but like something on wheels. I heard it say something that I didn't understand in a robotic kind of way. I was always freaked out and I didn't know if I should turn the light off or on. I left it on. It was really close and as every kid, I pulled my blanket over my head. The next thing stopped before my bed and said, so? At this point, I was absolutely terrified and I couldn't move because I was scared to death. I gathered my courage and watched what was standing there, just watching me. I think it was a witch, just watching me. You might think that sounds stupid now, or it's just the imagination of a child, but hear me out. I live in Germany, and my region is famous for Walpurgisnacht. So basically, all witches meet up at this place on their hex and tansplatz and dance with the devil. So why is this important, you might ask? My aunt once gave my family a witch. It's like a sort of doll that you can hang anywhere, and it looks like the witch is floating on a broomstick. 
Anyways, this witch is still there, hanging directly before you enter my old room, under the stairway I mentioned earlier. She also looks really scary. So now it's getting crazy. My sister once slept in my bedroom, since we had guests, and I slipped by my mum and dad. After that night, my sister told me that she saw some sort of witch. To be clear, my sister is five years older than me. It could be that she was scared, because I've told her about my encounter before, and she was scared after that. Maybe she just imagined all of this. Her reaction the next morning was real. She was really scared. Before this all happened, I want to explain what happened to some stray cats my neighbour, Juan, was taking care of. He would feed her antibiotics and food, and also has more cats around his house. So I was out peeling tomatillos for some food I was cooking in my front yard. I heard some dogs fighting, and this was usual, since my neighbours, too, had chihuahuas, which typically fought and barked all day. They went on for a while, so I checked to see what was wrong, and when I looked over, I saw the four dogs ripping the stray cat neighbour one was taken care of. Neighbour two didn't care, and didn't even call their four dogs in. I tried saving it, but it died in my arms, so I asked the neighbour if it was his, to which he said no. And so I decided to bury it in my backyard. I washed my hands and went back to my front yard to keep peeling tomatoes, but I saw something strange happen. This man on a bike I had never seen started to ride back and forth through the alley and near our houses, as if he were looking for something. I didn't think much of this until now. This recently happened a day ago, on my way to work. I woke up at around four and started on my way, as I would usually. But as I reached the intersection near my house, I saw a man with a black coat or robe down to his feet. The car lights were very bright, but his face wasn't visible at all. I was spooked, but didn't think much of it, and continued my day as per usual. After work passed, I heard back home, and I got out of my car, and went to get my mail, which happens to be near neighbour one's house. So as I always do, I started a conversation with him. He thanked me for burying the dead cat in my backyard, and wanted to say something else. He had told me that he had also experienced and seen some man in a black robe, near the same intersection around the same time, 4am, though his experience was much worse. He opened his garage early like he would every other day to start out his yard work, but when he opened his garage and looked out, he was shocked to see a man in a black coat on the sidewalk. The man was standing there and was looking away from the houses. My neighbour grabbed an axe from his garage and waited. The man in the black turned and slowly headed towards neighbour one. And out of nowhere, another man with exact features and no visible face came from the right side of neighbour one and started to walk towards the first man in black. It's as if they were meeting up. Once they got close, they started walking back and forth on the sidewalk. Neighbour one stayed there for an hour, but the men didn't stop walking back and forth. The sun started to rise, so he closed his garage and locked his doors. We haven't had any encounters since then. It was around 10pm at night. I was alone in my room and I had a huge day ahead of me, so I wanted to stay sharp and get some last minute studying done while on my phone before falling asleep. Then suddenly, I noticed in the corner of my eye, tiny orbs of white light started to amass just outside the window next to my bed. Gradually, the orbs of light grew brighter and more pronounced. As it started to phase through the window, my once darkened room became flooded with almost blinding white streaks of light. As more and more white particles were manifesting themselves right before my eyes, I felt a great fear that something was coming and that I needed to hide myself quickly. So I did the only logical thing I could think of at the time, I dove headfirst under the comfort of my bed coverings. From under my covers it was dark, but I definitely felt safer there, despite sensing this unknown presence still approaching me slowly. I panicked as it was happening, but somehow I managed to calm myself down. I definitely didn't feel like I was dreaming. 
I was totally wide awake. I wanted to believe I was dreaming, but I managed to check my cell phone for the time and it was only around 10 p.m. at night. Being able to quickly check the time on my phone seemed to confirm to me at least that I wasn't dreaming. When I got within a few feet away, I closed my eyes hoping it would just go away. I felt it stop right before me. I wasn't sure if it was friend or foe, but I knew it was watching me. I felt its grand presence looming over me while I cowered. I also felt it could sense my fear because as I started to succumb to the fear of possibly dying, I started to hear growling like from a dog. At first it started off soft, but after some silence, there was a loud snarling sound as if from a wolf. Needless to say, I was very afraid at this point. From there I kept my eyes closed and I didn't want to move at all, so I stayed still. I felt if I had peaked at that moment that I might not have survived. I just wanted it to leave me alone. After some brief silence, the orb of light seemed to have shifted its focus from me and floated across the other side of the room into my walk-in closet where it slowly dissipated. No longer after feeling this presence, I hopped out of bed and followed it towards the closet. Nothing. My supernatural encounter had ended. From time to time, I wonder what would have happened if I had looked at it instead of hiding. Not sure what it was. A cryptid? Interdimensional being? Something or someone astral projecting? Whatever it was, it was anything but a dream. Has anyone experienced something similar? So basically, since I've moved to my apartment complex three years ago, I've been experiencing paranormal activity that I've decided to name Bill. In the first few months there, I was experiencing things like hearing someone breathing behind me at night while in bed or in the bathroom, and seeing tall figures in the hallway or in my dad's room. Bill might also be following me, because in my time living here, I've also been to two different psych wards for unrelated personal reasons. At the wards, I also experienced paranormal activity. Seeing tall figures in the hallways or running past a window, and feeling like I was being watched or like something in my room was going to jump me. He's still there after I got released from the psych ward, obviously, because otherwise I probably wouldn't be posting this. Whenever I'm home alone, I keep hearing things like knocking and scratching on the walls, and that same feeling of being about to be jumped from behind. Things have also gone missing, like water bottles that were on my desk, but gone the next day. Things like the shower or sink turning on their own have also happened. Though to be fair, that's more annoying than scary, if you take into account the water bills. I've also been getting touched in random places, like on my arms and legs, or feeling a head laying against my side. I know this all might seem a bit ridiculous, especially considering I named him, but I could really just use some advice on the matter. I've already talked to a friend who's more experienced with spiritual things, and they're convinced I'm dealing with a nuisance or a demon. I wanted some outsider opinions on the matter. In April of 2021, I was on my way to get my medications when I got into a very serious car accident. My dog and I recovered after very serious injuries. When the man hit me, he was going 65 miles an hour on a 30 miles an hour road and blew the stop sign. I'm not one to believe in ghosts, but there was this huge rainbow around my car. I couldn't move for 45 minutes and thought I was dying. I feel like maybe I do have good spirits looking out for us. We survived. In October 2021, my partner had moved in with me at my apartment. I've lived in this apartment completely alone for over a year. Nothing had really been happening, but it was starting in very small incidents. When my partner was in a different room, I was laying on the couch with my dog Kuma and my cat Marley asleep next to me. Our balcony door was locked because I struggled with paranoia. I used to have curtain lights hanging from our balcony door until I noticed that one strand was swinging and it wasn't just subtle. 
I managed to get a quick video of it, but it stopped as soon as my partner came back. Since 2022 started to now, we noticed our devices are acting up. My television is linked up to my PlayStation 5, so when I turn on the system, it will turn my television on. I work from home, so I'm here 24-7. The television itself has turned itself on multiple times. Now, my PlayStation 5 just turns on regularly by itself. Could that be a glitch? We were also trying to sleep one night and my entire work laptop, monitor and keyboard all turned on after it had been powered down. None of it made sense. Within the last month, I could hear my boyfriend coughing in the living room, but he's at work. Could it have been my neighbour? None of them are home when I'm working. It happens multiple times throughout the day, along with phantom vibrations. This is always something my partner and I disagree with. He swears up and down that he's never heard this vibration at all, and that I need to let it go. The couch vibrates four times like a Samsung phone, but that makes absolutely no sense, as none of my friends have left their phone here, and my couch is new. I've noticed that my hair gets blown when I'm either cooking, showering, or working, etc. Today has been what motivated me to write this. I'm currently at work, and I started to hear the coughing again, so I took a break to see if I could catch it, but it stopped. This is going to make me sound like I'm insane, but I had gone to Arby's for dinner, and we had this leftover sauce cup that I didn't use, so my boyfriend threw it away. After two days, I noticed it had been out on the counter. I was confused, as I had watched my partner throw it away. It was just hanging out like it had never been touched. Another day goes by, and the sauce cup is upside down next to our dog's bowl. I picked it up to see if Kuma had been moving it, but there were no bite marks, and Kuma would have eaten it. Today, the sauce was directly in front of our shoe closet. My boyfriend said he threw it away three times already, and thought it was me taking it out, so we threw it away again. I just threw it away about 45 minutes ago, and I'm worried that it may happen again. What should I do? It's clearly messing with me, and we're already moving, but who knows if it'll follow me. One month ago, in my apartment building, some weird noise started. Like someone was doing some construction work on their flat. I didn't pay much attention. Someone should be repairing stuff, or something of that sort. It started on a Friday, and it was almost always in the afternoon when it started, ending at like 2 or 3 a.m. The weekend, same thing. Morning quiet, rest of the day busy, with a noise sounding like someone was hammering something. Everyone that was on the right side of the building was starting to get annoyed, mostly because everyone wanted to rest to be able to work on the next day. Of course, we started to try to find the location of the source try to pin down to this one apartment. There's also another building close to ours where the walls connect. I've gone to every apartment. I put my ear near the lock and almost no sound. The flat most affected is my upper neighbour where she lives with a daughter. We thought that it should be the apartment above her making all the noise even though the water supply is shut down. Same with electricity. So logically no one should be living there. But we had to be 100% sure. So we called the owner and asked her kindly to open the apartment so we could check if someone was using it or had to force an entrance. No one was there and the noise could still be heard. So we ruled out that the inhabited apartment was the source. Time goes by and the phenomenon repeats every day. No mistake. Bangs on the wall, bangs on every division of the apartment of my neighbour, on the furniture, things falling in the bathroom and kitchen, etc. The police were called three times, but of course, they couldn't solve anything. They entered this flat, also heard the noises, but couldn't pinpoint where all the sound was coming from. It also travels very fast, from the kitchen to the living room, etc. Also on this corridor, we started to bang the wooden walls and we would have replies. Even asking questions and saying, knock once for yes, knock twice for no, we would get re replies. If I knock one time, 
two times, three times, four times, etc. I would get the same number of knocks answering me. It's very weird. Fast forward to the last few days. Both my neighbour and her daughter went away for the weekend. Magically, the sound stopped. I didn't know this until yesterday. I just thought, finally, the fucking noise went away. They returned yesterday. And guess what also returned? Yeah, that's right. Knocking hell again. So I was in the corridor with both my upper neighbour and another from the same corridor chatting. Both her and her daughter were outside the flat. Her daughter playing with another girl. And by this time, zero noises. We're all chilling in the corridor. But later on, her daughter went inside to pick a doll to play with. We started hearing the knocks again. Every single time her daughter went inside, we would hear, after five seconds, the knocks. So I asked my neighbour, can I go inside? She replied, yeah, of course. I went inside, in full silence. I stood there for like 30 seconds. Nothing. I come out, ask my neighbour if she could go inside as well. She goes inside, zero knocks. We ask her daughter if she can go inside again, and boom, knocking all over the place. I kid you not. This didn't miss like 12 times she went inside, every single time. Later on, another neighbour arrives in the corridor. We made the same request. He went inside, zero noises. Daughter goes in, full blown knocks. This happened in the north of Iran. To Baristan. The forests between the mountain and the Caspian Sea have always been known to be home for creatures called Jinn, Deev, and Parry, also known as fairies in Western culture. My aunt and her family went on a vacation in the north. She just bought a new phone that rec can record video. It was a new thing back then, so she kept recording everything they did on that trip. When they came back home and rewatched the videos, they all quickly notice something strange in one of the videos. They rent a house that is next to the forest, the last one. In the north of Iran, because of farming rice, houses are not built next to each other in some areas. They made a campfire next to the forest. They used coals for kebab, and then headed back to serve in the house because of flies' annoyance and bugs. But they left the fire alone because they wanted to come back and sit next to it after eating. When they're eating, my aunt is recording them, and the house, and explaining the vibes. She then shows the fire through the windows and then zooms in it, then explains that we made fire here for kebab. Big fire as you can see, like she's recording a show to her friends. After the vacation when they're re-watching the videos, they quickly notice something strange in the part where she zooms on the fire. There are at least three blurry human figures around the fire. They move around the fire and then jump over it as if they're dancing with the fire. The way they behaved is actually a famous tradition that Iranians do in the Scarlet Day Festival. We make fire on the last Wednesday of the year to celebrate fire for some ancient religious reasons. After the influence of Islam on Iran, people pretty much call everything supernatural jinn because its existence can cover anything. Because they can take any form. So everyone pretty much agreed that these are jinns and they made some prayers and more special prayers and said it's not good to talk about them. I personally watched that video on my aunt's phone like 20 times. I was mesmerized by that. I didn't have a phone back then, so when I grew up and understood how important that video was, my aunt's phone was long gone. I've been searching for that video for five years now. First, I wasn't even trying to look for the video because I knew it would be impossible. But when I ended up in the north of Iran for university, I met so many locals. I've heard so many similar stories. Most of them are fogged with myth and other extractions. One day, when I told the story to some of my local friends and they quickly recognized it, they said they've also seen the video. I thought they were lying but they finished my story before I even told them what the figures were doing. They already knew it. I was blown away. Turns out, 
My aunt shared that video with some locals because they were excited that they caught gins on camera. Over the years, the video was shared in the chain of Bluetooth sharings, and many people have seen it back then. So I started asking people if they remember such a clip and found three more non-related individuals who have seen it. I tried searching the internet, deep web, dark web, any web you say, and haven't found it. Sometime in 2017, my dog seemed to be staring into my lounge room at night for no apparent reason. My house was cluttered, so I couldn't do anything to explore it, but every time I'd see him in there, I'd just look into the lounge room as well, trying to see if there was anything there. I couldn't see anything many of the times, so I'd just ask my dog, what are you looking at? He's usually very ready to react to any conversation around, or projected at him, but all these times he was completely undeterred from staring into the lounge room. So over these months, I'd see him doing this. Something I started to notice was that it was always around 11 and 12 o'clock. It really started to freak me out, so I kept looking in when he would do this. For the first time I saw that of a grey figure, and I mean a slightly different hue of grey from the colour the room was in the dark, kind of just floating there looking at me. It was freaky, and I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, because I don't exactly have the best vision. I blinked a few times and the figure disappeared. I was pretty spooked for the night and couldn't stop thinking about it. Now once again, over many days, I didn't see any figure when I would look into my lounge room, even though my dog seemed to see it. Eventually I saw it again, but this time it was like trying to hide from me, behind some boxes I had piled up, once again just looking at me. I spoke to my dad about the situation and he said that he believes that when we die, our energy is left behind, so basically like our soul, and so we've told to go away, it will go away. I ended up seeing my dog looking into the lounge room again, and so I stood there alongside him, ready to say the words, but I felt scared. I didn't know whether it would properly found out, oh, my cover is blown, or something like that. So I didn't say go away, at least I don't think so. My memory is very bad. And this is the only part that I'm pretty clueless on. But if I didn't decide not to do it, I think fearfully whispered go away. And then I didn't really see my dog looking into the lounge room anymore. He would just go to bed and sleep. So here is my basic orb explanation. It's not too in depth but maybe it can help someone somewhere to understand. Orbs are extremely common type of paranormal misunderstandings. They've become an extremely common misconception in the paranormal community due to many paranormal reality television shows. These shows have spread this misinformation to many believers simply because they require content for their episodes. But if you look deeper into the paranormal community, you'll find that orbs are widely hated and not considered paranormal evidence at all. Orbs are also known in the photography community as backscatter. Many people believe that orbs are paranormal due to the way they appear and disappear and their movement. Orbs are very minute particles or even small insects flying in the air. Whenever there's a light source, it can be reflected by these particles and the sensitive camera lens can pick up these light reflections. So, in an example of a night vision camera, a dust particle can float into the light and fade into existence. And when it's out of range of the light, or the light is no longer reflected towards the lens, they can fade out of existence. And as for the movement, you have to consider just how small and light these particles are as they float through the air. Any slight difference in air pressure, even a breath or slight movement, could cause them to rapidly change direction. These changes in direction are commonly mistaken as an intelligent pattern. This is known as agnenticity, the tendency to infuse patterns with meaning, intention and agency. An easy way to tell its backstatter is the environment. Normally people associate old buildings as possibly haunted, but they're also really dusty. 
As you walk through an old building, you'll kick up dust. So if you go to take photos, you're sure to have orbs. When you're outside, you also have to take into account pollen and insects. You'll also notice that orbs are rarely, if ever, visible in daylight photography. It's always either dark with the use of a flash, or it's poorly lit. Ever since I was about one and a half, I'd have terrible night terrors. I'd scream and cry like I was being murdered while dead asleep. Then when my parents would tip wake me, I'd act like nothing happened and return to being a normal, smiley toddler. My doctors couldn't figure out why, because my brain looked normal, and they didn't look like night terrors. So my mom brushed it off as she was already dealing with so much. I was born into a house that was built in the early 1800s, and was the only building that survived a fire that burned down the whole town. A lot of weird shit went on in that house. It turned out that there was a hidden room that was filled with dead animals and stuff for witchcraft and rituals. So we moved to our next house when I was about two. When we moved, my night terrors got a lot worse. I would wake up with bruises from flailing my body so hard in fear, and I would scream so loudly that the neighbours actually eventually called the police because they thought I was being abused. Up until I was about ten, I had distinct night terrors of a man and his dog standing over my bed, blankly staring at me while they burned to death. I suppressed these memories so deeply that I had no clue that I had any of these night terrors. But my family was very aware and got freaked out when I came home one day with my foster sister and told them about how we played detective and helped solve a mystery where a guy and his dog died in our front yard and we couldn't figure out how. Years passed by. I had other night terrors that I don't remember much of. And they stopped altogether when my family moved to a different house when I was 15. I was a freshman in high school and something I thought was weird was that I drew a picture of a burning man that seemed mouldy and familiar. But it didn't bother me until a few years later. When I turned 16, my family was eating dinner and my brother and he casually made a joke about me being a spawn of Satan because of my night terrors. I laughed because I thought he was making a joke about my night terrors until my mom got mad at him and told him to shut up. That's when I got confused and a little concerned. I asked what they were talking about and my mom sighed. She reminded me of my night terrors about the man and his dog and then told me there was an electrical fire in our house about 10 years before we lived there. The entire inside was destroyed and an elderly man and his dog burned to death while asleep in my room. They didn't want to tell me while we were still living there. I'm now a senior in high school, and I found the drawing and put those together. Kind of scared the shit out of me when I first was told. Has anyone else had a night terror that turned out to be true? Paranormal tales surrounding the Bel Air house are not new. In fact, it dates back to the early 20th century. There had been certain events that brought about the haunting of Bel Air house. It's simply abnormal due to the fact when you see the Bel Air house, the primary thought you get is that it's an innocent looking residence that sits on top of a cursed coal mine. However, if you enter the house, you'll come to see that the house belongs to a horror movie. The house had tales of the supernatural, even during the years when it was sitting abandoned. People from the neighbourhood claimed to see figures roaming around within the house or peeking out of the windows. These were reported when the house was inhabited. The Bel Air house is situated close to the banks of the Ohio River. This is the land where the French and Indian Wars took place from 1754 to 1763. The house is on a ley line meaning there is a consistent paranormal energy encompassing the house. The Bel Air house is also believed to be haunted due to a coal mine explosion that took place within the Ohio Valley in 1893, where 42 men died in the explosion and it took days to find their bodies. A humble man with a good reputation named Jacob Hetherington owned all of the coal mines within the Ohio Valley. 
He additionally worked within the mines along with his employees and his pal Jack, a mule. Jacob married a charming lady named Eliza Armstrong. This humble man was not just the authentic owner of the Bel Air house, but also Bel Air itself. In March 1893, it was widely said that the Hetherington coal mines at Bel Air were to be deserted after the explosion. The operators had spent $8,000 in an attempt to put the fire out and concluded that no more efforts would be made. This explosion happened in coal mine number one, and the frightening part is that the Bel Air residence is located on top of coal mine number one. In 1847, Jacob Hetherington built the Bel Air house near the Shawnee burial caves. Because of the house's location, it's believed to serve as a portal to the realm of spirits. Also, in 1754, the French and Indian conflict ran riots through Bel Air. The bloodshed still stains Bel Air. Also, it's believed the place this house is located on was used by Native Americans to perform occult rituals. After Jacob, Alex Hetherington inherited the fortunes, but the business started to fail due to Alex's strange state. He reported seeing demons and claimed that they tried to kill him and also had sporadic seizures. People believed that he was haunted and cursed by the spirits of the people who died in the coal mine explosions. Alex was put into a mental asylum and the property moved into the hands of his daughter, Lied. After a few years, she even died inside the house itself. After her death, Edwin tried all he could to commune with the spirit of his sister with the help of multiple occult rituals. It's believed that these rituals made this house a portal to the realm of the dead. It's said that the kid of one of Edwin's servants was pushed out of the window in the attic as she had a powerful bloodline that would lure a specific demon inside the house. He strongly believed that this demon would help him commune with the sister's spirit. But after this incident, three other people died in a similar fashion by jumping out of the window in the attic. After the house's abandonment, neighbours started to report seeing apparitions on the windows of the house. The house then went into the possession of Kristen Lee, and she moved into the house with her family. Kristen reported making contact with multiple malicious spirits and documented the terrific experiences she had. Because of multiple terrible experiences, she eventually had to move out of the house. The house is said to be haunted by multiple spirits, with Emily Davis being the most prominent one. Some say that she's a little girl, while others say she's a disconcerting demon who hides in the identity of a little girl. This entity is often spotted inside the attic. Paranormal activity is never short inside the house with visitors reporting hearing voices and footsteps and seeing phantoms and shadow figures. Poltergeist activity has also been reported inside the house with visitors being physically attacked and scratched by the unknown. The Bel Air house is now open to paranormal investigators and it can be rented from their official website. Kristen who's the current owner, still hosts the place and shares the creepy encounters she has inside the house. So if you're brave enough, try paying it a visit once. In a quiet and scenic town named Atchison in Kansas, sits a house whose characteristics are completely different from its locality. A phantom named Sally had reportedly made this house its home, and this has given the house its well-known name, the Sally House. It's claimed that even the bravest of hearts break emotionally inside the house because of the eerie atmosphere it offers. Built during the mid-1800s by the Finneys, it was used by Dr. Charles Finney as his clinic. He was a local physician and used the house to practice medicine. He used the bottom floor to perform surgery and examinations and used one of the bedrooms as his office. The family initially lived inside the building but eventually moved out because of the limited space inside the house. On a dreadful night, a panicking mother brought her six-year-old daughter named Sally to the house for treatment. The kid was going through extreme pain and suffering and the mother begged Charles Finney to treat her. After performing a thorough examination, 
he confirmed that she had appendicitis and decided to operate on her before her appendix burst. Because of the emergency, Charles Finney did not wait until the anesthesia's effect was felt and proceeded to surgically operate on the girl. This, however, proved to be the wrong choice as Sally died on the operation table. However, before her death, she went through extreme pain with reports saying her screams were heard throughout the street. After all, what else could a kid do who was being cut open in a half day's date do other than scream? The house was left abandoned after this incident and locals say that occult rituals were performed in the house's basement after its abandonment. The house was later bought by a young couple, Tony and Deborah Pickman, who moved into it in 1993 with their newborn. They eventually moved out of the house again after Tony was attacked by an unknown entity inside the house. This led to the house being featured on a television show named Sightings, which increased its popularity among the paranormal investigators community. The Sally House was listed on Zillow for $1 million in February 2016, and then its price greatly dropped to almost 500000 in August 2016. In November 2017, it ended up being taken off the real estate market. Some claim that the house is haunted by the spirits of Sally, while others claim that a demon that was called by the cultic rituals the house hosted haunts the house, and apparently hides under the identity of Sally's apparition. Also, after investigations, the Kansas Paranormal Group claim that the phantom of a middle-aged woman also haunts the house. The house's former resident Tony reports seeing his dog growl at the empty spaces, mainly near the upstairs nursery. He also reported that he eventually started feeling scratches on his chest and abdomen while he stayed in the house. He says that the operating area grew cold all of a sudden and objects moved all on their own. He says that the event where he was lifted and pushed off the stairs by something that can't be explained proved to be the last straw. One of Atchison Chamber of Commerce members, Andrea Clements, reports getting a headache and scratchy feeling in the back of her throat every time she enters the house. A paranormal investigator named Elijah had investigated the house multiple times and every time we've come, it's gotten progressively more intense. What we feel, it's more dangerous, is what he had to say. He firmly believes that the house is haunted just by Sally, but also by something more sinister as well. During his investigations, he reports seeing balls and toys move on their own in the upstairs rooms, and also reports hearing footsteps inside the house during the night. Visitors of the house say that their gadgets abruptly stop working inside the house, only to work again after they leave the place. They also say that batteries drain extremely fast inside the house. Some have seen objects move on their own, and some even say that things were aggressively thrown at them by something invisible. Many visitors reported seeing mysterious scratches and bruises on their bodies during and after the visit. It should be noted that most do report being hurt by the entities inside the house, and men. Visitors have also reported being touched and feeling cold spots on their bodies. Some have also experienced sporadic mysterious drops in the temperature. The house not just scares people, but also animals as trained guide dogs constantly refuse to enter the nursery and growl and bark at empty spaces. Many psychics who have tried to commune with the entities inside the house have also claimed the house to be haunted. And the house has also made many skeptics who enter it, leave it as believers of the paranormal. The house is now open for public visits and overnight stays, which can be booked on their official website, and continues to stay a hotspot for paranormal fanatics. Last Monday, I was at the clinic checking on my dad and I decided to stay the night with him to keep him company. We started to talk about all sorts of things, and then I mentioned to him that I had the creepiest sense of deja vu prior to coming to the clinic. One thing led to another, and we went on talking about the brain, false memories, and so on. 
Then my dad told me one of the weirdest things that he had ever experienced back in his 20s. He never told anyone about this before, so I was intrigued. He said he was still a college student at that time. It was the holidays for our country and he came back to his hometown. He had some old friends who invited him to their place for dinner. He stayed up with them until around midnight, then he left to go to his parents' house. My dad's hometown is small and people don't hang around the streets, especially late in the fall. He remembered walking and then hearing the sound of hooves clicking against the concrete sidewalk. He looked behind him and he saw a horse. The horse didn't have a saddle or a brittle on. Dad said it was a typical dark brown horse, the kind your mind would conjure up whenever you thought of the word horse. Dad thought that it must have run off from somewhere, but he didn't know of any farms around the town. The horse kept walking. It moved past my father, paying him no attention. Dad was confused, so we followed the horse. The horse took a turn and my father went after it, only to find nothing. The turn the horse took was a dead-end alley. Dad said there were no doors or passages or side buildings, just a plain dead end. The horse was nowhere to be seen. The sound of its hooves disappeared. Dad was so creeped out, he ran all the way home. To this day, he has no idea where that horse came from and to where it went. I want to say this before I start. I'm 28 years old, healthy of body and sound of mind. I don't do drugs, I don't drink, and I'm not under any form of medication. I haven't experienced anything paranormal in my life, except for that one dorm room in which I lived back when I was in college. Even then, I never saw anything, just felt something, which my roommates also experienced at that time. With that out of the way, I'm going to tell you exactly what I went through. A week ago, at about two in the afternoon, I was coming down the stairs, from the second floor to the first floor, in order to feed my dog and cat. I, with startling clarity, remember tripping on the way down, falling and breaking my neck. I have the recollection of that event in my brain, which is the weirdest part. Next thing I knew, it was almost as if someone pressed a rewind button and I was back halfway through the stairs. Only this time, I didn't trip. I walked down normally, and once I reached the first floor, I felt so weird. Like I was almost outside of my own body for a moment. I freaked out for a while, and I started to question my sanity. Eventually, I moved past what happened, fed my pets, and busied myself with paperwork. That day, my cat, who was usually very aloof, kept following me around the whole day, staring at me constantly. He even slept on the bed that night, and he doesn't usually do that. I have no way to explain what happened. Was it a hallucination? What kind of experience is this? Here's one of the earliest things that happened. I was in high school, 16 or 17 years old. I was at a friend's place, staying overnight. I went to a Catholic school and this happened to be a very Catholic family. We were eating dinner and there was a lull in the conversation. And I thought, oh crap, I have to talk about something. As I was pretty self-conscious at the time and apparently thought it was my responsibility to be chatty. Anywho, I racked my brain trying to think of something to say. Couldn't come up with anything and started looking around the room for something, anything that I could talk about. I saw a tapestry of Jesus on the wall, and I said, incredibly lamely, that's a nice tapestry of Jesus. My friend's parents turned, looked at it, nodded, said something enthralling like, yes, and thank you. Awkward silence fell again, and maybe two seconds later, the entire thing fell off the wall onto the floor. Everyone kind of jumped. We all looked at the blank spot on the wall, and the parents looked back at me. And the dad said, with a great deal of disbelief, the tapestry fell off the wall. That's never happened before. And I said, I'm sorry, because I didn't know what else to say. 
Some folks would likely think this was a coincidence, but around that time, in my teens and high school, things were falling down around all the time. I was once sitting in our tiny study on the floor watching TV. All of a sudden, the damn glass shade of the light in the ceiling fell down in my lap. It's the kind of light where you have to unscrew three screws to release it properly. A heavy chipboard poster fell on me while I was sitting on my bed once, out of nowhere. When I found out my grandpa died in my teens again, I was distraught and sobbing in my room about how I never got to say goodbye. Shortly afterwards, my mum and my brother started talking about how they heard footsteps coming up the wooden stairs and down the hall and stopping outside me and my parents' door. I never heard them. Apparently, mum entered, opened the door once, thinking it was me or my bro, and nobody was there. They heard this over and over. They heard bangs and things as well. And one night when we were eating dinner together downstairs, we heard this loud banging noise on the stairs. We all looked at each other and said our cat's name, but our cat was actually outside. We figured it was probably grandpa. Mom had the house exercised and the noises never came back. Personally, I think that was probably a little rude. I have heard knocking and tapping near my bed frequently with no apparent source, both when I was young up to when I was in my mid thirties. I've seen four ghosts in my life, but I've only heard one speak. The first ghosts I ever saw were two males in workman's gear from probably the mid 1800s. Not sure, but it certainly wasn't the 1990s. I was doing seasonal work at a ski resort in Montana at the time, and I was living in old dorm style housing, just down from the main resort. I was sleeping, and I woke up knowing that there were people looking at me. I saw these two men standing in the room, one older and a little taller, and the other both wearing pretty distinctive hats, and they were pointing at me. So I pointed to them, trying to reach them, and they slowly disappeared. They looked as if someone had taken a grey scale photo and just sort of overlaid it in the room. Lots of detail, but no colour. They didn't say anything, just pointed. I felt no fear at all. The next two ghosts I saw came at two very stressful points in my life, very close together. I was having trouble sleeping at one point, lots of tossing and turning, lots of worrying. Hubby had just left the room and I had turned on my back and looked up, and there was the head of an old woman in front and above me. I couldn't really make out her features. I saw her hair, sort of curly around her head, like my nana's used to be. I knew it wasn't my nana though. It felt like a person who was a little irritated. The head was there for maybe half a minute, and then she just faded away, like the guys I mentioned above. It didn't freak me out because I knew that I was only able to see that much of her. I didn't see it as only a head floating around, just only the part I could see. I told my hubby about it when he came back and he took the computer that was on the opposite side of the room off its screensaver and suggested I had actually seen the picture of Aragon that he had on his desktop. I just calmly explained that no, the head wasn't that low, it was up there and that her hair hadn't been anywhere near as cool. The last time I saw a ghost was when I was extremely distressed. We just found out that a family friend had been murdered. They knew who did it. The husband of the woman who'd been murdered was going to come and stay with us for a while and I was basically drowning in how horrible this all was. I was downstairs in the study and crying and I slowly realised that I could see the oddly negative shape of someone sitting in the computer chair diagonally across from me. I stopped crying very quickly because I realized that I could actually see the head of this person, their legs over the chair and their arms on the armrests, but there was no detail at all. This was in a brightly lit room. It looked like a featureless shape of a person sitting there, but in a weird negative way. Not dark at all. It's very hard to describe. Closest thing I can think of is like the invisibility camo from Predator with less choppiness. I stared at this person blinking and I said, what? Out loud. And slowly it faded. I was confused more than anything, 
but also strangely comforted. Lastly, the only ghost I've ever heard speak was at Fort Delaware in the Endicott. I had two visits to Fort Delaware as I worked in the parks at the time. The first was for a Halloween tour that I'll explain in a minute. The second was as an emergency stand-in interpreter during an actual ghost hunting tour, organised after the Ghost Hunters episode. It was an interesting tour. I had to learn about the history and use the rooms pretty quickly while we took the ferry over. We basically moved from room to room, as did about six other groups, staggered across the fort. At each stop, I would talk about the history, and then the Ghost Hunter crew member would start asking questions and watching the little light up do hickey for responses. Nothing really happened on most of the tour, but I'll never forget the sound I heard when I was passing through the Endicott, right near the spot where that footage was taken of the soldier, and where Ghost Hunters caught something on the flare. This was, by the way, before I saw the episode. A guy had gone in front of me, and the rest of the tour was way ahead. It was really dark in that spot, but we had flashlights. And I heard from my right something very whispery, very raspy, that spoke two syllables. I asked the guy when I was through that bit if he'd heard it, and he said no. I have no idea what it said. My name is two syllables long, but frankly, it could have been anything. Weird, weird sound. I found it utterly hilarious and a little irritating when I finally watched the Ghost Hunters episode based at Fort Delaware, because they mentioned a ghost account by a lady who saw a lamp off a table. They dismissed it immediately as she just knocked it off the table. No, I was on that tour. I was busy walking back and forth on the roof of the fort, swinging a lantern while dressed up as a Union soldier. This was during a Halloween tour before Ghost Hunters had been there. Halloween tours were totally for fun. We had mad scientists chopping up people in the Endicott, ghosts and zombies everywhere. It was great. I was on the boat heading back when the lady told her story. She was an utterly normal, friendly lady in her late 50s. Her sole job was to wait in the officer's rooms under a window that faced the courtyard and scream when the group passed. She had been waiting for the next group to arrive. There was a lamp on the table next to her. She was sitting there, not doing anything, not fidgeting, not kicking out with her legs, not moving. She said that out of the blue, the lamp was thrown off the table to the floor. It didn't fall. She didn't knock it off. She told everyone sitting with her on the boat because she was freaked out. Somehow, that made it to the Ghost Hunters team and was dismissed just like that. It annoyed me so much watching that episode. My dad died in 2016. I was able to spend a lot of time with him before we went, and my brother and I set him up in an amazing care facility in Australia, where we was for a couple of months before we went. This place had a small cafe with a barista, and I would frequently grow and grab us a coffee. Dad couldn't walk anymore, and I was having a harder time getting him into a wheelchair to get him out of the room and inside. He also wasn't eating as much or interested in much of anything. This is all pretty normal for someone who's dying. I knew he was, and I knew he'd go pretty soon, but nobody else seemed to think so for some reason. I asked Dad if he'd like a latte, and for the first time in a few days, he said yes. I was excited he was interested, so I headed over to the cafe, got us both a coffee, and headed right back. I walked into the room and said, Got your coffee, Dad? I noticed Dad was staring at the far corner of the room. He looked from the far the corner of the room to me when I walked in. Then after I spoke, he looked back to the corner, and back to me and said, What about Mom? My mum died in 2008. Now, since I've seen ghosts and had a bunch of weird experiences, I'm all aboard on this train, and without missing a beat, I look at the corner in him and I say, I can get a coffee for mum, no worries. And dad looked from me to the corner, back at me, the reality clearly dawning on him, then quickly shook his head. While my dad did have some confusion when he first came to this place, he settled down pretty quick. 
You didn't see anything else that he mentioned and was lucid right up to the end. I'd like to think that Mum came to see him off. One was a massive dump of all my experiences. The other was about a special visit my dying dad had before he died. This one just popped into my head today and I hadn't thought about it for a long time. I used to work in a state park and I loved it. While out on a hike with a school group, I found myself stopping at a section of the trail that I hadn't really paid much attention to before. But I stopped there as the kids followed the other lead because there was something about that place. Couldn't really put a finger on it. It wasn't all that spectacular review. The river had chewed away a great deal of the bank. I couldn't see any wildlife. But it felt important and special, and I realised that I loved that spot. I continued on with the kids and didn't think much of it. A little while later, my boyfriend, who I'd been with for a long while, asked if I'd like to go for a hike. I said, yeah, and he said, let's go to your favourite spot. So I took him to a spot that I really liked, closer to where I worked, that was much more scenic. We stood there and he asked if it was my favourite spot. And I thought about it and said, well, actually, there's another spot that I like. We hiked there and we stopped there and I said that I didn't really know why I felt this was such a special spot, but it was. I really liked how the place felt. And I turned around to find him getting down on one knee and holding out a ring. His proposal was lovely. The ring was perfect and of course I started blubbering like crazy and said yes. Honestly, I probably should have guessed he was going to do this because he got dressed up too. But it's like I knew something very special was going to happen in that place. And it's a little funny too, that the only reason it happened in that place is because I felt something special was going to happen there. I've had little knowings like this my whole life, but this one will always stand out. This happened eight years ago at my grandparents' ancestral house. Apart from the usual mischief of the Duende, our house rarely displays apparitions from the other world. We have a superstitious belief that we should never leave a house without any person or people for a long period of time. If you do, someone or something might live there. Our house was built in the late 70s. The ground floor was used as our living quarters while the upper floor just gathered dust because I have only my mom and my brother residing there in a single room for the time being. One night, I was talking with my significant other through the phone on the second floor of the house. I went there because of privacy while also maintaining the silence on the ground floor. The time, if I recall, was past midnight. We've always been liking talking from this evening till the wee hours in the morning. As I'm trying to make a laugh, I saw a tentacle-like white greyish long thing fitting through the jealousy window. I'm describing it as a tentacle because of the motion it made. It's slithering of what I thought of at the time, its whole body forcing its way to come in. At first my brain was still not afraid, because it might be a snake, because we have lots of trees inside our property. Notice I said tentacles, because I can't for the life of me relate that thing to a human hand. I just saw it as a long white thing. Know how a grandma uses her hands to do Tai Chi? That's the way it's moving. Next thing I know, there's another long thing which I now realised is the other hand to get inside. What fucked my brain out was the wizard's head was trying to get inside also. I'm afraid, that's why I can't look at its face. My breath is now shallow, I can't think of anything. I'm stuttering and my significant other noticed it too and asked why. I told her what I saw and said, keep talking to me. I shut my eyes, but once I opened, it was still there. Now it's waving its hands and shaking its head vigorously so it knows that I can see it. I muster up my courage and nudge myself a little so I won't be able to see him. I think I moved 12 inches on the right just so I can remove him from my vision. You know what I did? It also moved to its right just so I can also see it. 
This thing knows that I'm afraid. In the beginning, the motion of its hand is like a Tai Chi grandma. Now, it's dabbing to its right, so I can see both its hands. Once that happened, I steeled myself and almost jumped the stairs to go to my brother and mother. After a few moments, I asked him to go with me, but we didn't find anything. Seems nothing out of the ordinary happened. What bothers me up to this day is I can't remember if I looked at its face or just the peripheral vision, because every time I try to remember its face, I just see a blank face. No eyes, no mouth, no facial hair, just blank. Up to this day, I don't know what kind of ghost it is, but typing this up until 3am gives me the chills. A few months ago, my uncle invited me to go to a well-known paranormal hotspot with him in his group. I've always been open-minded about the paranormal as I've had other experiences with what I believe to be spirits or ghosts. The place in question is an old, out-of-use prison, used to hold political prisoners and murderers, etc. Me and my uncle are out first, and so we thought he should show me around. We walked down every wing, long dark hallways leading up from the main foyer, all with prison cells on each side, of course. The least frightening experience was when I saw a dark figure standing there, and I looked at my uncle, and looked back, it was gone. This is when I realised my belief in the paranormal had been well placed. He then showed me to a room, or cell. The reason I call it a room is because it was the most luxurious smell. It had comfortable pillows, a big soft mattress, and a bookcase to top it all off. The very bookcase, which when slid over, leads to the room the prisoner would be hanged in. The noose came from the ceiling, and a large glass floor came down and led to the coffin room. Before my uncle showed me what was behind the bookcase, I saw a huge white flash come from the cracks behind the bookshelf. I get chills as I'm writing this. After my uncle opened the bookcase, I saw a large black figure peek over his shoulder. This terrified me. It seemed normal to him. Under the prison, there's a long dark tunnel, which leads to the old courthouse across the road. As an initiation, they made me walk to the end of the tunnel with all the lights off, knock the rusty metal door at the end, and ask for Sir when I came within five feet of that door. I felt a horrible feeling, like something was waiting for me. I strongly hesitated, but I knocked on the door and asked for Sir. As I walked briskly back to the group, I heard them all exclaim. They said something walked back with me, a dark figure. I didn't believe them until someone else did. And I promise you, a large black figure came slowly from the wall and walked behind him. I thought because it was so dark, it was just another person walking with them until I remembered he walked down alone. So this has been going on for many years, but I just ignored it since it happened like three times. But now it's way more common and it's freaking me out. So I'll start with my first experience, the closet. I was 12 years old, I think, and me and my sister shared the room. It was summer and we were about to go to the beach. Since summer guy, I took my stuff off and entered the closet. At that time, my sister left the house. I changed and was about to leave the closet, but the closet door just shut so hard that I saw the movement of the door closing and I couldn't leave. I tried everything, but when I saw, I just can't open it. I called my sister and said if she doesn't open the door, I'll beat her. Boom, door opened on its own. I was about to beat her, but the room was empty. And then I saw my sister out the window. She said she was out and was getting her bikini. We just laughed it off. The second experience was also in our room but with my sister and two cousins. We bought so many sweets and treats and were having fun the whole evening. But then we heard a weird noise somewhere in the room, like a sharpening knife. My little cousin got really scared, so we all tried to cheer him up. Now we went to sleep. All night, I heard someone walking across the room. 
I was too scared to check. In the morning, we sat down on the floor and my older cousin said she barely got any sleep because of someone walking in the room and I froze. Since she was on the floor, she could have at least seen who the person was walking because I was sleeping with my face to the wall. Younger and sister didn't hear anything but got scared anyway. After this, I had problems sleeping. The third thing that was weird was two mirrors breaking all of a sudden on their own in the middle of the night. It's been years since that happened and the next thing's happened in the last three months. A glass of Coca-Cola just crossed the whole length of a table in front of my mom, sister and me. We thought maybe the table glass moved, but then why didn't anything else move? My mom saw someone closing the bathroom door thinking it was me, but I was in my room. She was like, Luca, hurry, I can't hold it anymore. And then I left the room and said, what is it? Mom entered the bathroom and it was empty. Now, my room is divided by the wall, creating two rooms. One for my sister and one for me. And when we went to talk, we used our phones. I had to study that night, but my sister wanted to play some tycoon on Roblox. And since all I have to do is to be and save money, I accepted. We were talking and talking, and we heard someone washing the dishes in the kitchen. And we were like, what the fuck, it's 2 a.m. When we checked, the kitchen was empty. My dad heard loud running footsteps in the hallway in the middle of the night. We don't know if he heard any of us. My mom's sister and I went to KFC for lunch, and we made sure everything was turned off. TV, lights, laptops, etc. And we closed the windows and locked the house. When we came back home, the TV was on. My mom was angry, but I know I turned it off. And the last one is the scariest thing that happened last week. Me and my sister were home. She was in her room, alone, and I was making the food. I had some problems, so I really focused on what I was doing. Come on, said my sister. Or so I thought, and I answered, what now? I didn't get an answer. Then something poked me on the shoulder and I said, leave me alone, I'm doing something. Then again, something poked me on the shoulder and I was like, Lorena, leave me alone. Again, something poked me and I turned around and screamed, Lorena, but no one was there. And then I checked her and she was in her bed. When I was young, probably around eight years old, I was playing hide and seek with my friends. This was what I believe was the first paranormal experience I had that I remember. So I went to the basement and hid. My friend came down and I'll always remember since he went pale white and ran away as he looked at me. I chased after him and was like, why did you run away? He replied, he saw a shadow of a person behind me where I was hiding with red eyes. I thought to myself, what the fuck, and you left me there? And this is why it stood out. Fast forward to me being 17 or 18. It was a Sunday, just finished my roast dinner. Friends called me and asked, shall we go to Plucky Woods, the most haunted woods in the UK? I'm sure. So we drove down there, got to the woods and were messing around. And then as it got dark and the sun set, the woods literally went pitch black. These were the times where I didn't have a torch app on the phone and had to take photos in order to get some sort of light. Shouted to my friends to meet them back at the car. As I was taking photos to avoid falling over, etc., I noticed in the camera there's a green mist of some sort. Thinking it was a reflection of the tree's moss, I didn't take notice of it. As we all got in the car, I was like, lads, looking at these photos and started swiping from the beginning. Sure enough, that mist was swirling around on the outside and coming in the middle of the screen as the photos kept moving to the next one. Then it turned into a face similar to the mummy movie with his face in the sand. As we all saw that, we screamed, mainly because the inside car lights just started flickering randomly on and off. We drove away from there sharpish. I get the chills thinking about it now. Deleted everything, unfortunately, because I didn't want anything like that latching onto me, or so I thought. Fast forward four more years later in Germany. 
I moved to a different room in the camp. Everything seemed fine, except in the middle of the night, I started getting sleep paralysis. Waking up with a shadow of a person standing over me, pinning me down. The only way for me to wake up from that was to scream. Honestly, even screaming at that stage took a lot of effort. My roommates are like, what the fuck? I'm trying to rationalize things during the day. This kept happening for another few days. At one point I was like, fuck, it shows me what's the worst that you can do. I felt my leg being grabbed and dragged. Never dared it again. We went back to the UK for a few weeks holiday and even my mom was like, you screamed last night. I didn't even remember it, but I had a vivid dream of being choked and lifted in our hallway. So when I returned, I moved rooms. And even in that room at midnight, as I fell asleep, I woke up again with the noise of some of the guys outside the block. I see a shadow in the corner of the room and fuck me. It jumped on top of me and grabbed my upper arms, which I screamed. And even the guy next door asked me, what the fuck? What was that about? in the morning. I showed him the bruises and I was glad we moved to a different block then. We've had occasions where people hear showers being turned on and off when no one's there. So I went to Canada, forgetting about these terrible events and as I got asked to stay for three weeks over Christmas to cover the cells, I was sure it would be an easy three weeks and then three weeks holiday after that. That Sunday, the last person to get moved out of the cell so I was free starting Monday and just on call. So on the first Monday night, I woke up to my duvet getting pulled off slowly. So the next day, I was like, fuck it, I'll leave the light on. I was the only person in that block. Imagine an old asylum. Those were similar to what we stayed in, converted to accommodation. Tuesday night, I wake up again, and this time with the light on, I see a shadow over me. Yeah. I kept my eyes closed. So Wednesday onwards, I had to resort to drastic measures and literally kept myself awake till I passed out and watched funny movies, etc. But I could hear it. Knockings on the middle of my wardrobe. No, it wasn't the radiator or plumbing because trust me, I know the sound difference between them. I remembered my friend stayed last Christmas time to do guard duty. So I asked him if he experienced anything weird. His reply, was it a friendly ghost? Let it in and accept it. He told me the exact same shit that happened to me as his personal experience. Having seen enough horror movies, it's a 100% a no-no to let anything in. Three long, grueling weeks of staying up until I passed out, finally over. Promised myself to never ever volunteer for that again. After a few days in my old room with sleep paralysis, I met one of the guys who now had that as his bed space. So after the party was at my old room and I was like, hmm, this is my old room. Experience anything weird here? His reply was, yeah. I've woken up from sleep paralysis and had a shadow of a person standing at the end of my bed a few times. His answer sort of gave me closure that I definitely wasn't crazy and imagining it to myself. I grew up in the countryside in Ireland. The house was originally a small cottage. My parents bought it before I was born and they renovated it and added an extension on. There were five other houses on our country road, the closest being a large field away. I didn't know much about the history of our house, the land it was built on or the history of the area, other than an elderly lady lived in the cottage before my parents bought it and she passed away in a nursing home the only info I have about the area, it was it was old and it was a civil parish. Whenever we get together as a family, we always end up talking about the house and what we experienced. We moved out six years ago. I don't know who or what it was, but there was definitely more than one ghost or spirit. It seemed like a lot. I don't know if it has anything to do with the graveyard, what they found, the house or the land itself. I really don't feel like it was the woman that lived there before us either. My mom, dad, two brothers, myself, obviously, and friends that stayed over all experienced something or got a weird vibe. Funnily enough, almost everything that happened happened in the new and built part of the house 
rather than the old part, and stuff happened outside too. I would often feel like there was someone in my room, and I don't know why, but I felt like it was a man. I would never chill in my room alone, and I'd dread nighttime coming to go to sleep. I just felt like someone was there. I heard what sounded like someone walking around, not footsteps, but just like the movements of someone. I often felt like I was being watched, inside and outside. Fair enough, that could have just been my imagination, or me freaking myself out as a kid. On multiple occasions, I heard what sounded like children talking and playing, but no one would be there. On one occasion, I heard what sounded like a choir singing in the direction of the graveyard and church. And on a separate occasion, I heard what sounded like drums being played. It was like this weird repetitive rhythm, hard to describe. Another time, I was outside playing near the side of the house. I was kneeling down, and it was as if someone threw a small stone or pebble, not at me, but in my direction from behind. So I heard the stone land, as if someone threw it, and it happened three times within like 20 seconds. I turned around, but of course, no one was there. On another occasion, I went to bed really early, when it was still bright out. I remember this so vividly, I can even remember the duvet cover that was on. So I was laying down, wide awake, and it felt as if someone poked me pretty hard. It was like a strong index finger poking my lower back. I kind of froze, felt freaked out, didn't turn around and just convince myself it was one of my teddy paws and didn't think about it again until years later. From the living room window, my brother saw a man in a hat, smoking a cigarette, standing outside, leaning against the wall near the front door. He got up like, who the hell was that? Went out, no one was there or anywhere near and he didn't hear him run away. Which brings me to my next point. On a couple of occasions, my mom heard someone knock on the back door, but when she went to answer it, no one was there. Again, she didn't hear them walk or run away. Another time, she saw the silhouette of someone, again smoking, through the window of the back door, as if they were standing outside the door. As usual, no one was there. On a couple of occasions, she felt as though someone was sitting in the back of the car with her when she left our house to go to the shop in the late evenings. The feeling was so strong that she'd keep looking in the mirror and even stop the car and look under the seats to make sure no one was there. My dad, who's a skeptic, saw a black shadow down the end of the hall go from one side to the other. My other brother felt like someone touched his foot in bed and on a couple of occasions, heard what sounded like someone walking down the hallway and stopping outside his door, as if they were going to come in, but hesitating. He would call out to see who it was, but no one answered, so it wasn't any of us. He would also see the hallway lights being turned on and off, and when he was outside around the back garden, he would get this sudden urge or feeling that he should go inside, and he would run our dog, started and barking at nothing a couple of times. And a friend of mine that stayed over hated when she had to wake up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because she felt like someone was watching her from the end of the hallway. I saw an unidentified flying object in my backyard last month and I can't find any explanation for what it could be. I was inside our house finishing up some work but I could see my boyfriend and our dog in the backyard, through the back door window. Suddenly, I hear our dog barking. As I glance up to observe what it was unnerving her, I realise that it's something flying alongside the back of our 10 foot fence. Quickly, I open the back door and walk onto our patio. The creature was completely silent and looked like a straight yellow line that was hovering 5 or 6 feet in the air and moving in a precise, straight formation. And let me tell you, this thing was fast. My dog is a greyhound mix and extremely agile, and even she couldn't keep up with it. It was a little less than a foot long and a centimetre or two thick. I couldn't tell if it was glowing 
where it was just a combination of the glow from our backyard lights and its golden tone that gave off this illusion. Because it was flying, and clearly much faster than my dog, it wasn't acting like it was trying to evade danger. I had the feeling that it was fairly intelligent. It was almost playing with my dog, like it was playing a game of tag. It flew back and forth four or five times in a straight line at about 20 or 30 miles an hour, I'd say. My dog attempted to catch it, running as it moved to the opposite side of the fence. But once she started to catch up, it would start flying in the opposite direction without ever getting to turn around. It flew in a smooth, unwavering manner, like when you point a laser at the wall and move it back and forth to get your cat's attention. Obviously, I wanted to get this on video or at least a picture, but I wanted to get a closer look because my mind needed an explanation. As I moved closer, it quickly flew over our fence and I never saw it again. But I could hear the rustling of leaves around the side of our house. After I knew it was gone, I looked at my boyfriend and his face said it all. I asked him what he saw to confirm that my mind wasn't simply playing tricks. His experience was the same as mine. We both have been looking for this thing every night since we saw it, but to no avail. We still have no idea what this unexplained creature could be. Has anyone else had an experience like mine? Or any explanation for what it could be? I've just heard of the Hatman and did some Googling, only to find that this Hatman is some evil entity that many people seem to encounter, mostly during sleep paralysis. The part that gives me chills is when I read the description of what he looks like and see images replicating those descriptions. He looks exactly like the shadow man I saw everywhere when I was a kid. I saw him from the ages of 7 to 14 when I lived in a two-story house. Except I never saw him in my dreams like a lot of others seem to. I saw him in the hallways. Anytime I didn't look down a hallway, I would see him in my peripheral vision. For example, if I was walking to my room, I would see him slightly standing at the end of the walkway, opposite my room. It only ever happened if I didn't look down the hallways before walking past them. Just like what I read, this shadow man was just a black silhouette. No features except for a detective type hat and a trench coat. Never once did it approach me. I would see it in my peripheral, and the second I'd fully look towards him, the figure would be gone. It also said that he feeds on people's worst fears, and if my shadow man was the hat man, he was very much feeding off my fear of a bad guy being in my house, and waiting for the perfect moment to catch me, as I was a really paranoid kid growing up. What are your thoughts? I still don't know too much about the hat man, but it seems pretty straightforward. About two years ago, I was watching a movie at my sister's room and saw some white figure at the window in my peripheral vision. When I looked to the window, there was a faceless nun. Actually, I couldn't see a face, but I knew she was staring at me, dressed in an all-white habit with a red cross on her gwim. It wasn't a crucifix she wore, it was a red cross printed like her gwim. I was in shock, I mean, how could someone get inside? To get to my sister's window, she'd need to pass through my house gate and walk 25 meters without being noticed. And well, how could she? When I looked down to pause the movie, she simply turned left, walked away and disappeared. But that shouldn't be possible since there's another locked gate and then a dead end. I barely slept that night. My eyes were watery and I was still in shock and telling myself it was just a hallucination. Later that year, I was drawing something when I realized I had drawn a freaking faceless nun wearing many crucifixes with a weird crown and with her arms open looking like she was floating. About three months ago I was drawing a female figure with a charcoal and again I ended up drawing a nun exactly like the last one and I decided to put on my closet door because why the hell not? My mom saw and hated it then I told her about the nun I saw years before, and she told me that maybe I see apparitions. Maybe I'm sensitive, because my grandma is. My mom said I just should throw the drawing away, but I didn't, 
and left it in there. A few days later, I had a dream I was in a big old house and there were four nuns looking just like my drawing and they were side by side. Arms crossed, staring at me at the top of the stairs, swinging, oscillating back and forth. I woke up very scared and later told mom about that. She said I should burn the drawing and so I did. But every now and then, I cannot stop thinking about that nun. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for conversation. First, this bulletin from the WOR newsroom. Six members of one family have been found shot to death in their nightclothes in their expensive home in Amityville, Long Island. The only available information at this moment, according to the Amityville Village Police, is that the men victims have been identified as members of the DeFeo family. They were found by their 23-year-old son, Ronald DeFeo, who is believed to be the only surviving member of the family. Six members of one family were found shot to death in their home in Amityville, Long Island. We'll have further details on the 11 o'clock news. This was the first radio broadcast to announce the murders in the Amityville Horror House at 112 Ocean Avenue. The entire DeFeo family was shot by one of their own, Ronald. This terrible event would spark the start of a current day legend. A legend which around 15 Amityville films were made. Ronald, to begin with, claimed that a hitman murdered them, whom he named. But this tale was proved wrong, for the reason that the intended hitman was not in New York at the time of the murders. The very next day, Ronald confessed to having killed his family all by himself. He stated, it all happened so fast. Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. What he called it started around 3 in the morning at 112 Ocean Street. Ronald took his 35 caliber rifle and psychotically shot his brothers, sisters, mother and father. One bullet for his siblings and two for his parents. Later, Ronald bathed and redressed, threw his gun into the swimming pool and then went to work normally. It wasn't until later that day, around 6.30pm, that Ronald opened up about the death of his family. While Ronald's story about the bloody event has been inconsistent, the most famous claim is that he had killed his family due to demonic voices in his head. At some point in his trial, Ronald's advocate set up a defense of insanity, which was supported by means of a court psychiatrist. Regardless, the judgment determined Ronald was both responsible and had control over his actions, and sentenced him to six consecutive life sentences. In the following years, Ronald claimed that he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol when he executed the murders. In another model of the story, his sister Dawn was the murderer. His story was changed so often that the handiest reality which we will now be certain of is that Ronald DeFeo was a liar. Certainly, perhaps the most demonic issue of the Amityville murders is the creativeness of the killer himself. However, in spite of Ronald's terrible lies, there are things which make this case peculiar. All the victims had been located lying on their stomachs, without signs of struggle. Toxicology reports have proved that no sedatives were used, and police determined no proof of Ronald having used a silencer on his very loud rifle. How then did the DeFeos continue to be asleep in their beds, as Ronald killed them one after the other? Dr. Howard Edelman, the examiner on the case, said that he was mystified as to how a single gunman could have committed the crime. In reaction, there have been several competing theories, but none, in reality, satisfies the question of how Ronald went on a flurry of kills when the others were asleep. Even if the house did not already host an evil entity, being the scene of such a grotesque crime, it would have hosted one after these events. A bit over a year later, 112 Ocean Avenue, the scene of these dreadful murders, became home to a new family. The residence, with all its furniture intact, was sold to George and Kathy Lutz and their three kids. Although they had knowledge about the gruesome things that had taken place there, the Lutzes were positive 
describing the residence as their dream home. They even set up a sign that named the house High Hopes, but they could only inhabit the house for 28 days. They would forcefully emerge from its partitions, running out in their nightwear, leaving behind all of their possessions and never returning. Whilst you listen to any of the Lutz's testimonies, there's a feeling that they're telling the truth. On the very first day of moving into the house, the Lutzes commenced feeling as though something wasn't right. A family friend, a neighbourhood Catholic priest, Father Ralph Pecoraro, visited the house to perform a blessing. George told what occurred in one of his final interviews before his death in 2006. Whilst blessing, the priest was disturbed by a weird feeling he got in one of the upstairs bedrooms. Pecoraro told George, who informed him that it had been the stitching room. The priest, who supposedly appeared relieved, then stated, That's good, as long as no one sleeps in there. Paranormal activities unfolded very soon. Within a week, Kathy's hand had been touched by something that we discussed and couldn't explain. It was just something unseen, are George's own words. We also had, um, hordes of flies that would appear within two rooms. And no matter how many times we would kill them, they would reappear. Lisa added in the interview, it wasn't in the water. The floor itself turned black, and at first it was the one bathroom, and then another, and then another. And then the telephone repairman came three times, because each time we tried to communicate with the priest, we would run into faulty connections, George added. Time and again, noises jolted the family from their sleep during the night. George was the one who was disturbed the most. He described how the front door would violently open and close, and when he investigated, he would see it locked with the dog asleep in front of it. Paranormal investigator Ed Warren drew interest in how most of the paranormal events occurred at three o'clock in the morning, the same time Ronald DeFeo murdered his own family. Kathy Lutz mentioned that she got into a state of deep, contented lethargy in the house. She would by no means want to leave. Even the simplest of chores became too much for her. Others have said how the house appeared to age Kathy, both mentally and physically. On the night that they fled the house, George claims to have witnessed his wife become an aged woman before his very eyes. The visage took several hours to wear off. Although it's too easy to push aside the Lutz's tale as a made-up one, the consistency with which they maintain their story makes it arguably believable. A documentary filmed in 2012, after the deaths of both Kathy and George, has introduced additional proof of intrigue to the Amityville case. For the first time since 1976, one of the Lutz youngsters, Daniel Lutz, came forward to discuss his childhood experience. Daniel has corroborated his mum's and stepfather's stories while adding some of his own. One of the most disturbing events, which has haunted him since the day it befell, was when he saw the door of the boathouse open and shut repeatedly with extreme violence. The family dog, Harry, with his pen being inside the boat residence, was visibly disturbed. In an attempt to get away, he jumped over the fence of his pen and apparently seemed to hang himself. After rescuing the dog, it took Daniel and George an amazing effort to close the door. It was then Daniel remembers one of the weirdest elements of his stories in Amityville. In the course of the interview, his own disbelief at what he saw, even a few years later, is quite obvious to look at. When the reporter asked, what did you see? What was in the window? Daniel replied, it would have been what looked like a cartoon character of a, mm, an angry pig with like wolf-like teeth. When he and George went upstairs to investigate, they found a rocking chair moving all by itself. Daniel claimed that he was possessed by a powerful entity in the house. Even after leaving the Amityville house, Daniel was sent to a Catholic monastic school by his parents. There, the priests performed exorcism rituals for a year to rid him of the demon which had possessed him in that house. I had just gotten in a fight with George about, I don't even remember anymore. So by the time I got to the second landing, I was projected up the stairs into the wall, and my mother was like 15 feet behind me. I know that the spirit of some other thing passed right through me. 
My mother was standing right there, and she broke down and cried. That was the most horrible thing she'd ever seen. And I stand up, and... and... my body starts like... I no longer have control of myself. She jumped around in shock, like something just scraped her or touched her. Then it entered into me. Through me. And if I have to describe what it felt like, it would be like the numbness after being shot. From somewhere in the room, it said, it is you. It was like a sub-bass, like a gargle and a crackle to it. And that stuck with me for at least a decade on a daily basis. A words from Daniel in the interview. On the last night the Lutzes spent at Amityville, an unseen force lifted Katie and the two boys up with their beds. Daniel says he still remembers the sense of terror he felt as the headboard of his and his brother's beds smashed at each other in the ceiling. They were trapped on the beds as it levitated. This became the tipping point and they couldn't tolerate it anymore. After 28 days of living with a constant feeling of terror, the Lutzes called Father Pecoraro who suggested that they go away from the house and spend the night at another place. In March of 1976, psychics, paranormal researchers and a news crew were all allowed access to 112 Ocean Avenue. Amongst the investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warren. During the initial investigation, Lorraine got repulsed when she entered one of the rooms, which was later observed to have been the bedroom of Ronald DeFeo. Lorraine believed that even as numerous spirits roamed the house, there was one unique entity which was more powerful and malevolent than the others. When we went into the house that day, we didn't realise that it was diabolically infested. This case had everything. It had the monstrosities of the night which roamed that house, which infested it, which caused a young man to murder his whole family. The Amityville case affected our personal lives more than any case we've ever worked on. This is what the Warrens had to say about the house in an interview. Warren's photographer captured the notorious photo of a spectral kid in a doorway. A few have speculated that that is the youngest member of the family to be murdered in 1974, John Matthew DeFeo. Daniel Lutz states that each one of the hauntings was brought about by George Lutz. In spite of denials during his lifetime, Daniel asserts that George was a person who enjoyed occult rituals. I think somewhere along the line that George's beliefs and practices and things that he was directly involved with triggered and was a catalyst to what was going on in the house. It was kind of like a magic trick gone bad that you couldn't shut off, said Daniel. He also states that George used to be an abusive stepfather, a reason that led him to leave the house at the age of 15. It's interesting that Daniel might corroborate the tale of a man who repulsed him and abused him as a child. His statements might give insights into why George preserved all of the possessions of folks that had died in the residence before. Should it be that, as a dabbler inside the occult, George knew something of the alleged power of death and blood? Possibly George Lutz has attempted to interact with this energy. In this process of interacting with the souls of the DeFeos, did George disturb something darker? As a result, did he unleash demonic forces? which he couldn't control upon himself and his own family. Unfortunately, all we're able to do is raise questions. Some time ago, me and my family went to a city close to ours to visit family. Everything was fine. We had lots of fun and I saw my cousins that I hadn't seen in a while. We decided to go camping, but returned to aunt's home some hours after, a little traumatised. But more than traumatised, I was intrigued. I wanted to see and explained what happened in the woods. So I begged my mom to let me stay another day. She said that she and my dad had work the next day. My aunt then interfered and said that I can stay and that she can take care of me. My parents trusted her. Bad idea. My aunt was a remarried woman. And the guy she married wasn't much to my family's liking. He has lots of money, but he's very arrogant and selfish. Once, we did a party to celebrate my great-granny's 99th birthday at my aunt's house. He got mad and kicked out all of us. We didn't even get to sing happy birthday. But luckily, he was on a business trip and we were alone. I always feel something off of him. 
everything was good. My cousins and tried to return to the woods to continue investigating. But for some reason, we got the feeling that we weren't going to make it. So we decided to return and go to the cinema. When we got out, it was almost 10 p.m. I called my parents to let them know that I was still there and wasn't on my way. They said it's okay, but if I was returning home, better do it the next day, because it was really late. Me, as a very stubborn child, decided to still return that night and didn't obey. But first I needed to say goodbye to my aunt and go for some things I left there. At the time we arrived at the house, I only heard shouting from inside the house. One of my cousins covered my ears, but it was in vain. The husband, we call him Choby, was home. When he saw me there, he freaked out. He started yelling at me that I shouldn't be there. I wasn't family, etc. I explained to my aunt that I was taking my leave. She said the same thing my parents said, and I was about to agree until Choby interfered and said that I wasn't allowed to stay in this house for the night and that I should return home. I obeyed him because I fear Choby. There's something weird in him that really creeped me out. When me and my cousin were about to go out, Choby again interfered and said that I'm old enough to be by myself and ride a car. He didn't let any all my cousins or my aunt come with me and they fear him a lot. Yeah, maybe Choby gives you everything you need and maintains you. But for that, you need to obey him. If you don't, bear the consequences. So I packed my things and put them in the car. It was a short ride of about two hours. If I went now, I could arrive at 12am and surprise my parents because they still worried for me. So my aunt walked me to the car and apologised for the third time. I started to ride and everything was fine. I was slow because I'm still learning, but shortly before I had been on the road for an hour, it started to rain very hard. The truth is that I felt happy because my city was in a drought, so the rain was something miraculous. So I slowed a little bit more just to be cautious, but for some reason I got lost. I didn't know where I was anymore, I called my aunt, but nothing. My cousins, I even called Choby. I was really stressed because I was alone at night and lost. I calmed down and started to drive again. I found a motel in the middle of the road. It wasn't weird because, well, it was a well-used road some time of the year, but it should be open, so I went there. The place looked very run down, but it had a sign saying there were vacant rooms. I didn't hesitate and went inside, but for some reason, I felt really weird. I didn't care at that time. It was late. I was wet, and I wanted to sleep. I get inside, and there was a receptionist, a woman in her 50s. She looked at me weird, and after a talk, she told me she can't do anything. I can't have a room because I'm underage. But at that time, a guy, like in his 20s, came. He said it was the owner. Of course, it was a weird situation. He said that I can have a room and gave me a key with a really creepy smile. I take it and smile awkwardly. The receptionist was there with a really worried face. I was on my way to my room when I heard someone crying. I see in the distance a woman, but I felt that she wasn't normal. I ignored her. It's not that I go there and talk with ghosts, so I went to my room. But I couldn't sleep. Something was bothering me. Then... I started to hear whispers. That's normal to be honest. But I could still hear a voice saying, get out of here. That's when I decided to listen and went out. Went to the car and stayed there for a moment. Then I saw it. The owner trying to get inside my room with a key. When he entered and saw I wasn't there, he rushed outside and started to scream, heading to my car. I rapidly hide in the lower part. He peeked inside the fear was killing me and little by little, the tears began to roll out. I had to get out there as fast as possible. He didn't see me. Lucky me, I guess. I called my grandpa, a police chief. He said he'd do anything possible to save me, but I needed to get away from there. As soon as the owner left, I saw the golden opportunity to go and ride as fast as I could. But there was a problem. I left the keys in the room. I started to cry more when I heard tapping on the window. It was the receptionist. I thought I was going to die there. I thought it was the end. 
But then she showed me the keys and left them there. She helped me. She saved me. The owner started to return, screaming. I peeked, and he was really mad. He then cursed and saw the ghost woman in the pool. The man rushed there. I don't know if he was thinking it was me, but my opportunity to get the keys and run away was there or never. I did it. I turned on the car, and as soon as I did it, I see the man turning and start to run toward the car. I rushed and get out of there. Five minutes in the road, a car was behind me at speed. It was my end, but I don't know, God. My grandpa and dad arrived with the police car, so they knew where I was. I saw the car passing beside me and returning where it came. I stopped the car and started crying out loud. That was the most terrific day ever. I arrived home and told them everything, just like in the clown thing my grandpa immediately investigated. After some weeks the guy was arrested and turns out he was a fugitive. He raped women and came to kill two. I suspect that one of them was the crying woman. When I asked him about the receptionist, he told me that in there they just found the guy alive. He asked me then how did the woman look and I gave a description. His face turned pale immediately. He showed me a picture, asking if that was the woman. I said yes, it was her, but looked more healthy in the pic and more happy. Turns out, she was the last victim. He killed her. She was dead. This story isn't personally mine. I came after the fact. I'm a custodial supervisor for about 30 employees at a college. I have this one employee who's a skeptic. She doesn't believe in ghosts or anything supernatural. She's made that very clear on a few occasions. I had her cover the library for a week when someone was on vacation. So it wasn't a building she spent a lot of time in before, but she still knew it enough that she was fine on her own. One morning around 4.30am, she calls me and asks, what time do the staff start to show up here? I go on to tell her they start to show up between 7 and 8am. I could tell that she was flustered by her reply. No, you're wrong, they're here now. Someone's in the bathroom. They're in there making noise, walking around and flushing the toilets. I hear them. I'm like, yeah, no one should be in there. Go in and see. No, I'm not going there. Get over here and tell them to get out, was her response. So I'm like, okay, I'll be there in two minutes. I'll stop by. I get there and she's standing in front of the bathroom, yelling at me to go in there and tell this person to get out of the bathroom. They shouldn't be down there. I walk in the bathroom, check every stall, come out of the bathroom and look her in the eye and tell her, nope, no one is in there. She then accused me of lying, said there's no way. She'd been standing in front of the door the whole time, didn't see anyone leave and heard the same noises till right before I got there. I told her to relax. It wasn't a big deal. There was no one in there at all. This was more than likely just a normal library ghost. Of course, at first, this didn't get me anywhere. She still didn't believe me that no one was in there. I then went on explaining to her why I say it was the ghost. Years ago, in about the 70s, they had been doing work on the elevator, and unfortunately, a little girl who was at the library with her father fell down it and died at the bottom. or well, the basement, in other words. I even showed her the plaque that was for the little girl. This bathroom that she heard everything in was in the basement, right across from the elevator, no more than 10 feet from where the little girl died. This happened a couple of years ago, and just last month, the same employee was going on about ghosts being not real. Then I reminded her about her time at the library. She then admitted that every time she's in that building cleaning in the morning, she makes a point to tell them not to bug her and leave her alone. Well, they have to help her work. But she still sticks to the same, they don't exist. In March of this year, my family had to put my dog down. He was old, sick, and could barely do anything. He was confused, and it was definitely his time. I'm turning 19, and I've had him since I was five. 
I grew up with him. He was always there throughout the entirety of my adolescence, and there was never a time where he wasn't around. He was always the closest to my mom, and he wanted nothing to do with me until I was older. Mainly because as a kid I would play with him like a toy, put him in Barbie cars and dress him up. The night after he died, he visited me in my dreams. In the dream, I was in my grandparents' old basement and I saw him. He was young, happy, and was leading me towards the opposite end of the room. I followed him, and my mom was sitting by the wall. There was an invisible barrier dividing us from her, and he was trying to get through but couldn't. I was crying, happy to see him, and I was asking mom, can you see him? He's here. He's right here. And she said no, she couldn't. I took it as a message that he wanted to get to my mom first, but couldn't. So when I woke up, I felt weak. It hurt to sit up. It was as if a weight was trying to hold me down. All of my energy had been drained. This occasionally happens to me when I have very vivid dreams. It took over a month for him to visit my mom, but when he did, she dreamt of him the entire night. After that, I only had regular dreams about him, nothing too symbolic, just him appearing here and there. Last night, however, he visited me again. In the dream, I was on the phone, standing by the closet. I was about to say something, then I passed out and fell to the ground. I woke up in the dream and saw my dog. He came up to me and I reached out to pet him. It felt so real. I could feel his fur and everything was so realistic. He looked so happy to see me and I just sat there going, Are you real? Is this you? Is this a dream? And he just jumped on me like he used to and licking my hand. Throughout the rest of the dream, I would try to tell my parents about it, but each time I tried to, I'd pass out again. I think this was his way of keeping it a personal matter between us. My parents divorced when I was seven years old, and my mother was left with five children to raise alone. We lived on the brink of homelessness for a few years, my mum applied for housing assistance, and we were accepted into public housing. We were all so happy. The house was huge. Four bedrooms, two full baths, a large living room and dining room, and a large kitchen. The house was originally a duplex. I recently found out that these homes were over 100 years old. We were all happy to have our own rooms. My room was different. The hall in front of my room was always dark and cold. My room was freezing, and every time I put a light bulb in my closet or room, it would immediately flicker out. One day I was babysitting my siblings. They were on the side of the house, writing with pavement chalk. So I went to my room to read my latest Nancy Drew book. As I sat there, I heard someone call my name. It was faint, like someone was yelling my name from a distance. I checked the windows, no one was there. I thought it was the boys next door playing a trick on me, so I continued to read my book. I again heard someone call my name, this time more forceful. I got up and checked the windows. No one was there. I went outside to check on my siblings, and they were still writing with the chalk and having a good time. I went back to my room and continued to read. Several minutes passed, and then I heard the most terrifying voice. A demonic, vile voice screamed my name, and the voice sounded like it was right close to my face. The voice was so angry that I imagined that whatever it was had to be shaking. The voice was shaky and angry and calling my name. I threw the book down, and me and one of my younger sisters moved everything I owned out of the room the next morning. I want to add that underneath my room was a locked cellar that we were never able to access. That side of the house where my room was located was always dark and cool, even on the hottest days. I was so glad when we finally moved out of that house. I drove by the house from time to time, and it still gives me the creeps. My youngest brother was five years old when we lived there, and told me when we were adults that he saw a midget with a lion cloth on a climb from under the heater on the floor. Look at him, and laugh and then disappear. This bothers me to this day, because this thing called my name. I was a troubled and sad teen, and sometimes I think that the evil spirit was trying to entice me to converse with it. 
I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and maybe a year before this happened, my pastor came to me and said, Tony, if a spirit talks to you, don't answer. I don't know why he said that to me, but I remembered what he said when the entity yelled my name. I purchased a house last year, and it has a little wooden church glued to the wall, and for now, it will stay. I want to start off by saying that I only talk about this because it's part of my healing process and helps me to deal with the trauma of losing my infant son. In 2007, I was nine months pregnant with my last child. I've had preeclampsia with previous pregnancies and a placenta abruption with a pregnancy seven years prior, so I was being monitored closely. Not as closely as I should have been, but that's another story for another time. The evening of December 12th, I became ill. I felt dreadful and looked at my abdomen and thought it looked rigid and strange. Instantly, I knew I was dying. I can't explain it, but simultaneously, I heard a whisper in my left ear. A soft, gentle whisper that said, the baby has died. I instantly thought I was losing my mind and yelled at my son to call 911. We were in the middle of a winter storm, so our phones were dead. I finally got a neighbour to call my husband, who took me to the maternity ward of a large hospital. One of the most experienced nurses happened to be on duty, thank goodness, because I coded when I got to the floor. I'd had a third degree abruption, fourth degree of death. I spent two weeks in the hospital and had to go on dialysis for a while. My ammonia levels were high, so for a while I thought I had given birth. I did get to hold him. He was beautiful with dark curls. When I got to the med surge floor, I was coherent and trying to come to grips about why this had happened to me. One night, I had awoken to voices. I thought it was my family in my room. My eyes were closed, but I was awake, and I heard what sounded like 20 people talking about me. I was laying there trying to understand what they were saying about me, but all the people were talking so fast and in a hushed tone. I opened my eyes to find no one there, not one soul. What scared me was as my eyes opened, one person said, shh, the second person said, shh. Then there was a collective, shh. I was terrified in a dark room with the door shut, and I had a hard time moving around because of my emergency C-section incision. I started calling for my husband. He didn't answer. He often would sleep on the floor outside my bed on a pull-out sofa chair. Suddenly, a small, olive-toned girl of age six or seven appeared beside my bed. She had two curly ponytails and was dressed in 1970s-type clothing. I couldn't see her eyes, just dark shadows. She pointed to the other side of my bed and said, He's over there. My husband had been on the left side of my hospital bed and was asleep. I turned back to face her, and she was gone. Having that experience in the hospital helped change my insight about death. I know I'll see my infant son again one day. I also think the people and voices I heard may have been the people that had passed at that hospital, as well as the little girl. I felt no threat at all, but was scared because it was so unexpected. When I was a kid, I grew up in a house that had a ton of ghost activity in Puerto Rico, where I'm from. Honestly, in my opinion, demonic even. For background, me, my parents and my two siblings all had experiences. When my parents first moved in, their bed would shake at night and it didn't stop until I had the house blessed by a priest. My brother once was crying uncontrollably on his top bunk bed and refused to look up because he said there was a demon on the ceiling laughing at him. My sister's room was the worst though. She would wake up crying from nightmares almost every night. I found out a couple of years ago from my mom that apparently an old man died in the house before we moved in. But he must have been evil or something because interestingly enough, the next house we moved to, two people committed suicide in and we never experienced any activity at all. Anyways, Here's my two worst stories I had in that house. 
first one was at my sister's room. I was maybe 11 or 12 at this point. For some reason, I had to sleep in her room that night. I think we had a family member over, so they slept in my bed, which was bigger. I was terrified and didn't want to sleep in there because of my sister waking up crying every night with nightmares. I remember I was so scared something was going to happen, looking around the room for a while until finally I started to calm down when nothing was happening. There was a huge tall box in the middle of the room from a fridge we just bought, and I just looked over at it and noticed there was a pitch black shadow leaning next to the box peering over at me. And as soon as I saw it, it hit behind the box. As soon as this happened, my vision got blurry and distorted, and I couldn't scream for maybe five minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Then it went away, and I ran out of the room to tell my parents. I read somewhere that a pitch black shadow of a person was demonic, so this definitely scared me even more. Second one is my least favourite memory, and even talking about it gives me chills and makes me uncomfortable. At this point I was maybe 13. I was in the living room laying on the couch, and I remember my parents were fighting about something in their bedroom, but it was getting pretty bad. It ended up moving into the living room where I was at. They were screaming at each other pretty bad. Then all of a sudden, my mum gets silent and closes her eyes and won't respond to my dad. All of a sudden she starts saying she's Satan, that he's taken over her and won't let go, and telling my dad he's his instrument and a sinner, that he should kill himself. She just kept saying all these horrible things to my dad. He got his Bible and was reading passages to her, and she just kept laughing and saying that wasn't going to do anything. All the while, I'm laying there on the couch scared to death, and my siblings are peering from the hallway too scared to come in. The absolute worst part about it though, was that she would go from saying horrible things to my dad, and she would turn and look at me smiling with these horrible eyes asking me, Are you okay? Do you need anything? Are you hungry? Why do you look so scared? I won't hurt you. I love you. Then go back to my dad and say horrible things to him. Eventually my dad called someone from the church to read more Bible passages to her, and she locked herself in a room, and then she came out normal a few hours later. It's never left me. As soon as I saw her eyes, I knew that wasn't my mom. I'm 25 now, and I still wonder why that thing in my mom was being so nice to me when it was saying it was a demon. We moved a few years later and never had any more experiences. It was definitely that house. We moved into our first home in February of 2016, but it was an old home built in the early 1900s in the historic part of town. I loved it. All of the hand carved woodwork and glass doorknobs with skeleton locks. It was exactly what I wanted and perfect for myself and my husband. I was three months pregnant with our first and we were so excited to start our family. As we got settled in, we noticed the house was very noisy. I rarely have my home quiet due to having tinnitus and always needing some kind of background noise to drown it out. On the rare occasion the house was quiet, there was always lots of clicking and moving, mostly coming from the loft style attic we had. We shook it off to the house settling and being old. At least, that's what my dad told us. So we moved on. Spring came and we were scrambling to get ready for the baby. The house needed a lot of work, but we were determined to get it done. The first major encounter was on a beautiful spring day. It was the weekend, and my husband and I were spending our day off working on the house. I was cleaning the kitchen, and he was working on my car in our detached garage. The way this home was built, you could see the detached garage from the window that's above the kitchen sink. I would glance out every now and then to see what he was up to. A little time passed and I hadn't looked out at him. I started doing the dishes when I heard him walking in the living room towards the kitchen. I could feel his presence and without turning back I said, hey babe, no answer. Wondering why he didn't answer, I looked back over my shoulder only to be met with a dark silhouette of a man standing between the living room and kitchen. 
In the blink of an eye, the figure was gone. Unsure of what I had just seen, I yelled through the window for my husband, who was still in the garage. He came in, and frantically I told him someone was in the house. Immediately, he went and grabbed his weapon and checked all over the house. Nothing was there. In all of the years we lived in that house, not once did my husband see our roommate. I saw him all the time, out the corner of my eye, peeking around corners, but more than anything, I saw him looking into the living room from the staircase that led to the attic. In the beginning, he frightened me, but after a while, I got used to him being there. I even spoke to him sometimes, telling him I'm okay if he stays in the attic and asking him to leave my baby alone. He seemed to have agreed, since in the five years my son lived there, he never saw him. While we went to sell our home, the realtor brought us some historical information she found regarding the house and our neighbourhood. We found out that our house and our neighbour's house was built by a brother and sister. Our home was my brother's. Their last name was the same as our current neighbour, so I figured he was most likely a descendant. I asked him one day, and he told me that the sister was his mom, and his uncle owned our home. He said it was a kind man who lived alone, and died in the home many years ago. I asked him about the attic, and he said that was his uncle's favourite place in the home. He kept all of his trinkets and projects up there, and would spend hours working on things. I didn't tell him I believed my house was haunted, as he didn't seem like the type who would believe me. Our home was listed and sold within the same day. Sometimes I wonder about the man in the attic. If the new owners are nice to him, or have even noticed his presence. I hope they'll give him a space, as there are only passers by in his home, like we once were. Ever since I was an infant, my mother had noticed that I had an aptitude for the paranormal, and I was her third child, so I know it wasn't something she was expecting. My brother and sister had never terrified my mother as much as I had. When I was not even two years old, and had only just begun to talk properly, she would take note of me going into rooms where nobody else was around, and walk in on me talking to empty space. Not fun talk like one would have with an imaginary friend, but full-blown complex conversations, like I was curious and questioning rather than playing imaginary. I was heard saying things that I, as a two-year-old, would never have heard from anyone else. Then one night, not long after, I had a dream and woke up sobbing, when my mom asked me if I'd had a nightmare. She said that I had told her that my friends are dead in the lake, like it was a revelation. As if through a dream, I had finally realised that the friends I had been talking to were dead. After that, there were many other experiences, even as I got older. When I was 11 or so, I was curious about out-of-body experiences. And I read that if you lie down and imagine water rising around your body, you can force yourself to have one. I tried many times and only succeeded once. I felt myself float, looked down at myself got freaked out and fell to the floor beside my bed and woke up in shock. I've told my mom that I saw people around our house once I had grasped the concept of spirits, and I told her about their distinctive appearances. The man with the hat, the girl, and I distinctly remember seeing a cat in the old house I lived in on multiple occasions. Now that I'm much older, I still feel sensitive, but I've stopped seeing visions. I still remember many of my experiences though, so I'm curious if anyone else has had such experiences from when they were kids. I firmly believe that the younger you are, the more prone you are to the paranormal. Back when I was in college, I had to take a few night classes to finish my program. I was going to school for drafting, and one of the classes was only offered at 5 p.m. This was a bit of a pain for me, as I still lived with my parents, and the college was located an hour away. So getting off at 3 p.m., then driving home, and heading back was pointless. That's why I typically stayed and just killed time at the school unit until it was time. Sometimes my dad, who worked down the street from the school, would wait around, and my mom would meet us for dinner. 
but other times it was just me killing time. Yeah, it was a pain, but you do what you have to do. One day, near the end of the semester, both of my parents decided to meet up with me, just as we had before. It was getting close to Christmas, and this town happened to be where our closest mall was located. So they decided to use the chance to get in some Christmas shopping. And after we finished eating, they did just that. I went to school, they went shopping, and that was that. Or at least, that's what I thought. With Inventor, despite it lasting a few hours, you could leave whenever you wanted. We were allowed to work ahead, and he didn't care when you left as long as your assignment was done. Being someone who picked up on the program and 3D modeling quickly, I was in the group of kids who were constantly 10 or so models ahead, so it didn't matter when I usually left. This being the end of semester, however, I was out of work to do. I reached the end, so I ended up leaving class extra early, so I called my parents to let them know. They were still at the mall, so I drove over there to meet up with them. I did some shopping myself, and then we packed up the two cars to leave. Since they had gifts for me, my dad decided to drive one car, while my mom went with me in mine. Dad left first, so I didn't see what they had inside, and I took out after him. Back then, I still hated driving at night, so I followed him closely on the way back. My dad is a crazy safe driver, so it took longer following him, but it was okay. Felt safer with him in the lead. Getting close to home, we arrived at the T outside of the town I'll call RL. My dad was at the stop sign ready to turn left, but a car was coming. So my dad being an extra safe driver, he proceeded to peel out and cut the guy off. Now RL isn't the safest town around, and when the guy slammed on his brakes and stopped in the road, I was scared. This is where people would get shot, and the guy stopping terrified me. I sat at the stop sign myself and had no idea what to do. Do I go? Do I wait? What's this crazy guy going to do? I sat there for a few minutes freaked out before my mom finally said, just go. So I did. And the whole time I kept my eyes on the grey car as I slowly pulled out and passed them. They're gone. My mom's screaming shocked me and I remember saying, what are you talking about? As I too realised, the car I was passing was not there. In fact, another car then passed through where the first car was sitting. The car was gone. Where I was looking was empty. Later when I got home, we asked my dad about it and he was confused. According to him, there never was a car. He wondered why we stopped and said we were the only ones on the road. Minus the guy he passed down the road always five or so minutes later. So what did we see? Every time I passed that road, I looked to see if maybe something could have reflected light and made it look like a car. But there's nothing there. Just a cornfield. My story is extremely complex, so I'll try to hit the bullet points as quickly as possible. Growing up in this house, it's a smaller 1960s rambler in Western Washington on a half acre that backs up to about four miles of green belt and it always felt off. The backyard and looking into the woods I'd hear things and just have that full panic whenever and I'd have to go out. Experienced full giant orbs that would float through the kitchen on certain nights. It would make people fight. My parents got divorced and my dad lives here alone for about seven years and it becomes rageful out of his mind. In his bedroom, I'd hear breathing, snoring, all of that in his bed, behind me when I'd sit where the computer was. Fast forward to 24, I had just recently gotten sober, gotten my life together and moved back to take over the house for him while he bought a new house with his girlfriend. My mother passes from a drunk driver incident and immediately things happen again. I find Catholic pendants everywhere and when I hold on to them, they disappear within a week or so. Two weeks later, we had a tree service come a few giant cedars down, and a guy fell from 25 feet climbing and died right at my front steps. Then, everything became a whirlwind. 
That feeling when a person walks in and you can feel their energy right behind you. It was like that times 10. One morning, I walk out of my bathroom. My office is open to the window right where he passed. And I see a giant man in white walk past. Mind you, this is 7am. A totally clear sunny morning. The one that really got me the best. I was out in the driveway working on my car, middle of the night. And someone said, hey, directly behind my head. I'm under my hood, so I jump out, hit my head and scream in the same motion. So that was about five years ago with the deaths. Now it's toned down, but they're very subtle and smart about it. Glances of people from your peripheral, slight walking and tapping noises. I have a home studio on the same side where the guy passed. And I woke up last week to my speakers on. My interface cranked with the mic on, so it's full feedback out of nowhere. Somehow, I've never caught any pictures or really damning visual evidence, but I'm working on it. I'm with a spirit box. I was born and raised, and still live, in Savannah, Georgia. I've always believed in ghosts. As a kid, my aunt lived in a very haunted house. And she and my mum had lived in haunted places before then. My aunt's house was historic, gorgeous. And my mum and siblings and I all hated it. Point is, that I grew up with a close family telling me stories about their old houses. In 2011, I took a job at a haunted row house on Mary Marshall Row. You may have heard of the haunted Marshall House Hotel... I go in the basement one night, well, this is the same Mary Marshall. It's diagonally across from Colonial Cemetery, which was a mass grave for yellow fever victims, as well as broken tombstones just leaning against the gates. From the first day, I was horribly depressed. I have depression, but I felt crippled. I also had the urge to jump off the back balcony repeatedly, as crazy as that sounds. Our office manager told me she felt so bad there, she said protection prayers on her way to work daily. Plus, she had the cabinet doors in the supply area scare her badly numerous times. She would close all the doors, walk out of the room, and return to find them open. The house had four levels, basement, main, second, and third. My tiny office was on the second, right by the stairs. Up until this time... Aside from gut feelings, I'd never seen anything but once. I was returning from my lunch break, entering the main floor from the back door. Got in and reached into the mini fridge on the floor to get a drink. I needed to go to the bathroom, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone I thought was a man go into the bathroom and close the door. I figured I'd wait and talk to our office manager. And after five minutes, she asked if I was waiting for something. I said I needed to run in the bathroom. She said, well, nobody's there. I was smoking a cigarette on the back balcony on my floor and through the glass door, I saw the back of a man walking down the hall into my office. I saw pants, shirt and dark hair. While it looked taller than my boss, I rushed back in thinking he was looking for me. Walking down the hall, My tiny office was in the middle at the far end of the hall, against the front of the house. Looked expecting to see my boss and saw no one. I turned and went into his office to see if he was looking for me. He had his feet on his desk and said he hadn't moved in 30 minutes because he was eating his lunch. Our runner was picking up everyone's mail and was in front of my office, about to step onto the stairs to go up to three. She was walking to a co-worker, also standing in the hall. All of a sudden she screamed, and all three of us watched a black shadow float down the stairs towards us, against the wall, and disappear. I hated that job. Hated it. I was there for eight months. This all happened in that span. And all in the middle of the day. I began working for a company whose corporate headquarters is located in three separate buildings on the city's first square. When Savannah was built, it was built in a number of squares. This one saw public markets, slave auctions, and public hangings in colonial days. 
When I began making friends, I'd heard that the main building was haunted by a little girl named Gracie. I assumed that they just referred to her as Gracie because everyone from Savannah knows the legend of Gracie. My friend, who gave me express permission to share, told me that the ghost was indeed Gracie, though I never believed it. She was one of the company's first employees, and she had entered the basement level office many times before anyone else was in mind, the music blaring. She would turn it down and later it would rise again. She got used to it and would tell the spirit, okay, we can't play anymore. It's work time. Gracie Watson is a young girl buried in the famous Bonaventure Cemetery. She was born in 1883. Gracie's father took a job managing the prestigious Pulaski Hotel and he, his wife and Gracie, their only child, lived in the hotel. Gracie was known as the life of the hotel, loved by guests and staff. In 1889, she came down with pneumonia and passed away. Gracie's grieving mother soon began claiming that her spirit was still in the hotel. She could still hear her daughter giggling and bouncing a ball on the back stairs. Her husband was convinced that it was grief and took a job at another hotel, then eventually leaving Savannah altogether for his wife's mental health. I'd known Gracie all my life. As kids, we would go to Bonaventure to see her grave, where people still leave toys. Legend has it that if you rub the statue's hand at night, her eyes would open. Everyone had a different version of our little urban legend. I worked in the basement for two years until my department was moved. After my move, another friend, who also gave me his permission to share, had an experience. He's in his early 50s and a church-going Catholic who's extremely well-rounded and in a senior position. One day, standing at the desk of another employee, he saw out of his peripheral vision a little girl in a white dress walk out of the basement conference room and walk into a wall and disappear. The person he was standing by said, you just turned white, are you okay? He was in shock. When he told me what happened, I asked if he'd ever had any experiences before, and he said never. He wasn't scared when he saw it. It was just shocking. On a couple occasions, I've seen a spirit. That was my reaction as well. Not scared like I'd expect. Just happened matter-of-factly in the middle of a work day. I was fascinated and began researching the building location. Turns out, that particular building had indeed been the old Pulaski Hotel, on top of that, the bottom of the back stairs of the old hotel would have been in that basement conference room. This story happened in 2007 and gets told every time my family gets together. My nana owns a farm and she's always had a herd of cows and a guard donkey. In one of her cattle fields, there used to be a large circle of mushrooms that my nana said was a fairy circle. Now, my nana is Irish, and Irish people don't mess with fairies, and she refused to even mow over the circle. When she married my step-granddad, he didn't believe in fairies or the paranormal, and he wanted to remove the circle from the field, but my nana told him not to. He thought that she was being silly, and they would argue about it all of the time. Long story short, he went behind her back and had the fairy circle removed while she was away. When she found out what he did, she refused to talk him for days and was very angry and upset. Two weeks after the circle was removed, all of her pregnant cows aborted their calves. My nana was devastated since she's very experienced and careful with looking after her cows and she had never lost all of her calves before. She has lost one or two, but never all of them. There was also a strange, scary experience that involved me that my nana believed was also connected. My mum and one-year-old me stayed with my nana for a few days to cheer her up since she was still upset about the cars. Somehow, I ended up catching chicken pox, which is supposed to be rare in babies under one. Luckily, I wasn't too sick, but it still scared everyone. I know that my nana still leaves small offerings in the cattle field, like small cakes and barley water, even though my step-granddad still thinks it's silly. I've stayed at her farm a lot, and the field definitely has a different feel to it than I've never felt anywhere else, especially at night, and I would never stay outside after dark. 
I know it was probably just two random coincidences, but it's become a legend in my family. Since I was a child, I've had these weird dreams where I saw myself in a situation of everyday life. And after a short while, some kind of disaster would happen that would kill me in my dream. And just before I can feel it, I can't wake up. Now here's the part that weirds me out. Some variable time later, I get to see the same time frame. The last scene that went through my eyes just before said incident happened and ended my life. But the difference is that this time, such thing doesn't happen. I could compare the experience to watching a picture. My memory remembers that dream I had when I got to see that last frame before the disaster. I don't want this post to sound like I got superpowers or some kind of made up thing. I've always supposed this had an explanation. And when I asked my students if they had similar experiences, some of them told me they've been through that as well. As an extra, I'd be definitely grateful if you have experienced something like this and share your experience. Or if you could explain to me why this happens and if there are any case studies or documents relating to it. The year is 2007. I'm nine years old and my brother is seven. Our parents are out working. Our grandmother is out buying groceries, so we're left alone at our three-story home. Bored and quite energetic, we decided to play hide-and-seek. The family house is too big and too old, so we have plenty of space to play around and have fun with. After a few rounds of playing, the turn to seek is mine, and my brother has to hide. Counting up to ten against the wall, I shout out, ready or not, here I come, and begin my search. Despite both of us being somewhat good at choosing difficult and creative places to hide in, my brother went for the most obvious spot I could imagine. On the first floor, behind a curtain and against a wide window, where light reflected his body. His silhouettes giving him away at first sight, and his tennis shoes showing at the base of the curtain. Victorious, I tell him, come on, that's a real easy spot. It's your turn to seek. He doesn't move and he doesn't answer. So I go upstairs and wait for him to come. Sitting on a sofa against the wall with a clear vision of the stairs. After a good 20 minutes or so, I see my brother come down from the third floor. Confused, he asked me, why didn't you come seek me? I stayed silent for a moment and asked him, did you put your runners at the base of the curtain? He answers firmly, no. He tells me he heard me talking from the third floor and assumed grandma arrived and I was talking to her which wasn't the case. I tell him I thought he was behind the curtain on the first floor, and I asked him to come with me to the curtain to investigate. Slowly, we descend the stairs one by one, always keeping our backs to the wall and our eyes on the bottom of the stairs. When the curtain is within our vision, there's no figure there anymore, yet the shoes are there, still at the base. Closing in, I reach out with my hand to the curtain, but there's just air. I keep pulling the enormous curtain trying to feel something, but an earwig falls from it and lands on my shoulder. Scared, I slapped it away and stepped back. Both of us go upstairs quickly and I tell my brother what I saw. He reaffirms me that he didn't put the shoes there and that we should stay put on the sofa until grandma arrived, so we did. Up to this day, I don't know what I saw back then. Since three and a half years ago, we moved out of the home because of financial problems and we never experienced something similar ever again. I always took my brother's word as the truth. Since the last round before he hid, I was the one to hide and I don't remember seeing the shoes on the first floor when I did. There's no way he could go from his room in the back of the second floor to the first floor and then to the third floor in just 10 seconds without me hearing him run. Perhaps my memories are blurry. Perhaps my brother lied and somehow pulled it off. Or maybe someone or something really manifested then and there. Maybe it just wanted to play with us. Maybe their motives were more sinister. When I was about five or six years old, I used to sleep in a small room with my mom. 
We shared the same bed and room. The room didn't have a door. The room was also about eight by eight feet. It was small. There was only a small bed and a wardrobe. It was also my grandma's house. One night, I woke up during the night and noticed a lady standing or floating, watching me by the door. Her face was blurry and her body was a long white dress, kind of like a wedding dress or a gown dress. When I noticed her, I wasn't scared or felt anything scary. I was just staring at it. I also tried to wake up my mom saying, Mom, there's a lady at the door. She would just ignore me and didn't want to look at it. A few more seconds of me staring at it, I went back to bed. The next morning, I told my family about it during breakfast but everyone ignored me and told me it was part of my imagination or a dream. As I grew older, my older cousins would tell me the paranormal stuff had always happened in that house. That during nighttime in the kitchen, utensils would start making noises and plates would be moved around as well as cups, as if someone was cooking. Then one time, one family member told me that my grandma's mom used to live in that house and used to sleep in the room I slept with when I was young. She also passed away in her sleep in that room. So after years of wondering what I saw, I finally had closure. My dead great grandma visited me because she never met me and just wanted to say hi. I also feel like she looks out over me. About three years ago, I moved into a house that was built in the 1800s. It was an old Victorian house. Nothing out of the ordinary ever happened there. Just your old squeak sounds at night because of the wind and rain. One day, I met a girl and we started dating. One time she slept over and we started Netflixing and chilling. As we're doing it, I started squeezing her neck with my hand. I'm into choking while doing it, but she didn't like it at all. It nearly turned off the mood. After a few weeks, we stopped seeing each other for various reasons. We weren't compatible, and so we broke all communication off with each other. The night we broke up, I went home and went to sleep. This is when something indescribable happened. Around 3 or 4 a.m., I woke up in my dream and I felt something choking me so hard, I couldn't breathe. I was gasping for air. As I was being choked, I saw two bright energy bulbs by the side of my bed and I said, Help me! As soon as I said that, I woke up feeling a bit frightened. That same morning, I wondered what had happened. Then I came to the conclusion that it was the girl's dad who did that to me. You see, the girl told me about her dad and how he died when she was a teenager. She's an only child, so I believe he always looks over her. I strongly believe that after I made her daughter sad, he choked me as I tried to choke her daughter just a few weeks before. He was taking revenge in a way. The two bright energy bulbs were looking out over me, so when I asked for help, the choking stopped, and I woke up for real. I've not made contact with her daughter again, because I'm scared he might choke me again. I literally took it as a warning. I also think she deserves to know that her dad is always with her. My cousin got stabbed during a fight two days after Thanksgiving in 2018. It was horrible and the whole family was devastated. I cried because I was close to him and he was too young to be gone, just 19. A few weeks passed and I had a dream where my dead cousin spoke to me and told me to buy his car. I told him I couldn't afford it. I woke up and didn't think much of the dream, just that I still missed him. Maybe three months later, my dead cousin appeared again in my dream. This time it was more emotional. It was a house party at my mom's house. Big house. Everyone was coming over. The family. That's when Aunt Rosario comes with everybody. Cliff's kids too. I say hello and hug Michelle. One of the kids said, I remember you. That's when my dead cousin appeared and he said, I don't remember me. And then disappeared but I was the only one who saw him. Then I started crying. The whole family wondered why I was crying, but I couldn't explain to them what just happened. More months go by, and I have another dream with my dead cousin, another cousin and me. We were playing tag, 
and then we dressed up to go out and have fun in the city. I don't remember much, and it wasn't that emotional. Just a fun dream. The last dream I had with him felt like closure, because ever since then I haven't had a dream with my dead cousin. The dream is about a house party with lots of people. I was drinking and having fun, and then I went to a room to do something. After I finished doing what I did wrong, I went to the pool area. I stopped walking and noticed my dead cousin in the hot tub. He turned around, smiled at me, and took a sip of his drink. Then I woke up. I believe my cousin has finally found peace. He's now on the other side and is no longer scared or afraid. He knows he's gone, and that was his way of telling me not to worry. I still miss him. I lived in my apartment in Brooklyn for a little over a year now, without much going on. Just recently though, my fiancé and I have had a few strange things start to happen. I think taken separately, most of the events could have some explanation, but it's all of them together in a short time span that makes me wonder if something else is going on. In no particular order, here's what we've experienced. Drinking glass on my fiancé's side of the bed broke by itself in the middle of the night top half of the glass just broke clean off. We both woke up to the sound of it. I thought someone had thrown something at our window, but when we checked, we saw the glass was broken. Nothing had knocked into it. No major temperature variations that we know of. Maybe explainable by some weakness in the glass. About a week later, a glass candle broke in a similar fashion. We had burned the candle before, but it wasn't lit at that time, and similarly, the top half of the glass just broke off on its own. Could also be weakness in the glass, but weird it happened so soon after the other glass broke. I saw a shadow move across our bedroom in the middle of the night. Didn't have a discernible shape, but it moved in front of one window, then against the wall, then in front of the other window. No way to be a shadow from the other side of the room, but possibly I wasn't fully awake. Fiancé has also seen a shadow figure moving across the hallway in the apartment. Fiancé's DSLR camera, which was hanging up on a hook on the wall, turned on by itself and started taking pictures. I wasn't home, but my fiancé was and showed me the pictures after. Nothing special, just the floor, but we can't explain that one. I heard the very clear sound of a door creaking when I was in the bathroom but there was definitely nothing opening or closing in the apartment. When laying in bed for a few seconds, I heard what sounded like a staticky old radio. It was brief, but very strange. Sounded like it was right above me. While I can hear our neighbours sometimes, this definitely sounded like it was in the bedroom and did not sound like a neighbour. None of them are too crazy, and I think each separately could have some explanation. But the fact that all of these happened just in the past month or so is interesting to me. And nothing had happened prior to that. This was a weird one. Friday night, I had some family over in my backyard for a social distance dinner. My parents bought their five-month-old puppy and I had a larger two-year-old dog. I was playing with the dogs and brought two balls over to where the smaller puppy was hanging out and set them down. An orange slash blue ball and a purple ball. I'm squatting down there in the grass. Both balls are on the ground about two feet in front of me. The small pup is next to the balls and my dad is sitting in a chair next to or above the small dog. I threw my dog one of the balls, the orange and blue, and she ran to get it. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw the purple ball get thrown towards the back of the yard. I assumed my dad threw it because he was sitting right there. But he didn't seem to acknowledge that he threw it or ask the pup to go fetch it. So after hesitating a moment, I asked my dad if he had thrown the other ball. He said, what ball? I said the purple ball that was right there. And again, he had no idea what I was talking about. At this point, I'm a little weirded out. And I go to the back of the yard about 40 feet back, and sure enough, the ball was back there on the ground. I again, very confused, explained to my dad what happened, but he didn't see it get thrown and didn't know what happened. No chance the puppy could move the ball that far, 
She's tiny. Nobody else was nearby or even paying attention. We've experienced some of the strange things in the apartment and even in the backyard, but this definitely was one of the strangest. A couple weeks ago, I stood at the old Harbour Inn in Savannah, Georgia. I didn't know it was haunted before booking, but after I learned of Savannah's general hauntings, I did see our hotel listed as one of the haunted hotels in the city. I stayed for two nights with my girlfriend and our dog. First night was uneventful. Second, at around 3am, the carbon monoxide detector started chirping. The out of battery type chirp. I found the source of the chirping and took the detector off the wall to remove the battery for the night, but I found that it was hardwired into the wall. So it wasn't low on battery, nor had the power gone out because the alarm clock next to the bed still had the correct time. Eventually pressed the hush button so we could sleep, and put the alarm back which then switched back and forth between green and red lights. Tried to go back to bed, but our dog was thoroughly freaked out. She was trying to squeeze behind the dresser and just get as far into a corner as possible. Ultimately, she ended up coming into the bed and sleeping with us. Now this might not sound so crazy, except for the fact that our dog never sleeps in bed with us. My girlfriend has tried to get our dog into bed with us pretty much every night since we got her, because she's just not that type of dog. She was maybe more scared than I've ever seen her. We all finally get to bed, and in the morning I check the alarm and it's back to fully green, fully functioning. No idea if that was the resident ghost or what happened, but it definitely was an odd experience. And given the hotel's history, I have to consider the fact that we had a visitor that night. When I was around 8 or 9, my whole family went to a quinceanera, and I guess we were good friends with the birthday girl. We received a quince doll that's basically meant to look like the birthday girl. To give you an image of what it looked like, imagine a doll with a white dress and curly hair. We kept it in the living room where I slept on the floor, and my brothers and I always had some weird feeling about it, like it was always watching us. I'd say around three to four months of it being in the living room is when I started to notice weird things happen, in not only the living room, but also in both of my brothers' room. I'll start with my experiences first. Like I mentioned before, I used to sleep in the living room. I would lay down near my parents' door and start to hear the strangest noises coming from near the TV or near the small cabinet we put the doll on display. From things in the kitchen to falling on the floor to hearing a girl laughing on the couch. And I'd pretty much try to ignore all this with tears in my eyes, doing what kids do when they're scared and cover myself with my blanket. But one experience will forever haunt me, and I still get chills thinking about it. I was crying one night for God knows what. My brother tells me it's because I was claiming I heard voices near my ear, and my parents didn't believe me, and told me I was delusional. He invited me into his room to sleep, and I jumped at the opportunity. Just before entering the room, I went to the restroom right next to it. While I was peeing, I felt someone's hand right on my shoulder. I immediately turned around and got freaked out and decided to flush the toilet, wash my hands and get the hell out. But that wasn't the worst that happened. I entered his room and slept on his bed while he just played on his PS3. I slept for maybe around 20ish minutes before waking up to him coming into the room with food. I shit you not, the moment he sat down, the closet door swings open with enough force to hit the wall. We look at each other in disbelief about what we just saw. My dad bursts in and tells us what the hell was going on. We tried explaining to him what happened and he just shook it off and told us to go to sleep. We walked out the room and my brother continued to play, trying our best not to talk about it when we heard the toilet just flush on its own, along with the shower curtain moving. Mind you, no one was in there. We would have known since the door always creaks open and shuts with a pretty distinct sound. That room, I'd like to say, is where the most activity always happened. The guy we let rent out that room always said he was scared of it because he needed a place to stay. He just dealt with it. That was my experience when I was younger onwards, 
to my older brothers. So I want to start with the youngest of my older brothers. Let's call him Dave. Dave slept in the room on the other side of the house, completely away from the doll, but with a massive window that had a hole within the curtains. He had things happen in the afternoon, like tools being thrown from one side of the room to the other, the TV falling, and unexplainable scratches on his chest. But the one thing that scared the shit out of me was the dreaming he had about the girl in the white dress. This happened to both of my brothers. The dream started off with what he described as a normal dream, until he noticed the white-dressed girl at his school and went near her. She turned around and as he remembers, she didn't have eyes, it was just black holes. She had a sad expression on her face. He woke up to my parents trying to calm him down. I remember being right outside his room, peeking inside. He was legit crying and I never saw him act that way before. I'm pretty sure he pissed himself. I'm not sure. My other older brother, let's call him Mark. I believe he had the worst of it since he slept not even five feet away from the doll. He also had a dream about the girl in the dress and the doll as well. The history wasn't scary, but anxiety inducing in my opinion. All he remembers is sitting at the dinner table. The girl with the white dress sitting across from him with the doll next to the girl. Apparently, the doll was blinking and the girl was emotionless, not blinking whatsoever. This is when he started hearing a clock tick. It ticked and ticked before he suddenly woke up in a sweat. But the problem was, the doll wasn't at the cabinet. It instead was right in front of him. He screamed and threw it towards the closet, breaking the head of the damn thing. My mom came in and thought someone broke in. She saw the doll with the broken head on the floor, and the creepiest thing was the doll was upright with the head right behind it. While she was extremely angry, she was just glad he was safe and threw the doll out. I've had nightmares my whole life. Most of my dreams are lucid at the very least, where I'm aware of the dream and choose either to press forward into adventure or force myself to wake up. But sometimes it feels so real that I can't tell it's a dream and I end up trapped. I think I need to explain the setting a little before I get into things. 12 years ago, we moved into my neighbor's apartment when they moved out. We lived there for a few years till we eventually left when I was 14. I was friends with the neighbor's kids before they moved out. When I visited the apartment, I noticed the bathroom was painted a deep red, making it appear very dark even with the lights on. It was a little spooky. The neighbors also collected a like of Native American stuff like dream catchers and things like that. When we moved in later on, the red was painted over with off-white. The red was still slightly visible as tiny specks in random places though. Also, there weren't any windows in the bathroom. Here's the main thing I wanted to talk about. Among all the ghosts and monsters in my dreams, there's one that stands out to me the most. It started when I dreamed of that apartment. During any dream, if I entered that bathroom at any point, there was always a heavy sense of dread. Some dark mass was in the bathtub that slowly drained away the light in the room, making it dimmer and making me feel slower. I consciously ignored it every time because I didn't want to show it any fear. Over the years of dreaming about that, it got bigger and drained more light. Eventually, when it was strong enough, it appeared in places outside of the bathroom like under beds or inside cabinets, or even entire rooms. Basically, I had to consciously avoid any dark places in my dreams. A couple times, it tried to pull me into it. The floor and gravity would work against me and I'd be crawling on the floor, pulling myself up with the door frame just to avoid getting caught. It caught me twice. The first time, I wanted to see if there was even a reason to be scared. I basically let it take me. What happened was I ended up in a different plane. Some endless pitch black void where no matter where I went, I couldn't escape. My screaming was muted. Fear was overwhelming me. I heard loud whispers inside my head. The second time I was in that void was a complete accident. I took up an entire closet of that apartment and appeared as if it was a staircase to a basement. In that dream, I was simply curious about what was in there 
but it was of course a trap. The second time, the whispers were a lot louder, but I couldn't make out anything they said. I felt like they were literally whispering into my ear. The final time I saw this thing, it had completely evolved. It took the form of an eight foot pitch black portal. It survived in the sunlight, and when I flipped the light switch on, it would flick back off on its own. I kept fighting to keep the switch on. Then I turned around and saw this tall demon thing. It was the most satanic looking thing, and since the dream felt real, it was probably the most terrified I'd ever been in a dream. It was basically a pitch black imp with either pointed ears or horns on its head. Long arms with big claws that reached down to their knees. Their whole body seemed very jagged and strange. I knew it was a dream at this point. I forced myself awake with every ounce of willpower I had. But when I woke up, I was paralyzed. The demon was on my back, biting my neck, scratching my arm. I was there for a good 15 seconds, freaking out. Then I realized that maybe if I just relaxed, then it would kill me and I'd wake up. The pain faded when I relaxed, and it felt like they were gone. Then, I woke up from that paralysis state. I've had other sleep paralysis things happen, but this one stands out to me the most, because it was from the same creature from years of dreams. That void shadow thing hasn't shown up again since then. So we moved into this house in like 2006 or 2007, somewhere around that time. When we moved in, nothing was really happening, but slowly we started realizing stuff moving or not being where we had left it. Me and my sister had made friends with some kids who lived three houses down from us, and they would tell us about how their grandma used to live in this house, and how they would always be over here during the day and after school. We had never really put two and two together. You know, the possibility of it being their grandma and everything. We would hear sounds coming from different rooms in the house, but we never really thought anything of it. Just the house settling or something. We had three dogs when we lived at this house, so sometimes we would just say that the dogs were doing something, or just playing around and making a lot of noise while doing it. One day, me and my mom had gone to Walmart and we had just gotten home and I had toilet paper, and she asked me to go put some in her bathroom, and some in the bathroom in the hallway. First, I had gone to the bathroom in the hallway and put it up. Then I was walking into her room. When I walked through her doorway and instantly stopped and looked, because there was a woman sitting on her bed. She wasn't doing anything, just sitting there. She stopped and looked at me. Then, she smiled and disappeared. I put the toilet paper on the bed and ran back into the kitchen. My mom asked me what was wrong and I said, please don't think that I'm crazy. And she told me that she wouldn't and that I could tell her anything that I needed to. I told her about the woman and how she had just disappeared. My mom said that she had seen her too, but didn't really worry about it because she was an older woman and she had always been really nice if my mom had seen her. Although these women had never done anything to hurt us, I had seen a lot of ghost shows and knew it could only be a matter of time before something bad could happen. Because even some mean ghosts seem nice at first. My mum used to be in this paranormal investigation group and one of the members was sensitive and she could talk to people who had passed on. She said it was like a play by play of a movie in her head when she would talk to someone who had passed. She came over and did a reading of me and my mom and then she walked through our house. We hadn't told her about the things that we'd seen or what had happened to us, and we definitely didn't tell her about the woman we had been seeing. After she walked through, she came back outside and said that she had picked up on three spirits that would come in and out all the time. One was my uncle, who had passed away when I was seven due to a car wreck. One was my mum's sister, who had passed away as a baby due to kidney issues. And the other was the lady. Mrs. Winters, who had owned the house before she had passed. She said we had nothing to worry about with Mrs. Winters. That she was only there to make sure the house was being taken care of because she loved it so much. My uncle would pop in from time to time, 
to make sure that I was okay. He said that he loved me and was proud of everything that I was doing in my life. My mom's sister was there for the exact same reason and just to watch so she could help us stay safe. Christy said they would come and go as they please and that we didn't need to be scared if we saw them. We ended up moving out of the house in 2009 and now it has new owners. I've always wondered if they've seen Mrs. Winters and how she likes them. I hope she's happy. My parents have been living in this house for almost three years now and nothing has really ever happened. Well, my aunt's mom passed away three weeks ago on Tuesday. Wednesday after she passed away, all hell broke loose in the house. Lights were flashing on and off. The dogs were freaking out. My mom's dog won't even go into certain rooms anymore that he would go into before. One night, my mom and I were in the kitchen eating dinner and the laundry room is right off the kitchen. We were the only ones there. My boyfriend and stepdad were both at work. The laundry room light started flashing on and off. I looked at my mom and said, something or someone is messing with your light. And then it stopped. Later, after we ate, we went back into the living room and were sitting down watching Hocus Pocus. And my mom's dog started freaking out looking into the hallway. My mom's chair is right by the opening to the hallway. And usually she'll sit over there with her. But I picked up to carry him back over to her. And he freaked out and started shaking. Then jumped down and ran over to me and sat in my lap again. It wasn't her he was scared of. Because once she got up and he jumped all over her. We went to bed after the movie was over. And I woke up with four scratches on my back. Remember that no one else was home but us. And none of the dogs slept in bed with me. They both sleep with my mom. Because she has a king sized bed. So there's way more room. They're way too far apart to be my boyfriend's fingernails and none of the dogs could have done it considering they weren't near my back and their na nails aren't sharp enough. Every now and then we hear stuff moving but we try to pay it no mind and not feed into it but I don't know what to do. I know it isn't my grandma because she would never try to hurt anyone and I'd like to think that she went into the light to be with her husband. But I don't understand how this all could start happening the night after she passed away. Could it be because we were all vulnerable? I live in Oklahoma and I'm really into finding abandoned places and exploring them. I found out a few months ago that there's a forgotten graveyard a few minutes away from my house. I've lived in Oklahoma my whole life and I've never even heard anyone mention this place before. So I looked it up and did more research on it to make sure that I wasn't walking into something crazy or where I could possibly be harmed. I found out that it was the site of an old schoolhouse and there was no marker so people had basically just forgotten that it was even there over the years unless they had a loved one that was buried there. I waited until daylight to go just in case, because I wanted to be able to see everything around me since I was in the middle of nowhere. I ended up asking my sister if she wants to go with me so I wouldn't be alone. We woke early the next morning to go before it got hot, because it was summertime. It was 10 minutes away from where I lived, so it was an easy drive. Finding the exact location was the hard part. Once we found it, we pulled in and got out to start looking around. The grass was all overgrown and you couldn't really see the headstones anymore. So we had to be super careful walking around because we didn't want to step on anyone. We walked around for an hour or so and then we stumbled upon this opening where the old schoolhouse used to be. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it sounded like something or someone was running right at us. But there was no one else around. So we stopped what we're doing and backed up a bit to look and see what was going on. We looked around and saw nothing. We decided it was getting too hot to just stand out there for much longer. We started walking back to the car and again, it sounded like something or someone was running at us, but faster this time. We both took off running to the car and didn't stop until we got in and locked the doors. As we sat there, I looked up more about this place 
And it's known by a few people to have major activity. And it's so bad, they actually tell you not to go at night time. I read stories of people who said they had seen figures walking around. Or someone asking them for help and then disappearing a few minutes later. I'm glad I decided to wait until daylight and I asked my sister to come with me. Because I don't know what I would have done if I heard someone that I couldn't even see running at me if I was alone. I've never been back to this graveyard. It actually kind of scares me to even think about going back after what happened. Even though it wasn't anything serious like some of the other stuff people had said happened to them. Maybe one day I'll have the guts to go back. I don't believe in ghosts. I never once experienced something that I would consider strange or inexplicable. However, my mother on the other hand had numerous experiences when she was younger. And considering she's the most honest and sensible person I know, it does make me wonder sometimes. I would like to share some of her experiences here over the next few days and see if anyone can make any sense of them. The first one being the mysterious barking noise. When my mother was about 13, their family dog became unwell and her dad had to the dog put down. He buried the dog under the house as he didn't want to dig a hole in the garden. Everything was normal until that night the whole family was awoken by the noise of their dog barking from under the house. This was not the sound of another dog barking in a nearby house. They could hear it coming from directly under their floorboards. Shocked. They thought that the dog had somehow survived and had woken under the house. They ran outside and opened the access door and called out to the dog, but nothing came. By this point it was late at night and whilst completely perplexed, the barking noise had stopped and they all went back to bed. The next morning, her dad went under the house and dug up the dog to definitely confirm that he was indeed dead. Upon confirmation, he buried him again and just passed off the previous night's episode as one of those mysterious but surely explainable things. Until the very next night, when the same thing occurred. At a very similar time, the barking started again. By this point, my mother and her brother were becoming quite upset and hearing this noise. Let alone the fact that it was preventing them from sleeping. Her dad checked again despite knowing it was stupid because there was no way the dog was still alive. Once again, nothing was under the house and the barking stopped. The same event occurred on the third night and by this point, my grandpa had accepted that something very strange was happening. The next morning, he dug up the dog and drove to a nearby park to bury him there. Following that, they never heard the barking noise under the house again. Some backstory. This happened when I was 14. My friend lived in a very rural area of Western Quebec. Her father owns a dairy farm with lots of land. I was basically there every weekend or so. Every year, her father would buy acres of land. There were some creepy abandoned houses in the middle of the acres surrounded by trees, but this incident really got to me. On a snowy afternoon, we decided to explore one of the new acres of land via snowmobiles. We did this all of the time, including summer. We were three girls with time to kill. When we explored, her two dogs would always be running behind us. Basically, they went everywhere with us. She had a German Shepherd and a Pitbull, who were the biggest babies on earth. So we went into this new wooded area, which we had never seen before. It was already a path for snowmobiles. Everything seemed normal, until we all saw something out of the ordinary. On the side of the path, an old man was just standing there, staring at us, in the middle of the woods, whilst it was snowing. I looked behind him, and there seemed to be an old mansion. We stopped, and her dog sniffed the man. He didn't react, but kept his gaze fixed on us. I remember his eyes being dark and empty. We asked him if he needed help but he didn't react. He did look down at the dogs, however. 
We had to physically pull the dogs away from him as they were so curious and wouldn't stop sniffing him. I remember there were footsteps in the snow that weren't ours. We got back in the snowmobiles and drove off. About ten minutes or so, we hit a dead end. We decided to go back the way we came from, since it was the only way we knew back. We were very spooked out, but we went. When we came back, the man wasn't there. The footsteps disappeared, but the tracks were still visible. It's important to note that it wasn't snowing that hard. There was no mansion in sight, just trees. The dog sniffed where the man was and they were as confused as we were. We all looked at each other and didn't understand what we had just witnessed. After a solid five minutes of confusion, we drove back home. We didn't sleep that night. My friend later told me she went back to investigate with her brother a few days later, but there was nothing. Only trees. I kind of just buried that memory and went on with my life. It had scared me so much that I didn't speak to anyone about it. Of course, we lost touch when we finished high school. I recently started talking to these friends again, and one of them brought up the incident. The craziest part is that we all remember that day very vividly. However, when I try to tell people this story, no one believes me. It really sounds like I made this up, but man, has this experience scared the hell out of me. I've not experienced something similar to this ever since. I had the sweetest German Shepherd, who lived through old age and is my family's prized possession. He passed of old age at almost 13. Since then, all of my family members have had an individual experience about him. Since his passing, we've moved houses, but he's come to us even after that. My experience? I was home alone one day in my room, with the door open and distinctly heard him walking downstairs on the hardwood. My family used to call it tap shoes because he would slightly drag his nails across the ground and have a heavy step since he was so large. There was no TV on or anything and I know I heard it. My sister's experience. She was visited by Ty in a dream and she was depressed and he came by when she needed him to cuddle and soon after left in the dream. She's had numerous paranormal encounters in her dreams so this wasn't totally out of the ordinary. My parents' experience. A few days ago, my dad was in the basement where we still have his old bed and was going through and cleaning some old stuff. On the desk he has in there, there's a stack of old papers like old bills and miscellaneous things. While not even near the desk, an envelope fell on the ground and when he looked at it, it was a letter from the vet with Ty's paw prints inside. He thought nothing of it until later that day, my mom said to him, you know it's Ty's one year anniversary of his passing? My dad was in shock and proceeded to tell my mom what just happened earlier. I miss his big fuzzy head so much and it brings me comfort to know that he's still there and letting us know that he's there. Back in 2000, I was 13 living in the Midlands of England in a small town between the cities of Coventry and Leicester. While out with two other friends, one my age and the other two years older, we decided to explore the younger friend's great uncle's house. My friend used to boast about how old the house was and the fact that his great uncle Jim had kept lots of keepsakes from his past and other antiques. We all rode our bikes over to the house and explored the garden first. There's a little here and an old gnarly tree overgrown grass and weeds with an unkept greenhouse. We decided to go in. It was known that Jim the owner was out for the day, and so we poked around inside. There were indeed a lot of old items and antiques. None of us were well off, so the house was small and nothing incredibly valuable inside, just things of personal worth to Jim. We decided to look upstairs. This is when it got real. We found ourselves in the bedroom and were looking through an old bedside table with a dresser and mirror. Curious, we opened one of its drawers and looked at an old pocket knife. This was left on top of the dresser. My younger friend then opened a picture. 
It looked like a big locket with no chain. He opened it up and placed it on the dresser top in front of the mirror. I'll never forget the picture, hand painted and very well done. It was of a woman, 30 to 40 years old, wearing a low cut and fancy white dress. Around her neck is a big silver necklace with a turquoise jewel at the center. Her eyes seemed to follow us, seemed to know we were there. Her expression unapproved and unmoving. We were starting to freak out at this. Just as the three of us had agreed that the picture was odd and it was time to pack up and stop exploring, the room went very cold. Cliché as it was, it was a clear sign and we all started to fret. The picture, knife and everything we had gotten out went quickly back into the dresser. We heard the back door open, slam shut, and then footsteps were making their way towards the stairs. Jim, my friend who was related to the homeowner, sheltered. No reply again. We were all on the landing at this point, looking down the stairs towards the lower rooms. We could still hear the footsteps, now really close. Then, the footsteps were on the stairs, which we could all plainly see. I must clarify, these footsteps were clear and loud. It was definitely not a neighbour or similar noise. Something was coming up the stairs, right in front of us, but nothing could be seen. I don't know how, but I knew there was something on the stairs, even if none of us could see it. At this point, we all panicked. We ran towards the back door of the house. We had to run through this invisible thing in order to get downstairs and out of the house. I should have jumped over the stairs banister as the footsteps were at the landing. Just at that point, when we would have touched whatever it was, I and the two others were frozen in place. We were running at full pace and had a lot of momentum between us, but we were frozen in place. We just stopped dead, like someone had hit pause on a remote. Impossible as this was, I remember straining against whatever was holding me, trying with all my strength to carry on running, but I couldn't move a finger. It must have lasted no more than three seconds, but it felt much longer. Then, just as suddenly as it had begun, we all started moving again. Because we were all fighting whatever was holding us, we all landed in a heap at the top of the stairs. I pushed my way up and ran outside with the two friends. We biked to a nearby park and tried to make sense of what had just happened. I've never had such a frantic conversation, but safe to say, no one could rationalise what had happened. Needless to say, we didn't go back to Uncle Jim's. I grew up never believing the boogeyman was real or ghosts, etc. In the fifth grade, my mom moved us back to New Jersey from Pennsylvania. I quickly made friends with some of the kids in my apartment complex. Soon enough, we were riding bikes all over the town. Small town, by the way. It's called Freehold. In Freehold, there's a small lake called Lake Toponemus. Behind the lake were bike trails and walking trails. Pretty much there's no outlet street with a rusty gate. Upon passing the gate, you'd be entering the woods or trails. The first thing you see is a bulletin board with nothing on it and some wooden rails with caution tape. The trail then forks off two ways, left and right. To the right were the bike trails and to the left would be a hill that takes you to the lake. At the middle of the fork was like a 40 foot drop. We would ride these bike trails all the time, but the first time my friends took me there, they said some guy and his son rode off and died. My friends also referred to the spot as Dead Man's. A lot of people in the town know this place. I dismissed it as urban legend, as every neighbourhood has at least one. Fast forward years later, I'm in 12th grade in the same town. After school, I would smoke and drink with my friends. One night, while I was with two of my friends, we decided to smoke, because weed was illegal at the time, we couldn't just smoke anywhere. So we all decided to smoke at the dead man's by the lake. We walked in, and made a left. We walked down this giant dirt hill to the bottom where the lake sat. We then made another left, as there was a dirt trail at the bottom of the hill. We made another left and continued down the trail until we reached the small area with a bench that sat right in front of the lake. 
We smoked two blunts and relaxed for about an hour or so. We then went up and began to leave. As we started walking back towards the dirt trail, there was a faint holographic looking object nearby. It looked like one of those doll things that a seamstress would use. It looked like a tuxedo or something. It quickly appeared and vanished. I didn't think anything of it. I was so high, everything was fuzzy. I just thought I was bugging out. As we continued to walk down the dirt trail, we came in on I entered a void-like state. It felt like I didn't exist. Like my body was on autopilot. Then boom, I came back and we're still on this dirt path. At this point, we're walking kind of single file. My friend Chris has his phone out with the flashlight on, leading the way. I'm in the middle and my other friend Karina is behind me. It felt like something was walking next to me all of a sudden and I heard a loud snap next to me. I tell Chris to shine his light next to me. There's a thick branch snapped in half. It would have required a lot of force to snap. I turn to Chris and say, let's get out of here. We continue walking. Keep in mind, it's 11 p.m. As we reach the part of the dirt path where we would walk up the hill, I see something further in the woods at the top of the hill. At first I thought it was a deer, how fast it was moving and how far away it was. It quickly got close enough to the point where it was easily visible. It was as bright as a LED light. This thing began gliding down the hill, completely defying physics. It stopped on the trail we were on, staring back at us. It grew super bright and vanished. At this point, we're all in a state of shock. Karina in the back of the line asked what was going on. Chris and I remained silent. We all continued walking up the dirt path. Halfway up this path, I feel something clawing me all over. It wasn't physically. It felt internal. I can't really describe it. It was excruciating and I felt like I was being restrained. At this point, we were almost out of the woods and as soon as I stepped foot on the paved road, it all stopped. When we got to the car, I asked them, you all saw that, right? They both shook it off like, nah. I believe they were too shook up to even talk about it because days later, they both confirmed that they saw exactly what I saw. So when I was nine months pregnant with my son, two years ago, for three weeks, every single night, I woke up at 3.38 a.m. Not a second sooner, not a second later. When I'd wake up, it felt like someone was near me. Like I felt like someone was there, but not physically felt. Like it felt like someone was just in my room, but it wasn't a scary feeling. So I brushed it off and went back to sleep. I used to watch this psychic medium's lives on Facebook so one night, something told me to tell him about it and ask what it meant. He told me he's sensing a father figure around me. He said he's sensing that I have the gift of mediumship, which he said is a rarer gift. He said that the time of night when I'm sleeping is when I'm most open and my light is the brightest. When he said father figure, I assumed he meant my godfather, who passed away in 2015. I started looking up ways to be more open to these connections and practiced each night. Three nights later, I had a weird dream. I'm friends with this girl on Facebook. She doesn't ever share anything personal about her life, so I don't really know her. I had a dream about her. In my dream, I was a man in his mid-thirties. I had dark brown hair and a dark brown five o'clock shadow. So anyways, it was the man, me, the girl and her mom. We were at a lake. The man was in the water and the girl had just gotten in. The bottom was slimy and full of algae, so the mom didn't want to get in. The man was playfully calling her a pussy to try and get her in. Then, we were all in the water and a turtle swims by. Then we're in the water and the man and the mom start arguing and he tells her that she deserves more. She deserves to be loved and happy and that she should find someone else. When I woke up, those are the parts that stood out to me and something told me to contact this girl and tell her about it. This girl told me that her mom's fiance had passed away a few years ago and the last thing they did as a family was go to the lake and that her mom was scared to get in the water because the bottom was slimy and her fiance was teasing her, calling a posse to get her in. They caught a turtle while they were there and she still has it. 
She said her mom has been trying to start dating again, but stopped because she felt guilty about trying to move on. Fast forward. The last two weeks I've been waking up at 3.38 again, but this time, when I wake up, I have this horrible feeling in my stomach and in my chest. My chest will hurt so badly because of the anxiety it gives me. I was sitting in the kitchen area doing vocabulary homework and studying because I had a test the next day. All of a sudden, I heard high heel footsteps upstairs above the living room. At first, I thought my mom came back and I was confused because I didn't hear her come back. I quietly walked across the house to get to the stair and I crawled my way up slowly because there could have been a chance that wasn't my mom. Once I got to the top, I slowly peeked my head only to find silence and darkness within all the rooms upstairs. I was alone. My eyes widened, the hairs on my back raised and I immediately zoomed down the stairs as fast as I could. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed the house phone and dialed my mom's cell. The moment she answered, I immediately started crying, telling her the whole story. My mom told me to ignore it and it was probably mice in the walls. To give a little backstory, my mom was like those typical parents in horror films that think the child has a wild imagination or chooses to ignore it, to not creep their child out even more and tell them what they're experiencing is nothing. The footsteps happened again and I remember trying really hard to pay attention to it because I wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy and overthinking it. Those footsteps were so familiar, sounded just like my mom's footsteps. Walking across the room and taking sudden pauses and walking again and again. Sounded like someone was in a rush to get ready. Just like how my mom sounds when she would get ready to go out. I was terrified, but I had no other choice but to listen. This wasn't even the worst part. I was sitting on the couch studying when all of a sudden I heard my dog on the other side of the wall making a snorting or choking noise. To give a little context, Behind the TV wall is the formal living room, and the ceiling is very high there, so that area of the home is eco-friendly. When I heard my dog making the snoring noise, I didn't think much of it, but to call out to him I yelled, Benji! I found it kind of strange, because he didn't come to me, but as soon as I turned my head to look outside, I saw my dog staring at me, faintly crying to come back in. The noise on the other side of that wall was not my dog. Something snored and echoed through my entire home. When I tell you my soul dropped, it dropped. At this point, I did what any sane, logical person or child would do. I put on Spongebob on max volume. Background story. I used to live in Mauab, Utah with my mom and her boyfriend and the boyfriend's brother at a mobile home park. She worked as the mobile home park manager and pretty much took bills for people for rent, signed up new people to move in, helped with issues around the park, etc. So she knew everyone's name there because it wasn't that big of a complex. So fast forward to us living there for a while. It was around 2 or 3 p.m. and I'm sitting on the couch in the living room, just chilling on my phone, waiting for my mom to get home because it was a boring day that evening. As I'm sitting there, I hear clearly as my mom yells my name. I heard her yell it in distress, Tiff. Now some may think that someone else was named Tiffany in that park, but since my mom worked as the manager, she knew there was no one else in the park named Tiffany. And she's the only person that calls me Tiff because I prefer to go by Tiffany. So I'm sitting there thinking about what she wants. I figured she would yell my name again if she really needed me. Then a few seconds later, I heard her scream, Tiff! This time she sounded more annoyed that I didn't answer her the first time. I sat there and thought to myself, the boyfriend's brother was outside on the porch smoking at that time. If she needs me to go out there, he would have come inside and tell me that she needs me. So I again stayed quiet, prepared to leave if I heard her again, and sure enough she yelled, Tiff! again. She let that yell kind of drag on, so I knew that she wanted me for something. I thought she needed help. So I got up and was about to walk out the door when the brother came inside and I asked him if my mom was calling me. 
And he just kind of stared for a second and said, no, like I was crazy or something. I called my mom to tell her that she was calling my name and she said, no, I'm at the store right now. I got off the phone and thought to myself, why the heck did I hear my mom screaming my name? Not just once, but three times, clear as day. When she yelled my name those three times, it sounded urgent, but not urgent enough for me to get up and run towards her. To this day, I think it was a mimic because I'm the only one that heard her when the brother was outside and could have heard it much better than me. Good thing I didn't leave the first time and went off searching for her on my own. I grew up in a two-storied house my parents built in the middle of an apple orchard in New Zealand. Other than a few other workers who lived on the orchard, there was nothing around besides my parents' business. A cattery and kennels right beside the house. My parents would get up early and go to work, leaving me and my siblings in the house alone. One morning, I got up at about 7am and went to the living room downstairs, and I sat with the family dog on the couch. I was too tired to turn on the TV, so I was sitting there in dead silence, knowing my mum would get back from work any minute. I sat facing forwards, but to my right were glass double doors that opened to a deck that wrapped from one side of the house to the other. I watched outside because I heard the sound of my mum's gumboots on the decking from the direction of the cattery. It sounded identical to her footsteps. As I was watching and waiting for my mum to come into view, my dog woke up and started growling. Before I even had time to question why she was growling, a see-through woman walked into view. She was completely transparent, exactly like the ghosts you see in old photos, wearing a long dress. My dog saw her too, as she growled even louder when the woman came into sight. The woman was looking forwards at first, but turned and stared directly at me before vanishing into thin air. She would have been two meters away from where I sat. I remember being so scared that I physically couldn't move. I just stared as my whole body was paralyzed with fear. I don't know why, but I didn't tell my mum about this until recently. I'm 26 now and still think about it often. My mum wasn't surprised at all when I told her and said she also saw things at that house, as did my siblings. We moved out when I was about eight. Some years ago, I had a dream in which I woke up on a dusty couch in the dirty basement of an old theatre. I heard the footsteps and giggling of children, often from a distance. I called out to them, and they didn't answer, but the footsteps got closer. The children slowly approached me, and one didn't have a face. However, they were friendly and wanted me to play a game with them. I began to play some old, dusty cardboard game with them when an adult approached. She was a short, heavy-set woman, wearing a lot of jewellery and a turban, holding a lantern. She sort of looked like a gypsy. I stood up quickly as she was asking what I was doing there with these children. I told her I woke up here, and that I'm sorry, and that we're only playing a game. She said it's fine. She was just surprised to see me, as she didn't get many visitors. The woman invited me to sit down and have a drink in the next room. As we entered, I saw an old round table with a man whom I don't remember much about and the woman who invited me. We sat down and chatted, but they never ate or drank anything. The bottle on the table was covered with dust, so neither did I. The children were in the same room playing together quietly. Then there was a very tall, deformed looking man who entered the room and I could tell he wasn't pleased that I was there. He glared at me and began to adjust some plastic tubes above these large blue barrels. The dream ended and I woke up. Months later, I wound up in the basement of the old theatre doing community service. I was taken aback when I saw the same blue barrels with plastic tubes and the same dust-covered couch that was in my dream. I had another experience while working in that basement with an old miniature suit of armour that I swear I saw move out of the corner of my eye. I don't scare easily, but I was so creeped out that I went upstairs and took a smoke break. 
The guy working noticed my demeanour and came out to talk to me. He asked what I had just seen and I told him. He didn't laugh at me, but I could tell he didn't think much of it. The rest of my time there was uneventful, but years later, I saw the guy who was working and he told me a funny story. He said that the suit of armour was stolen by someone after a show. About four months later, a box arrived from South Carolina and it contained that small suit of armour. He was shocked, because someone had to pay big bucks to have that thing shipped. It was about three and a half feet tall and weighed quite a lot. This particular theatre is known to be haunted. They hold paranormal investigations there every year. I went to one, and that's when I heard there had been a fire there where two children had perished. Me and my girlfriend went on a trip to a quiet beachside town. The town was basically one road banked by an estuary, which could be walked around. It was huge and about the only interesting place in town. On the far side of the estuary, away from the town, is a memorial walk dedicated to some kind of old. It's lined with many benches with memorial plaques and is backed by a road of detached, expensive houses. You could tell many of the locals enjoyed taking walks around this estuary, which was sort of the heart of the town. The estuary is very quiet and peaceful at night, beside the old walker, and the far side is away from the town. We sat late at night, around 12, on this far side. We'd been there an hour walking up and down, but stopped in the sheltered bench, the darkest spot we could find. Behind us was a garden, detached from any houses with two holes in the verge beyond that that went into the woods beyond. For most of the time we were sitting there, we could hear rustling, footsteps, and I had a feeling of being watched. This bush, with big heavy leaves, next to me rustled as if someone brushed their hand through it, or an animal went past, but there was nothing there, no sound or movement. We continued hearing footsteps, behind us mostly, seemingly from nowhere. Like people walking on gravel, but separated by periods of time. We were getting quite spooked, especially after the bush, though I was fairly calm and unfazed. Ghosts can't hurt you, especially ones that are just out to enjoy the estuary. I was just staring off to my right at this path along the estuary, which was lined on both sides by two low verges of plants. As I'm looking down at where this path goes out of vision because of the verges, I see what appears to be the shadow of a man. His shadow is cast on the ground, as if produced by the street lamp shining down from above. I could see the profile of head and shoulders, but no lower because of the verge. As I'm looking, I don't really notice it. I thought that it was a plant shadow. The shadow slowly disappeared behind the verge, but what startled me was the footsteps. The exact same footsteps we've been hearing, only this time they came from that shadow. This time one after another, as if produced by someone walking casually. The crunch of gravel is unmistakable. It all happened as it would if it was just someone walking. This is what my mind jumped to first, and I thought some locals had been staring at us. I immediately jumped up and went to have a look down the path. Of course, there was nobody there or in the bushes. Had it been an animal or a person, we would have heard them rustling the bushes or gravel as they walked or ran away. I know what I witnessed though, and I can't explain it any other way. In 2017, I lost a cousin. He previously had eye cancer from which he had recovered, but then relapsed, and it transformed into a brain cancer. The last months of his life were very complicated. He was stuck in a hospital kind of bed at home, and couldn't really talk and had child behaviour. His brain couldn't even control his throat to make water and food go through his throat instead of his lungs, so he had to eat gelled water. So the day he died, I was on the phone with my other cousin's daughter, and she and her mother were about to go on holiday. But just after they go, my cousin's, the sick one, wife, calls, telling them that my cousin is not breathing. She called the emergency services. So they ran to his apartment. 
After a couple of minutes, my cousin's daughter called me back and told me that he had just died. After consoling her, I went into my rom mom's room and tried to tell her. I didn't have the time. I just said, hey mom. And she cut me out saying, I know, he died. I was like, how the hell do you know it? And she explained to me that she felt a presence near her and then she heard him calling her. I was shocked and didn't know what to say. When my cousin was younger, he liked my mom a lot and my mom liked him too. She took care of him and his sisters when they had family worries and educated them a little. Nobody called my mom or sent a message to tell her. Today, I still don't know what to think about it. A few years ago, I had a weird experience. That night, I went to sleep completely healthy. No signs of any illness whatsoever. It was a normal, unremarkable day. Then I had some sort of nightmare. Thinking about it to this day still makes me feel uncomfortable. I remember waking up slowly to a terrible headache that started growing out of nowhere. It felt like a drill in my head. It was all dark. I couldn't move or talk or see anything. I felt really confused for some reason, like if I was experiencing something illogical. I know it sounds like sleep paralysis, but it wasn't. I've had sleep paralysis before, and this wasn't anything like it. It did feel like some sort of dream, like I wasn't fully awake. It was all blurry and confusing. Then, I started hearing voices, but not physical sound. Like it was information forcefully entering my mind. Words. Ideas. They were suffering a lot. They were dying in the middle of nowhere, like a forgotten vessel floating in empty space. I remember how fucking bad they were having it, like if they were dying slowly or something. A disease, or perhaps the end of their life support, I really don't know. They begged for help. They were begging me for their life. I remember feeling really confused about everything. I really can't explain this feeling. It kind of felt like that viral image of a bunch of things where you can't name any single thing. I remember they asked me to do something with a flower that looked big and purple. I remember seeing it very clearly. A huge flower laying on the floor. It's like they were trying to tell me to do something I didn't understand. The verb part was missing. The action. The thing I had to do with the flower. So I didn't know what to do. And they were really nervous. Like screaming into my ear begging me that I did it. I felt really bad for being unable to help them. My head hurt like hell. In the end, it suddenly stopped. I woke up with this horrible, painful headache and like 40 degree fever. I felt lightheaded and it lasted for a week. Back in 2005 or 2006, I was renting this house that was nearly a hundred years old farmhouse. My bedroom was upstairs and for some reason it always creeped me out a little bit. It was as if I felt a presence there, although I hadn't had any actual paranormal experiences. One night, my then boyfriend and I had stayed up late watching TV and had fallen asleep on the couch. I had to work early the next day, so when I awoke around 3am, I decided to go upstairs to bed. I gently shook my boyfriend to get him to come upstairs, but he didn't immediately follow. It was beginning to get light, so when I got to bed, I pulled the cover up over my head to try to block out the lights so I could sleep. The house was old and creaky, and I heard my boyfriend coming up the creaky stairs and walking down the hallway to the room, not long after I had laid down. I could hear him come in the room and I felt the bed depress on his side as he sat down. But then he got up and then sat down further at the bottom of the bed. He did this, getting up and sitting down all along the edge of the bed until he was sitting right next to me. I was annoyed at this point, wondering if this was some weird attempt to put the moves on me when all I wanted to do was sleep. Then I felt his arm go across my waist. So I flung the blanket back to ask him what the fuck, but he wasn't there. I ran downstairs to see if maybe he was tricking me, but he was still sound asleep on the couch. 
So I ran back upstairs and got under the blankets and shut my eyes tight until I fell asleep. For as long as we remained in that house, I never had another experience, although the creepy feeling upstairs always remained. I'm sure that what happened was real. It felt real. I don't think it was a lucid dream because I hadn't had time to fall back asleep yet. This happened to me when I was 11 or 12 years old. We had a house fire and had to move in with my grandmother for a time while the insurance was sorted and our new house was built. Luckily, the land my grandmother owns had an old farmhouse near her own home that she mostly used for storage. It had water and electricity, so we were good to go. The first few nights in the house were very scary for me. Every little pop or flash of light made me think of fire. I slept between my parents each night. It was rough, but after about three or four nights, I was no longer scared while I was in the house. I even started going upstairs in the evenings and reading in the loft while listening to the radio. I decided that I was able to sleep alone in the house and spent a few nights on the old couch in the living room. After that, I ended up in the loft using a sleeping bag borrowed from one of my cousins. Anyway, the loft had a massive window facing the front yard, driveway, and the main road. I was just settling in for the night with my little lantern and my book when something passed by the window. I shrugged it off as the reflection of a car going by and started reading my book. It happened again, and this time I got up and went to the window. This is where it gets weird. Standing in the middle of the yard was a deer. It stood on its hind legs and its neck was bent at an odd angle, like it was broken or something. It walked with a strange grace, especially for something that appeared to be so out of place. Through grass, across the road, and disappeared into the woods. At no point during seeing this creature was I afraid. I was actually very calm somehow, and even went to my sleeping bag and went back to my reading, not even thinking about what I had just seen. This is really out of character for me, to say the least. I'm the type to get worked up over seeing a bug in my house. The next morning, I told my mother what I saw, and she seemed totally unaffected. She just told me not to tell anyone, and sent me off to school. I assumed she thought I was seeing things due to the stress of the fire, but I knew exactly what I saw, and I wasn't dreaming or even close to falling asleep when it happened. We moved to our new house about three weeks after I saw the deer man. I've only told a few people what happened, and I've never seen anything like that since. But I'm terrified of going into the woods. When I think about it now, it's super scary, and I'm not sure why I was so calm. When I was young, I was brought up with a Chinese folk religion background. Back then, my mother, me, and the general public in Singapore didn't know better and called it Taoism and Buddhism. I slowly ventured out from it into full Theravada Buddhism now. From young, imagination and horror stories taught me to fear ghosts. Now in my 40s, I wish for a definite experience so you know at least there is an afterlife. Maybe you won't be afraid. I never had any clear signs from Christianity or any religion in the paranormal sense. However, I wish to document a true experience for posterity, in case I pass away or something. Singapore has conscription, so when we reach a certain age, we're drafted to serve, at my time, two and a half years in the armed forces. Official acts don't allow me to disclose details, so I'll be brief on my experience. I worked or served in a store, issuing out equipment and receiving them back. Part of our equipment is laptops. We have some experience handling them, although they are new to us. One fine day, someone returned a laptop and my storemate handed it to me to keep it back in its storage location while he clears off the paperwork. The moment I touched the laptop, I had a very strong and definite feeling that it would be lost and the loss would be found out tomorrow. I didn't hear any entity whispering or telling me or seeing anything, just blam, an insanity. I'm very sure it will be lost tonight, and the loss will be found tomorrow. Now, it is an army camp, a locked store with proper security procedures. 
It's far-fetched, but I'm very sure it will be lost. I called out to my mate, asked him where to store it, just to make sure he saw me storing it properly. I stuck to him the whole day and night to make sure he's my alibi. And yes, the loss was found the next day when someone else wanted the laptop. Spirit, guardian angel, or deity? My grandfather, we call him Bopper, was such a joy to be around. He worked hard for many years as a doctor and would make many lives so much better. Always kind and had an incredibly goofy way about him. I always looked forward to seeing him when we would visit, but as I grew older, I started to notice something was wrong. It wasn't until he was running out of time that I discovered he had cancer in, I believe, his marrow. It was horrible to see how much it affected him and hurt all the more when the morning where he breathed his last breath came. It was devastating, but it was what came after that gave me a reason to truly believe that he may be, be, still be somewhat present. My parents sent me and my sisters to my other grandparents' house the night before, as they seemed to already know what was coming, and they didn't wish for us to witness it. They came to pick us up that very morning, and they told us of his passing, and how everyone was mourning just downstairs from the room he passed in. My family swears up and down that they heard whistling. Everyone seemed to have picked up on it, but no one claimed to have been whistling, and that was something Bopper would frequently do. I eventually would hear the whistling too, as we would eventually come back up to visit our grandmother and help her go through Bopper's things. I was in the room where he passed, and I was looking at his desk. Still sitting there was a plush, robotic-looking figure that I got for him a year or two ago, and I felt my eyes well up at the sight that he kept so close to him. It was when I was reaching to touch it that I heard a single note of a whistle in my right ear. I jumped in surprise, which caught the attention of my sister. I explained what I heard to her, and the room fell silent. It felt bittersweet. I recall swallowing a lump in my throat and saying, Hi, Bopper, we miss you. What really sold it was how one of his last words was him mentioning how we wished to pass under a rainbow. This connects to how the morning of his death was also the day we needed to head home so we began to make the trip back. It was silent, everyone was in grief, and we were all still processing all that had occurred. It was that moment when we were hit with a rainstorm that felt almost sudden. It poured for a bit, but vanished almost as quickly as it came, and then there it was. The clouds grew lighter to make way for it. As clear as day, a rainbow painted the sky. When I was a teenager, I went through the mandatory emo phase and collected empty, differently coloured cans of Monster to use as a bedroom decoration. Classy, right? They were on a cabinet just as you entered my room. Once, after coming home from school and walking into my room, one of the cans was flung a good two metres further into my bedroom. Now I know what you're thinking, maybe my backpack caught on it as I walked in. The wind from me entering my room knocked it over. I thought that too. The more I thought about it though, the more it seemed off. I was already well into my room and had just stopped walking when the can was hurled across my bedroom a split second later, like someone had smacked it. If it had caught on my bag, surely it would have moved with me. It wasn't on the edge of the very wide cabinet either. It was snug against the wall and none of the other cans seemed to be disturbed. The cans were stacked next to each other and touching, so for the direction the can went in, it would have been impossible for me to knock over just that one and not affect the others. No windows or doors were open, so external wind knocking it over was impossible. I kind of forgot about it until one day in high school, a year later, I forgot my fairly large water bottle in one of my classes. I went in quickly before the next class to grab it. The art teacher looked kind of off when I greeted her. Oh, that's your water bottle? Miss Smith and I were eating lunch in here and something really weird happened. What? Did it move like someone had smacked it? I laughed, remembering what happened with the monster can. 
She gasped, nodded and jokingly refused to let me into her class anymore because I was haunted. Later, I talked to Miss Smith and confirmed that my water bottle was flung, just like the monster can. It was a good few feet into the huge conjoined art desk we all used and not near any windows. This time though, the bottle was half full. It would have taken some force to fling it. Not super exciting, I know. Just weird. I remember being quite stressed both times, so maybe it was something latching onto that. My maternal grandmother lived with my family growing up. She raised seven children, but her health declined after her last child. She had epilepsy her whole life, but it got much worse after that. In the years that she lived with us, she also suffered from Alzheimer's, dementia, and her bipolar disorder surfaced. I grew up with her having so many seizures that it was just a normal part of my childhood. It's heartbreaking, but that's just how it was. She had her bad days, but she was an angel on earth. Our entire family adores and thinks so highly of her. Unfortunately, she passed away in my early 20s. When I was 25 and living with my fiancé, I started having weird feelings of anxiety and dizziness, where I had to lay down immediately for it to go away. One day I was showering, and I completely forgot everything. I didn't know who I was or where I was. To this day, it was the scariest thing I've ever experienced, but it only lasted a few seconds. I quickly remembered. My name is Maria, I'm in my fiancé's shower. I was so freaked out. Fast forward a couple weeks, it's a long and traumatic story, but basically, I had two grand mal seizures in my sleep. My fiancé, never having seen a seizure, woke up to me convulsing and bleeding from the mouth. After more seizures and several hospital stays, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. It was hard, but honestly, I felt more empathy for my fiancé and my mom. He would have to watch me have seizures, and she would have to live knowing her daughter was suffering the same way her mom suffered. I thought a lot about my grandmother. I knew I felt her better. The weird feelings of anxiety and dizziness were auras or small seizures, which is what happened to me in the shower. After that shower, I always had bad feelings going back into that shower. That was my biggest internal struggle. Until the day my grandmother came to see me. Yes, in the shower. With her sweet Hispanic accent, she said, it's gonna be okay, baby girl. And from that day forward, I've never been afraid of showers or seizures. She is my guardian angel. This experience took place between the eighth grade and freshman year of high school. During my eighth grade and high school years, I was an extremely depressed kid. My mom was an abusive alcoholic and because of that, there was a lot of negative energy that not only filled the house we were renting, but seemed to hover around me. I was stupid at the time, even more so than I am now, and liked to give this negative energy a lot of attention. While I had a lot of minor experiences like hearing voices, lucid nightmares, scratches on my body, etc. One experience really sticks out to me in my memory. I was spending the night at my grandparents' house. I wish I could remember the reason, but it's hard for me to recall a lot of memories in that time period due to my trauma. I was raised for a good portion of my life in my grandparents' house, and so I was spending the night in my old room when I was very suddenly and very aggressively shaken awake. I quickly brushed it off as me having one of those nightmares where you feel like you're falling. But as I got comfortable and tried to go back to sleep, I heard snapping. No rhythm, just very aggressive snapping all around the bed I was lying in. At this point in my life, I was so desensitized to having weird things happen to me. I just sighed angrily and went back to sleep. I don't know how much time had passed, but for a second time, I was shaken awake. This time the bed was shaking a little too much, however, so I knew it wasn't one of those falling nightmares. I remember sitting up this time out of annoyance and just looked around. I had a nightlight in the room because I'm kind of scared of the dark after certain experiences that I might share here later. So I could see everything fairly well. 
the snapping started again, and it came from all around my bed once more. Once again, I grumbled some obscenities and angrily went back to sleep. Finally, for a third time, I was shaken awake. This time I was still being shaken after I'd woken up for a few extra seconds. I sat up again, and this time the snapping noises were louder and somehow felt even closer to me, much more all over the place. I was really pretty pissed now, and as I glared around my room, I suddenly saw something whiz past the front of my bed and smack the tall metal lamp on the left side of my room. For whatever reason, this sent me over the edge, and I remember paying some pretty choice words to whatever was waking me up, and threatening them, before throwing myself back onto my pillow, turning to my side, and yanking the blanket over my head to sleep. I didn't wake up again after that. The following morning, I looked around the lamp to see what could have been thrown, but found nothing. It sounded like metal hitting metal, so I assumed it was a coin, but I couldn't find anything. I've also had some other experiences in my grandparents' house and my own, so let me know if you want to hear about those. Steve is a weird thing that I cannot explain. I thought he was a shadow person, but he isn't always like a shadow. He can interact with physical objects, can touch me, touch others, his touch is cold. I call them he because the few times I've heard him speak it sounded more like a distorted masculine voice. He's tall. I tend to feel a cold near me whenever he's present. He sometimes closes and opens doors, taps on the walls, flicks lights on and off. He's able to imitate mine and my parents' voices and can look exactly like me, but his eyes are wide open so you can see the white which is something I cannot do. He's also saved my life on multiple occasions, which has always confused me on why. Also, Steve's eyes are green. They look as if they're bleeding green. That's basically all you need to know about him. So now I'll go through and tell you all the weird shit I've dealt with. Things that I have a hard time believing, even though I'm well aware they happened. Take note that I also wear glasses, so I don't have the best distance eyesight. So... Where to start? When I was little, I had an imaginary friend and Steve, this tall, large, black, shadowy figure that would watch me from the hallway. He would often just sit there and stare at me as I played. I invited him inside multiple times, which now I realize was a really stupid thing to do. My cousins were not the nicest people to me. They often locked me outside, inside rooms, and left me alone for hours locked up. One night, they threw me outside and locked the door. It was pitch dark, and I was scared. I sat down and sobbed my eyes out until I felt something was there. I told it to just eat me, but I'd taste bad. Nothing happened. Eventually, someone opened the door and let me in. I walked up the stairs to go to my grandfather's room, but I turned around, and to my surprise and fear, something was staring at me through the glass on the door, watching. A while later, I was five and we moved from Chile to Australia, rented, my parents bought a house, waited two years for it to be constructed, and then we find a home. I've forgotten the exact dates and shit. I'd spoken about this on Amino, but I'd lost my account. But what happened was, one day, I walked into my bathroom to wash my face. I was frowning and looked up into the mirror. My reflection was grinning. I frowned further. It grinned more, as if pleased that I saw it. I screamed and ran out of the bathroom, slamming the door shut behind me, and scrambled into my room. Fear set in again, as I realised my room had a mirror, and I could still see my reflection. So I was caught staring between the bathroom door, afraid my reflection would try to kill me, and my room's mirror. My parents came in and asked if I was okay, and I said that I'd seen a spider. It was nothing. Things went silent for a while until one night, I was laying in bed and staring at the entrance to my room. Out of nowhere, something large and black came and stood in the doorway, hand on the wall, head lowers, eyes and just stood there staring at me. At first I thought it was my mum who came up to check on me, so I moved to put my weight on my arm. 
Steve moved back. Since I haven't been wearing my glasses, I just thought it was still my mom standing there. The lights from the living room shone to the hallway so I could see it was a solid black mass. I called out, Mom? Dad? No response. I tried again. Mom? Dad? No response again, and I was fucking terrified. No, I didn't think it was a ghost. First thing on my mind was a home intruder. I feared the worst, that my parents could be out cold. Or what if this person had a gun? They could shoot me. I started trembling and crying, but didn't make a sound. I remember reaching for my glasses and putting them on, and it quickly moved away, going into the bathroom. I got out of bed and rushed, flinging the bathroom door open. There was nothing there, yet the mirror? Oh, fuck. I felt as if something was there. My parents called out asking if I was okay, and I just said yes. I will never forget this. I was little, with two friends. We were at a park playing by a lagoon. They had walked off to show their parents something while I stayed behind. For some reason, I just walked into the water mindlessly. I felt so empty, so lost. I exhaled all the air out of my lungs and inhaled as much water as I possibly could when I fell in. Five or so minutes passed, or more, I cannot remember. I did count to five minutes though. I felt sleepy and I heard a voice with no voice. Like words spoken, yet no voice behind them telling me, get out of the water. Cold hands grabbed my armpits, trying to pull me up. I could hear the desperate voice, get out. Eventually, I listened and I tried to swim up, but my foot was stuck. I tried to reach down, but the voice told me not to. So I listened. I wiggled my foot and got it out, leaving my shoe behind. I felt the hands pulling me up and out of the lagoon. I coughed up a shitload of water, yet I felt no pain. My lungs were not burning in agony. I pulled out a piece of long green shit out of my mouth and felt it up my throat. My body felt cold. I felt as if I were being supported by something. As time passed, I started to forget about this whole Steve thing. I was walking out of my room and had my bathroom door open. I look inside only to see a black solid mass, human shaped, the exact same height as me standing staring into the mirror. I went fucking pale and looked forward again and walked to the living room, sat at the table and burst into tears. I tried not to sob so my parents wouldn't know. I just stared at the bathroom that was down the hallway, utterly horrified. Some time later I got up and went to check. There was nothing. I told myself it could be the lightning, but fuck, I know it wasn't the light. There wasn't any clothes hanging off the shower to cast a shadow, yet I knew it wasn't a shadow. It had been a solid fucking black mass standing there. This is when things started to get out of hand. Knocking on walls, opening and closing of doors, it was rather scary at first. The first time I heard him tapping was when I was in bed. Behind me, he tapped on the wall, so I tapped back. A few days later, there was a tapping on the wall in front of me, so I called out his name. Then he tapped in my dad's workroom and freaked my parents the fuck out. My dad ran to the studio and asked if I was tapping on walls. I said no. I was honestly trying not to laugh at how scared my parents were. Footsteps were something I heard a couple of times. It wasn't much, just a few of them silent again. Though one day, while I was with my mum watching TV in her room, we heard it. Loud, thumping footsteps from the hallway coming to her room. Mum grabbed me and hugged me tightly. She started trembling and was scared. She began praying and told me to pray as well. I watched where the footsteps were as they entered the room and stopped at the front of the bed. Mom hugged me for quite a while, until she thought it was gone. More shit started happening. Footsteps became more frequent. Knocking, doors, all that stuff became more normalised. He would sometimes make loud growling noises, scratching. I had spotted him watching me down the hallway multiple times, yet never managed to get a decent look at him. He spoke to me when I was annoyed, mumbling. His voice had been a distorted male voice. 
quite scary, actually. I'd been in my room minding my own business when I heard my mum yell for me to open the door. I got off my bed and she came inside because the door somehow unlocked on its own. She smiled at me and asked why I'd come to stare at her and lock the door. I went pale and told her I hadn't left my room. She laughed and said she saw an exact copy of me standing there, staring at her and locked the door then walked down the hallway to her room, but never towards mine. So she'd be confused by the fact that I came from my room, not hers. Time passed and I was in an awful state of mind. I was more suicidal than ever, felt more depressed than usual and just wanted death to claim my name. I was walking to my studies down a walkway when I fell towards the road. I saw a car ring coming and it beeped its horn at me, but I couldn't bring myself to care. I was falling. That's when a cold hand grabbed my wrist and yanked me off the road, saving my life. I stood there shocked and shouted at the dude for beeping their horn at me. I turned to thank my saviour, but there was nobody there. I touched my wrist. It was cold, as if a hand had grabbed it. That happened twice. The third time he saved me was when I'd been walking to the bus stop after studies. I was feeling like shit and stopped out of nowhere in the middle of the road and then walked extremely slowly. I felt two cold hands shove me out of the way and I nearly fell flat on my face at the end of the walkway. I got up to shout at the person but a car swooshed right in front of my face. I could have died and nobody was there again. Two things happened after some time though, maybe a few weeks or a month later. I wasn't myself. I was angry, aggressive acting like the old me that I despised so much. I'd been sitting in the living room doing a craft project to try to get the nerves out. It was 12 o'clock to midnight. I got up, realising it was so late, and went to close the window. A voice in my head said not to close it. I could feel a presence there, yet I was so angry I did. I slammed it shut and walked to get a glass of water. That's when I heard it. The fucking door. It clicked slid open, slammed shut, and quickly clicked back to shut. The door was broken, so you had to quickly slam it shut and click the lock to close it. I turned, nobody there as usual, yet I could feel something staring, angry, really angry, hateful, wanting to tear me apart. I got the water and walked to my room and tried to pretend there was nothing there. He followed me, stood at my doorway glaring, I tried to go to sleep, but fucking hell. I'd never had such terrifying, gory nightmares as I did that night. I woke up so many times, every five to ten minutes, trying to scream. Tears running down my eyes, desperately trying to stay awake, but my body felt too heavy. Eventually, I woke crying and stopped. I felt a cold hand rest on my shoulder, and I finally got an hour of sleep. Peaceful sleep. His weirdly aggressive manner didn't change for a few months. He continued to slam doors angrily. The presence felt unpleasant. Displeased in a way, maybe. I sat on my bed watching a Marco Pilio video of him playing a horror game. There were footsteps on the video, but there were some that sounded off, so I paused it. Mind you, I was wearing noise-cancelling headphones. The footsteps continued. I was confused and unpaused the video, thinking I hadn't paused it. Paused it again, and I could still hear the footsteps. I slowly took the headphones off, loud and clear footsteps, coming towards my room, stopped at the doorway, and back down the hallway, then back towards my room. At first I thought a home intruder, so I looked for an item to defend myself, a pencil at the very least, to stab them if they tried to grab me. There was nothing, so I started crying, utterly horrified. I've never understood how people who hunt paranormal can just grab and record because I couldn't bring myself to grab my fucking stupid phone. I was so fucking scared I couldn't move. Just covered my mouth to stop myself from screaming. Eventually, I grew the courage to get off the bed and when I looked down the hallway, there was nothing there. Yet I heard the footsteps coming back and forth until my parents arrived home. Steve headed to the living room and left. I got better. Steve went back to normal stuff. 
He no longer was scaring me or trying to hurt me. He was just his old self, you could say. Knocking, doors, random pokes and just the usual. Though he still managed to give me more than a good enough of a fright. While cleaning the kitchen floor, I heard my own voice call out to me. Come over here. Come, come. Laugh and call me over again. I was home alone and immediately grabbed a knife, scared for my life. Then he started laughing like crazy and in silence. Eventually I looked down the hallway to my parents' room, but nothing. This was the fourth time Steve saved my life, and the one time my mum saw it with her own two eyes. We were at the train station, and I felt weird. I started to walk the edge of the station, the yellow line that leads over the edge to the rails. The train was coming. A few seconds from arrival, I put my foot over and felt my body starting to fall forward. I locked eyes with my mum, and she looked scared, unable to do anything. Then, two cold arms wrapped around my waist and pulled me back, right as the train passed by, pulling me out of danger. Mum was furious with me, but once we got off the train and reached the car, she started crying and saying I should be dead. I should have been gutted on the rails. She looked at me and said she saw something pull me out of the way. Saw me as I pulled back. She couldn't believe it. She said she didn't know whether it was a guardian angel, a ghost, God, some sort of entity wanting to protect me, but whatever it was, had saved my life. As we drove home, I asked her if she had ever seen a tall black figure, long fingers. She had turned to face me looking dead serious and asked me how on earth I knew about him. I told her that I'd seen him since I was a child. He's been with me forever. That's when I found out that Steve here, he'd been with us for years. When mum and dad had gotten together and bought a house in Chile, the house was built from zero and all. For some reason, they both saw Steve, the tall, black, shadowy figure. They'd seen him standing in their doorway when they'd go to sleep. Mum told me Steve loved my room. It was almost as if he knew Mum was going to have a baby and was waiting. My parents weren't the only ones who saw him. Our maid, who was my mum's friend, had seen him and screamed. She'd been so scared she never came back to clean the house again. My mum's mother saw it too. She got scared and called a priest to cleanse the house of the spirit, but it didn't work. When I was born, Steve stopped bothering my parents and stuck with me for some odd reason. As I told my mom about what I'd seen, Steve, and he was still here, she got scared and decided to start cleansing the house again. She told me she was going to shut every mirror since they're meant to be portals from the other side, she said. Now, things continue as usual. He just does what he always did, normal Steve things. Then... The fucker decides to really mess with my parents. I'm sitting inside cooking with mum while dad is outside. He sees me, asks him if he wants a glass of water and he says, I walk away but never came back. He comes in angrily and asks why I didn't give him the water. I stared and said I haven't left my seat. He got angry and shouted at me until mum yelled that I wasn't lying. He went pale and said he had seen an exact copy of me go outside and asked him if he wanted water. Mum had the same experience when she saw me standing in her room and asked her something, yet I was in the living room and I hadn't moved from my location. Another, my dad saw me standing by the large fence staring at it. He didn't interact though. He said I looked off, so he kept his distance and ignored me, and that I was gone. Basically, Steve being a little shit. We went back to Chile to visit my parents' family. I was always alone laying in bed since I was despised by my parents' families. The thing was, my cousin saw me standing there on multiple occasions staring at them hatefully. But whenever they tried to approach, I'd walk away behind something and disappear. They yelled at me thinking I was playing pranks on them even though I wasn't. They blamed me for the strange occurrences since the only time they happened was when I was around. When at one of my aunt's houses, there was a small house shed built on her mother's property, like a three minute walk away. I was with my cousin watching TV, when all of a sudden there was a loud obsessive scratching and growling on the floorboard that became louder, more desperate and angry. 
My cousin got scared and grabbed my wrist tightly, yanking me off the bed. He shouted for his mom, who came running and stared at the exact same spot as I. She grabbed her rifle and lights and ran outside with us and tot, but there was nothing under the house. She turned and glared at me, yelled I bought nothing but trouble, and weird shit only happens when I'm around. I got sad and walked back to the other house. I could hear footsteps behind me. When I stopped, they took a second longer to stop. I continued and thanked Steve for staying with me. Mum's mother spotted me when I was alone and glared at me. Said I was cursed, I was evil. Something evil followed me. Something with malicious intent. I'll be honest with you. I'd wanted to talk gibberish to make her think I was possessed or some shit. You know, scare the living fuck out of the people who were making my life a living hell. I still didn't really believe in paranormal, yet I did, partly due to Steve. I sat outside later that night, crying, wanting to go home to Australia. I felt Steve sit beside me, and I smiled and thanked him for keeping me company. Seconds before my mom opened the door, he vanished. We came to Australia. Finally, I was home. A few months passed, and my dad's mother passed away. On the day of her funeral, I was inside the room with my parents, watching a live feed of the funeral. When I turned around to look at the foggy glass door of the sturdy room, right there against the glass was Steve's face, eyes boring into me. He pulled away once he realised I noticed him. I went out of the room eventually, but he wasn't there anymore. There was a thunderstorm, a really bad one a couple of months later, I believe. I was laying in bed, still awake, messing on my device when I heard the door slide open. I recognised the noise as the fly door and swore. The wind probably opened it, so that meant I needed to go lock it before I could potentially break from slamming open and shut. But then, the slider window door opened up. I heard the clicks and then it was closed. I froze in horror, then heard a masculine voice I recognised as Steve's. Hello? Hello? I didn't respond at first. Eventually I called back, Steve? But there was no reply, so I hid under the blankets. That's when I heard footsteps coming towards my room. They stopped right outside it. Then there was one, two, and I thought it was mum. Three. I sighed and took my blankets off, only to come face to face with a huge fucking black figure standing over the edge of my bed. Two green bleeding eyes staring at me, and then he ran. He ran right out of my room, and I just sat there in shock. Time passed on as usual. Then, this bullshit happens. So I'd been pissed off and shouted at Steve to give me proof he was real. To show me. At least let me record one thing that would prove he was real. A few days later, 1am or some shit in the morning, the curtains in the living room started banging against the glass. And I get scared as fuck since there's a huge windstorm outside. Of course, first thing I assume is that a window is open, yet my common sense tells me the curtains would have been banging from earlier. And also the fact that we had turned on the heater and we had closed all windows. The grills for the air conditioner were all shut, so no air could have come through those either. I was scared. My cat was in my lap, so I knew it wasn't him. I heard my parents in their room, so it wasn't them. The sound continued and it stopped out of nowhere. Loud footsteps that towards my room and stopped at my doorway. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. I saw nothing, but could feel eyes on me. A bit passed and he walked away. I heard his footsteps all the way back to the curtains and they started a banging again. Like fucking hell, that. That kind of shit is scary and incredible. I couldn't believe it. Steve just came in. Came to see if I was recording and went back to make sure I got a fucking recording. Like, damn, man. I showed the recording to my mum, which was a really shitty audio recording. And when she heard the curtains banging, she went pale. So did my dad. She cleansed the house again and asked me to stop interacting with Steve. Small random things that have happened are him patting me on the head when I was walking down the hallway after watching a horror movie. I was scared and he soothed my worries. Another, he adjusted my glasses since they were shonky. It was random but sweet. 
He threw a piece of paper across the table when I had wanted it, and he neatly put all my sparkles into an envelope folded paper, which I don't fucking know how he did that without me seeing. Once I hadn't wanted to shower, then the tap opened and closed. The bathroom door opened and closed. I glared at him and told him to fuck off, since he didn't have anything to clean, so he can show off. It's funny, because I'm not even scared anymore. It's more entertaining, and I just want to figure out what's going on. Since I never believed in the paranormal, until this asshole decided to drive me mental. Trigger warning for anyone easily disturbed by mentions of suicidal tendencies. From some stuff that's happened recently, I think that it's confirmed. Steve is responsive, yet hasn't spoken. He knocked stuff off my shelf while I was venting. I felt his presence right before I slept, and weirdly enough, it was the first time in months I had a few hours sleep with no nightmares. He's a soothing presence, and I only feel lonely or scared. And he tends to make noises in an attempt to tell me I'm not alone, I'm guessing. On the other hand, I started to notice the difference with the other presence. It's much, much colder. It feels eerie. My room can suddenly feel like a fridge out of the blue. When I'm near a mirror, I feel it close by. Something always seems off about my reflection. I guess one of them is attached to me due to my depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies and all negative things. Or Steve just wants to help for unknown reasons. I wasn't going to mention this originally, but I decided to try my luck and put a knife against my stomach to see if it would pierce. No, I wasn't intending on hurting myself. Well, I was, but that aside. I usually have my mind filled with whispers of encouragement to hurt myself, but at that moment, I felt as if someone else was holding my hand that had the knife and put it down. My mind hasn't been filled with whispers for once. Just a voice without sound and saying they needed me just as my mum walked into my room. I sometimes wonder if Steve is a guardian or someone who killed themselves and is trying to save me some, for some reason. I've been wanting to ask them. For context, I moved out from my parents' home about a year ago and will sometimes come back for a day or two, but this week... I decided to spend a week at their home. I remember as a kid always being frightened by something I couldn't explain in the house. And my brother had oftentimes seen full body apparitions, voices and noises all throughout the house ever since he grew up. It pretty much died down, especially after we had our house blessed by our parish priest. I personally have not experienced anything in the house since my early teens. Today, however, when I was taking a shower in one of the bathrooms, the door somehow opened. At first I chalked it up to my two dogs, who both can be clingy, and follow me around the house. When the door opened, I was half naked, and peered around the empty house and saw my dogs were not there. I have a husky puppy that I keep in my old bedroom while I'm away, so he doesn't make a mess around the entire house. I called for both of them and started hearing frantic barking from my bedroom, so I ran over and they calmed down when I opened the bedroom door. I didn't think anything of it, but I went back to the bathroom and closed the door. I started undressing again when the bathroom door opened. At this point I thought something was wrong, so I closed the door again and put my body against it, and to my complete horror, I felt something pushing back at the door. I felt it push about two or three times and then it stopped. My brother was outside doing yard work, so I called him from the bathroom to run into the house and see if there was anything outside of the bathroom. When I heard him come back in and in front of the bathroom, I exited, and we took a brief look around the house and found no one or anything. I had been used to seeing or hearing things, but I've never had an encounter with something paranormal that could be physical. A little backstory. I'm from Northern California. All my life, I wanted to be a cop. After the army, I got hired as a sheriff's deputy in the Sacramento area in late 2011. Worked patrol and was also on the CSI team as collateral assignment. 
So I would work a normal 12 hour patrol shift answering calls and doing standard cop stuff and then go to CSI calls for serious stuff. By early 2017, I was badly burned out and found a new purpose in life and quit. This story occurred at the end of 2016. I'm not religious at all, but I am spiritual. The house I grew up in as a kid was haunted by something serious, and I've experienced my fair share of serious paranormal events as a kid, but nothing since about the age of 15. I was about 33 when this occurred. In late 2016, I was working a day shift patrol in a smaller town in our county. I got sent to a Safeway grocery store to report a domestic violence, which was occurring in the store. Being a deputy, I'm alone and have no partner, but I have backup that's coming, but it's like 20 minutes away. It's reported that a younger Hispanic male is slapping around a younger Hispanic female. It's over now and they're checking out and not fighting anymore. I show up and enter the store and immediately recognize these people. They're Norteno gang members. You see them now and again in the area, but it's semi-rural and these people mostly lurk in Sacramento and don't really come to the area much. I won't go into the whole thing, but I could just tell by how they were dressed and talking and appeared. Dude had some teardrop tattoo on his face and some crap tattoo on his neck. I knew what I was dealing with. They're compliant and say nothing happened and agree to come outside to talk. I pat them down, separate them and handcuff them. Sit them down a good distance apart from each other and start interviewing one half of the party to figure out what occurred and if anybody needs to go to jail. They're both sitting on the curb out the front of the store with their legs kicked out facing the parking lot. My back is to the parking lot and I'm facing the store. It's about one o'clock in the middle of a weekday in a strip mall. There are dozens of people shopping and going about the business. As I'm talking to one of them, getting their half of the story and taking notes, it's clear as day I hear the most beautiful female voice I've heard in my life. It sounded smooth and almost like really, really good computer AI. Like that customer service phone supports AI that you can't tell is human or not, but it's just a little too perfect to be human. The voice spoke inside my head. This was not my gut feeling, in a monologue, sixth sense, training, whatever you want to call it. It was an outside voice that was not mine or from my thoughts and it was beamed inside my head. All it said was, turn around. At the same time, it took to say turn around. Simultaneously, I saw my entire life flash in front of my eyes and then saw a Hispanic man in his 30s wearing blue jeans, Adidas shoes, and a red plaid long sleeve lumberjack slash gang member shirt walk up behind me and shoot me in the back of the head in the parking lot. It's like a 33 year long movie of my entire life just played out in half a second in my head. So when a disembodied voice tells you something, you do it. So I turned around and the exact person I saw in my vision of me dying, wearing the exact same clothes, with the exact same scars in the backdrop behind him as were in the vision, is walking up behind me and is about 15 feet from me. Exact person, like the guy from my vision, is now standing behind me. I confront him without pulling out my gun and immediately can tell this dude is legit and is up to no good and is trying to purposely sleep foot behind me. I'm professional but firm, trying to address the situation and process what just occurred at the same time. I don't have time to deal with this guy and the two detained persons. The short of it, it's the two detained people who were his friends, and he wanted to come see what was happening, as he was concerned for their well-being. He gets told to basically fuck off, or he's going to go to jail, and he agrees that's a good idea, and walks away back into the parking lot, and disappears from view amongst the cars. He walks away easily 100 meters, and appears to be gone. I go back to interviewing one half of this domestic, and about a minute later, the same thing occurs at the first time. Voice, vision, gang members, etc. Exactly the same thing. I turn around again and pull out my gun. I regret to this day not pointing it at him and pronering him out of the ground. I'd love to know if he actually had a gun, but I suspect he did based on how he was walking, holding up his pants at the belt buckle and moving behind me. I ask for my cover officer to expedite with lights and sirens, and the second this guy hears the sirens, he quickly walks into the store and disappears. 
Don't ask me why I didn't do what I knew was right. And as I was trained to do, points a gun at him and entertain him. I just didn't. All I could think of is I just want this asshole away from my presence. I don't want to search for him, get near him, talk to him or deal with anything about him. All I want at this moment is for him to not exist and to be gone. He had a horrible energy to him, like an almost evil energy to him. I've only ever felt that type of energy coming from another person a few times in my life. People that have experienced this might know what I mean. That's it. Partner shows up, we deal with the couple, male half goes to jail for beating on his girl and she goes about her business. I go into the store with my partner to look for the gun guy and we never find him. He must have gone out the other entrance. Didn't mention it to anyone for years and definitely not any other cops as they would have taken me off the streets. Can't prove it occurred other than my word. One of the single craziest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I recently moved to a new house. Immediately, the house just doesn't feel right. Maybe it's because this is my first time moving, but still, it was just wrong. Two weeks and everything was fine, except I kept having these dreams of a child and dark figures. That's when it started. I woke up from the nightmare and I heard this tapping on my window. It sounded like a thumb just tapping the window, and I had this sense of pure dread. The tapping was also in rhythm. It went three taps, then two taps, then again two taps, and then one. And it continued like that until sunrise. I've never felt whatever it was that night, and that was the first and last time that happened. But this next one was the one that got me to write this. So I'm cleaning the house all day. I watch a good bit of TV shows, and suddenly out of nowhere it hits me. This dread. And I don't know why, but I'm on edge. I go to my room, and I check if anybody's there, because I was hearing sounds. Nothing. Before I leave, I turn the lights off in my room. And there, this being, or humanoid, but darker than dark. It was endless dark, and I was standing in a pitch black room, yet I saw it clearly. I immediately close the door and leave the house for the drink. So my friends and I were all hanging out. There were five of us at first, and later on, only four. And due to a power outage, we resorted to playing board games and such with candles lit and flashlights out. My sister suggested we try to summon ghosts and shit like that as a joke, or just to have some fun and occupy the time. We all decided to go along with it for the time being, and started by joining hands and inviting spirits to join us, or whatever we had read online on how to summon things. We did this multiple times in two separate rooms, and it had started with us hearing noises that could have very well been cracks or knocks from the house being old. But I started being convinced that it wasn't a coincidence we would hear noise whenever asking for sounds and only then. We weren't getting much, so we all just started hanging out and talking in my family room like normal. After a while of just hanging out and talking, everyone in the room froze as my bathroom door at the end of the hallway slammed shut. Everyone was quiet, and I started getting excited as we actually had proof of something. So now everyone in the room was on board that something was with us, and it was pretty undeniable by this point. Our fifth friend ended up leaving after this, so it was only the four of us left. We came to the conclusion a majority of activity was coming from around the hallway, so we all decided to move into the hallway and try to communicate with whatever was there. We sat down and asked for signs. Our friend said he heard noises from the kitchen, but the rest of us didn't hear anything, so I asked for more signs. Then clear as day, all of us heard a noise like a sigh, and everyone freaked out as they heard it. My sister actually managed to get an audio recording of the noise. Everyone had to calm down, and as we calmed down, I decided to leave the house. As I'm writing this, we haven't been back. We had recently moved into a big house in a small village near the city. The house had two floors and the rooms were downstairs and the living area upstairs. At the living room, we had this 10 meter long balcony door that you could see all the way to the city 
as we were the first house of the village. So one night around 7 p.m., I was sitting with my mum watching TV on the couch. My father was taking my two sisters to gymnastics practice. I liked to watch the cars leaving towards the city and disappearing into the distance, so that's what I did with my father's car. After a while, I turned again towards the TV. A few minutes passed by and I clearly heard my little sister giggling loudly from downstairs. I was horrified as I just saw my sisters getting in the car and leaving with my father. However, the TV was loud and I reassured myself that it was probably a sound from the TV. Then, I saw my mum standing up and reaching for the TV remote and she asked me if I heard my sister giggling. I told her that I did and together we went toward the stairs. Then my mum called my sister twice with no reply. We stood there for 10 seconds and everything was quiet. All of a sudden, we both hear my father screaming, Hey! My mum ran in the kitchen and called my father and asked him where they were. He replied that they just arrived in the city. Then my mum grabbed a golf club and together we went downstairs as we thought it was probably a robber taunting us. We searched every inch of the house inside wardrobes and under beds. No one was there. This happened in the middle of the winter and all the windows were closed, so this wasn't someone from outside. I work as a karate instructor. The school I teach at is set up with the main entrance in the front, leading directly onto the main floor, and then behind the main floor, a bathroom to the left and a private instruction room to the right. The private instruction room has a large viewing window facing the main floor and a single steel door as its entrance. I'd say it's about a 10 by 5 space. It's important to note that there are no air vents or exterior doors or windows in that room only some crash pads and wrestling mats on the floor inside it. One day, while sweeping the main floor before class, my boss came in to drop off some equipment we had ordered. He decided to leave the equipment in the private instruction room so that it wouldn't be in the way. After he had dropped off the equipment, he left the door to the private instruction room standing completely open, resting on the doorstop. I knew this to be a fact because I could see it through the viewing window built into the room. My boss crossed the main floor and exited through the front door, closing and locking it behind him. After my boss left, I turned to sweeping the main floor. No more than a minute later, I heard the door to the private instruction room slam shut. Now I don't mean that it swung closed quietly, or that the AC turned on and caused a change in the air pressure that made it swing almost shut, or that the door was hung crooked so it swung closed by gravity. This perfectly stationary all steel door slammed shut, as if someone or something was pissed as hell and found the first thing it could slam. My eyes snapped towards the room, and I walked towards it to see if someone was in there. I found no one. I reopened the door and left it to see if it would close again. It never budged. I tried opening and closing the front door, nothing. I tried turning on the AC, and again, nothing. I have two cats, a fat grey one, B, and a long orange one, L. I'm putting that out there first because I feel it's important to specify they look nothing alike, and there's no mistaking one for the other, not to mention their personalities because they're polar opposites. Anyway, this is mostly about B, and it's happened twice now. The first time, I was alone. My daughter was at school and my partner was at work, so it was just me and the kitties. I was tidying up the living room in front of the couch and I distinctly saw B crawl under the couch. There was no mistake in it. I've seen him do it a hundred times before because he loves it under the couch. I saw his hind legs and his tail disappear under there and the couch skirt lap down behind him. But then I looked up, seconds later, and saw him across the room, asleep on the dining table. I stopped in my tracks. I convinced myself maybe I had mistaken the colour somehow despite grey and bright orange being two completely different colours. I went into the kitchen to throw away the trash I had just gathered and Elle was in there eating food. I would have seen him leave the living room if that had somehow been him under the couch. 
he would have had to walk right past me. I chalked it up at the time to being a visual hallucination as a result of a manic episode. Even though I'm far worse mania and I've never experienced visual hallucinations before, but I tried to get over it. But that wasn't the end of it because yesterday, about a week after the first incident, the same exact thing happened to my partner and daughter. They both saw it. They were in the bathroom getting our child ready for bed while I was in the kitchen feeding the cats their supper. When I had walked from the bathroom into the kitchen, I chased Ellen there playing with him and Bay was sitting in the kitchen doorway cleaning himself. I remember this because he jumped when I ran past chasing El, and it was funny. But he went straight to his bowl with El and waited to be fed. I fed with both of them, sitting right there staring, and they both started eating right away. They were both at their bowls when I left the kitchen. So both of them were in my sight the entire time. My partner and daughter say this happened. As they're brushing their teeth, they both saw B bolt across the living room and crawl under the couch. My daughter even reenacted it for me. She's four. What reason would she have to make it up? This really freaked me out. I don't trust myself, but both of them saw this. And they didn't say it to try and scare me. They didn't even realize B was in the kitchen. They thought he took off chasing a bug or something and thought it was funny. My partner even checked under the couch for me, and of course, nothing was there, but I was so freaked out. I don't know what to think. I was walking through my lounge, my boyfriend in the kitchen next door, when I heard a click directly next to my ear. Like someone sharply snapped their fingers. I checked around and couldn't find a source of the sound. Boyfriend heard the click, but faintly since he was in the other room, which at least tells me I wasn't hearing things. Second instance, was in the lounge again and sat on the sofa. I was taken off my cardigan, when I suddenly felt my scrunchie on one of my Dutch braids disappear, like the weight of it suddenly went missing if that makes sense. While I was holding the ends of the plait to make sure it didn't unravel, and I was searching the sofa and surrounding area, but couldn't find the scrunchie anywhere. Decided to go into the bedroom to get another scrunchie. And when I got about halfway across the room, I felt something lightly drop onto my head from a short distance. It then fell to my feet on the floor. I looked down and it was the scrunchie. This really kind of freaked me out to be honest and I wasn't sure how to react. So I just picked it up and said thank you out loud and immediately hightailed it out of the room. I'm not sure about the energy. Like I don't know if I was so freaked and weirded out by and during the experience that that tainted the energy of the being. But I didn't feel in danger, but I also felt unnerved by its presence. My house, where I've always lived and still do, is built on the site of an old deep pit. In 1874, the pit collapsed and killed a hundred boys and men. My house is around a hundred years old, I think. Anyway, weird things happen here, and it's not just my family who have noticed it. The sighting started when my sister was young, around nine or ten. She was woken by the feeling of being stared at. When she opened her eyes, she was greeted by the clear face of an old woman. As you can imagine, she jumped out of bed and cried at my mum's door. I've heard both accounts of this story, and she still swears by it to this day. When she was older, I want to say around late teens or early 20s, she was in the kitchen with her then boyfriend cooking food. A white apparition swiftly shot past them as if it was walking down the hallway. Both her and her boyfriend looked at each other in disbelief and asked each other, did you see that? My sister isn't my only sibling. I'm the youngest of three. I also have a brother who's slightly younger than my sister. They used to have the house full of people drinking and partying on weekends. This is where it gets interesting. On several occasions, friend would ask, who's the old woman? Or say things like, I swear I saw an old woman. One occasion in particular was a close family friend of ours who randomly mentioned one day that he'd been sitting in our living room during one of the parties and saw an old woman sitting at the end of our old corner sofa. At the time he was drunk, confused, and probably a bit scared, so didn't really act on it. However, mentioned it a couple of days later during a conversation. 
Now this is where I come into it. When I was a kid, I had one of those old type TVs that give off a fishbowl vibe. I woke up in the middle of the night randomly, but what I saw wasn't an old woman. I opened my eyes and in front of me was my fishbowl like TV and the reflection was a girl. The girl was not me. She was sitting upright just staring back at me. I was lying down in bed. We still have weird things that happen around the house. It's only me and my mum here now, but things like Alexa randomly playing the radio at 3am. Things going missing, random bangs, cold drafts and light bulbs dying quickly. I often feel someone watching me when I'm in bed, but I convince myself it's paranoia and ignore it. There's sometimes a bad smell that cannot be explained around the house. When my mum first moved in almost 30 years ago, the neighbour asked her if she could smell it. We have no idea what it is. We lost my mom unexpectedly in July. We're all dealing with it in our own way, but she was the person who held us together. I don't normally live with my family, but a few months ago, I became homeless. Until about mid-August, I wasn't staying in the family home, but right now I am temporarily. I don't like being here because I don't feel close with my other family members, and one of them, my niece, has brought her boyfriend here to live. Even though in no way is this the house, he makes me feel uncomfortable and unwelcome, so I'll be leaving here as soon as I can make other arrangements. The weirdness started about three days ago. We have one of those heavy duty metal screen doors with a deadbolt lock. It's been very hot here and the house doesn't have working AC. I'm sleeping in the living room near this door. I like to keep the inner door open at night for the cool air. I've started to hear what sounds like somebody fiddling with a key in the deadbolt, which is always kept locked. We have a few cats and dogs, but when I'm hearing it, none of them have been near the door. It's only been happening at night when everyone else is asleep or before noon when I'm alone. I've gotten up multiple times to see if someone was out there and there never was anyone. I didn't put too much thought into it and tonight the door inside of the screen door is closed. Earlier, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw movement between myself and the kitchen. This would be the path someone would take when walking to or from the door where I've been hearing the noises. I ignored what I thought I saw until about an hour ago. I was looking in that direction and there were no lights on. There is some light coming through the window, but it doesn't reflect in the direction of what I saw next. A shadow moved from left to right, darker than the dark. I'm currently the only one awake. Nobody but me was in the room except for a couple of the cats. There's never been any activity in this house, even though a couple of other people have died while they lived here. But now all of a sudden, right after my mom passed away, I'm seeing shadows and hearing noises. It isn't scaring me or giving off a threatening vibe. In my 30 years of existence, I've seen some pretty weird stuff. Some things I think if I was smarter, I could figure out with logic, but other things I just can't explain without bringing in the paranormal. One of the weirdest experiences I've ever had was when I was 19 years old. I'm from Deming, New Mexico, born and raised. And being from New Mexico, there's no shortage of folklore and ghost stories. There's a lot of places around the town and surrounding places with some dark history. And one of those places is the old Silver City Highway. Since I was a kid, I've heard stories about crazy shit that's gone on that highway from people seeing witches, strange lights by the road and by the mountains, and even a man with wings walking along the road by a more remote spot by the highway. The highway has seen its share of car accidents and death, but all highways have their fair share of tragedy. But still, even with everything, I've heard about the highway. I'd never seen anything the times I went to Silver. So after high school, I got a job with Coca-Cola as a merchandiser. I was training with two guys. One guy did the in-town stores and the other went to Silver City and the Bayard area in New Mexico. For out of town, we had to leave a lot earlier than everybody else. Pretty much had to be on the road by three to get to Silver City Walmart first. Weekend guy was Alfredo. I was still pretty new, so we're still in that kind of awkward but cool stage of working together. It was a Saturday before the Deming Duck races. We both showed up at the plant around 2.45. We take a company car, stop at a gas station and snacks, 
and we're off. So we're driving on the highway about 20 minutes in, and it takes about an hour to get to the Silver City Walmart from Deming. It's still early, so talk was minimal, mostly just listening to the radio. I can't remember what it was about, but we did start getting into conversation about something. While we're chatting, we both see we're coming up to what we thought was a motorcycle ahead of us. To be honest, I couldn't remember if I saw anyone in front of us when we left, but it was early morning, so cars on the highway are minimal. Again, we're just talking about whatever, just staring straight ahead. The lights are a good 30 feet from us, keeping a steady speed. All of a sudden, the light starts to slow down slowly. I just remember thinking like, why is this guy stopping in the middle of the road? Alfredo was driving, so he started to slow down, and he's now getting pretty close to the light. We almost came to a full stop when we saw it. It was a red light, like the backlight of a dirt bike, but that's all we could see. Everything else was just blacked out. And in a split second, the light in the road shot off into the field on the side of the highway. What made it so creepy was how subtle it was. It didn't make a noise when it shot off. The best way to describe it was like someone moved a laser pointer on a wall real fast. The light when it shot off also turned white and disappeared into a green-like speck. We didn't say anything to each other when it happened. I think we were both trying to process what we just saw. After what seemed like forever, Alfredo says, Did you see that shit? I could tell in his voice he was hoping it wasn't crazy, and I saw it too. Yeah, what was that? I responded. I wish I could say we spent the whole ride talking about what we just saw, but we didn't. For the most part, it was awkward and silent the ride there for the majority of the day. Whatever it was, it affected us in a weird way. I could tell Alfredo was still trying to process what he saw. He had this dumbfounded look on his face all day. I didn't really feel like talking that whole day, just wanted to know what the fuck I saw. We finished all of our routes by three and were back home by four. The next week, I was moved to a warehouse, so I never went back on route with Alfredo. But I never told anyone at the plant what I saw, and I don't think he ever did either, besides maybe friends and family. My girlfriend at the time thought maybe we're just still groggy from early morning. My mom actually believed me though, telling me she's seen weird things as well when she would drive to Silver to take night classes at the college. So after recently visiting my family in New Mexico, I wanted to share this story. What reminded me of these events were actually from a country drive I took with my brother. It was near sundown, so we decided to just take a drive out to listen to some music and enjoy some scenery. Heading back from our drive, my brother took a back road that would lead us on a main road back to our house. And when he got on it, I immediately got shivers and remembered this road. We were on Hermanus Road. A really sketchy dirt road that loved to bust tyres, shake your vehicle uncontrollably while driving, and was about two football fields long. But most of all, this road was fucking creepy at night. Luckily, there was just enough light left when we crossed it, and headed back onto the paved road back to our house. So when I was a senior in high school, I started dating this girl who lived out in the country with her family. Once you crossed Hermanas and hit the stop sign, you'd take a right and there were a few trailers and houses that resided around the area. On the road itself, only a few houses, some were ranches. So I'd drive her home from my place at night, and at first, I never saw anything. But make no mistake, at night, the road was its own thing. The road would be dark, I mean pitch black. The road had trenches on the side, guess to keep the rain from flooding the road. But if you weren't paying attention out there in the dark, you could go over. You really had to watch yourself when crossing it just from all the elements on it already. But from the beginning of my senior year to graduation, I was taking my girl home and driving the room at night and never saw anything. Then about a month after graduation, I was taking my girl home during the day when we saw a giant gust of dirt in the mesquites on the side of Hermanus. As we got closer, we realized it was a car that had flipped into the bush. We got out and went to the scene A guy about my age at the time was sitting near his flipped car and bleeding from his hand. We asked him if he was okay and immediately called an ambulance. 
He really wasn't hurt too bad besides cracking his knuckle, but he was definitely in shock. We gave him a towel and asked him what had happened. All that he would really say is that somehow he lost control of his car. When AMS got there, we headed out. Not too long after that, maybe a few weeks, I had three experiences driving home from my girlfriend's house that prevented me from ever driving down that road again. This happened when I was 19. I'm 33 now. So I can't remember exactly how it all took place, but I do remember it was in a matter of two months. One night, while I was driving to my girlfriend's house, I came across a dead dog lying near the road. I remember it was a pit bull, a big one. From my headlights it looked brown, but it laid there sprawled out like someone had moved its limbs to make the figure more dramatic. Well, it sure as shit worked on me. The look of it was unnerving. I told my girl about it when I got there, and we thought maybe a neighbor's dog had gotten hit, and someone tried to move it. When I left and drove by the spot I had seen the dog, it was gone. One night, I decided to stay the night at my girl's house. It was late, maybe around one. I'm driving down the road when all of a sudden, I see someone on the side of the road frantically waving their arms, trying to get me to stop. I remember it really startled me, so as I got closer to where they were waving, I started to pull over to see what was going on. Then, I saw the figure drop its arms and kind of just look at me very strangely, and it moved back. And when it moved back, it was gone. To this day, all the best way I can describe it is like the scene in 1408 when John Cusack is waving to that shadow figure across the building next to him. On what would be my final time on this road till now was one night while coming home from the girls I had just turned onto the road when my 2000 Nissan Frontier started to shake uncontrollably. I thought, okay, maybe the dirt waves on the road are bad on this side, so stay on the other till it's over. Same thing shaking the shit out of my truck. I'm driving at normal speed, going over the bumps, when all of a sudden, my truck starts to want to lose control. I remember vividly, my truck was getting pushed near the side of the road. I was holding onto the steering wheel, trying to straighten it out, and hitting the brake, because for some reason, the truck had excelled. The truck finally came to a stop, as my front end hit a few mesquite bushes. I shook up after that. It was such a weird experience because it really felt like someone grabbed my truck and was trying to push it off the road and I was resisting it. I backed up and hauled some major ass out of there. I was so scared I threw caution to the wind in my escape. After that night I never went on that road again. I told my girlfriend and some of my family what happened. I also assumed no one would believe me so I never pressed too hard on it and I didn't want them to make me want to take them there. Until she came and moved with me into town, I took another way to my girlfriend's house. From then on, I'd come from the opposite side of where the houses were, from a paved main country road. The creepiest thing to this day is the first encounter I had on the road it was with that kid who flipped his car. I remember him saying I don't know how I lost control of the car. And my last encounter on that road was some kind of entity trying to throw me off the damn road. So I wonder if maybe he got thrown off the road. My wife, myself and my daughter live in our two bedroom home. My wife has lived in the property a year before I moved in and has never come across any paranormal activities until I moved in. There have been three incidents of a shadowy silhouette in our bedroom in the dark. My wife thought it was me leaning across our bed at night, but I fell asleep downstairs. I thought my wife was peeking through the doorway pulling faces at me while I said, Stop being silly and come to bed, you donut. My wife was in the bathroom brushing her teeth. We both saw a silhouette peeking through the doorway. There have been several incidents of things being knocked over, which shouldn't have fallen over, The things were firmly placed down. One time, my daughter was pushed off the toilet, and another time, I woke up with scratches on my back. My wife is very into this kind of thing, but is concerned. She's burnt sage in the house and has had her very religious grandmother bless the house with holy water. We're still having incidents. My wife is generally scared and wants to move house immediately. If it helps, 
This house was built in 1901 and was part of a mining community. Any tips or pointers as to what to do would be great. It's about my life, and it's really bothering me sometimes. Basically, for context, I live near two graveyards. They're usually old, and contain very old and rigid gravestones, and I explored the graveyards before, when I was younger. Now, I'm older, and I experience weird stuff. For example, I usually see some white smoke in the corner of my eye, and shrug it off, but it happened multiple times. Like some wind flew by, or someone was passing by. They were small instances of smoke, and I couldn't really explain them as I'm not a smoker, and there wasn't any smoke in the house. I usually laugh it off and say something under the lines of, oh, spooky ghost, haha, <laughs> or something really silly. It looked small, and like someone was heading towards a direction. And sometimes, often I feel unsafe in my room. When I'm alone in my room, going on my phone or doing something, I sometimes get nervous and panicked as if the room is packed with entities. I felt like I was being watched. Like imagine a whole room filled with people just staring at you. That's how it felt. No one was there. And I felt the need to get out immediately. And I slept on my couch all night. The feeling was dreadful. As if I was kicked out by someone that wasn't even there. All of my instincts just told me to get out ASAP. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I've told some of my friends and every time I say it out loud, it just makes less and less sense to me. While it's not particularly horrifying, it was certainly something else. Tell me what you think of this. To start, my name is Adam. A good buddy of mine, Bailey, invited me to go to this Christian camp. Now, I'm not very religious, but I like camping and I like him and his family, so I said I'd go. It was a beautiful place, but way different than what I was expecting. Usually when you camp, you kind of keep to yourselves and set up a tent on the ground somewhere. However here, it was like a whole community of people with trailers, tents, cabins, etc. There were daily activities and events. Everyone knew each other. It was like a family reunion where I didn't know anyone. Very different from how I normally camp, but I will say, I had a great time and felt very welcomed. I met lots of people made a few pals, and learned a little more about Christianity. Anyway, two of the people I met were named Emily and Mike. They were a few years older, but that didn't really matter. Great people who love to party, and that's just dandy with me. I like to have some fun myself. I want to say it was like day four of my stay there, and it was around midnight. Everyone was going to bed, but the four of us stayed around the fire and had a few drinks. For those wondering, yes, Drinking was definitely against the camp rules, but whatever, we were having fun. Mike then asks us if we wanted to go for a bit of a walk. Feeling good and not yet tired, we all said sure and off we went. Mike and I were both barefoot because why not? It's nice to feel the earth under your feet and it didn't slow us down much, so we rolled with it for the stroll. We weren't just going to take a walk around the grounds though. We wanted to go across the road and take the trail for a little hike, so we did just that. Bailey and Emily led the way with the lantern, and Mike and I followed right behind, drinks in hand. After a couple stopped to chat and take a quick rest, we continued on our journey. We were probably about two kilometres away from the camp, when Mike and I suddenly realised Bailey and Emily had marched right on ahead, leaving the two of us behind. It didn't seem to make much sense though, because they were right in front of us the whole time. It was like they triple timed their walking. We didn't think anything of it. We also weren't too worried because Mike had basically grown up at this place. He's been going there for the last 30 years or so and knows the trails very well. We had some moonlight and it's not like our eyes didn't work. So we just decided to take our time, chill out and enjoy the beauty of the night. However, if anything did happen, my phone was dead and Mike didn't have his on him. So in hindsight, that was probably a mistake. We stopped for a few minutes so Mike could have a smoke, and we chatted about some deeper topics, or at least it felt deep. Mike and I were really bonding, and it seemed like we could have kept our conversation going for hours. But out of nowhere, 
we heard this sort of screaming sound, probably around 50 meters away. Now, we're in the woods of Canada. Lots of things make strange noises. We're trying to figure out what it could be. Mike said cougar, I said fox. It screamed again, and we still couldn't quite determine which one of the two, Eve either, it could be. So we hushed and waited for it to do it again. It took a couple of minutes, so naturally we got to talking again, but when it did scream, it wasn't quite the same as the first two. Something sounded a little off about it. The distance seemed to stay the same, so our concern didn't necessarily grow, but our curiosity most certainly did. Then we really stayed quiet so we didn't miss it or mishear it with our talking. It took less than a minute this time, and it was clear as day. In a weird, cougar fox-like scream, Adam! Mike and I just stood there for a second and looked at each other. Mike said to me, did it just say your name? I stayed quiet as I looked on into the woods. I say with certainty, it wasn't a human, so I knew it wasn't Emily or Bailey looking for us or anything. Plus, it was in the opposite direction of where we had to go and where they went. As I'm trying to process what I heard and making an attempt at rationalising it in my head, my thoughts are interrupted by another scream, just as clear as it was before. Adam! I turned to Mike and I said, Yep, that's definitely my name. The fuck is that? Mike had a little chuckle and said he didn't know. As I started to follow up with my worries, he shushed me and said to wait. He wanted to hear it again. I suppose I did too, but by this point, I just wanted to start heading back. I was getting increasingly uncomfortable. After the third time hearing this thing scream my name, I said to Mike, Okay, let's get out of here. I'm not sure I want to meet it. He complies, but starts talking about how he isn't worried because God is right here with him and stuff. Which is fine, but it brought me little comfort. We started making our way down the trail. We took a shortcut because if we took the trail, it would have been roughly another two kilometers back. So we barefoot bushwhacked until we ended up on the trail again. We reached the hill where the trail began, and I heard Bailey make a sort of caca sound. Mike and I returned with our own caca and began making our way down the hill. We had a laugh about how instead of calling our names, he's making crow noises at the base of the trail. When we got to the bottom, Bailey had informed us that we'd been missing for about an hour and a half, and that he and Emily, along with Mike's wife, were getting pretty worried. Mike and I were blown away. We could have sworn it was no more than a half hour or so. Maybe the time thing was just the drinks, but I swear on everything I care about that something was screaming my name, something Mike or I couldn't identify. We went back up the following night, just to the top of the hill, but we got nothing. No screams, hardly any noise at all, really, which in itself is uncomfortable for a forest. It was just an unnerving experience, and I'd be cool if it never happened again. Quick context. I came from a very superstitious culture and believe in black magic and curses and evil eyes and all that. I've heard so many stories, but this is the first time I've personally encountered anything remotely creepy or off. I was staying at my aunt's house. It was the last leg of a month long escapade and I was looking forward to staying with family and not bouncing from hotel room to hotel room. I was sharing a room with my sisters and all night, I felt like someone was in the room walking around. I'm not a great sleeper in general, so I thought it was me. The next day, everyone went out, and I decided to stay home and get some rest. I kept feeling like someone was watching me, and the air just felt really heavy and negative. Again, I chalked it up to the lack of sleep and travel. As the week went on, I couldn't be in the room alone. I was so scared of being in the room by myself, day or night. Suffice to say, I didn't get much rest. When we left, I asked my sisters and they said they felt creeped out too. My sister randomly called my aunt one day and mentioned it. Our aunt told us that someone had cast black magic on the family. So much so that my nephew would wake up screaming in the middle of the night like clockwork. We were on the first floor and he was on the second. But the house was big and wouldn't hear it. They eventually got the house cleansed and blessed and my nephew is okay now, but I still absolutely refuse to go back. 
Those were some evil vibes, like pure hatred. We never found out who did it. I work out in a very isolated stretch of the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State, and I've had an alarming amount of strange experiences while out there. The basic things that happen are humans screaming far away in the woods. It's a really dense rainforest with no trails. Hearing high-pitched voices say one or two words like thank you and again. Sometimes I'm all alone, and sometimes my boyfriend will be here and hear them too. There is a really upsetting presence that sometimes appears to be a tall shadow that crouches and peeks out from behind things in the dumpster area. And all but a couple of my co-workers have had unpleasant experiences while taking the recycling out. Another friend saw a face gliding by her window like it was on a skateboard looking straight in. Until recently, it's been mainly ghost happenings around here. But in the past week, we've had some things happen with strange lights. The first thing that happened was my boyfriend and I walking up to our bedroom, being flooded with an intense bright light. We just stared at each other while it was happening for a good 20 seconds. And then the light just flicked off and the room went back to pitch blackness. Our room backs up to a dense forest and we promptly looked outside to make sure nobody was there as soon as the light flicked off. Nothing but pitch blackness and no movement. Two nights ago, a co-worker of ours was returning home late at night, and when he got out of his car, he saw an orange ball hovering over one of the housing units. It did a couple of loops, and popped out of sight at about the same time as he started feeling scared. Situated in Tonopa, Nevada, the Mizpah Hotel is one of the historic hotels in the US. The Mizpah and the close by Belvada building shared the record of the tallest construction in Nevada till 1927. The resort became named after the Mizpah mine. The hotel became a hotspot of celebrities and rich investors for the duration of the silver boom in Tonopa, and it turned into one of the first luxury hotels in the state. This hotel now stands as a haunting blend of the new and old. Whilst the inn is one of the locality's oldest constructions, it became predated by the Mizpah Saloon, which was started in 1907. George Wingfield, Cal Brueger, George Nixon and Bob Govan, some of Nevada's most well-known financiers, financed the hotel George Holsworth was its designer. The hotel's financiers also owned other Tonopa firms. The resort's facade was made of stone, and the neighbouring Brewvergreen block acted as the first Mizpah Hotel. These buildings were joined with a wooden stairway, and they remained connected even now. It should also be noted that the hotel was the first one to have an elevator in Tonopa. The hotel was bought and sold quite a few times, in the course of the years, till Frank Scott of Las Vegas bought it in 1979. He renovated the structure and encompassed modern luxuries in it, without disturbing its original antiquity. The renovation was valued at $4 million and took almost three years to complete. The hotel was closed in 1999 and it remained shuttered until it was purchased by its new owner. In early 2011, Fred and Nancy Klein bought the hotel and renovated and reopened the construction in August 2011. Since then, the hotel hosts guests from all over Nevada, visiting the region. Ghost hunters trying to feel the eeriness of the clown motel to know Cemetery and the Mizpah Hotel itself. One of the well-known and dark memories to pop out of the Mizpah Hotel is that of a theft that went wrong. In line with the tale, two miners utilised the underground network of old mining shafts under the hotel to dig through its floor and empty its vault. Later, the bodies of the miners were observed inside the tunnel beneath the resort. However, the cash they robbed was gone. It seemed they were double-crossed by an unknown assailant who murdered them and took the loot. Some claim the miners remain inside the basements underneath the resort. Visitors have claimed to experience paranormal events all through the construction. This includes rooms, hallways, and even the elevator. 
They've claimed to sight apparitions, hear voices, and even sight objects shifting on their very own. It's stated that a couple of children haunt the third floor. This playful duo can frequently be heard playing and laughing inside the hallway. An unknown soldier lingers on the fourth floor, and it's said that he died within the hotel, and lamentably, no one knew his identity. Perhaps the most known phantom that the hotel hosts stays on the fifth floor, specifically within room 504, which is claimed to be the most haunted room of the hotel. A former prostitute who once lived in the hotel, she's referred to as the Red Lady. Unfortunately, she got killed outside room 504 in a brutal way, being strangled and stabbed several times by a jealous ex-lover. Many who stayed in this room during the night have seen the woman in her spirit form, heard her voice, smelt her perfume, witnessed objects shift on their own, and some have even woken up in the morning to discover pearls left by her on the mattress. Unlike other hauntings, the Mizbar Hotel shares its spotlight with the Tonopah Cemetery and Clown Motel. There's also an apparent curse that sits over Tonopah. It started with the Tonopah Belmont Mine Fire, in which 17 miners were burned to death and their bodies were buried in the Tonopah Cemetery. Visitors of the cemetery report seeing abnormal orbs and disembodied voices, but the nearby motel overshadows the cemetery in terms of paranormal activity. Named America's scariest motel, the Clown Motel has a lot of glassy-eyed circus clowns, and its owners swear that it's a safe location to spend the night. However, its visitors swear that it's haunted. In line with local legend, the clown statues act as containers for the miners' ghosts, who possess the dolls and make them come to life. Silhouettes have been seen walking from the cemetery to the motel, and disembodied voices have been heard announcing, We mind, and we died that day. In records, the Pueblo natives used to get dressed in clown-like dresses, while welcoming possessions of spirits. Possibly these clowns, with their identities ever converting, are portals into the spirit realm. Even the resort's proprietor says that he hears footsteps and knocking from vacant rooms of the motel. Apparitions of a person were stated leaving the cemetery and strolling across the belongings, even during the day. It's said that one of the preceding owners vanished when he tried to interact with the spirit. What's even more frightening is that the clowns have been seen leaving the cemetery at night and moving into the motel. The hotel stays open for public visits and offers overnight stays which can be booked from the hotel's website itself. I would surely recommend visiting the hotel once, not just for its haunted status, but also for its haunted locality, which is supposedly cursed. In 1840, Sarah Lockwood Pardee was born to wealthy carriage manufacturer Leonard Pardee and his wife Sarah Burns in New Haven, Connecticut. Sarah was left yearning for nothing, enjoying the best education in the nation. She spoke four languages, performed on the piano fantastically, and shortly became called the Belle of New Haven. Her charmed life seemed to move strongly whilst in 1862, she married the affluent gun tycoon William Wirt Winchester. He was the son of Oliver Fisher Winchester, well known as the Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut. Their life collectively became like a fairy tale, filled with romance, opulence, and dinners with New England's elite. To mess up their happy life, in 1866, their infant daughter Annie tragically died of marasmus. The couple were devastated, and Mrs. Winchester unexpectedly fell right into a deep depression that she didn't recover from. In March of 1881, 15 years later, tragedy struck again while her husband died of tuberculosis. With her family meeting their demise in a short span, Mrs. Winchester's grief led her into the palms of a spiritualist. Consistent with tabloid newspapers at the time, Mrs. Winchester consulted a Boston medium who supposedly channeled her dead husband and told her that her family and fortune had been haunted by the spirits of American Indians, Civil War soldiers, and everyone who had been killed with a Winchester rifle. The medium then went on to claim that it was those spirits who were answerable for the premature deaths of her daughter and husband. The medium advised her that the only manner to break out of a similar destiny 
was to travel west and appease the spirits by constructing a house for them. Now keep in mind that being the widow of one of the wealthiest men in the 19th century had its advantages. One of them was that, on William Winchester's demise, Sarah inherited more than $20 million, and nearly 50% of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, which gave her daily earnings of approximately $1,000. In 2022, that might equal to earning about $28,000 every day. To summarise, she lived a life that gold diggers dream of. This inheritance ultimately allowed her to create the bizarrely dazzling Winchester Mystery House, a construction that reflects her own cracked mental state. In 1884, she bought an unfinished farmhouse located three miles west of San Jose, California, and spent the following 38 years continuously constructing her retirement house for the recently deceased. By the turn of the century, this eight-room cottage had grown into a colossal seven-floor Queen Anne-style Victorian mansion, covering over six acres of land and surrounded by 161 acres of farmland. She didn't use an architect and by no means had blueprints drawn up for the construction. This led to several oddities, consisting of doors and stairs that go nowhere, windows that give a view into other rooms and staircases with peculiar sized steps. Because of her monetary freedom, Mrs. Winchester became capable of accommodating any high-priced fancy item that popped into her head, but those additions rarely satisfied her. Consistent with neighbourhood accounts, neighbours might frequently listen to a person in the residence ringing a bell at midnight and again at 2am. These have been the precise times of the appearance and departure of spirits in step with ghost lore. What those ghosts do in those hours remains a mystery. Every night, it used to be said that Mrs. Winchester headed to the blue room or seance room in the centre of the residence to communicate with the spirits. This room consisted just of a cupboard, a desk with a pen and papers, a closet and a planchette board. At these events, she would don one of 13 specifically coloured robes and get instructions from the spirits on how to continue her bewildering creation. In fact, the number 13 appeared to have an occult significance for Mrs. Winchester, as it frequently takes place in motifs all over the house. Most windows have 13 panes. There are 13 bathrooms. The 13th bathroom has 13 windows. The wall prior to the 13th windows has 13 wall panels. And there are 13 steps leading to the 13th bathroom. Even her will contained 13 components and was signed 13 times. That being said, it's not recommended to dash into any of those 13 bathrooms in your time of need. All of the restrooms except one are dupes, designed to confuse spirits that would try to follow Mrs. Winchester. The trouble is that they're also a hit at confusing real humans. There is one functional bathroom inside the whole house, and it's attached to one of the many bedrooms. But in her wily attempts to keep away from those spiritual stalkers, she slept in a different room each night. But the residence's layout wasn't all committed to avoiding evil spirits. When it came to creating the house homely to spectres, Mrs. Winchester spared no expense, importing a number of the most lavish furnishings cash can buy. The house was made almost completely of redwood, as she preferred the texture of wood. However, since she didn't like the appearance of it, she had it all painted over, ending in the use of 78,000 litres of paint. Silver and gold chandeliers adorned many rooms. Parquet flowers made from rare woods along with mahogany, antique-shaped impressive mosaics on the floors, and stained glass windows designed by Tiffany himself, split incoming light with a beautiful blend of colour. A lot of these Tiffany windows have spider or spiderweb motifs, one and all Mrs. Winchester's occult fascinations. And more importantly, the residence only has three mirrors, as ghosts would supposedly become disenchanted at their lack of reflection. Tragically, a lot of those fixtures have been in no way used and ended up in the fabled $25,000 storage room, the contents of which might be now well worth over $300,000. The house's interior beauty becomes matched best through its uncommon devices. As several of the conveniences that are boasted have been exceptionally rare at the instances of its construction. It featured indoor heating, 
cutting edge indoor plumbing, push button gasoline lighting, a hot shower, and three elevators. If you've ever lived in a residence and not used an indoor lavatory, you'll understand how genuinely magical this must have felt to the people of the 19th century. In 1906, a giant earthquake hit the area and reduced the residence to just four stories. Unsurprisingly, Mrs. Winchester believed that this was a message from the spirits, cautioning her that she'd spent an excessive amount of money on the front segment of the residence. She right away had 30 of the front segment rooms sealed closed, such as the grand ballroom and her preferred daisy bedroom. And they remained that manner till the house got into the possession of John and Mame Brown in February of 1923. Although on her demise, lots of Mrs. Winchester's property were bequeathed to her niece, her residence got sold at a private auction and was soon opened by the Browns as a tourist appeal. It rapidly became a site of large interest, even attracting a go-to from the mythical Harry Houdini in 1924. Nowadays, this structural behemoth is still open to the general public and is made up of about 160 rooms, which include 40 bedrooms and a couple of ballrooms, 47 fireplaces, over 10,000 panes of glass, 17 chimneys, two basements and three elevators. Not long after it became open to the general public, people started to record odd happenings within the residence. Brent Miller and his spouse, who had been the caretakers from 1973 to 1983, had been convinced that they might hear someone's respiration in the empty rooms and the sounds of footsteps within the bedroom wherein Mrs. Winchester died. One of Miller's pals, who had come over for New Year's Eve, took a few clicks of the house with his new camera, and one of them features shifting light fixtures with the silhouette of a man fully covered, standing in the background. In its long history, visitors of this mystery house have temporarily lost their eyesight, felt chill spots, and seen locked doorknobs turn. While a collection of paranormal investigators from the Nirvana Foundation decided to spend the night there, they used electric devices to try and record any supernatural occurrences. Their tape recorder picked up the sound of an organ being performed, and as they walked through the residence, several of them pronounced seeing shifting lights. One of the investigators even claimed to have seen a person and a female watching the bunch from across the room. Fascination with the mystery house persists to this present day. Irrespective of whether you believe in the supernatural or not, the Winchester Mystery House has an indisputable mystique that's positive to draw visitors for years to come. If you happen to walk through the suburb of Denver, you would surely stumble upon an innocent looking brick house named the Peabody Whitehead Mansion, encompassed by rusty wired fences. Trust me, this mansion has an extremely dark past and is not as innocent as it looks from the outside. The Peabody Whitehead Mansion was constructed in 1889 to house Dr. William Whitehead. He moved from New York, where he served as a wartime surgeon during the course of the Crimean War. He was also among the founders of the Denver College of Medicine, which was established in 1887, and also the president of the Colorado State Medical Society in 1883. Because of his profession and reputation, he made a lot of money, which he used to construct the mansion of his dreams. A few years after moving into the house, Whitehead met his demise inside the mansion in 1902. After his death, Governor James Peabody, an extremely aggressive and adamant man, made the mansion his home, thus giving it the name Peabody Whitehead Mansion. The mansion was later abandoned before being bought by a new owner who renovated it into a bar and restaurant. It served its new purpose during the 1960s and 70s. During the mansion's renovation, two construction workers allegedly abducted a young girl and raped her until she died. It's said that they buried the poor girl's lifeless body in the basement of the mansion itself, before laying a new foundation. Apart from this tragic death, the walls of this mansion have seen the death of many, along with a reported suicide. Dr. William Whitehead, the original owner of the mansion, was a wartime surgeon, and because of the war's intensity and the lack of medical knowledge during this time, despite his best efforts, he was not able to save the life of many of his patients. 
It's believed that the spirits of the soldiers who died under his nose followed him to the newly built mansion when he moved in. He reported being tortured by these spirits and also said that he saw these ghosts in every place he looked. It was not just him, but also his family who got a ghostly experience with poltergeist activity being the most common. Books flying out of the shelf, falling picture frames, wiping during the night and glasses breaking on their own are a few of their dreadful experiences inside the mansion. Whitehead died inside the mansion itself in a few years, and it's said that his spirit still haunts the mansion. The paranormal activity seemed to reduce after Whitehead's death, but after its conversion into a restaurant and bar, it peaked rapidly. The property's second owner, Governor Peabody, was an extremely adamant man who made sure he got what he wanted. It seems like he was almost adamant about staying inside the mansion even after his death. During the restaurant phase of the mansion, workers reported glassing falling all by themselves to the ground, being thrown on the walls and mysteriously breaking when they were still on the bar top. Also, a chandelier which was completely disconnected from electricity was seen flickering sporadically without any source of power. Paranormal investigators believe that at least 12 different phantoms haunt the mansion. A spirit named Elise, who died inside the building, is said to haunt the second floor of the mansion, and a waitress who killed herself inside the basement is said to still haunt the basement of the mansion. Some claim to have seen the phantom of an old man near the women's bathroom on the first floor. It's believed that he haunts the complete floor, with the bathroom being the paranormal hotspot. Visitors have claimed to sense a strong smell of cherry-scented pipe in this space. The phantom of a woman who died within the mansion's walls while waiting for her arriving fiancé has also been reported by many to be peeking out of the mansion's windows. Visitors have reported books flying off the shelves, objects being thrown around, constant wailing during the nights, eerie sounds of infants crying, ringing of disconnected bells and phones, mysterious scratches and bruises, and many other paranormal events within the house. With a metal gate that blocks the public from getting too close, this dreaded mansion now lies abandoned. With the future of the mansion still unclear, entering it is highly restricted. Locals, however, wouldn't enter it even if they're allowed to, as they fear that the mansion's deadly spirits might follow them into their home. In a historical town known for past witch trials, sits a colonial mansion named Turner Ingersoll Mansion, but it's better known as the House of the Seven Gables. The house was brought into the spotlight by Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1851 novel named The House of the Seven Gables. Because of the town's dark history of killing witches, it's got a plethora of haunted buildings, with the House of the Seven Gables being the pinnacle. The original section of the mansion was constructed in 1668 for Captain John Turner. It proceeded to be in the hands of his family for three generations, until John Turner III. Facing the Salem Harbour, the house had two rooms, two and a half storeys, a front porch and a huge central chimney. This house is now in the middle of the mansion. After a few years, two new kitchens were added to the structure. By the year 1676, Turner added a spacious front extension with its own chimney with a parlour on the ground floor and a large bedroom above it. The ceilings in this new wing are higher than the ceilings of the old portions of the mansion. During the first half of the 18th century, John Turner II altered the house in the new Georgian style by adding wood panelling and sash windows. Being an early example of Georgian architecture, the design of the house is still preserved. The mansion is one of the oldest timber framed in North America, and it has 17 rooms spread over 8,000 square feet, along with large cellars. After the third generation, the family lost the house in debt, and it ended up in the hands of Ingersolls, who altered it again. He removed the gables, replaced the porches, and added Georgian trim. The house was featured in a novel written by Nathan Hawthorne, which played a major role in the house getting this name, and the popularity it gained. The author described the house itself as a living being in his novel. The aspect of the venerable mansion 
has always affected me like a human countenance. It was itself like a great human heart with a life as its own, and full of rich and somber reminiscences. The deep projection of the section story gave the house a meditative look, that you couldn't pass it without the idea that it had a secret to keep. Author of Haunted Salem, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, once quoted that the house is a ghostly reminder of shipping fortunes made and then misplaced, a bust blamed at the curse of the witch trials of 1692. Although the employees and tour guides deny the existence of anything remotely paranormal inside the house, for many years, a lot of visitors have reported seeing multiple ghosts inside. Inside the well-known mysterious staircase, visitors have seen the spirit of a man running up and down the steps. Those who've seen him link his spectral origins to the Underground Railroad. Others document seeing a phantom boy who enjoys having fun in the attic. During the day, his little footsteps may be heard running around upstairs as he giggles and laughs. According to one historian, the attic space once functioned as a servant's quarters, so this could be the spirit of one of the servants. However, others confidently say that the little boy is Julian, the son of Nathaniel Hawthorne. The most frequently seen visible spectre on the residence is none other than Susanna Ingersoll, Nathaniel Hawthorne's cousin who fed him with the terrible memories of the Salem witch hysteria. She is an ex-owner and lived in the house during the 1800s. She was a well-known businesswoman who amassed huge amounts of wealth when she was alive. She's also the only woman to have been born and died within the house. Her spirit has been seen spotted walking in the halls of a former house, or even peeking out the windows to those who enter the estate through the garden, underneath, before mysteriously disappearing. In October 2006, one visitor named Christopher toured the mansion along with his girlfriend. Unfortunately, They'd only arrived at 7.30pm and the museum had already closed. The next day, they returned in the early evening to make sure they didn't lose their chance for the second day in a row. They checked in without knowledge of the building's haunted nature. Whilst Christopher descended to the bottom of the infamous attic stairs, he heard a woman whisper, shh, shh, into his ear. Christopher turned around thinking it was his girlfriend, but she was almost four feet away and swore she hadn't uttered a word. One other commonly reported paranormal hotspot is the attic. Suddenly, I felt queasy and lightheaded and couldn't breathe. I had the feeling that I had to get out of the room now. I couldn't concentrate and felt incredibly anxious, are the words of one verified visitor. Another visitor reported, I'm sensitive to that sort of stuff, and I felt a very strong presence inside the attic area. I remember doing a double take for no explained reason in the attic toward the little window facing the waterfront, but nothing was there. Also, one other visitor reported being strangled by invisible hands inside the attic. In 1910, the house was transformed into a museum, and it's stayed this way ever since. You can still visit the place though, but I leave the decision to your own judgement. Among the top five biggest castle-like structures in the USA, the Ohio State Reformatory has the world's tallest steel construction. But this prison offers much more than world records and paranormal events are a top pick in its menu of offers. The history of the Ohio State Reformatory started in 1862, and the site in which the reformatory was constructed was used as a training camp for Civil War soldiers. The camp was called Camp Mordecai Bartley, in honour of the Mansfield guy who served as Ohio governor in the 1840s. In 1867, Mansfield decided to be the place for a new intermediate jail. The city raised $10,000 to buy 30 acres of land for the jail, and the state bought 150 acres of adjacent land for $20,000, with the expenditure of the property being $1.3 million. The Ohio State Reformatory was meant to be a midway factor between the Boys Industrial School in Lancaster and the State Penitentiary in Columbus, and was supposed to hold young first-time offenders. Construction started out in 1886, and the property was under construction till 1910, due to troubles with funding which caused construction delays. The real architect for the layout 
was Levi T. Schofield from Cleveland. He used three styles, which are Victorian, Gothic, Richardsonian, Romanesque, and Queen Anne. Schofield designed the jail with these particular styles to assist inmates to emerge as returned spiritual people. A well-known architect, F. F. Schnitzer, was entrusted with the construction of the building. In 1891, the name was modified from Intermediate Penitentiary to Ohio State Reformatory. On September 15th, 1896, the prison opened its doors to the first 150 inmates. These prisoners were put right away to work at the sewer system and the 25-foot stone wall surrounding the construction. Schnitzer was awarded a silver double inkwell by the governor of the state in a lavish ceremony to recognize his services. In 1935, Arthur Lewis Glatke became the superintendent and his tenure lasted until 1959. He implemented many reforms which included radio and cell blocks. Glatke's wife Helen Boa Glatke died of pneumonia three days following an accident in November 1950, where a handgun shot her while she was trying to reach out into a jewellery box. Glatke met his demise due to a heart attack he suffered in his office on February 10th, 1959. Later, over 200 died there, which includes guards who got killed during escape attempts. During its operation, which was for almost a century, the Ohio State Reformatory had 154,000 inmates go through its doorways, although not everyone got out of it alive. Sickness, suicide, murder, and other ways rampaged the prison, taking the lives of 215 inmates whose corpses are buried in the prison cemetery, although the real death count of the building is said to be a lot more. Various spirits are stated to have been present in the reformatory and remained even after its closure. The ones to visit regularly document listening to disembodied voices, footsteps, seeing apparitions or shadow figures, or even being touched whether or not just a snatch or brush, at times in a much more violent way. One of the regions that have baffled investigators for decades is the chair room. This is a small room in the admin building and the only room within the structure to include no windows. Some speculate that it got used for dark activities as violent paranormal events are said to be experienced there. Some who sat on the chair have pronounced to be groped or even scratched by an invisible entity. Others have been documented feeling the chair shake under them. Another location said to be paranormally active is the West Wing Attic. This is a place where many prisoners with violent backgrounds were housed because of overcrowding. Since the attic wasn't made with cells, the prisoners were housed in more of a dormitory style, leading to a variety of unruly behaviour. Many others have additionally mentioned hearing and seeing paranormal things within the East cell block and underground solitary confinement cells, also known as the Hole. This is an area where guards and prisoners got murdered, and some even committed suicide. The Mansfield Reformatory Preservation Society is presently operating to repair and restore the structure to its original condition. Restorations encompass the elimination of dust and debris, changing the roof, and full restoration of the warden's quarters, in addition to the full restoration of the central guard room between the east and west cell blocks. The restorations are being funded via donations and tours. The windows of the south side east cell block were replaced, and all the stained glass windows of the building are in course of being replaced. During the Halloween season, the facility hosts a haunted house via Blood Prison. The Ohio State Reformatory gives ghost tours along with ordinary daytime tours. They provide public ghost hunts for casual ghost hunters, private ghost hunts for experienced ghost hunters, ghost walks for kids who are 13 or more, ghost hunt training for kids who are 13 or more, and special ghost hunt events. The Fairfield County Infirmary, called a poor farm, used to be a place for the less lucky ones. It used to shelter the homeless, and it was also a place where people with physical or mental health issues got admitted. It also housed people with disabilities who have been ill, the elderly who were too old to care for themselves, and also orphan children. 
With an extended history of over 170 years of serving the much less fortunate, Fairfield County Infirmary additionally preserves more than just history in its partitions. The Fairfield County Infirmary is said to be extremely paranormally active. It harbors a lot of darkish secrets, and after you know more about the infirmary, you'll quickly recognize why this brick behemoth has a haunted recognition. In 1828, Township officials who were charged with overlooking the poor and unfortunate contracted the development of a wood building in the north of Lancaster, Ohio. It got filled to its maximum ability quickly, performing as a place where the impoverished, mentally sick, bodily disabled, abandoned elderly and orphaned children could have food, clothing, a roof over their head and medical assistance. By the year 1840, the wooden building was turned into a huge brick building. Additions have been made to the facility in 1865, both to the principal construction, as well as building some of the outbuildings used for storage, tenants, laundry, and farming. The farm was situated across the street, and plenty of residents labored of the land to make food for themselves and others at the infirmary. In 1917, natural gas lines were laid out in the building to provide heat and lighting. Water pipes were laid in 1926, but the building only got electricity in 1958. A cemetery, which stands behind the construction, is where the bodies of the mendicants and residents without family lie, and most of these graves are unmarked. In line with documentation, the number of residents in 1903 was 82, and they had been admitted for numerous reasons, which included physical and mental health issues that their families couldn't handle. There were many residents, a majority of whose lives were at the infirmary, and they mostly met their demise in the infirmary as well. While residents usually lost their lives to old age or to their health conditions, some met their demise more abruptly and tragically. One such tale involves Jane Householder, a resident aged 72, whose clothes caught fire whilst she was near a gas stove. Whilst attendants working on the infirmary smothered the fire, Miss Householder was able to survive her burns for only a short duration. Tales persist that a former superintendent used to be especially merciless to the residents in the infirmary, reportedly hitting them as they worked within the fields of the farm. Those punishments have been witnessed by others inside the community, and it was stated in an article posted in 1851 in the Lancaster Gazette. The good souls of the vicinity ended the superintendent's brutality, and the life of the infirmary's residents became better once the abuse ceased. It's also stated that the county officials would periodically visit the infirmary and have a meal with the residents. People from the community would donate Christmas gifts. Nearby musicians might play for the aged, and ice cream socials were also held at times. Still, tales of suicide and violence persisted, as too many humans with different problems residing under one roof often proved to be disastrous. The infirmary functioned until 1985, after which it was seized with the last 16 residents being moved to nearby nursing facilities or foster houses. The infirmary became remodeled in 1986, and the county offices got moved there after establishing multiple protection measures, including the installation of fire alarms, sprinklers, and emergency lighting. Its name was then changed to Clarence E. Miller Building, and the county health department functioned in the building till 2013, despite the fact that the structure was completely damaged in 2011. Mix the death, trauma, and mistreatment of the former residents, and you end up with a perfect blend of a haunting. Many spirits are reported to haunt the Fairfield County Infirmary, with eerie events often occurring in the building. A lot of people trust that the former Superintendent Hommel still lingers in the building, it's believed that he might still enforce rules on the spirits on the property, overseeing them and silencing their attempts to talk with visitors. Another spirit stated to stay at the infirmary is that of Jane Householder. Her terrorizing experience could be the reason for her lingering around. Other spirits said to loaf around the infirmary is that of a young girl who has been named Susie. A spirit named Willie who is said to haunt the second and third floor, and a nine-foot-tall shadow figure who remains in the attic, additionally known as the dungeon, 
as misbehaving citizens were regularly chained to the partitions up there. There are lots of areas in which eerie activities have been reported. However, they aren't necessarily connected to a selected spirit. The prison-like cell in which residents were frequently locked up for not following regulations is paranormally active. The attic and dungeon, the toilets, hallways, some rooms, and even the lower floors that contain the former morgue are also said to be haunted. Site visitors have recorded hearing unclear voices and slamming doors and windows, smelling lavender fragrance and objects moving on their very own, shadows, footsteps approaching when no one is around, device failure or malfunction and unexplained banging are commonly reported occurrences in the house. The Fairfield County Infirmary is closed now, but those brave enough to visit can still visit the property. The Caledonia Estate 99 Door Mansion, strange name for a colonial mansion, isn't it? But what's stranger is its dark history. Hidden in an oil palm estate named Bryram in Nibong Tabal Penang, this enormous construction has remained abandoned for decades. It stays covered by an overgrown plantation, securing the privacy of the property. Yet many refuse to go into or even approach this abandoned mansion for its darkish connections to the supernatural realm. During the late 1800s, Ramsden, a wealthy man from England, along with his family, decided to move to Malaysia in his pursuit of becoming a successful businessman. He bought an estate in a place called Nibong Tabal in hopes of establishing a sugarcane plantation. But as the price of sugarcane took a sharp decline, he decided to convert it into a rubber plantation. The decision gave him extremely high profits, and with the money he made, he fulfilled one of his dreams, which was to build a grand majestic mansion. The mansion was built right in the center of the estate, and the mansion bewilderingly had 99 doors for just 10 rooms, with each room having a minimum of six doors, hence giving it its strange name. Despite many speculations, the reason for this bizarre architecture still remains unknown. The Ramsdens, with hopes of living a blissful life, moved into the mansion in the year 1840, happily. However, with the murder of their grandson, John St. Mauer Ramsden, their run of happiness came to an end. John was shot twice in the head, right on the front stairs of the mansion. A few have speculated that a jealous rival of the family was accountable for the murder, but the case was in no way solved. Through the 1950s, the mansion was completely deserted. A few claim that the whole Ramsden family died inside the mansion itself, which appeared to be cursed for them. Rumours exist that the home was taken over by the invading Japanese, and that they're the ones responsible for the death of the Ramsdens. However, this claim stays unsubstantiated. On 26th of July 2020, the mansion mysteriously caught fire, ravaging about 70% of the building. Firemen were dispatched to put it out, and an investigation was done to figure out the cause of the fire. However, until today, the cause of the fire remains an unsolved mystery. After the abandonment of the 99 door mansion, paranormal accounts from the locals started to unfold. Many declare that the Ramsdens continue to be at their former home to haunt it, but there are a lot more chilling stories concerning the 99 door mansion compared to this ordinary haunting. It's stated that when the mansion became abandoned, a bummo unnoticeably moved into the residence. In Malaysia, a bummo is a type of shaman, similar to a witch doctor and this specific Bummo practiced eerily dark arts. Supposedly, the Bummo used the residents to touch the other realms. Once this news unfolded, people started trespassing the mansion to contact the dead ones or have evil curses put on other people. Though the mansion is uninhabited and dangerously damaged these days, many trust that the mansion's history has left back paranormal stains. Legend has it that when the clock strikes 12 a.m. each night, a special 100th door, hidden inside the mansion, appears and opens. This acts as a portal to the realm of the dead and allegedly lets evil spirits enter our realm as they please. Those darkish spirits are cursed and have been described as having soulless black eyes. 
Some of the supernatural events reportedly experienced within the residence include the sounds of ritual drums being played across the mansion, being scratched by invisible entities, growls, screams, and even possessions. The sound of heavy footsteps on the empty staircases has also been reported. In recent years, many have sought to turn the Caledonia house into a heritage site. Reports suggest that the 54-acre land, together with the mansion, was purchased by a businessman. However, the present owner is uncontactable. In line with the edge, the property's caretaker reported to the star that the proprietor rarely visits, and that they locked up the fence to prevent outsiders from damaging the building even more. All of us would have felt unlucky at some point in our life, but what if you weren't actually unlucky, but under the control of a demon? The protagonist in this story was so unlucky that he was taken into the clutches of a demon who made sure he felt like he was the epitome of unlucky. Amar, a man from Chennai, is the protagonist of this story. He celebrated his 26th birthday all alone this year, in fact. He had celebrated his birthdays all alone for as long as he could remember. He has no friends, and when asked why, he says, I do not want people to die because of me. He had never lasted as an employee in a company for more than a year. Very unprofessional, right? No, it wasn't because of being unprofessional. Despite being among the top performers in the company, he would always be kicked out. Amar, despite being a Muslim from birth, followed Christianity avidly. This was because of the way he was raised by his father. Amar's father always told him, Amar, we call God by different names and group ourselves into different religions, but the Almighty always remains the same. Follow the religion you like, but do not forget there's only one God. He was very fond of his father, but he too passed away. In truth, everyone that Amar had gotten close to had left him and almost all of them had died in an obscure way. Despite being so ungifted, Amar had one extremely valuable gift, which was the ability to effortlessly astral project. He was petrified during his first projection, which happened when he was just six years old, but he says that the fright slowly turned into ecstasy. Event one, demise of his father. Despite being born and brought up in a conventional Islamic family, Amar's dad was a man who identified him as a liberal. He was a pro bike racer and owned a garage where he tuned and serviced bikes. He fell in love with Amar's mother during his early teens and eloped her with her as soon as they reached legal age. He was not blessed enough to live long enough with the love of his life as she died while delivering Amar to this world. He saw Amar as the only reason for him to live and never agreed to marry another woman. Amar, however, had a love-hate relationship with him. He wasn't much attached to his father until his father's retirement. By the time of his father's retirement, he had grown mature enough to grow a close bond with his father. But now, he feels if he hadn't established that bond, the poor man wouldn't have died. The year was 2014, and Amar had already begun to distance himself from others, as he had a strong feeling that he was the cause of the death of his close ones. He was on winter vacation and had no one else to accompany him except his dad. Being a sucker for motorcycles, the time he spent with his dad became the time he would relish forever. As they got closer, his dad started to feel giddy sporadically and fell down unconscious. When he was taken to a doctor for consultation, it was found that he had all of a sudden developed a tumour in his head. The doctors said that the tumour cannot be removed as his father was too old to recover. They informed Amar that he would be lucky if his father lived on to celebrate his next birthday. Amar saw his father suffer every day as he gradually became bedridden. He felt nothing but helplessness when his father suffered a tragic demise in just a month after all the ordeals he had been through. Event 2. The death of his first crush. Amar was adamant about not having any friends during his college days, but his hormones got the better of him when he saw a girl named Mira for the first time, and he developed an unexplainable admiration for her. He confessed his admiration for her and asked her for a date. The girl also seemed to have an interest in him, 
and agree to go on a date. Things seemed to go fine during the date, and he felt that they were quite a match. Once they were done, he dropped her at home and they exchanged numbers. The next morning, he went to his college excitedly, only to not find her in college. He tried reaching out to her phone multiple times, but she didn't seem to pick up. While trying to ring her again, he heard his principal speak on the announcement speaker. He was startled when he heard, one of our students named Mira committed suicide yesterday night. We got the information just now. Let us pray for her soul to rest in peace. He says even the cops were not able to figure out the motivating factor of her suicide. Cause of his ill luck. Despite many failed attempts, Amar was not able to figure out the cause of his bad luck until the day he saw his dad's closet burn all on its own. He could only save a diary from the flames and the rest of his dad's belongings were burnt to ashes. The diary looked like his father's diary and it dated back to his birth year. He was surprised to know that his father had a habit of writing diaries. Despite knowing it was ill-mannered to sneak into someone else's diary, he proceeded to read it as he was overcome by curiosity. Amar, after reading the diary, got to know what a demon was cast upon his mother by his grandfather. The spell was apparently so powerful that despite many attempts his father was not able to remove the spell. From his father's words, Amar got to know that his father strongly believed that his wife's death was caused by that demon, and he also thought that the demon left his family after her death, but little did he know that it attached itself to his son. Amar feels that he got his psychic powers from this demon and still refuses to establish a bond with others for their own good. Aaron, a man from a city named Medorai, is the protagonist of this story. The year was 1999, when Aaron built his first house. He had grown immensely in his journey, from working in a tea stall to becoming a landlord. His new house had two floors, he resided on the first floor and rented the second floor. The second floor had three houses with a shared washroom. After a grand housewarming, Aaron rented two of the three houses to two different families. The third house was a little bit smaller than the second one, so he wanted to rent it to a bachelor. Soon after the housewarming, a bachelor named Mayandi came to the house, asking Aaron to rent it to him. The person looked odd, which raised suspicion in Aaron's mind but he rented him the house after the person told him that he was a Shivite. After a week or two, the other tenants started to complain about a weird sound coming from Mayandi's portion at night. Aaron did not pay much attention to this and asked Mayandi to reduce the noise as it disturbed the other tenants. He later noticed that many unknown men were visiting Mayandi's portion during the nights, and the weird sounds that the other tenants complained of were ritual chants made by these people. He called Mayandi and inquired about the things happening in his portion during the night. The latter said that those strangers were his friends and they were praying to Lord Shiva during the night. Aaron could clearly sense that he was lying and told him, say the truth or vacate my house. Mayandi told him that he was not a Shivite but a black magician. He warned Aaron, saying that if he questioned him again, he would cast a spell on him. Aaron says that he went speechless hearing this and felt helpless as he started practicing black magic more brazenly. The other tenants eventually vacated because of the disturbance felt by the sounds from his portion. Aaron was struck in the middle and didn't know what to do. One day, his friend came rushing to his house saying that his newborn baby was missing and asked Aaron to accompany him to the police station to lodge a complaint. His friend stood still after stepping out of Aaron's house looking at a piece of blanket. This is the blanket my baby was wrapped in when it went missing, he told Aaron, pointing at the blanket. Upon hearing this, Aaron rushed into Mayandi's portion and broke into the house. When he entered, he saw a baby in Mayandi's lap who had a knife in his hands. He snatched the baby after a tough battle and gave the baby to his friend. Knowing that he was caught red-handed, Mayandi ran out of the house, leaving behind all his things. Aaron tried to follow him, but he was nowhere to be found. When he came back inside, 
he heard the sound of someone breathing heavily from the washroom. He locked the door and tried calling the police. While the phone was ringing, my Andy started to chant spells which Aaron says hypnotized him. When he tried to open the door in a hypnotized state, his friend shook him and brought him back to his senses. He was enraged by what happened and set the washroom along with my Andy who was on inside it on fire. After a trial by the police, Aaron was sentenced to two years in prison. The house remained uninhabited for the course of his punishment. After getting released, Aaron renovated the house and decided to rent it again. During the renovation process, he demolished my Andy's portion completely as he felt it gave out negative energy. He rented the houses to two different families. The very next day after moving in, one of his tenants complained to him about someone constantly walking around the washroom at night. She said that she could also sense someone else's presence while she was inside the washroom. Aaron thought some burglar was hiding inside and went into the washroom to check it himself. When he entered, he sensed the smell of a burning body and as he stood there, thinking of what had happened inside the washroom before, he sensed the breath of someone on his shoulder. He ran outside in a jiffy and sought the help of a priest he knew. When he returned back home with the priest on his side, he saw an ambulance near his gate. When he rushed to see what happened, he found out that one of his tenants had slipped inside the washroom and had her skull cracked. She was bleeding profusely. She was admitted to a nearby hospital and when she gained back consciousness, she complained of a burnt man who hit her hard on her back, which caused her to slip and fall. There was a handprint on her back which proved that she wasn't lying. The poor lady, as Aaron says, died of a heart attack the very same night. The priest, after performing a few rituals, told Aaron that Myandi's spirits haunted that washroom and asked him to demolish it and make a chapel for his deity in its place. Aaron obliged and contracted a builder for the task. The bathroom was successfully demolished, but at the cost of an amputated worker who lost one of his limbs while demolishing it. The disturbances vanished after he constructed the chapel and he still resides in the same house peacefully. The story I'm about to tell has shared with me by a friend of mine. I'll be writing the story from his point of view. We were in search of a new house as my father's retirement balances were settled by the company he was working for. After checking out quite a few houses, we stumbled upon a property that was being sold for a quarter of its worth. The house had enough room for all nine of us, but it was surrounded by nothing but forest for a five kilometer radius. The owner of that house said that he was being disturbed by something unworldly in that house and was selling it only because of that. My family, being firm non-believers of the paranormal, decided to purchase this house as we were getting a property whose worth was three times the amount that we were paying for it. The purchase went smoothly and we moved into our new house in the winter of 2020. Our family is made up of me, my mom and dad, my elder sister, my paternal grandparents, a German shepherd whom we named Lisa and two Labradors who we named Tina and Maria. Our initial days in that house went peacefully and we thought the man who sold us the house was a madman who imagined things that were actually not present. But little did we know, he was right. My family had to leave for the neighbouring city for my uncle's wedding, and I wasn't able to join them as my board exams were nearing and I had no time to waste. I was left alone in the house along with our dogs. I shut the house door after waving them goodbye and went back to my room to continue studying. While entering my room, I saw a man standing in the hallway in my peripheral, and when I turned to see who it was, I saw no one. I paid less attention to it and continued studying. The clock struck 8pm and it was time to feed our dogs. I went to the kitchen using the light of my mobile's phone flashlight as there was a power failure. When I brought Lisa her food, I saw her stare into the empty hallway, empty eyed. I flashed the torchlight into the hallway to see what was frightening her and I saw no one again. I petted her and sat with her until she calmed down. The Labradors, who were just six months old then, were already asleep and I had to wake them up to feed them. 
Maria stopped eating and started barking in the hallway all of a sudden. I was confused by the behavior of my dogs and decided to stay with them for a while, as they were visibly scared. Thankfully, power was back on, and I turned on the lights in the hallway. The dogs were calmer now, and I went back to my room after turning off the lights in other rooms. I had apparently slept while studying, and I woke up in the middle of the night to the barking of Lisa. When I rushed out of my room, I saw a shadowy figure standing near the Labrador pups. When I ran downstairs shouting back off, the figure disappeared right in front of my eyes. I turned on the lights in the hall and slept on the couch with the dogs near me. I was woken up in the morning by my mom who asked why I was sleeping in the hall instead of my room and I explained to her what had happened the previous night. She didn't seem to believe me and told me that I'd had a nightmare. Things were not the same in the house after that. I started hearing someone walk in the hallway at night and my door was knocked on repeatedly when I fell asleep until I woke up. My parents were worried as my grades were dropping and I was falling sick often because of not having enough sleep every night. I was now used to the knocks at night as I thought I was safe as long as I stayed inside the room. One such night, I heard the knocks along with the mumbling of a man in his twenties. I was startled when the man started yelling my name and ordered me to open the door. I covered my face in a blanket and with the holy bible in my hand, I wished for the night to end soon. I rushed to my sister and told her what I had been going through and I was relieved when she told me I wasn't the only one as she was also experiencing the same. The hallway was always colder than the rest of the house and we were not able to figure out why or how it was happening. While watching a movie in the main hall together on a Friday evening, we saw Maria play fetch in the hallway all by herself. My dad went upstairs to see what was happening and brought the dog with him when he came back. He was pale and didn't tell us what he saw despite us asking him multiple times. Later that night, all of us were woken up by a screaming Maria. And when we rushed to the hall to see why she was screaming, we saw her being carried and thrown from one corner by a shadow. The shadow disappeared when we turned on the lights, but the poor dog had already died. My dad now told me what he had seen earlier. He saw Maria catch a ball that came out of the darker side of the hallway and when he turned on the lights, he saw no one. We went to a local priest the next day and told him about the issues in the house. He suggested we perform exorcism rituals in the house, which proved to be of no use. Despite many attempts, we were not able to drive that entity out. Now we live in the same house with fear and none of us step out of our rooms during the night. So a few years back, me and my best friend wanted to try out a Ouija board. So I made one up and we decided we would try it in a graveyard at night. And we knew a pretty cool graveyard to try it in. It's a massive one that's locked up pretty tight at night, but me and him had climbed in quite a few times in the past. This graveyard is very overgrown and resembles a wild woodlands with dirt paths that lead around and into the center of the graveyard. And right in the center, there's an old abandoned chapel that has a memorial area at the front of the chapel. And this is where we decided to try the board. So we sit down facing each other and we ask the usual questions. And this is how it went. I asked if there were any spirits here that wanted to talk. We didn't even have to wait long and the planchette started moving very slowly over to the word yes. So we look at each other I was kind of shocked and had a tiny doubt in my mind that my friend was the one who moved it, but we carried on. The next question I asked was what was their name? And again, the planchette started moving very slowly and it landed on the letter B and stopped and didn't seem as if it was going to move anywhere else. So I asked, is your name B? Again, it slowly moved this time to the word yes. So, I ask another question. Are you male or female? Again, as before, the planchette moves very slowly and stops at the letter F and just sits there. Now I'm starting to think my friend might be messing with me, seeing as it's moving so slowly, 
and not actually spelling out words, just stopping on letters. But I've known this friend most of my life and I trust him, even though I'm having small doubts. So I ask my next question. Are you happy? Then, for the first time, the planchette moves really fast and stops dead on the word no. And at that point, I had this really strange feeling come over me. It was like a really sharp, cold feeling. And the night seemed to get darker and really quiet, as if the wind completely stopped moving and a strange calmness took its place. I looked at my friend and he seemed to feel the same thing I was feeling. But for some reason, I didn't want to stop. So I ask, is there anything we can do to help you? The planchette moved fast again, this time to the word yes. Now I'm starting to feel fear because I'm realizing it's not my friend moving this thing. He looked afraid too, and he's a pretty tough guy. I've never seen him scared in the 15 years I've known him. I ask my last question, what can we do to help you? And this is when the planchette moved really fast and really accurately. It spelled the words, get out. We look at each other. I say, okay, goodbye. The planchette moves fast to the word goodbye. At this point, we were pretty freaked out. We stood up and literally ran through the wooded pathways until we got to the main gate and climbed out. As soon as we were outside and on the streets, everything felt normal again, with the cars and lights and a couple of people walking by. We caught our breath and walked down the road, both pretty shaken up about what just happened. Was it all real? Or was it one of us subconsciously moving the planchette? I believe we actually spoke to a spirit that night. I've never done it again, but I think about that night often. I'd love to hear what you guys think of it. When I was in middle school, I lived in a neighborhood with brick bungalows. One summer day, I was reading upstairs when I heard a bit of a blast. I didn't really think much of it. It was indistinct. Home alone, the phone rang and I went down to the first floor to answer our kitchen phone. It was a family friend calling to say they'd heard on their police scanner that there was a gun fired at the address next to my house. During the call, I could hear sirens and once I hung up, I went onto my front porch to see what was going on. Outside, one of my neighbors was screaming, she did it, oh my God, she did it and was also screaming as some of the emergency responders held her and tried to calm her down. Her DIL had taken a shotgun and killed herself at the top of the stairs to the top floor. Apparently, her husband had cheated on her once again. He owned a bar and met women all the time. They lived there a bit longer until he decided he was going to take his mom, the lady screaming, to a warmer climate. A new family moved into the house with two daughters. One of the daughters was my age and we became quite close. She and her sister slept in the top floor area of their bungalow. It was one long room with a private bathroom and enormous closets. While in high school, a big group of us were going to a school dance together, carpooling. As we were pulling away from our houses, my friend remembered she forgot the ID she needed to get to the dance. As she was lodged back into the back of the car and I was more towards the front, I volunteered to go into the house and get it. She handed me her house key and said it was up on her bedside table. I went inside. The house was dark, so I flicked on the light that turned on the front of the house's interior lights. No one else was home. Her parents were out for the night and her sister was away on a business trip. I went to the stairs to their bedroom and it was cold, but I figured... Oh, they turn their heat down when they go out. I then quickly walked the length of their bedroom and grabbed her ID. That's when I felt like, crap, there's something not right. So I turned and there was my former neighbor, the one who killed herself, standing not too far from me. To say I was freaked out is an understatement. But she was friendly and smiled and gave me a wave. So I remember blurting out, hi Fern, Nice to see you again. 
And then I ran out of there so fast that by the time I got into the car, my friend was screaming, don't tell me you saw, don't tell me. Because she knew I'd seen something that she'd experienced regularly. I was literally trembling in my seat and our friends were trying to console both of us. I felt bad afterward for the ghost. I think she was always a lonely woman. She has no ill intent. Bit of a strange one, but last August, my uncle died. He was a very kind man, but suffered badly with his health. He had lost a leg due to diabetes and was virtually blind. He was very eccentric and always wanted the latest iPads, laptops, TVs, literally anything that was new on the market. As a family, we were concerned that he was wasting his money because he didn't see to use all his new gadgets. But no matter what we said, he told us it's only money and it made him happy. Anyway, one day he called me up and asked if I could set up his new 50-inch TV that he just had delivered. I set it up and all was good, but then a few days later he rang me and said he was fed up with it and could I set up a smaller one for him. I did it for him. He then told me that I was to take the 50-inch TV home with me. I told him that we could return it and get a full refund, but he wouldn't hear of it. And I was to take it as an early Christmas present. I felt awful, but he was so happy that I now had it. A month later, he got an infection which led to sepsis. He was put into an induced coma, but sadly never woke up. I organised his funeral. All his gadgets that he had bought over the years were sold and the money given to charity, which I think he would have liked. I brought his jasses home with me before we scattered them in his favourite park. Two months ago, I was sat in the living room watching the TV that my uncle had given me. I popped in the kitchen and came back in five minutes later and there was a big dent on the screen like something had been thrown at it. All the kids were at school. There was no one else in the house. The TV was ruined. We've since bought a new one but it turns itself on in the middle of the night at full volume and last night my daughter was going to bed and her TV in her room switched itself on and a number four appeared on the screen like someone had the remote and was channel surfing. The remote was at the other end of the room. Pictures have randomly been falling from walls also. Do you think my uncle could be haunting us? Roughly an hour ago, my wife and I were talking on our couch. Her seat allows for a peripheral vision of one of our sets of half stairs. As I was saying something, she immediately jumps up and with a few seconds, says she saw a kid, not one of our two, walking down the stairs. And that's what spurred her sudden movement. Where I was sitting is essentially back to the stairs, but I lined up the shot. Even if I had been facing that way, the wall would have blocked it. Details according to her, as she tried to recall specifics of something she saw for two seconds. At the moment of realization of the figure, she felt a blanket was placed on her, attempting to tell her, no, this is just your son, don't worry. But her internal instinct piped up and told her to not let this thing get behind her. Ironically, if that were its goal, I would have certainly seen it if I am in fact capable of such things. It was lanky, possibly 2D, but almost spindly like a spider, with knee joints resembling that of a spider. It had clothing on, unsure of exactly what, but it was wearing something. She saw it move, hand on the banister. The leg movement was similar to how our youngest kiddo comes down the stairs, just a bit more overreaching, like it had to force itself to do so. Its face was almost purely white and had absolutely no facial features. She tried to rationalise it immediately and failed to do so. Since I didn't see it, I'm forced to look at the conditions and do my best to reconcile it in my head. Mostly so I can get some sleep at night. 
The lighting wasn't terrible on the stairs. There were eight stairs and at the top, we have a nightlight wall outlet. She said it was on the third from the top, stepping down the fourth from the top. The downstairs light illuminates it fairly well. I cannot chalk this up to the dark corridors hallucination that I've experienced in the past. Does anyone have any experience with such things? I'm at total loss. Okay, so when I was about seven to eight years old, I was at my grandma's outhouse, outside playing in the front yard with my cousin, who was just a few years older than me, 10 or 11, something like that. So we're out in the front and something catches our eye at the same time, almost as if something subconsciously told us to look. We both look over towards the street where there are a few large trees lining the street, one of which has a man standing next to it. And the very moment we look, he turns and walks behind the tree. It all happened so fast, it was almost as if he knew we were going to look before we did. My cousin and I both glanced at each other in shock, as if to confirm, you just saw what I did, right? But without saying a word, we both dart over to the tree. And when we get there, the man's gone. I look up, thinking he climbed the tree. I look at the other side of the street and thought the only explanation would be if he ran straight back, keeping in perfect line off the tree, so we couldn't see him. But he would have had to have been so fast for us not to spot him while running over the tree, so I just don't see it as likely. I'm 28 now, and still to this day, I have no explanation. I lived with my cousin and her boyfriend out in a rural area of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, for three months of 2020, during which I had three separate encounters with what I'm convinced was a ghost. The house itself was big, spacious and spread out, with three rooms and a long, long corridor. The house was once a childcare centre that had been rezoned as a private property, so the corridor had two doors that were nailed shut and no curtains or curtain rods, which left the windows exposed all the time. At night, it was absolutely creepy. It was on the main road, but so far back from the street, and absolutely surrounded by trees and bushes that the streetlights were barely visible. My first encounter was extremely terrifying, and even thinking about it now scares me. I was in bed, long day at work in the hospital during covid extremely stressful, so I went to bed around 9.30pm. I remember waking up in that slow way you sometimes do at night, but it wasn't because I needed to use the toilet or get a drink, it was because I felt a heavy presence on the end of my bed. I slowly woke up and the presence on my legs felt heavier. I was trying to control my breathing, trying to move my legs, and the heavy presence moved up my body until it felt like something was crouching on my knees and thighs. I tried to pretend to be sleeping because I felt like if the presence knew I was awake, something would happen to me, so I lie as still as I can. I slept under three blankets, all of them wrapped around me, so I felt like I was safe, until the blankets started slowly being pulled down from around me. I could feel the blankets being dragged back and the presence shifted until it was on my hips and just above my belly button. I tried to breathe as little as possible as the blankets were dragged off me and the mattress shifted beneath me, as if something was kneeling or standing on it. That was when I started to cry, biting my lips so I wouldn't make a noise, as the presence pulled my first blanket off me and started on the second. I genuinely felt like I was going to die or be seriously hurt, so I lay there in heart-pounding fright. I think I might have, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but I think I might have passed out, because I remember that feeling of lightheadedness, and then nothing. The second encounter I had was once again when I was in bed, but it was nowhere near sleep. I tried to watch a few episodes of Collateral on Netflix, 
but had given up due to stress about an upcoming uni assignment. I was lying in the dark, half covered by my blankets, when something took hold of my arm and tucked it out of my blankets and held it up in the air. Once again, I froze, pretending to sleep. My arm was perpendicular to my body, up in the air, and I could feel something heavy kneeling on my mattress next to me. I tried to breathe slowly, as whatever it was held my arm in a tight grip. I remember desperately saying Hail Mary and trying to casually move my arm, as if shifting in my sleep. But all that happened was the mattress shifted, as if the presence was climbing onto the bed, and it dropped my arm, which tingled for the rest of the night and felt like it had gone to sleep, or how your elbow feels when you bang your funny bone. The last encounter was an early morning one, because I remember seeing the sunlight through the gap in my blinds. I started to push my blankets off myself and climb out of bed, when something grabbed my waist and pulled me back down, wrapping what felt like an arm around my waist. I froze, unable to move, and this presence pushed up against me, and something pressed up against my ear and whispered, No. I remember shaking extremely hard as I pulled myself out of bed and basically bolted from the room, smacking into my cousin's boyfriend, who was walking up the hall from their room. When I started preschool, when I was about three or four, my parents had their old friend Helga and her sister Gian, who lived from her babysit me. I had afternoon preschool, so my mom would take me over there in the morning. Helga and Gian also babysat my older brother, David, who was about five or six, and the other kids of other friends. Deirdre and Danielle were fraternal twins a year older than me, and their older brother Andrew was a year older than David. We live in the Midwest, where everyone loves baseball, and Helga was the biggest St. Louis Cardinal fan I've ever met. The first room you see when you enter her house is the living room, which had cardinal red painted walls and the cardinal logo on the wall above her TV. There was a fake cherry tree outside my house. You had cherries, but they were hard and not safe to eat. I don't know why we have it. Anyways, four-year-old me knew Helga liked red, so when she dropped me off home, I'd pick a cherry and give it to her. She was nice about it. Her rocking chair was right next to the front door when you walked in, and she was always knitting a rainbow blanket for me. She finally finished it before she died. I don't know why I gave so much backstory, but I remember walking in front of the door with my mom. David, Deirdre, Daniel and Andrew weren't in preschool at this point, so it was just supposed to be me, Helga and Gian until Helga drove me there. I walked in first in front of my mom, and I looked to the left, and Helga was sitting in her rocking chair asleep. Or I thought she was asleep. It didn't look comfortable, but Gian was sitting on the couch watching something on TV, so I took it upon myself to wake her up. Hi Helga, wake up. It's morning, I said, smiling. Helga always let me nap in her room before I had to go to preschool let us snack on honey buns, and she'd take all of us to a road ranger for pancakes in her red van sometimes. When we got the mail, she would choose someone to run and get it, and when we came back, she'd pretend to forget to shut the door for a few seconds, which was hilarious and incredible to five little kids. I remembered all of this while I was trying to shake her awake. My mom and Gian realised before I did, but I was crying before I knew why. Olga's skin was wrinkly, but still kind of warm. She had her cardinal baseball cap on. She looked normal, but still. She had a heart attack in her rocking chair whilst asleep, and that was that. I remember my mom ushered me out into the driveway, and the police came eventually. I remember asking them to come back many times to say goodbye. I don't remember the goodbye, but I remember running back out into the driveway in tears. A few years after that, I still remembered Helga and the itchy blanket she spent so long knitting for me. I didn't have many friends, 
on my parents divorced when I was five. I was a sad kid. And I think it was Veterans Day where my dad took grandma, David and I to see our papa's grave. Before we came home, we also went by to see Helga's grave. I talked to her for a bit, but didn't feel much better. When my dad pulled up to the driveway, I saw a bright red cardinal in my dad's fake cherry tree. There were cardinals everywhere, and I realised it could be a coincidence. But I like to think Helga's still looking out for me. In 2017, me and my girlfriend moved into a tiny, kind of crappy house in our college town. The house was made by a couple of students a few years prior, so the architecture was a bit sloppy. For example, the roof was flat. However, the house was really cheap and close to campus, so it seemed like a total steal. The first couple of months living there, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But it wasn't too long before we started experiencing strange paranormal activities. The first odd occurrence was with our smoke detectors. Our smoke detectors would go off constantly. It was strange, because they would go off even if there was no smoke in the house. We thought that maybe it was because of old batteries, but no matter how many times we changed them, it never made a difference. It got to the point they were going off three or five, five times a day. And at that point, we just broke down and took the batteries out of all of them. However, even without batteries, the smoke detectors were still going off. So out of desperation, we turned off the entire smoke detector circuit to the house. It was at this point when things started getting really out of control. The back room slash storage room in the house always had an eerie feeling, like someone was watching you or standing just behind you, staring down at you. Thankfully, my girlfriend and I's bedroom was the furthest room in the house from the storage area. So I avoided it like the plague. Anyways, one night around 3am, the smoke detector in our bedroom goes off. However, it's not as repetitive beeping like usual. It's a single, long beep. It sounded like someone holds its test button on a detector. Frustrated, my girlfriend grabs a chair from the dining room and stands on it to reach the detector. But moments before she touches it, the beep stops. We both groan in irritation as she goes to put the chair back. But before she makes it to the dining room, the smoke detector down the hallway from our room makes the same continuous beep. Just like before, she stands on the chair to reach the detector but right before grabbing it, the detector stops. Our smoke detectors continued this pattern all the way back to the creepy storage room. This happened two more times that night. It was as if whatever was messing with us was trying to lead us to its room. This would happen to us at least once or twice a week for the next year and a half we lived there. Shortly after the encounters with the smoke detectors, the house became absolutely infested with bugs. There was no history of bug issues when we bought the house and it started almost immediately after our first experience with the smoke detectors. Bugs would pour out of light fixtures, small cracks in the walls and counters and of course the smoke detectors. Literally one minute everything would be fine, then the next winged insects or ants would pour out of the walls. We had multiple exterminators come but less than a week after treating the house the book would come back just as bad as before. It made us miserable, and I've never seen an infestation to that extreme. It was unnatural. After these occurrences, we began feeling really terrified and depressed. We both hated being home, but there was no other place for us to go. This is when the footsteps started. Remember how I said our roof was flat? At least a few times a week, we would hear large, heavy, possibly hoof-like footsteps on the roof. We tried writing it off as being animals, so whenever we heard the steps, we would run outside to see if we could stop the animal in question. But there was never anything there. The steps were very far apart from one another. Whatever was walking on our roof would start from the creepy storage room 
and in maybe three or four steps, walked to our bedroom. The steps were so loud, so loud it sounded like whatever was haunting us was either very big or stomping to get our attention. Now began the phantom sounds. We had large metal bowls that we used daily for cooking. So when we were done, we would wash them and set them on the counter to dry. The first time it happened, me and my girlfriend were sitting on the couch in the living room. The couch was right next to the living room, but there was an island that blocked our view to the sink area. Anyways, on this night, we were startled by the sound of multiple metal bowls being thrown off the counter. At this time, we didn't have pets, so we assumed the worst and thought someone might be breaking into the house. We both shot up and ran over to face our worst fear. But not only was no one in the house, nothing in the kitchen had been moved. The balls were still on the counter just where we left them. This was the most common paranormal occurrence in the house and it happened at least five to ten times a day at all hours. After a while, we were so sick and tired of these disturbances, we stopped using our metal balls. Or if we did use them, we would hand dry them and put them away right after use. This didn't make the spirit very happy. So next, we started hearing what sounded like our ceramic plates being thrown to the ground and our kitchen cabinets slamming over and over again. Do you know those type of cabinet hinges that close slowly? Yeah, that's what we had. So to slam the cabinets like that, they would have had to have been closed with excessive force. The next phase in our haunting was sightings in photographs. The phone I had at the time had one of those automatic face tracking features, meaning when you take pics on my phone, yellow boxes would appear around the person's face to focus on them. One night I was taking a picture in my girlfriend's bedroom when a yellow face tracker square appeared at the foot of our bed, way above our bed. If that was a person, they would have had to have been at least seven feet tall. At the time, we did have posters on our bedroom walls, so while focusing on the face tracker square, I circled the room to confirm that the tracker wasn't just focusing on one of the posters by accident. To my dismay, no matter where I was in the room, or from what angle the square stayed in the exact same place. Oh yeah, even better, I was home alone for a few nights. I don't think I've ever experienced such sheer terror as I did when I went to sleep that night. After this first encounter, having cameras track faces in our pictures became a constant occurrence all throughout the house. The final phase of our haunting before getting the heck out of there was physical encounters. This happened more often to my girlfriend than me, but something would occasionally grab and pull our hair, especially when we were walking through the living room. But the most terrifying experience goes to our friend Jamie. She came to visit us for a few nights, and while she was there, she would sleep on our couch. She was aware of all the paranormal encounters in the house, and she had seen most of them firsthand, but nothing compared to what was about to happen. It was around three in the morning when she woke up with an eerie, uncomfortable feeling. All of a sudden, she experienced what felt like someone or something stepping up onto the couch. It stepped both of its feet up, one on either side of her body. Starting from her feet, it slowly walked up the length of her body until it felt like two feet on either side of her head. She said she felt an intense malicious energy staring down at her, but she was too terrified to open her eyes. Meanwhile, the cabinets in the kitchen began to slam over and over again. For the next few hours, she pre pretended to sleep, all while this presence still stood over her. She told me she's not exactly sure when it went away, because she eventually became so exhausted, she fell asleep. Not too long after this experience, we were finally able to sell the house and get the heck out of there. We lost tons of money because we sold the house for way less than we originally paid. I can't help but feel bad for the person who bought the house. It's been almost three years and she's still living there. I think the takeaway from this story is if a house is priced too good to be true, then it is.
For a bit of backstory, me and my dad's side of the family have always been attuned with spirits and the paranormal. It's affected my grandmother, aunts, uncle, most of my cousins, and of course, my dad and I. Spirits are drawn towards us because it's easier for us to see them and be positively or negatively affected by their presence. My earliest spiritual memory is when I was a kid seeing and speaking to spirits. Basically, what I'm trying to say is I've seen many full body apparitions in my life, but this experience was by far the most surreal. I was a freshman in high school when this encounter took place. On this day, I got to school much earlier than usual. I got there about 30 minutes before class started, so I hung out by my locker for a bit. The student population was fairly small, so the entrance to our school was a narrow double door entryway. During the start of a school day, students and faculty were usually squished together like a can of sardines while trying to enter the building. Anyways, my first class was near the front entrance and my locker was on the opposite end of the school. While walking to class, I had to push against the flow of people entering the building or while getting slammed with backpacks and glared at by annoyed upperclassmen. But suddenly, I got a very uneasy feeling. Walking with the crowd of incoming students was my school's art teacher. He was fairly popular with the students. He had recently graduated from college, so it was easy to relate to him. Typically, people would chat with him wherever he went, but today, no one was acknowledging him. It was at that moment we locked eyes. He looked startled when I saw him, and his reaction totally caught me off guard. Visually, he looked normal, but in my mind, I saw a dark aura hanging over his head. A sharp chill rushed down my spine and was so intense, it was practically painful. I felt weirdly drawn to his energy, and it scared me. Like a lot. I physically had to struggle to break our gaze, and when I did, I practically ran to the classroom. After our first period, it wasn't long before the entire school erupted in chaos. Our art teacher had never shown up to class. This sparked out-of-control rumours, and some of his dedicated pupils had started to panic and cry. A couple of girls were crying in my second period, so I avidly assured them that I had seen him that morning. It made them calm down and feel a bit better, so I promised all my friends and classmates that I had seen him just a little while earlier. But at lunchtime, the news finally broke. The night before, our teacher had committed suicide. Students were crying and the school fell silent, but I had seen him. I was confused and frustrated, so I was begging my friends, teachers and even strangers to listen to me when I said he was okay. People became furious with me. I was accused of making up lies for attention and was shunned by a lot of close friends. I was an insecure 14 year old, so getting attention was the last thing I wanted and I had no reason to lie. However, I would soon find out I wasn't the only one who had seen him. During lunch, as I was rambling on about what I had seen, three upperclassmen approached me. They all began to corroborate my story. Yeah, I saw him by the school entryway. So did I. Me too. Something was off, but I'm certain that it was him. Did no one else see him? And so on. Not only had we all seen him, it was at the same time, in the same location, and we all had the same reaction to his presence. I was just thinking about a very haunted area near where I grew up. I'm often homesick for the mountains and was reminiscing about one of the strangest things I've ever seen. When the old mining cemetery was open and you could drive up, we went there annually at night on Halloween. There's a lot of lore. People seeing full-bodied apparitions and handprints appearing on the windshield if you drive up on a particular foggy night. We took our annual trip up. This was about 2006. I remember it clearly. 
My dad's friend was running around with a cigarette, shaking branches to try and scare us. I was tough as nails, and he wasn't going to frighten me, as the rest of the kids ran back to the car. I was standing there looking around at the old headstones and taking in the chilly night air. He was perfectly calm, and he walked up behind me. Still smoking and carrying on about how he could tell I was my father's daughter. As we were chatting, a white pickup rolled up next to our truck with the cab light on. The cemetery is on a hill, and we were only about a hundred feet up the hill, so I could see clearly into the cab. I couldn't see the driver. I said to my dad's friend, hey, who's driving that? He said, I don't see anyone in the cab. Me neither. My dad's friend looked extremely confused. I yelled down to my friend who was outside the truck to lock in the window. She looked in, turned completely pale and jumped in our truck. Both my dad's friend and I ran down the hill and the truck slowly backed out and went back down the path. Cab lights still on. No one is visible driving. I jumped in the truck and she was yelling, no one was in there. Either this was the most elaborate redneck prank ever pulled off and someone has hid it for 10 plus years, or I saw a ghost truck. In our area, news travels fast and I'm sure if some redneck rigged a self-driving pickup, it would have been news for days. I've been watching videos about cryptids recently, and I guess I just kind of wanted to just have this exist outside of my head. The house itself wasn't that old, like 40 to 50 years, and before us, I think it was used for parties. The area does have another haunt. Across the street there's a house, and in the night, apparently, someone can be heard walking to the bathroom. I've been told by several people that this happens. To my knowledge, I'm the only person who experienced these events, so like, grain of salt and all that. But in that same vein, I didn't experience anything like this in any other place I've lived. The most persistent appreciation was the sound of clanking metal, kind of like pots and pans. It was very faint, but my room was the furthest point from the kitchen. So honestly, I spent a lot of my time as a young child just assuming someone was making something. It did really freak me out though, like the first time I entered the kitchen past 8pm to find no one was making anything, I had no clue where the noise originated from. I think it happens every night, if not, it was common enough where it just kind of lured me to sleep. It eventually stopped, but I have no clue when. The second is worth I'm going to call the bride, so one time, I'm running through the hall of my house, and when I passed an open door, I saw what looked to be a five to six foot figure in white in the corner of my eye. The room was dark and nothing in there was white, let alone that brilliant white. I can't remember much about the figure other than approximate size of the colour. I call it the bride because while I can't remember much about it now, that's what I called it then. Like I said though, I'm not confident in this one. Now the final one is the one that affected me the most. The others happened when I was younger, but this happened when I was like 14 or 15, so I'm pretty confident. It's a short story. One night, I got up at like 2am, and I heard the sound of like a chainsaw or something revving up in my house. And I know the sound had its origins inside, because my place had an echo, and an outside noise wouldn't have moved like that. It scared the shit out of me, and it was so vivid I can't imagine it being my mind. It only happened once, but the fact I got scared like that as a teen made it so this one really stuck with me. For context, I'm visiting family in Mexico City with my dad and sister. We're staying at my grandparents' house, where my sister and I are staying in one room, and my dad in the other. Moving on, after what was a very normal day, I decided to go to bed since it was getting late, and I was getting up early the next day. Keep this in mind, 
the curtains on the window in front of me were closed. It did take me a while to sleep, but that's not out of the ordinary for me. After about an hour, according to my watch on my nightstand, I was woken up by the buzzing of a fly and the itching of bug bites. After about an hour, I decided to go back to bed since I couldn't kill the fly. Thankfully, I was able to go to sleep, but not for long. It was now 1am. I woke up cold and sweaty to the fly buzzing again. The blinds of the window in front of me were now open halfway. I was getting mad at this point, so I turned the lights on to try and kill the fly. I didn't see it once. If it wasn't for the bug bites, I would have thought I was hallucinating. After an hour or two, I gave up on killing the fly, so I decided to just chill on my phone for a while and try to go to sleep. This is when I got an overwhelming sense of unease. I realised just how off things were. Not a single noise coming from the house, which is usually very busy. Not a single noise coming from inside, which had a lot of people. I sent a text to my dad to see if he was awake and we could watch TV or something. The text didn't even go through. This was when I got scared. I looked out the half-open window and saw that there was no movement outside at all. Not a single car passing by, nothing. I tried to go to bed because I was getting very scared at this point, but I couldn't. No matter how hard I concentrated, I just couldn't go to bed. By now it was 4.30 and I decided that I would just wait until I had to get ready, since I couldn't sleep. I could still hear the fly every now and then, but other than that, there was still no noises at all. It must have been around 5 or 6 when I was finally able to sleep. My dad woke me up about an hour later, where I woke up feeling super tired and groggy. But the scariest part was seeing that all my bug bites were gone, and that the curtains were all closed. I worked at a cafe for seven years now, all through high school and now into college. I'm technically management now because I host, making price decisions and close the restaurant. The owner's mom, who's usually there every night to close and do the cash draw, is in Arizona for a few months visiting family, meaning I close the restaurant by myself. So I go about my business, walking the cooks and busboys out to the back door, locking it after they've left. I then head back to the front of the house to grab the cash drawer, credit card slips and keys and head back to the other end of the restaurant where the office is. The office lights in all the years I've been there has never been turned off. Not after you leave the room, not even when you leave at night. I've had talks to them about why but the owner's mom is not negotiating on it and always wants it on. It was on earlier when I went back there and I'm the only one with the keys to the door. I know I didn't turn it off, because it's not a habit for me. I've never turned the light off once. I check the side of the wall, and flick the light on. So it was in fact physically flipped again. Again, I'm alone, and the only one with the keys, so I have no clue as to how it was off. There was an older man who had a heart attack and died in the restaurant in the bathroom about nine years ago. So people always say the place is haunted. I've heard my fair share of kitchen pots clicking after the kitchen staff have left. Or random slips printing off when no one is by the order screen to click print. And even the sound of toilets flushing after clothes when it's only me around. But this incident freaked me out the most. Last night while closing, the door to the inside of the restaurant slammed shut in front of me and the head chef. We just looked at each other with our jaws dropped. No one was in there and the clear glass door was behind another clear glass door to the outside, which had already been locked. So it couldn't have been the wind since it was behind an outdoor door. I'm kind of on edge, as it seems as though the more I'm closing alone, the more things I'm noticing happening. It really picked up when the owner's mom left town and I was left to close by myself at night. 
with no one else. I don't want to get yelled at for not wanting to close. So I'm thinking about making the back of the house guys wait for me and leaving all together. My four year old son woke up screaming in distress. While my wife was comforting him, my seven year old daughter came out of the room and said her bed was wet and it was scary. Backing up. Last night, we put our kids down for bed. They sleep in a bunk bed, my daughter on top. After my son was screaming and my daughter saying her bed was wet, I thought she had just sweat a lot and discounted the fact that it had scared her. I felt her and she was completely dry. Dry hair, dry clothes, dry skin, not even clammy and dry underwear. I went into the room with her and felt her bed. It jolted me. Her sheets had a wet spot about two feet across and her bed was soaked down into the mattress. I mean soaked, like someone had poured an entire glass of water into the bed. She hadn't wet the bed. Like I said, previously she was completely dry clothes and all. The position of the wet spot was odd as well. It was the upper half of the bed, from where her chin would have been to where her belly button would have been. Even odder, the bottom part of her pillow was soaked and it cut off the top of the wet spot. By that I mean it was like the liquid came from above rather than getting the mattress wet and soaking into the pillow from below. The liquid was clear and senseless. I soaked as much of it up with towels as I could. There was enough liquid to even wring them out into a bowl, so I did exactly that. I have some water testing equipment for an aquarium I have downstairs, so I thought to test the hardness and see if it was tap water. Our tap water is extremely hard and tests at 360 ppm. The liquid from her bed registered at 555 ppm. It was 50% harder than tap water and definitely not urine. The walls and ceiling in her room were bone dry. There were no water bottles or cups in her room at all. This water basically came out of nowhere with no explanation and there was a lot of it. I can't come up with anything to explain it, not one. And it has us both a little dumbfounded and freaked out. This is probably unrelated, but it adds to the creepiness. Our dog was completely freaked out last night. Stress panting, not leaving my side, ears back, acting absolutely stressed, both before and for the duration of the evening. Back at the very end of my sophomore year of high school, I had an event after school that caused me to come home a little late. My parents had just split, so my mom and one of my sisters lived in an apartment together, and my dad worked nights back then. As for my other sisters, the oldest was married and the other was rarely home. So it was just me that day until either my sister actually came home or my dad came back after midnight. I was chilling in my room and I heard the garage door from downstairs slam shut. It scared me so badly especially as the next thing I heard was the front door open and slam shut as well. My bed was right by the window to look out front. No one. No one left the house, and even stranger, my family's dog wasn't barking. She was a rescue who was all bark and no bite, but boy would she bark at anyone or anything she didn't recognise. Or even if someone came into the house or left, yet she didn't bark once. She actually ran into my room, seeming a little spooked, and when I went downstairs to check, everything was in its place. I opened the front door, and no one was there, possibly just staying on our porch out of sight of my bedroom window. My first encounter was after one of my very last days in high school. I was somehow home alone again, despite having extended family move in after my parents split. Big house filled with even more people, yet somehow... I was alone again. When I made it all the way up the stairs, I heard something downstairs. I can't remember if it was a pop or a slam, but nothing had fallen when I went to go check. I called out for anyone, checked every single room, 
but there was nothing. And I know it wasn't any of the doors, because each had their own distinct creaks or sounds when slammed, on purpose or on accident. I brushed it off thinking I was crazy and ran back upstairs. A little bit later, I decided I wanted a snack, and barely a few steps out of my room, just before turning the corner to go down the stairs, I heard a voice over my left shoulder whisper, Hey! in a hot, breathy way. It was a male voice, but when I turned around, nobody was there, because of course, I was alone. Normally I would have chalked it up to bring in my thoughts running rampant, and I confused myself by thinking something while the vent was blowing. But the vent wasn't blowing, and why would I hear a voice in only one ear? Or feel the air over my left shoulder as if it was hot, despite it being spring? So the AC should have been on. I'll still never forget or be able to explain that experience. So to start off, I want to explain that I suffer from bipolar disorder and I deal with many sleepless nights because of it. I've experienced sleep paralysis so many times in my life since I was little that I never kept count. When I was little, I was absolutely terrified. I wouldn't be able to move and there would just be this dark silhouette of a person standing nearby. Distance would vary from each experience. The most terrifying one that stuck with me was when I was maybe 10 years old. The figure was standing on my chest and I had difficulty breathing. I never understood why this was happening to me. Then, as I got older, my fear turned to rage. Instead of wanting to scream out of terror, I was trying to let out a war cry and would try to charge the figure, but to no avail. I turned 21 and I stayed up playing games all night. When I finally drifted off, it was the figure, but this time was different. Again, I was filled with so much rage. All I wanted to do was attack the mysterious figure. I managed to lift my arm towards it, took a step back, and I woke up. That was the first time I saw it move. I then went a very long time without suffering sleep paralysis. My wife left me unexpectedly when I turned 29. My grief consumed me. I spent many nights sobbing without sleep. Then one night, when I finally did fall asleep after being prescribed a powerful sleep aid, the figure returned me. Except it was more aggressive this time and it was no longer a shadow, but it would never let me see its face. Still filled with rage, I would try to change it, but my movement was very slow and took so much effort to just lift a finger. It grabbed me by the foot, but to its shock, I grabbed it by the hand back. I then tried to pull myself up using all the strength I had. Just before I could look at it, it shoved its other hand in my face, blocking my view. I then bit its hand as hard as I could. I woke up shortly after that. So far it hasn't returned. That was only a few months ago. I'm sure that that isn't the last encounter I'll have. Every time I have these episodes, I make it my goal to defeat whatever it was. And I'll get stronger every time I face it. Given my bipolar condition, this could just be my imagination, since I don't have a very good self-image. I don't claim to know what it is or what's happening to me, but what I do know is I will not stop fighting it till it's defeated or leaves me forever. Well, this is something that happened around four years ago. I got home from work around 6pm, but in winter time, 6pm is like midnight, so it was dark already. I live with my older brother in a small apartment. Two bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, and a small living room that we had as a personal gym with some weights and a punch bag hanging from the ceiling. That punch bank weighs around 200 pounds, and it's attached to the ceiling with a chain. So when I punch, it moves and the chain makes a noise. So that afternoon, I got home, brother wasn't there yet. Went to my room, left the door open, turned on the PC, and just started relaxing. Suddenly, the chain started to make a noise. I didn't mind at that moment, just continued with my things. Then the noise increased. So I got up to take a look and I saw the bag moving from side to side. 
My rational mind thought, hmm, maybe the wind. Went to check if the main door was open, but it wasn't. I stopped the bag and went to my room. A few minutes later again, but I wasn't scared. I thought this is interesting and came to my mind to sign this very strong and loud. Stop doing that. I don't want to play now. That punch bag stopped right there. And that's when I freaked out. I just couldn't move. I felt goosebumps and I wanted to run, but I was too afraid to move a finger. I managed to play loud music from the computer to try to recover a little. Ten minutes later, my brother got home and I felt much better. Nowadays, when I told this to people, I just laughed about it to see their reaction. Even they got goosebumps listening to my experience. I had a person in my life when I was in high school that changed my perception of my life forever. And I never felt a stronger astral connection before with anyone. In those years, my borderline personality disorder was not yet diagnosed. And I was in the year worst years of my life struggling seriously with drug addiction and with a preoccupying case of bulimia, depression, anxiety disorder, and my mood swings were uncontrollable. I met this guy from another school. He was the cliché deranged and artsy guy with a magnetic personality, and everyone looked at him with a strange perception. We used to date, and he revealed to me that he was an indigo child, and he truly believed that I was too. We had this connection that I haven't experienced before or after him. We were in our cloud above the others, and my life was a continuous discovery of new angles and shades of myself. I connected with my inner me and finally tried to find a cure, a palliative for my mental illnesses. One night he escaped from his home and walked 40 kilometers through the countryside to come to my house just to give me my letter. In that letter, he talked about his upcoming death. He knew with certainty that when he would be 19, he would be dead. He pictured his death in detail and he was not preoccupied about it. He said that he would be surrounded by blood, needles and pain in his deathbed, and it had no connection with drugs. Anyway, his 19th birthday came and went, and I was crazily paranoid. I began to suspect that he was a fraud, not that I wanted him dead. I truly cared for his beautiful soul. In April of the same year, he died. He was crushed by a truck transporting gravel and he died in the ambulance. When the news broke in my school, my first reaction was to laugh. I couldn't believe this was true. When reality hit me, I was gobsmacked and everything fell into place. I don't want to continue right now, maybe later if someone's interested. But only remember, it's so painful and soul crushing. So this happened in 2013 when I was 18 years old. It was sometime in the summer. I've forgotten exactly when, but that isn't really relevant. My friend, her boyfriend, and several of his friends were going to camp out for a couple of nights in Sulphur, Oklahoma. They invited me and my boyfriend at the time to join them. Everything had been great. We had a typical summer camping experience with lots of swimming, hiking, and arguing over correctly setting up the tents during the day. Nighttime comes around and earlier in the evening, we befriend some people camping near us and invite them over. We have a nice fire going and we're all just sitting around shooting the shit with our new friends and a bottle of Bacardi Zombie. Around midnight, we all start to get a little restless with our campsites. Our new friends tell us we should drive out to the cliff that overlooks the town. The moon was super bright that night and we all thought that this was a great idea. Kids, don't go hiking in the middle of the night. It's super dangerous. Also, don't drink if you're underage. I mean, you will anyway, but as a responsible adult, I have to say that. Anyway, nine of us piled into my friend's boyfriend's truck. Six of us in the bed of the truck, three in the cab. By the way, her boyfriend didn't drink, so he was definitely okay to drive. And another point I'd like to make is that I only had one drink this night. And at the point of our excursion, it had been a couple of hours since I'd had it. So I definitely wasn't intoxicated, and certainly not intoxicated enough to hallucinate what I saw. 
So where we were was a very dark rural road headed up to this cliff area. There were a few houses up this way, but at the time it was pretty desolate. There were also no cars except for us on this road at this time. My friend, my boyfriend and myself were sitting on the driver's side out in the back of the truck. So we're outside enjoying the breeze. We came up to a spot on the road where we're passing a home. Again, there are some houses out here, but not a ton. And it's not a residential area, it's rural, so no street lights. As we pass this house, I see a girl standing next to the mailbox at the end of the driveway. She's barefoot, dirty blonde hair that's just past her shoulders, light blue sundress with what appeared to be a flower print. And she's just standing there motionless and facing the road. Her face was completely expressionless. I may have thought she was a mannequin had she not just turned her head and held my gaze as we drove by and kept staring until we were out of sight of each other. I instantly had chills head to toe and felt incredibly uneasy. She looked to be a teenager herself or a very young adult. She was alone and the house was completely dark. No porch light or any light coming from the windows. I turned to my friend and boyfriend and asked if they had just seen what I had and exclaimed how creepy that was. They agreed, but didn't have too much else to say. Naturally, I thought whomever lived there was not just trying to scare whoever drove by by looking like a stereotypical ghost girl. But what made me so uneasy was the idea she would have just been standing out there alone for who knows how long, all in the hopes that someone might drive by. Keep in mind, this was in the middle of the night, and we hadn't passed a single other car the whole trip up to the cliff. It just wasn't sitting right with me. We continued on and made it to the cliff and enjoyed a moonlit mini hike and enjoyed the view over this sleepy town without any other incidents I might add. A few years down the line, my friend and I are having a spooky discussion and I brought up that night. I asked her if she remembered that night and how creepy that was. She told me that she had a confession to make. She said, you've brought that night up a few times since then, and I have to be honest, I never actually saw anyone standing there. None of us did. We actually thought you were trying to scare us, so we played along. She went on to tell me that she does remember the house in question, and she does remember the mailbox and all of that, but that there was never a person standing next to the road beside that mailbox. And everyone else in the car, they hadn't seen her either. They all thought I was full of shit and just trying to scare everyone. What the fuck did I see? I remember so many details of what she looked like. Almost in a frame by frame sequence. I remember the uneasy feeling I got as soon as I saw her and how it felt like she was staring directly at me. At the time, I thought she was just staring at all of us. But maybe she was, in fact, only staring at me. My friend has since told me the story thoroughly creeps her out now, knowing that I was dead serious about seeing her and I definitely wasn't fucking around. And I'm also way more creeped out now that I'm the only one who saw her. I just don't know what to think of it. My parents moved out there in the early 90s and the whole family experienced weird things there. And I wonder if anyone who's lived in the house after them, or even now, has experienced it as well. My grandpa bought this foreclosed house. They lived in a condo or something in the meantime, while they finished the house. My uncle told me that when he went there to smoke and chill with friends, the house had pentagrams spray painted on the walls and empty beer cans everywhere. So he assumed teens used the house to party and do weird shit while it was empty. He took a girl there one day and he heard pipes banging upstairs and when he went to the spot that he heard in the pipes they started banging downstairs and he thought it was weird. They finally moved in and my aunt, the youngest sibling, came home from her first day of school crying. She said the kids were telling her how a girl hung herself in their attic. That's where both of my aunts slept. The attic wasn't like a crawl space either, it was a finished room. My other aunt, the older sibling, said that the initials of the girl who supposedly killed herself were carved into the windowsill. 
My dad said he'd always see a girl in white in the house, but never really thought anything of it. He said he remembers sleeping and feeling the pressure of someone getting into bed with him, but no one was there. He'd sometimes even feel someone breathing on his neck. Craziest story is when the oldest aunt got engaged and her fiancé was at the house playing cards with the family. And they both told me that they clearly saw a woman walking or floating in the kitchen up to the attic. She had white on and something white on her head. They were confused because my youngest aunt had gone to bed about an hour before. So my aunt ran upstairs to check if her sister, thinking maybe she had just showered. But my aunt passed out, dry hair and not wearing white. My grandpa, who's a foreign Albanian man, said that he would also see a girl walking around the house. And one time he got so upset that she wasn't answering him, thinking it was his daughter, that he walked around the whole entire house looking for her. And one day, one of the family members, years after moving out, mentioned how they used to see a girl walking around, and everyone had those on guy saw it too moments. My grandma and grandpa on my mom's side were born and raised in Montenegro. My great grandpa's house is where they and the whole family live. Things were done differently in my culture, so if it's something in the story seems odd, it's just how things were done then. Witches are and were very common back home. Most people couldn't afford doctors, and like my family, when you live surrounded by mountains and no one owns cars, you would go to the village witch doctor. This woman, who was a known witch, married my grandpa's brother. Before she could get pregnant, my grandpa's brother was murdered. So even though she didn't bear any children, my great-grandfather still kept her in the house as his daughter-in-law. Only thing I've heard about her is that she was an evil woman. Her and my grandparents lived in the same house. My grandma got pregnant for the first time and had a dream that a woman in a wedding dress came to her and said, Congratulations! You're pregnant and it's a boy, but do not get excited because he's going to die. My grandma had the baby and before he was a couple months old, he died. My grandma got pregnant again and the same woman visited her in her dreams and said, congratulations, you're pregnant and it's a boy. But just like before, don't get excited because this child will be taken from you too. Sure enough, it happened again. Before the baby was one year old, he died. Third time, my grandma got pregnant. She believed the land or something had been cursed, and so she had the baby far away from home. After a year or so, she woke up in the middle of the night to the baby dying. She can't explain to us what exactly the baby was doing, because our language doesn't have a lot of descriptive words. But she called the witch to come help. The witch cracked an egg on the baby's chest, and my grandma said she saw the yolk slowly move up to the baby's neck and stay there. The witch turned to my grandma and said, the baby won't die with you in the room, you have to leave. And my grandma said the moment both her feet were outside the house, she heard her baby die. My grandma had 11 children, and only five of them are alive today. The worst she went through was they had a son in Italy while they were refugees coming to America. And when he was eight years old, he got hit by a car when his ball rolled onto the street. My grandma and family are convinced that the witch cursed her. Union Cemetery in Connecticut is known to be one of the most haunted in the country. You can research it for yourself. There are a lot of people who have seen the White Lady. My family, who lives nearby the cemetery, told me that the legend is you'll see a green mist or sparkle, and then see her usually in their car. Whenever I visit them, I pass the cemetery more than five times a day, and it's definitely creepy looking. About 20 years ago, when my aunt and her family moved there, they all went and got ice cream one night. On the way home, they all were looking to see if they could spot the ghost. 
One of my cousins was maybe five at the time and acted very weird when they got home. He told his sister that he saw the woman, but they were kids and she thought he was just trying to scare her. That night, he woke up screaming and crying. His mom and sister went to calm him down, but he didn't stop. Every night he wakes up crying and screaming, talking to someone, sleepwalking, all the stuff you'd imagine. And whenever they tried to calm him down, he was totally not aware of anything that was happening around him. Like as if he was in another world. They'd shake him aggressively and he wasn't responsive either. My aunt said that she took him to see a spiritual doctor and the doctor healed him. Nothing has happened to him since. As a kid, I used to be obsessed with World War II. I'd collect items and made it a passion of mine. One day, I had some money and visited a local surplus store. I saw an authentic US M1 helmet on the shelf that I hadn't seen before, covered in dirt, even damaged. These can often go for a lot of money. I asked the owner how much it was and he reluctantly said $20, which surprised me. When I asked why this was, he pulled it down off of the shelf to reveal brown, crusted material inside and a bullet hole through the temple area of the helmet with no exit hole. He explained it had been dug up by a metal detector in the Ardennes. Being a stupid child, I bought it. I had no thoughts or fears about it and just thought it was cool. After a week of having it in my possession, I began to have horrific nightmares, mainly involving visions of death. My parents would report constant yelling in my sleep. Having no prior mental health issues or genetic predisposition, I was brought to a therapist. No conclusion was reached and the nightmares continued every day until two months later, I decided to sell the helmet to afford a new backpack. The nightmares stopped the day it left my possession. Not once during this time did I assume the helmet had anything to do with it until years later, accidentally stumbling across accounts from veterans describing cursed war trophies and battlefield items affecting their lives. Please do not take items from dead bodies. I really don't know where to post this, so I'm just throwing this out there. For backstory, my dad was an extremely frequent smoker. He'd say he'd been smoking since he was 16 and how it's keeping him alive. He barely had any teeth. The walls in the room were yellow. There were burn holes in a lot of the blankets and even the curtains, and I couldn't step into his room without taking a deep breath beforehand. It was bad, and I swear I had a part with him dying, but I don't really know. He died in January of this year, and we brought his asses home in February, and that's when it started. And ever since the stench of cigarette smoke just seems to follow me, even surrounding me when I'm sitting around or about to sleep. It only comes at night, and it gets so bad where I have to pinch my nose and breathe out my mouth. When I'm in my room, I have to close the door to get it to go away. Whenever it's around, I feel uneasy, and like I'm not alone. My dad and I never really had the best relationship, especially before he died. He was a piece of shit to me, and it was no secret to everyone that I hated him and he hated me. So maybe this is his way to annoy me even more. I brought up to my mom about a month after it happened to see if she could also smell it and that it's just a lingering stench. But she said, really? No, I haven't smelt anything. That's just your dad visiting you. Okay, well, maybe I don't want him visiting me, mom. Jeez. Maybe it's nothing, but he was a big paranormal monster movie guy. So maybe he just wants to have some fun, I guess. First one, five or six years ago, I was around 12, maybe 13. I went to take a shower in the evening around 9pm, and I was always scared of mirrors. Still am. Anyway, the way the bathroom is set up, the shower with curtains is in the corner, 
when you open the curtains, you see the mirror on the opposite wall. And in the corner of that wall, next to the shower, is the toilet, where I put clothes to wear after I shower. So I took a shower, went to get dressed, and opened the curtains. The first thing you see is the mirror and sink. And if you pull the curtains all the way, you also see the toilet. So I pulled them all the way, and above the toilet, I saw Grandma's face. Just a face, no body. It was almost like she was sitting there, but I couldn't see her body. She was looking straight at me, but she didn't look like anyone I knew. Maybe 90-ish years old, wrinkles and a bun. I stared for a few seconds and then blinked. Suddenly, she was gone. I honestly have no idea what it was, but I hope it's my imagination. Second thing, I was in my bedroom asleep and woke up around 4.50am. It was still dark out because it was winter and my bed was facing my door, which is in the corner of the hallway. On the connecting wall right next to it was the toilet room. The toilet room was always locked when my uncle wasn't redoing the floor. Anyway, I woke up and looking at the hallway, it looked like the light was on, which was weird as I was the last person to go to bed and turned it off, but okay, no big deal. Then I saw footsteps directly in front of my bedroom. I knew it was right in front of it because they were hiding the light from the hallway. They went straight into the toilet room, which was locked, but the footsteps didn't even stop and unlock. They just went straight in. They also didn't sound like anyone in my family. Later, I realized I shouldn't have been able to see any of that, even the light underneath my door, because the floor level of the hallway is higher than the floor of my bedroom. I used to babysit this kid when I was a teen. Every single time I went over to their house, I felt this absolutely repulsive energy. Completely terrible and downright disgusting vibes. I can't even explain it. Pure uneasiness. Now the two dogs we had were nervous, barked, twitched, and had to have had Prozac, constantly pacing and upset. The kid I babysat refused to go to bed, to the point he would scream and cry, completely age inappropriate. And to be honest, I understand. I never said anything, but I hated tucking him in too, and would run down the stairs after. The upstairs of the house felt horrible. It felt like something was in there. I say things because it didn't feel like a person. I literally get goosebumps thinking about that. When my mom would go over to dog sit or to feed the dogs, she felt the same. Years later, she brought it up to me and we both had felt it, but never brought it up to one another. I never said anything as a teen because I wanted to pay and just thought I was paranoid. Up until the age of 10, I lived in a suburban neighbourhood in Sacramento. The houses there were on the older side, but I'm not sure exactly how old. I know our house needed a lot of work and renovation, and I remember my dad worked on it a lot when he had free time. While nothing strange happened inside the house, there was something rather odd about the tree in our backyard. It was the only tree we had back there, and if memory serves, it was an oak tree. It could have just been my childish mind back then, but something about that tree really unsettled me when it got dark at night. The branches just looked creepy and menacing in some way, especially when the wind would move them. But that's nothing paranormal. What I think was paranormal were the orbs of light that would sometimes appear around the tree at twilight. I remember asking my dad what those orbs were, and his response was an offhand comment. Something along the lines of, probably just your imagination. I think the orbs were some kind of mischievous spirit which flocked to the tree. The reason I think that that may be the case is because of the two times those orbs got me in trouble. The first time they got me in trouble, I was about seven years old. I was playing outside with my dog, Loki, and it was getting late. Right when the sun began to set, 
I saw the orbs begin to descend from the top of the tree. Loki must have seen it as well, because he looked right at them and growled. They just hovered around the tree like fireflies lazily fluttering about. At this point, I was curious about what they were, so I began to reproach. Loki must not have liked the idea of me getting close to the orbs, because he began to bark like crazy. Then one of the orbs flew right by my face. That's when Loki went nuts and ran straight up to the tree. He began to bark so viciously that my dad came out and yelled at him. Loki was a relaxed dog, so he never acted like that. When my dad finally got him to calm down and come inside, he lectured me, telling me not to get the dog so worked up when we played together. The next incident is kind of funny now, looking back at it. Just a year before we moved out of the house, when I was nine years old, the orbs appeared one evening when I was outside making dirt roads for my toy cars. Dad must have wanted me to play outside that day so we could have some alone time with my mom. When the orbs appeared, they seemed unusually playful in the way they flew around the tree. It was almost like they were taunting me or asking me to follow them. One of them flew right up to my face again. Since Loki was inside this time, I decided to play along and follow the orb around the tree. It then flew off to the side of the house, a narrow space between the fence and my parents' bedroom. While chasing the orb, it flew right by my parents' window before stopping and disappearing. That's when I noticed my parents through the half window, half undressed and staring at me in shock. After hearing my mother shriek at the top of her lungs, my dad stormed out to scold me like I'd never been scolded before. The orbs only appeared a few more times after that before we moved and I ignored them. I still believe they were sort of mischievous spirits looking to cause trouble. We moved into our new house a year ago and especially in my room, there were things happening. First instant was when me and my sister shared the room. We both heard the floor creaking many times as if someone's walking right there, but no one was there. Second instance was the tap for the flush in the bathroom that was connected to our room it was closed automatically many times. So when we asked our parents about the tap, if they were closing it, they had no idea and told they never touched the tap. Then the third instance was when we heard sounds. Sounds of things falling like it fell in the room, but nothing fell at all. Sound of the phone vibrating, but no phone was vibrating. And the feeling of someone being there in the room when I'm all alone. Sometimes a static sound is heard right near the ear out of nowhere. And there were times when things went missing from their original place and were again found where they should have been originally. So after these incidents, we called a priest and let him bless our house and everything stopped. So we went on a trip and after returning, everything started again. So this time I prayed over the room and I pray regularly. So for now, everything is silent. I don't know what this is, but if someone knows, please tell me. This happened two years ago during late August of 2020. Me and a good friend of mine, we'll call him Sam, were going to do a two day, one night camping trip deep in the Sierra Nevada mountains of Northern California, 40 miles north of Yosemite. We were scouting deer ahead of the season. We parked on the side of a two way highway, which was around 7,000 foot in elevation and started walking straight up the mountain. We had come upon a clear flat meadow and decided it was a good place to camp. Once we set up camp, we climbed up to about 9,000 feet and came upon another meadow. We'll call this the upper meadow. This had the most beautiful views I've ever seen of the Sierra Nevadas. At this point I was tired and Sam wanted to explore the rest of the upper meadow. I want to say it was about 350 to 400 yards long. The grass was about waist high. We had brought a small little camping chair that fits in one of our packs. Sam wanted to explore 
and I wanted to sit and see the view and eat the snack, so we decided to split up. It was about 15 minutes later when I got this weird feeling. It wasn't necessarily a scared feeling, but more than putting me on edge, it felt like something was watching us. So I decided to try and get up and try and reconnect with Sam. It took me six whole minutes to find him, which didn't make any sense. It was a fairly long meadow, but six minutes just felt too long. Something was just off about this meadow. While writing this, Sam and I both just got goosebumps looking back at that moment. For some reason, we can't remember how, but eventually we met back up and went to the top of the mountain. At this point, we decided to go to the top of the mountain and look around, and then decided to go back down. Once we had gotten back to camp, we decided to eat dinner and go to sleep around 9.30pm. This is where it gets interesting. Once we had gone to bed, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Animal sounds here and there. But after around 45 minutes, we both had fallen asleep. It wasn't until, I'm thinking 12.30am, I woke up to the sound of what I thought was a branch getting smacked against the tree. This went on for a while, and it was coming from all around. As I was laying in my sleeping bag, listening to this, it suddenly stopped. Now one thing I forgot is where we set up camp. It was next to the edge of a straight climb up a mountain. The reason I say this is that I heard and felt a sound of like running, but the thud of its footsteps sounded really heavy. The only thing I could think of during this time was what the fuck is going on out there and I just couldn't move. I could hear this thing running until it suddenly stopped and then I heard it again. When I heard it run, it almost sounded like it was on two legs. This happened four or five times, and then it all stopped for good. The next morning I woke up to see if I could find anything about what happened during the night, but found nothing. It was the strangest thing. Sam didn't hear anything, so he didn't believe me at the time, but now looking back, he feels differently. I don't know what to make of this whole situation. Writing this made my blood run cold. Ever since then... I've had so many questions and no answers. I'd love feedback from all of you. I'm young, still in my teenage years. I live with my parents and a younger brother. I have little experience with the paranormal, especially since I've always been more on the skeptical side. I don't know much about spirits or the afterlife though I believe I've come to find myself living with one. It started about a year ago, at my best friend's house. We wound up incredibly bored, and found ourselves making a very good decision. Oh yes, genius level at that. We played with her Ouija board. That night, I supposedly spoke to four different ghosts. Two male children, a young adult, and an older or senior male, none of which had names. That night, I slept terribly. Ever since then, I've had issues with insomnia. I think I opened something. Ever since that night, I've been noticing more activity in my home, especially in my basement, where my bedroom is. I wake up frequently due to the overwhelming feeling of being stared at. I see faint white or black lines, lines floating in and out of my bedroom. I see things being moved. I don't know why it likes to mess with and toss my stuff. My phone was pushed off a counter and shattered. My headphones have been hit and spun. Stacks of boxes have fallen over. My computer mouse keeps clicking. Some nights, the air feels heavier and my energy drains as soon as I enter the room. It flickers my lamp that I use for reading and schoolwork. I've replaced the light bulb multiple times. I don't have any other explanation for what could be causing these things. I've seen it once or twice. A faint apparition of a small child. A girl, maybe around 12 or 13. Quite tall. It doesn't quite have a face, but I can tell that it feels sorrowful. The atmosphere is chilling, and I feel the sense of grief and tragedy. 
I don't think it means any harm, but it scares me. It scares me a lot. I don't know how to get rid of it. I don't want to force it away. I don't want to be mean to it out of fear for my own well-being. I sleep with a Bible. I don't have incense or sage. I don't know where I could find these things. My mother is friends with a medium. We sort of talked. My mother being the middleman and sending messages. She says it could be a relative or some sort. Once that's passed away, before that hasn't quite crossed over yet. That's about all the information I have, as my mother would probably rather believe that I'm hallucinating over anything. So I'm sitting here, 3.31am, typing up to text to post, anxious and irritated by my failed attempts to sleep. I'm terrified, and I don't know how to deal with this. I'm from India, and I experienced this about two years ago, when my grandmother died. My grandmother used to live in my family village, which was about 400 kilometers from my city. We got the news of her death in the afternoon. We were shocked, and started packing as we had to leave within an hour. My cousin's family met us halfway, and we started our journey together. It was a six hour long drive. We reached our village at around 11 or 12 p.m. My grandmother's body was resting at the entrance of our house, covered in a white blanket. It was a heartbreaking moment for us. Everyone from our village was at our house mourning the death of my grandmother and planning her final rituals. It was 2pm and my cousin's brother and I were tired. So the elders suggested we take a nap. Since there was no place left for us to sleep, we decided to sleep right next to our grandmother's body. I was not at all scared by sleeping this close to my grandmother's dead body. Instead, I have a feeling of peace and love around her. I fell asleep and I saw a dream of my grandmother which made me feel so happy and also scared. In the dream, I saw my grandmother waking up next to me. Everyone was confused. She started saying in a joyful and happy voice that she was very happy to see that all her children and family had to come to meet her in the final moments of her life. And then she hugged me and my brothers before laying back to rest forever. And then I woke up. Tell me guys, what do you think? Was it just a dream I had because of emotional breakdown? Or did my grandmother communicate with me for the last time before leaving this world? One night, I saw movement in the reflection of the television when I was about 15 years old back in 2010. What I saw was a blob, like black mass that was formless, sort of like a cloud, just jittering in the reflection of a TV screen. I saw it take humanoid shape and crawl on the ceiling in the reflection of the screen. Moments after processing every possible logical explanation instantaneously, and remembering other family members' experiences, something creepy happened. I concluded it must be paranormal. So I paid for protection and seconds later, a voice spoke into my right ear saying, are you afraid of me? Maybe jump out of my bed and flee into the room. Months, if not a little over a year, my younger sister who was about six or seven years old at the time, my room had no door, and she often played with her other sisters or by herself if she decided to enter my room without my permission. I had my television off, and she was playing by herself while I was on the other side of the house. I heard a screech thinking my baby sister got hurt. I came running to the rescue. Her entire face was red. She had tears and snot everywhere as she explained she saw a dark figure of a definitive woman as if she was from the ring. I always hated that TV. These events were correlation to the fact that a loved one was using a Ouija board. I've seen shadow beings in the corners of my eye. I saw red eyes for a split second. I've seen these creepy things occasionally. One time, I was using the restroom and didn't lock the door. 
A shadow with red eyes actually opened the door, slightly peeking in, and then closed it. The good news is that when I prayed the Ouija board would be thrown, it was thrown out. God answered that prayer. Obviously, he knew it was a door that was spiritually dangerous for me. Well, I was sleeping pretty tight. And I think it was something like 2 or 3 a.m. You know, when inside your house is totally dark, but not that pitch black darkness. More like bluish darkness. Anyway, I was sleeping like a rock. Trust me. Because I woke up all of a sudden without any sound waking me up. When the door of his room was opened, we could clearly see the short corridor on part of the living room. And then I looked at the living room to see that something quite tall, 100% black, and wearing something like a coat, was standing near his grandma's feet, and I was paralysed. I stared at the entity for about a minute or two, and it wasn't even bothered that I was looking at it. I looked to my boyfriend's bed, but he was asleep, and I wanted so badly to wake him, but I was scared that something might come to me. I thought maybe if I stand up or stick my leg pretty close to his body, it'll wake him up. But I was afraid the entity would look my way. So I tried pressing my eyes to see if it was maybe a hallucination. Who knows? And the things didn't even disappear for a second or two. Standing there like a real person. So creepy. After deciding that I couldn't do anything about it, I just closed my eyes with my heart pounding in my chest. So fast that I thought for a second I would pass out. And I went back to sleep. In the morning, I heard from my mother-in-law that his grandma wasn't feeling well and had to go to the hospital. I can't say how freaked out I was, but I didn't told her because she's sceptic as fuck. But I told my boyfriend what had happened. And from that day on, I've always been afraid to wake up in the middle of the night and see something. A couple of years ago, I was trying to fall asleep at night. I was laying in bed when I saw a little black figure staring at me. I shared the room with my sister and our beds were parallel to each other. At the corner of her bed was a black figure. It was super dark. I couldn't make out much, but I could tell it was staring at me. Here's the thing. I have a black cat. He normally sleeps with me at night. My first thoughts was that it was him. I really didn't think much of it. I didn't look at it too hard. I just saw a little black blob. I just continued to try and fall asleep, but I couldn't. I was just laying there for a bit. Half an hour passes and he's still there. I simply think it's the cat. More time passes and it moves to a chair at the end of my sister's bed. At this point, I think I'll just get the cat to come sleep with me since he's just sitting there. So I get up towards it and the thing just dissipates. I don't know how to explain it. It just moved off as I approached it and all of a sudden it was gone. I was so confused, but even more confused, when I looked back to my bed and it turns out my cat had been sleeping next to me the entire time. My sheets were black and grey so I honestly hadn't seen him till I got up and turned back to my bed. It was so strange and I got such an eerie and unsettling feeling this thing was just staring at me for about an hour. I couldn't make out any features. I honestly can't explain, but I just knew it was staring at me. I could feel it. It was also very small, about the size of a cat. I wasn't unsettled when it was just sitting there, as I thought it was the cat. I thought it was sleep paralysis, but I could move. I just couldn't manage to fall asleep. I was just laying there for about an hour trying to sleep. Once I realised it wasn't the cat, I was so overcome by fear, I just wanted to cry and run into my parents' room and sleep in their bed. I was honestly far too afraid to walk to their room as I had been spooked at this point. It never recurred again. I told my parents about it and my dad, who's a very religious person, then placed the Bible in our room open to a certain page. It's been years so far, and it's the only paranormal experience that 
that's ever happened to me. So I tend to dream quite frequently about random things that have happened the week before or things I've been thinking about before bed, like anyone else. My dreams are always so vivid that when I do have them, I can always remember the, lo the location and how I was feeling so vividly when I wake up. And I always tend to remember my dreams from start to finish. I'm quite a heavy sleeper, but noise and close proximity seems to wake me up straight away. I'm always up by the first tone of my first alarm. Last year, however, I experienced a dream that I will honestly never forget for the rest of my life. It started like this. I started off in my bedroom at my dad's house. This is where I was currently asleep on my bed. I was scrolling through my phone or something. It was really dark outside in the dream. I remember thinking I should definitely go to bed soon so I can wake up for work in the morning. I got bored of scrolling and was just about to get under the covers and get comfy like I usually do. But I had a really bad feeling and all the hairs on my neck started to stand up. I remember thinking, whatever you do, do not look out your bedroom window. But obviously, curiosity got the better of me. Even though I somehow knew something really bad or evil was present outside, I just had to look. At this point, I didn't even feel like I was in control. Like I didn't want to open the curtains one inch, but me in the dream opened the curtains a slither. And I could see two really tall, completely black figures. Like when kids draw stick people or like a slender man for just an image. A cold sensation went all the way through my body, starting from what felt like my brain all the way through my toes and as quick as it was. I'll never forget that feeling whilst looking at the two tall black looming figures a couple of gardens back at my window. Now usually this wouldn't alarm anyone. Weird dreams happen all the time. Could have easily been a nightmare something lingering on my subconscious. But here's the part that even to this day, I cannot for the life of me get out of my head around. As soon as the cold sensation ran through my body, I jolted so hard. I remember how much my body leaped from the mattress and realized I was awake. I was still drowsy, that kind of half sleep, half awake business, until my hearing suddenly seemed to just click into action. And I realized my phone was ringing as loud as the volume would go. And I could see my boss was ringing me. Confused, in my dazed state, I answered the phone as quickly as I could and put on my best, I'm definitely awake voice. Hello? Hello? Are you gonna join us today? Or let us know when you even are? My boss was so angry. He sounded like he was seething. This confused me even more. And before he could even say another word, I took my phone away from my ear to check the time. It was 11.45 a.m. I start work at 9 a.m. and wake up at 7.30 a.m. every morning. Shit, I replied. I'm so sorry. I don't know how this happened. I'm getting dressed and coming in right now. I'll be there in 30 minutes tops. When I ended that call, I couldn't move. My body was squirming with discomfort, like I'd been touched against my will. I felt so sick to the bottom of my stomach and was stuck to bed in sheer terror and panic. All of my alarms had gone off. My mum had called me six times, my boyfriend around four. How have I lost nearly four hours? And how didn't I wake up to my alarms? And why did I feel cold all over for around an hour after I woke up? Now I know there are perfectly logical explanations to this. Could have just needed more hours of sleep that night and just fell into the deeper sleep. Not responding to my phone, which I placed onto my pillow every night. The phone, whose alarm wakes me up every morning before and since this incident. Nothing like this has ever happened to me since. I haven't seen the figures in my dreams again, nor have I slept through alarms or lost hours. But let me tell you, I'll never forget what I saw out the window that night, and I'll never forget the feeling I had after realizing how much time I'd lost. I'd be very interested to find out if anyone else has ever experienced anything like this. This isn't just one experience, it's a handful of experiences. 
I live in a two-story apartment building on the second story with my mom and our cat. I've lived here for over five years now, and I've got a handful of experiences, and I'm here because of that. I've always known that there have been things that live here with me, and I've never really been scared of it. I can tell whatever lives with me isn't out to cause me or my family any harm, and it's just probably trying to live beside us in harmony. It's totally possible that they don't even realise we're here. That being said, when one of my best friend's boyfriend visited my apartment and immediately said, oh, this place is haunted, I replied, yeah, I know. One of the experiences that terrified me the most was when I was 13 and snapchatting a friend late at night. And in one of my pictures was an incredibly detailed but semi-transparent face right next to mine. This was way back before Snapchat introduced filters and facial detection. This was also before memories, so when I saved this picture, it only saved into my iPod Touch's photos, and not online. Two of my biggest regrets are that I saved it instead of screenshotting the photo, because when I saved it, the quality was so bad that you couldn't really see the face at all, and that I don't have that picture anymore. I really wish I still had that picture, because since then, it's been easy to sweep this memory into the category of loose childhood memories that I'm not quite sure happened. I can remember this moment so clearly though, and I remember how terrified I was. I couldn't sleep after that. This was the biggest experience I had, but I didn't really go looking for them. A more recent thing that still continues to this day somewhat periodically are the footsteps. I'll hear footsteps above me, stomping around in the middle of the night. Remember that I live on the top floor of the building, and every time our apartment does roof work, it's during the day, so as not to wake anyone up. And they warn us at least a few days ahead of time. It's not as frequent anymore, but a year or two ago, it got to the point where I was hearing them every night, for a few minutes at a time, all around, the exact same time, 11 to midnight-ish. Similarly, the most frequent thing is the noises from next door. It's a very normal thing for us to hear banging and loud noises from the other side of the wall when we go to the bathroom, and it always startles my friends the first time they visit. That's not that unusual by itself, since it's an apartment building, and you always hear the other people stomping around. The odd thing is that I've been hearing a baby crying on the other side of the wall since we moved in five years ago. The same baby. It really sounds like it. Plus, I've never ever seen the people in that apartment actually leave their apartment in the five years of being there. That one is a lot easier to write off because it could simply be that they have a lot of babies and they don't really leave. Another thing that you can come up with an explanation of your own is that our fire alarm goes off all the time in the middle of the night and our building is literally known for that. They've never caught anyone who may be at fault for this and I'm pretty certain they've changed their system several times to prevent this from happening, but it doesn't work. Finally, possibly the most damning experience I've had are the children in the hall. Just as it's normal for you to be able to hear your apartment neighbors yelling next door, it's pretty much certain that you're gonna hear kids laughing and running through the halls. The apartment managers often send out notices to please try and contain your kids because they get noise complaints consistently. The problem with this is that I've literally never seen these kids. They run through the halls pretty much every day, and it's been like that for the past five years. But whenever I've tried to look for them, I can't see them. My mom is one of those people who tries to complain as well, and the first few hundred times this happened, she stepped out to ask the kids to be quieter, but she's never been able to find them. This might just seem like an easily explainable thing, and I get that. I don't currently have any proof because these things happen either very quickly or gradually over time, but I'll definitely try and get some. I know that there are things here with me living here. I can feel them. I don't really want to bother them when they're just having peacefully beside me and have never caused me harm, and I'm very cautious about trying to summon spirits or disturbing them, but I'm open to suggestions. Ganeshan, a 60-year-old man from Andhra Pradesh, is the protagonist of this story. The year was 1992, and he was 30 years old back then. 
He owned a Tiak grove, which was his main source of income. The grove had over 300 Tiak trees, with one banyan tree planted in the middle, and it was located in the close proximity to his house. This grove was his ancestral property, and he revered it a lot, as it was established by his father himself. He used to guard the groove all by himself, and there were a lot of wood thieves during those times. He used to spend most of the time inside that groove guarding it. One day, when he went to the toilet outside his house at around 3am, he saw fire amidst the grove. Thinking that someone was intentionally trying to set his grove on fire, he rushed into the grove making a lot of noise. He followed the lights which led him to the banyan tree in the middle of the grove. He was shouting, hey, get the hell to my grove or else. He stopped shouting as soon as he had a view of that fire. He was shell-shocked to see a figure that resembled a man burning. He ran towards that man to help him, but as he neared, he saw that the man was not even flinching in spite of the heat of the flames. The man slowly went behind the banyan tree, and when Ganeshan followed him to know what was happening, he was nowhere to be found. Startled by what he had seen, he stood there for a while blank-minded. When he felt the heat of the fire on his wrist, he came back to his senses. Sensing something was wrong, he decided to leave the grove as soon as possible and started to walk back. While walking back, he saw someone on that tree in his peripheral vision. When he turned, he saw that burning figure hanging from the tree. He was scared to death by the scene and ran back to his house in fear. With a lot of questions clogging his mind, he didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, he explained what had happened the previous night to his friends and took them into the grove along with him. Everything looked normal, with a few burnt leaves near the banyan tree beyond the only exception. He showed them to his friends, who told him that some thief might have burnt them for heat. They suggested appointing a separate night watchman to which he agreed. The next night, he was woken up at around 2am by knocking on the house door. When he opened it to see who it was, he saw the weeping face of his watchman. When he asked what went wrong, he said, Did I wrong you in any way? Why did you put me in the guard of those wretched trees? I saw four men burning there. I went to help them, but I... I was wrong. Those are not humans. This is something else. Ganeshan asked them to calm down, and they reluctantly walked into the grove again to see what was causing all this. As they neared the banyan tree, Ganeshan saw a man performing some ritual near that tree, and he was surrounded by three burning figures. When he asked the watchman, you told me there were four figures, but I only see three. Are you sure there were four? He got no answer. When he turned to see why the watchman wasn't speaking up, he saw his face turned pale. The watchman seemed to be frozen with fear looking at something near him. When he turned to see what he was looking at, he saw another burning figure staring at him. Its one eye was gouged out and its body seemed to be completely burned. They were so scared that despite their attempts to shout, their voice never came out of their throats. That figure slowly moved near the other three figures. They rushed out of that grove without turning back to save their lives. After sending the watchman back to his house, Ganeshan went back to his house and slept. He was woken up by the wailing of the watchman's family. They were blaming and cursing him, and when he asked the reason for their bad behaviour, they told him that the watchman had hung himself from the banyan tree in his grove and died. Why did the watchman go to the grove again? What was the reason for his death? You'll know the answer to these questions in the second part. Ganeshan had a feeling of guilt for the death of his watchman, as he felt that the watchman died only because of him taking the latter into the grove again. He gave a ransom to the watchman's family, and informed his dad about the things that were happening in the grove. His father yelled at him for not informing him earlier, and went to the village leader's house. He explained everything to him and told his dad, All of us will go to your grove tonight. Let us see what's happening there. Ganeshan, along with the village elders, camped inside the grove that night. There seemed to be no unusual occurrences, 
until one of the elders complained of a sudden burning sensation on his hand. The others told him it could be because of a honey bee sting, but a section of the hand, which he complained of, started to show second degree burns. It looked as if a man wearing hot iron gloves had held his hand. He was taken home by a few of the elders and his condition seemed to worsen. Later, Ganeshan's father had a similar burn on his arm and they were not sure about what was causing these burns. The elders were dismayed by what they were seeing and the clock struck 2am. When Ganeshan turned towards the tree, he saw the black magician he had seen the previous night. He stood near the tree with the four burning figures he had seen earlier standing around him. He screamed in fear, which made the villagers turn toward him. And when they saw the magician, they rushed towards him to beat him up, thinking he was the cause of all the happenings in that grove. But as they got closer, they saw those figures themselves and stood frozen in fear. He told them that the thieves from the neighboring village hid their loot in that tree. They had apparently died in an accident and these four figures are their spirits, he added. When the elders asked him what should be done to free that grove from those spirits, he told them that the tree should be cut and burned. He also said that the tree can only be cut after a week, as few rituals were supposed to be done on it. He warned them that during the forthcoming week, those figures could kill people from their village, and they should stay watchful. During that week, as he warned, over 12 villagers had hung themselves from that tree and died. The list included a six-year-old girl, a pregnant woman, and an elderly woman in her 60s. Those people did not have any driving factor, and the cause for their decision still remains a mystery. On the first day of the very next week, the elders, along with the black magician, headed to Ganeshan's Grove to cut that banyan tree. They proceeded to cut the tree after getting Ganeshan's approval, who despite being reluctant at first of the emotional value the tree had, decided to let them cut it for the greater good. While cutting it, the elders heard a sound that resembled the wailing of a crowd of people and told the black magician about it. He told them to continue without paying much attention to it. They cut that tree together and burnt it. They were happy that no one else was harmed and continued with their daily lives. Everything seemed to be normal in the village, for a week after which everyone who cut the tree hung themselves to death on the same day and time. The people who died included Ganeshan's father as well as the black magician. These people were financially settled and had no reason to kill themselves. The cause of their death still remains a mystery. As days passed, the villagers started feeling their harvest catch fire all on its own, right in front of their eyes. They started hearing the cries of people on the streets during the night. They tried seeking the help of almost all the priests in and around the village, but they seemed to be of no use. These occurrences eventually stopped on their own, and Ganeshan says that they don't know even now what caused all that ruckus, and how it stopped on its own. Shasha, a software developer aged 25, is the protagonist of this story. Born in India and brought up in Singapore, Shasha has been in constant topper and this has led to her peers getting jealous of her. Opposed to her liking, she was forced to come back to her birth nation because of the demise of her maternal grandmother. Seeing the mental state of her grandmother after her husband's death, Shasha's mother decided to settle back in India. Like any typical unmarried Indian, Shasha lived with her parents while she searched for a job. She got lucky enough to land a good job within the first month of her search, and her office was at a commutable distance from her home. Her life was going peacefully until this event occurred. Although her initial days in India were worry-free, eventually she started noticing her family members becoming sick often. She didn't hear much attention as it started with a common fever, but with time, things started getting a lot more serious. Her mother started complaining of severe stomach ache, but despite multiple appointments with the best doctors in the town and prescribed scans, the cause of her ailment was never found. It was not just her mother, 
but her father had a similar ailment as well. But for him, it was his head instead of his stomach that had a constantly terrible ache. Imagine a 3BHK condo where two bedrooms were almost always filled with his sick parents. This was Shasha's reality. Surprisingly, when she left for another city with her parents to attend a close friend's wedding, her parents' ailment disappeared magically, only for it to return when they returned home. But this time, she started having issues with her vision, which caused blind spots in her peripheral vision. She was barely surprised when she even had the best ophthalmologists in the city who couldn't figure out the cause. Despite her ailments, she continued to work as that was the only thing that gave her relief from her sorrows. One day after finishing her work, she came back home. She left her office by 5pm and the next moment she saw her watch, it was 10pm. Did she magically teleport herself from the office or was her body being controlled by something else? When she returned back home, her parents asked her the reason for turning up so late. When Shasha tried to explain, she backed out again for a few minutes, and when she came back to her senses, she saw her mom in a stunned state. When she asked what happened, she replied, Why did you speak like a guy now? Shasha thought her mother was pulling her leg, and went into her room to sleep. But with time, she started having these blackout episodes quite often. This dented her reputation in her office, and she didn't know what she did during these episodes. Similar to her mom, her colleagues and friends complained of her speaking like a man and acting strange sporadically. With time, the frequency of her episodes skyrocketed, which caused her job. This, in turn, led Shasha into deep depression, giving her suicidal thoughts. With her parents suffering every day from an unknown ailment and her losing her job, her family eventually became financially weak. She wanted to leave that house immediately as she felt that it was the cause of all the things happening in her life, but her mother didn't even show a remote interest in it. It was the 40th day after her grandmother's demise and a priest visited her house to perform the 40th day rituals. The priest was visibly perplexed when he entered the house and it became even more evident when he looked at Shasha. The rituals went as planned, but the priest's facial expression never changed. When he was about to leave, he asked Shasha's mom to bring her daughter to this place, as he felt something was wrong with Shasha. Her mother obliged and brought her to this place, as she had asked. He greeted them, and after performing a few rituals, he went back to their house with them. They were surprised when he asked them about the ailments that they were going through as he didn't say anything about it to him. He led them to a place near the house door and asked them to dig the ground, to which they obliged. During the process, they found three clay dolls. The dolls had blood on them, and they had pins pierced throughout them. One had a pin on its stomach region, the other on its head. And finally, the last one on its eye. This instantly made them understand the cause of their suffering. The priest burnt those dolls and told them that they had to perform a few rituals for 48 days. He also told Shasha that she was possessed by the spirit which was cast upon their family and warned her saying, you might die if we try exercising you now, but even if we don't do it, the spirit will kill you. She and her family decided to take the risk and proceeded with the exorcism. Unlike in the movies, no spirit came out of her body during the process, but she stopped having those episodes after the process. Day after day, the family's sufferings reduced and they completely disappeared by the 48th day. Zorin, a well-established lawyer from Malaysia, is the protagonist of this story. Zorin is a single mother who tragically lost her husband to an accident after just five years of marriage. Because of her love for him, she continues to live alone with her daughter without marrying another person. She's a very strict mother and never compromises on her daughter's score, a characteristic of which her daughter ranks a solid proof. Zorin claims to have been blessed with psychic powers 
and she claims that she can see spirits and demons and commune with them. She also claims to have used these powers to solve multiple tough to crack cases. Although these powers have helped me in many instances, they have given me a lot of sleepless nights and mental scars, she adds. One day, Zorin's daughter's best friend named Gayatri went missing after school and a legal complaint was lodged by her parents. But despite the police officers trying their best, there were no clues about the missing girl for over 10 days. Her parents sought Zorin's help and requested her to take up the case, to which she obliged. Zorin was trying her best to figure out what had happened to the kid when she came across reports of a foul smell that resembled decaying meat being emitted from a local department store. She reached out to the police, asking them to check what was causing this foul emission. The police, after investigating, figured out that the smell was coming from the cooling ducts of the store, and on further investigation, they found the missing child's lifeless body inside the duct. The case was already a nationwide sensation, and the police proceeded to arrest the store owner. But this case was not straightforward. Records stated that the owner was not inside the country for a previous couple of weeks, the time period during which the kid went missing. Zorin, after seeking special permission from the police authorities, proceeded to investigate the detailed owner, who constantly pleaded innocence and told her that he was not aware of how the corpse ended up inside the store. Despite tracing multiple loose ends, the investigation always ended in nothingness. Frustrated with her incompetence, Zorin filed a petition in court, seeking permission to witness the post-mortem procedures on the kid's corpse, in person, in hopes of a solution to the case. The court accepted her petition and granted her the permission she had requested. The procedures took place on the very next day, and Zorin had a really hard time trying to control her tears while looking at the kid's body getting eviscerated. After all, this kid was her daughter's best friend. The body had a whole lot of deep disturbing scars, and the doctors who performed the procedures speculated that the girl was brutally tortured and raped for at least three days before her death. Once the procedures were completed, Zoran was able to hear faint whispers of a young girl. She anxiously looked around to see who it was, but there was no young girl nearby. Thinking it was her mind playing tricks on her, a depressed Zoan went back to her home. That night, she went to sleep earlier than usual, only to be woken up by the whispers again. When she opened her eyes, she saw Gayathri's enraged spirit staring at her. Petrified at the sight, she tried speaking to the spectre. With every question she asked, Gayathri's spirit came closer to Zorin, saying, Mom. Her whispers gradually changed into wailing. Although terrified, Zoran was persistent in her questioning and never stopped her questions. Her attempts did not go in vain as her spirit finally gave her the answers she was seeking. Zoran says that Gayathri's spirit told her, I got a call from my boyfriend's number. When I answered it, I heard the voice of his friend instead. He told me that my boyfriend met with an accident and he wanted to see me. He told me he'd pick me up that evening and take me to the hospital. Extremely worried by what I heard, I grew gullible and agreed. He came in a car and picked me up as planned. My worries slowly turned into fear as the car went into a shady road. The car stopped near a warehouse and when I refused to get down, two other guys came out of nowhere and pulled me into the warehouse forcefully. They tied me up and brutally raped me till I died. The spirit had apparently let Zorin know their identities and the warehouse where she was abducted. When asked about how her body ended up in the store, the spirit said, one of the guys who raped me works in that store. Despite multiple attempts, the officers never believed in Zorin's claims and asked her to meet a good psychiatrist, thinking she was mentally ill. But Zorin did not give up, and with the help of her friend who worked in forensics, she gathered DNA evidence against those three bastards. She presented a report that the police officials couldn't reject and finally, those bastards were arrested and put behind bars. I didn't reveal Zoan's real name as she is still practicing lawyer and asked for her identity to be kept a secret. The story is hard to believe, 
but the records of this event, excluding the commune with the spirit, are officially recorded. Listening to this incident changed my opinion on ghosts. Maybe all spectres are not bad. I feel like time is kind of doing its own thing. When I was in school, which I finished in 2016, a day felt like it lasted ages and that I could do so much in one day. For example, I could easily go to school for six hours, get back home about half an hour by bus, eat something, do some homework and or some revision, play my PlayStation and with friends for a couple of hours and then go back to the school's football pitch to play with my friends in person for another few hours. Then. Time started going extremely fast once I finished school. It often felt like a week would go in the time of a normal day while I was at school. It felt like I could barely do anything in one day and it just felt like time was going faster and faster. It basically feels like some years have been skipped. By this I mean mid 2016 when I finished school to 2019. It legitimately felt like these years have gone in like a month. 22 was kind of a mix. Sometimes it felt like a month flew by other times a day lasted for ages, like it did when I was in school. If someone was to ask me when I finished school, my first thought would be to say a year or two ago, even though it's been almost five years. This has been happening no matter how busy or free I am. Now, I always heard a lot of adults and elderly people say that the older you get, the faster time flies by, so I assumed that's what was going on. However, time recently started to feel normal again. By this, I mean that it feels the same as when I was in school. I feel like I can do so much again. Time started to feel normal around November slash December. Why is this happening? Is this happening to anyone else? Is there a way to fix this? My parents and I go to this church, which was built in the 1800s. And as my dad is the pastor, I end up spending quite a lot of time there. We've been going there for almost seven years, a time in which I experienced quite a few things that I can't explain. It's mainly been stuff like the sound of doors opening or closing, or getting locked or unlocked, people chatting or singing in another room, the sound of children playing and laughing, the sound of footsteps and other similar stuff. However, I never saw anything or anyone, and everything would be the same as before. I think it's worth mentioning that these things happened while I was there by myself. Anyway, I once went there with my mum as she forgot something and she didn't want to go by herself. I needed to go to the toilet, so I went to do my business while she was looking for her stuff. I didn't lock the door as my mum knew I was in there and she could have used the other toilet if she needed to go. However, the door just opened by itself. I literally saw the door handle go down by itself and then the door opened by itself quite violently. I managed to stop it when it was about a quarter of the way open, but it still opened with quite a high amount of force. After I finished, I asked my mum if it was her and she said no. It was only then I realised I didn't hear any footsteps on a floor where footsteps are quite obvious. I explained what happened to my mum, but she said it was just the wind and the door mechanism playing tricks on me which didn't make sense. I went back to the exact same door a few days later, closed it and tried to open it without touching the handle, but I couldn't. The door simply wouldn't open, no matter how hard I pushed it or the amount of force I used, meaning it was definitely not the wind. My older brother died on June 1st. About two months before his death, I started seeing a shadow person walking from the kitchen to the bathroom. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal, but my boyfriend has never experienced anything. I never said anything to him about it because I'm not sure he believed me when I would tell him about the things I'd see and hear. My purse was also thrown out of my dresser and landed on the foot of my bed. There's five feet between them. One day, I'm sitting on the couch and my boyfriend looks at me and says, been seeing a person-like shadow walking from the kitchen to the bathroom, but it's only in my periphery and when I try to focus on it, it just disappears. 
I just saw one behind you. For him to see something I've been seeing actually was a relief. About two weeks before my brother died, I also had a friend tell me they see the same thing while at my house. The home was built in the early 1930s, but there's never been any activity. A few days before my brother's death, I was standing in the kitchen. I could feel someone with me, but it was almost comforting. They said my name by my right ear. The voice was male and almost a whisper. It startled me so much, I jumped and said, I hate it when you do that. After his death, there were no more experiences. I've always had a very deep connection to my brother. He caused an accident when I was 14 that claimed the life of a young lady. I was over a thousand miles away, but I just knew it. It was late at night and I was hysterical. I started calling friends and family and asking them not to let him do whatever it was I was feeling. The next morning, I got one of the worst calls I've ever had. He had killed a woman in the accident and wasn't expected to live. How did I know? Another time, I had a dream about him being lost in a forest, running, but unable to find his way out. The next day, I started calling hospitals and police stations until I finally found him. He had lay on the floor in the bathroom for three days after a night of partying. He had internal bleeding. Blood had settled in one of his kidneys. He had to be on dialysis. Again, how did I know? But I always knew when something was really wrong. I've been thinking about my brother a lot in those two months before his death. At this point, we were six years estranged because of his lifestyle. I knew something was wrong, but what was the shadow about? I just don't understand seeing this thing weeks before he died and then everything just stopped after his death. Was it a warning? Were they trying to tell me something and I just wasn't listening? Any thoughts on this subject are welcome. A couple of years ago, I had come home from a typical day of work and had to run out quickly again to do whatever errand I had for the afternoon. I live alone, but occasionally have my kids with me. I have a corner lot in an older suburban development and am surrounded by really good neighbours. The woman across the street from me on the small side street was in her mid-90s at the time. She was actually somewhat active for her age, frequently going out late at night and driving herself most of the time. Whenever I would see her in her driveway, I would make it a point to say hello and ask if she needed anything. In addition to being somewhat active, she was also very witty. She always knew my name and noticed things like a new car whenever I would pick one up or something that I cleaned up in the yard. If we happened to see each other when we were in our cars, either pulling in or pulling out of our driveways, which faced each other, she would simply make it a point to wave in a very generous way and smile. I got to know her sons a little, but they are both about 20 years older than me. We didn't have much in common, but we would chat whenever they would stop by to see her, and both of us happened to be outside. Probably around four to five months prior to this incident, I told one of them that she was out the other night, as he had stopped by but she wasn't home. He was surprised to learn that she had still been driving herself. I didn't think anything of it, because she never seemed to have any problems, and seemed to be very with it. Soon after that, her car was gone, and the two men started checking on her more regularly, even though one of them had to drive a couple of hours to get here. So getting back to this sunny afternoon, I pulled out of my driveway to go about my business, and I saw her sitting in her driveway with a white suit, bluish blouse, and sunglasses on. I pulled away slowly and waved to her as I always did. She didn't wave back. Rather, she used one hand as a visor, as if she was trying to make out what she was seeing, despite it being me, who she'd seen hundreds of times before and being only about 20 yards away. I sort of shrugged my shoulders, didn't think anything of it, and went about my day. This was midweek, and to this day, I don't know if it was on a Tuesday or Wednesday. I wouldn't have ever given it a second thought because it didn't matter. That is, until that Saturday. I came home from whatever it was I was doing, and both of the boys were there with their families and trucks. I figured they were either there to celebrate something, or move her possibly closer to them, or into a nursing home or somewhere else. Of course I went over to say hello, and asked what was going on. The older one told me that she had passed away unexpectedly of a heart attack. I was shocked, and told him that I had just seen her in the driveway and had waved to her. He said that it had happened 
around 5.30 a.m. on Wednesday. Rather than being overwhelmed by fear or anxiety, my mind immediately went back to seeing her that day. I still don't know if I had been one of the last people to see her alive, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 13 hours before she'd passed, or if I was one of the first to see her after passing. Wondering if anyone else has had these type of experiences. When I was a little girl, like from a toddler through to 10 years old, I'd be scared to death to sleep alone. My parents were pretty nice to let me sleep in between them on their calking most nights. There were a few nights that I remember extremely well, ones that have haunted me for years. I've even researched the previous owners of our home with no luck. One night, I was laying in between mom and dad in their bed, staring at the ceiling and trying to feel sleepy. Mom and dad had already drifted off to sleep, and I could hear our grandfather clock start chiming from the living room. All of a sudden, a glow could be seen from the hallway, and then as I entered the room, I freaked out. Standing at the foot of the bed was a tall, slender apparition of a pretty woman with red hair, wearing a long, flowing yellow dress with a flower in her hair. It was either a dark pink or red flower, but I'm sure it was hibiscus. I immediately sat up and woke my parents up. Well, my mom was the only one who agreed to deal with me. I was yelling and asking her who that lady was. Where did she come from? Why is she here? Well, my mom could say that she's so sorry and she can't see any woman. I was adamant and pointing and still couldn't see. The woman just stood there standing for a few minutes and then disappeared. She came back a couple more times, but then as I got older, never again. I actually got used to her when she did grow up and would talk to her while my parents slept without any response from her, ever. While I was still scared, as long as my parents were right next to me, I don't think I was in any danger from her. To this day, I remember exactly what she looks like. The other day, I asked my 82-year-old mom if she remembered those nights. She looked at me completely shocked and alarmed, almost like she had just seen a ghost and told me, I don't want to talk about that right now. But she did acknowledge that she did remember those nights. About a week or so ago, I had some strange dreams. I lost my dad in 2012. Whenever I dream of him, it seems very real, as if it isn't a dream at all. What I mean is, the two of us are doing things that we normally would have done when he was alive. They aren't mixtures of different visuals or random people doing strange things that don't make sense. They are, in fact, very pleasant and comforting. So last week, I had a rather weird one. People who I know have passed on, former teachers, neighbours, etc., were in it. They were talking with each other and knew that I was there, but sort of just looking at me but not really engaging in any type of conversation. I can't even recall what they were saying. The weirder thing was that a couple of them were holding keys. Skeleton keys. I felt like it was weird, but didn't think too much of it, other than the fact that it was so vivid, and I remembered it so well over the next couple of days. Here's where it all came back to me. Just yesterday, I decided to get my daily exercise by walking. Rather than taking the dog, which I normally would do, I decided to go on my own and make it a long one. As I was entering a local park by way of a service road, I thought I saw a skeleton key laying along the side of the road. At that point, I walked over to it, and the conversations that some of the people in my dream had started coming to me. They weren't anything out of the ordinary, just things like what they ate and how nice the weather was. I knew at that moment that I was remarking on the weather with my girlfriend on that day that I had the dream. No big deal. I always try to make sense of my dreams and connect them to my activities that day. I had no idea if it was really what they said in the dream or if my imagination was starting to make things up. I stared at the key for a second and then just shook my head and smiled. It wasn't a key at all, but just a piece of rust. Literally, before I could turn back to the direction in which I was walking, a loud sports car with blaring music 
came around the bend at a high rate of speed, right through the section of the road that I was standing on before I saw what I thought was a key. It scared the hell out of me. I had my AirPods in and never would have heard it. It's very unusual for anyone to drive through that park that fast. It took me about a minute to wait for my heart to stop racing. At that point, I turned around and walked home. It took the wind out of me and literally exhausted me. This happened today at work. I'm currently TDY at a military base in Kansas, Fort Riley. This building is on the airfield and not the main post. This happened midday today and there was nobody around but me. I had walked next door from my office to the next building over to go talk to someone and grab a drink. Turns out the person I was looking for wasn't there. The entire building was empty except for me. I walked to the kitchen and grabbed my drink from the snack fund with no issues, except an uneasy feeling. This is unusual for me because I've been here for a couple of months and never had off feelings. I turned around and walked out the kitchen door and down an open hallway where the exterior glass door was. Just as I reached to push the door open, I saw my reflection and someone else standing behind me. I got all the way out the door and held it open expecting someone to come out behind me. I hadn't thought about the fact the building was empty until I turned around to see who it was. Nobody. I paused and actually shook my head as I was confused and really expected someone to be behind me. I went back and told my co-worker about what happened. She believed me. Turns out that people stationed here full time have had multiple experiences in the building and they keep it amongst themselves and only share with people who bring it up. Partially to keep from sounding crazy and to make sure stories remain true and don't get blown out of proportion. I haven't confirmed this yet, but apparently in World War II, the building was used as a temporary morgue to house bodies of soldiers, waiting, processing after getting back to the area. Significantly creepy. I've tried to debunk what I saw with light and darker furniture or things in that direction, but I can't. The entity was right behind me in the reflection and there's nothing in there that can make that sort of a reflection that close. I'm only at this base another week, and I might go hang out with the night shift guys and get keys to the building next door to see if I can do a nighttime investigation, although I'm not super keen on doing an investigation by myself. So a couple of years ago, I worked at a hospital as security. As part of the security duties for the second shift, it was to lock all the doors downstairs in the basement of the hospital. The type of things down there range from offices, supply rooms, bathrooms, and the morgue. So one night, I went down to the basement, which is basically a big rectangle, locked all the doors, and just as I was making a, make a right to take, take the stairs up, I noticed someone walk out of the corner in what looked like blue scrubs, take about five steps into the one of the doors I locked. They didn't open the door or anything, they just walked right in. As security, I couldn't just brush this off because recently we had people steal from the supply room, so I had to check it out, especially since it was after hours. As I walked up to the door, I immediately got goosebumps because this specific door was one, an automatic locking door that can only be accessed by ID clearance, and two, I didn't see the individual pull out an ID, which you have to do to get in. You pull out your ID, scan, and wait for the green light to pop up, and then open the door. I literally just saw someone take about five steps into the door like it was wide open, which it wasn't. This door automatically locks and closes itself. So I think to myself, well if somehow someone accessed the door after hours, they aren't allowed to, so this might be the person that's stealing stuff. If a nurse or someone needs to go to the supply room, they call security, and security escorts them because of stealing incidents. So I pull out my ID, scan it and open the door. I walked in and saw nobody. Then I opened all the closet doors to confirm nobody was hiding, and then immediately got the fuck out, because I was 100% sure I just saw a ghost. 
Later that night, I got a call from the ER department to escort a nurse down to the supply room, and we made sweet, sweet love. Plop. I wish. What actually happened was I escorted her down to the basement into the supply room and told her what I saw. She then shuffled through some boxes in the supply room and pulled out the same exact looking light blue scrubs that I saw the ghost wearing. Except they weren't scrubs, they were the blue gowns patients wear inside the hospital. So what I saw that night was a patient ghost walking around the basement. After this experience, I definitely believe in ghosts in the afterlife. Till this day, I kick myself for not looking at the cameras that night. Last summer, my grandmother was put into palliative care as her health began to decline. I had already booked vacation time off near the end of August to go home. It was about a week before I was due home when my father called me to tell me that I need to come as soon as possible. Today, if possible. I changed my flight and left that night. I arrived home 12 hours later and went straight to the palliative care centre, meeting my parents, sisters, aunts and uncles. I'd spoken on the phone to my grandmother around four days prior, but at this point, she could barely say a word as she was in and out of consciousness. I crept in, leaned over and whispered in her ear. She opened her eyes and in the slightest whisper said my name. I gave her a kiss and she went back to sleep. She was waiting for me to get home. Over the next two days, we encouraged her to move on. She would have bouts of semi-awareness where she would seemingly be talking to my grandfather, who passed a few years prior. Two nights after I arrived, she passed on. I was never really sad though. She was 94 and had lived a great life. There was no reason to prolong the inevitable. My father and I decided that I need to not to stay around for the funeral, as I had to get back to work, so I flew back west. Out of my immediate family, I've always been the more open and deep one. I love researching spirituality, ancient history, often lost in thoughts of who we are and why we are here. I believe in reincarnation and that our bodies are animated by spirits, but I'm not religious. About a week after I was home, I had a rather frightening dream. I was at our old cottage in Nova Scotia where my grandmother was born. I spent my summers there growing up. I remember being in my grandparents' room when a lady in a black veil approached me. I knew it was my grandmother, but it terrified me and I awoke. The next night, I again dreamt I was at the cottage. This time I was in the room next to my grandparents. I was rifling through a cabinet with file folders looking for something. Next, the scene cut to the living room, and my grandmother was there in white, but she looked younger. But I never knew her, and yet I knew this was her. We sat on the floor and had great discussions about life and death, and what it means to be alive. Unfortunately, I don't consciously remember the details of the conversation. I feel she came to me because of my affinity with these subjects. Anyway, that was the first and only time I've been visited in a dream that I'm aware of. The validity of this encounter, to me, is without question. Everything started in my old apartment, right after I had my daughter. For the longest time, me and my roommate would hear and see things. My roommate would be in her bed with the door open, reading, and she'd see little blue lights come up the stairs and into my bedroom during the day. There was one time that I heard what sounded like a towing chain fall to the ground, but we didn't have one. I looked all over our apartment and didn't see anything that could have made that kind of sound. I've also had things thrown from one room into another room as I was cleaning. Well, after I had my daughter, I had these weird feelings like I shouldn't be touching her. It was as if every time I picked her up, I had this feeling like something was going to attack me for touching my child. When I tried to explain this to my husband and his friend, they both laughed at me and said I was crazy. But in the same moment, a crack came from the ceiling where the baby bed was on the second story, and my daughter started screaming. I ran upstairs and grabbed her and came down and just cried because no one believed me and I didn't know what to do. 
Two months later, we bought our new house. Everything seemed fine for a long period of time. When my daughter turned four, she started telling me how there was a man named Dwayne in her room. When I asked her what he looked like, she responded, he's brown with a white shirt. So when I asked her, does he say or do anything when you're in there with him, she just said no. He just watches and smiles at me while I play. So I let it go. Then a couple of months later, she started talking about what she called the silly guy. The way that she described him was not so silly. She told me that they were black and had red eyes. She even told me that the dad was the mean one. So because I'm a full believer in the paranormal, I took it on myself to start carrying a Bible around her room and yelling things at it. I basically yelled that I had no permission in the name of Jesus Christ to touch my daughter and that it was no longer welcome in my home. It's been a few years since then and all has been quiet. My daughter is now 11. In December, we started renovating the inside of our home. I went to my daughter's bedroom and saw what I thought was her leg on her bed. And I asked her to please get out of bed. Your dad and I need your help. I continued talking to her and then walked out of the room. When I came into the living room, I looked out the front door. And there's my daughter walking through the front door. I stopped and said, no fucking way. I went to her room immediately and saw no one was in her bed. My husband and his brother just laughed at me and said I was being stupid. A month later, I woke up at 12.30 or so, and our dog is staring at my dresser and growling. There was nothing there. And just last week, I picked my daughter up from her grandparents' house and noticed that our house was completely dark from the outside. But as soon as my daughter walked to her room, she yelled, Mom, something's wrong. I walked to her room and she opened her door. Her colourful disco ball was going off. She's had sleepovers before with it going off and you can see it through the blinds. It was pitch black when we pulled in. I have no clue what's going on, but I feel like it's attached itself to her and just remind me it's still there. I have no clue what to do about it. About two years ago, I personally believed something entered my house. I was in my room and a family friend was coming over to grab something. I unlocked the door so they wouldn't have to knock or anything. They live really close by, so about five minutes later, I hear the door open and my dog started barking and bolting downstairs as per usual. Then I heard the creaking of someone walking up the stairs and heading into the living room. As they walked up the stairs, I clearly heard in their voice them shout, Hello? So I shouted hi back and said I'd be down in a few minutes. So about two minutes later, I hear the doorbell ring and my dog starts barking and running down the stairs again. So I went down confused. When I got to the door, I saw a family friend outside it and the door was now locked. I unlocked and opened the door and asked, oh, did you forget something? And he just looked at me confused and said, I just got here. Confused, I peeked into the living room and saw no one was there. I was still confused, but brushed it off and just continued on with the day. Although the more I thought about it, the more unsettling it seems. Think about it. Something opened the door, locked it, mimicked the person's voice perfectly, then walked upstairs and disappeared. And I know I didn't just hear something, as my dog reacted to it too. And doors can't just lock themselves. I tend to tell the story to people who will listen. Some think I just heard something or imagined it, but others truly believed me. I don't know what happened that day myself, if I'm being honest. I'm a healthcare professional working at a small hospital in a rural area of the Midwest in the USA. It's not unusual for me to see six to eight patients a day. Occasionally, you run into a patient who you really hit it off with, where it seems as if you've known each other for years. That's how my story starts. At my hospital, we have what's called a joint program for patients who are having elective hip or knee replacements done. I was scheduled to see this lady, who we can just call Doris, for the last time before she was discharged home later that same date. As I've said, Doris and I really hit it off. 
In the process of helping her prepare to head home, I asked what made her finally decide to get her knee replacement done. She explained that she had been to a doctor many times for knee pain and finally decided to follow her suggestion after they found what they should describe as little beads around her knee in her x-rays, likely bone or cartilage. I teased her by suggesting that, oh, the aliens probably put them in there. Doris didn't miss a beat. She told me that she wanted to show me something and asked me to grab her iPad for her. After doing so, she pulls up pictures of some of her cattle that had been mutilated in the way you usually see on the alien TV shows, documentaries and so on. I'm talking patches of skin taken out in perfect circles around the eyes, missing tongues, desiccated insides with perfect hide, missing rectum or udders, no blood, all of that. I was honestly too shocked to speak much at first. I asked Doris who or what she thought was doing it. She stated she had absolutely no idea, but that she was sure it wasn't the government because they could easily come to any of the cattle auctions and buy cattle and no one would be any the wiser. She said she thought it was an intimidation tactic to leave the cattle behind like that to be found the next day. She also said that it seems they rotate around the cattle ranches in the area every year or so. Her ranch will go a few years unmolested while her neighbours will have problems. Also, she stated that it always seems to occur on what she called those weird holidays, by which I'm guessing she meant equinoxes, solstices and so on. She said that sometimes her husband will hear a loud whooshing wind sound above his head outside as well. I'm a therapist in a small rural hospital in the Midwest. This experience occurred during one of our COVID waves in the month of September in 2020. I had a patient on my caseload at the time who I'll refer to as Herbie. Herbie was an older man who unfortunately had caught COVID and wasn't doing well with it. My job was to come visit with him during his stay to assist him with completing exercises, using the restroom, getting cleaned up, etc., to help him stay active in the hopes that if he recovered, he wouldn't be too debilitated. Unfortunately, this wasn't to be. Herbie and I had a good rapport. We were both Catholics and enjoyed talking about the various goings-on in our diocese, talking about the priests, some of the beautiful older churches in our area, and discussing his life up until that point. He had just finished on a cabin that he was planning on spending the remainder of his life in, and really missed his dog. I remember Justice Ginsburg had recently passed away, and this was on the news every time I came to see him. Herbie's health did begin to take a turn for the worse, but I was sure to make him time to come see him, even just to do something simple so I would have the opportunity to keep him company for a little while. He had been in the hospital for a week at this point. We assured each other of our prayers every time we had to say goodbye. My manager needed my help on our inpatient rehabilitation floor one day, and I was unable to see him. Late that night, I sat down to pray the rosary. I'm pretty serious about my faith, and so I sometimes like to set the mood, so to speak, when I pray, to aid in my meditation on the mysteries. I'll sometimes light some candles and burn some incense to create a chapel-like atmosphere. It had to have been a Tuesday, because I was praying the sorrowful mysteries. I couldn't keep my mind off Herbie the entire time I was praying and was distracted to the point that I stopped to try and clear my mind. I noticed that the incense I was burning was producing an uninterrupted flow of smoke all the way up to my ceiling, with no breaks or curling. Yet my two candles were flickering like crazy. The vibe in the room really changed when I noticed that, but I refocused and then finished the rosary. Still though, I was unable to keep my mind off Herbie. When I finished, I put my rosary away and sat there for a few minutes to think about what was happening. The incense and the candles were still acting strangely. I didn't feel a chill or anything like that, but then I heard a very strange sound that I can't really explain. The best way I can say it is that I had a garbled or guttural quality to it. Me hearing a sound at all is pretty unusual, because I have profound hearing loss, and without my hearing aids in, 
There's a lot of noises that I simply will not hear. Then, my phone at the opposite end of the room from me began to go off. I get up to shut the thing off and I'm feeling pretty on edge. My phone was on the Google Assistant screen where you can talk to it and have it look things up or whatever. And the time read 1.17am. At this point, I have an idea of what may have happened. And I'm sure anyone reading this does too. I fell asleep that night praying Hail Marys for Herbie. The next morning, the very first thing I did when I signed on to our patient information program was look up Herbie. He had indeed passed away that night at 1.12am. I was stunned. I went to the nurse's station at our COVID wing to try to get some information about what had happened that night. But of course, there was another crew of nurses there. I heard through the grapevine months later that there were many patients who begged for time with a priest for last rites, anointing of the sick and so on. But these requests were ignored or denied since there was a strict no visitor policy in effect at the time. Besides that, I don't think the diocese would have allowed priests to enter the building anyway. I'll leave my opinions on that whole situation to the side for now. I've sat on this story for a few years and have only shared it with family and some of my close friends. It had an effect on me that I struggled to explain. I considered going to a priest to discuss it, but I've never worked up the nerve to do so. I just don't think any of the priests in my area would be very helpful. And if I'm being brutally honest, I'm still carrying a stone in my heart that the priest did not advocate more strongly for our dying patients at the time. It feels nice to get the story out in a somewhat more public way. Wondering if anyone else has had these types of experiences. When I was a little girl, like a toddler through to 10 years, I'd be scared to death to sleep alone. My parents were pretty nice to let me sleep in between them on their calking most nights. There were a few nights that I remember extremely well, ones that have haunted me for years. I've even researched the previous owners of our home with no luck. One night I was laying in between mom and dad in their bed, staring at the ceiling and trying to feel sleepy. Mom and dad had already drifted off to sleep and I could hear our grandfather clock start chiming from the living room. All of a sudden, a glow could be seen from the hallway and then as it entered the room, I freaked out. Standing at the foot of the bed of the, was a tall, slender apparition of a pretty woman with red hair, wearing a long, flowing yellow dress with a flower in her hair. It was either a dark pink or red flower, but I'm sure it was a hibiscus. I immediately sat up and woke my parents up. Well, my mom was the only one who agreed to deal with me. I was yelling and asking her who that lady was, where did she come from, and why is she here? Or my mom could say that she's so sorry and she can't see any woman. I was adamant and pointing, and still mom couldn't see. The woman just stood there staring for a few minutes and then disappeared. She came back a couple more times, but then as I got older, never again. I actually got used to her when she did show up and would talk to her while my parents slept without any response from her ever. While I was still scared, as long as my parents were next to me, I didn't think I was in any danger from her. To this day, I remember exactly what she looks like. The other day, I asked my 82 year old mom if she remembered those nights. She looked at me completely shocked and alarmed, almost like she had just seen a ghost and told me, I don't want to talk about that right now. But she did acknowledge that she did remember those nights. I've been struggling with anxiety and depression for the past years, but this went to break more than usual. And this afternoon, for whatever reason, I decided I wanted to take one long trip down memory lane. So, I plugged in my external DVD reader and started looking at old photos and videos from when I was 10 to 15. I'm 24 now. I stumbled upon a picture from 2006, Christmas day, with me, my sister, my uncle, and two second degree cousins whom I just met for the first time. It's not important, but they were 24 and 22 at the time and were the sons of the aunt's sister. I was watching all these old photos with my mother and sister. 
After feeding my need of watching old embarrassing photos of my family from back in the day, I went outside for a smoke. When I came back, my mom was literally shouting when I rang the bell. But the weirdest thing just happened. She was cleaning the kitchen table and my father's cell phone was on the table alongside other things. And she just piled them up together and moved them on the chair that was nearby. After 10 seconds, the phone started saying something of the likes, the number you're trying to reach is non-existent. My father picked the phone up and it was trying to call my dead aunt's old number, which was saved in my dad's contact list from all those years ago. It hadn't been used since. He freaked out on how it was possible because the phone unlocks with the pin of the fingerprints. And anyhow, even if it magically unlocked, it should have at least tried to automatically call one of the last dialed numbers. Not a number that hadn't been used in nine years. We are all pretty freaked out by this experience. Kind of gives us the chills. I've never told anyone about this, except my mom, because I don't think anyone else would believe me. When I was 13 or so, my parents drove our family from Texas to Virginia to visit family. My mom is all about things being educational and killing two birds with one stone. So one of our stops was in Gettysburg. We took a day to tour the town and the battlefields and then were supposed to stay in a and b that night. The B&B was located either right on or very, very close to one of the battlefields. The entire town was super creepy and the B&B had a weird feel to it, like there was a tension in the air. We checked in and everyone went to bed. Around 3am I woke up, completely alert. Despite it being mid-July in a 19th century building, with the window unit AC that limped along just enough to keep the temperature below 80, the room was ice cold and there was someone standing next to me. I'm very glad I had the presence of mind to not open my eyes, or even move an inch. I'm pretty sure it knew I was awake anyways, because after about 30 seconds, I could feel it lean down and look me straight in the face. It didn't like me or my family. It wanted us out. I could feel how angry it was. After a while, it left my side of the bed and went to look at my brother, my dad and my mom. It stayed longest by my dad and for some reason, I could tell because I could feel its footsteps on the floor. There wasn't a sound, but there was the definite feel of heavy feet on the floorboards. It came back around to me again and stood for a long time. Very close, very hateful. Then it was just gone. I can't tell you how I knew it hated us and what it has gone. It was just like the feeling you get when someone is angry at you, but you don't know why and you're scared to ask turned up to 11. I kept this to myself until about 18 months ago when I told my mom that I hated Gettysburg and wouldn't ever stay there again. She just said, is it because of that thing that was in the hotel room? I saw it too. Which of course, of course it is. Just an hour ago, I left the movie theatre after watching a light-hearted movie. Nothing scary at all. Right after, I went to a restaurant to get some dessert. I had a hankering for pie. As I was there, I felt this nope. I call it a nope because my back arches severely away from whatever is behind me. This nope only happens when someone or something bad is behind me. I don't claim to be psychic, but I am sensitive. Usually this only happens with living people. I had an art teacher in middle school that followed my class into high school who gave me this feeling anytime he was behind me. In the hallway, in the classroom, anywhere. If he was behind me, I'd feel it. Every now and then I get this feeling and it usually goes away as soon as the person or thing in question isn't behind or around me. This feeling in the restaurant stuck the entire time I was there. I kept getting waves of it. It made me shudder. The kind of shuddering you do when something cold touches your back. Now let me say, I didn't feel cold, I just felt nope. After I was done, myself and the person with me, who I'd been relaying this nonsensical feeling to, went up to the register to pay. As we were up there checking out, I looked at the lady at the register and blurted out, Is this place haunted? 
I don't go around asking people that shit. I just don't. I don't need to look like a lunatic asking about bad vibes and cornflakes. It's just not something I do. This lady, without skipping a beat, tells me that the other location she works at is. She said she literally watched a printer nearly be pushed off a counter in the back room. And another person there witnessed it too. And it was caught on security camera. She said she and the person who witnessed it were both working at the restaurant I was at tonight. And said she was a little worried because she's noticed things now moving around in her home. She asked if it could have followed her and I told her yes. I said she needed to sage herself, her home and the freaking restaurant and tell it to get the fuck out. The entire ride home, I still felt this nope. So bad to the point where I just saved myself, the person I was at the restaurant with and my whole damn house. I feel much better after saging. The shit was just too strong not to cleanse every inch of the place and I feel the compulsive need to share this with you all. Does anyone else get this nope, as I call it? I feel crazy for even sharing this because despite sharing other experiences, I've never really talked about the nope with anyone before as I think it just sounds absolutely off my rocker. I used to live with my best friend and his family in high school. The house was an older, run-down house in a very nice part of town, so it stuck out quite a bit. The entrance to the den was covered with a mattress leaning against the doorway because water damage made part of the ceiling fall in and none of us had the funds to fix it. Half of the kitchen was the same way and most of the windows in the house were covered up with cardboards or whatever else my buddy and his brothers could find. So the inside of the house was quite dark and eerie already. It was a well-known drug house for years from members of his family dealing and using drugs. So the house had seen its fair share of strange people and violence. So let's just say there was always this kind of bad vibe hanging about. I have many stories of this house, but the one that stuck with me the most is this one. I was laying in my bed one night watching TV, trying to fall asleep since I had school the next day watching Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke on the TV at the end of my bed. I would close my eyes and then crack them slightly when I would hear a funny part come on the show. I did this for about 30 minutes until I got cold so I covered myself up. I was almost asleep and cracked my eyes one last time and saw this solid black figure with a large strangely shaped head fall out of the wall above my TV and land on my bed sprawled out over the top of me. It was really tall, no apparent face, and silent. I flinched, closing my eyes and jumped up with my fist balled up, and when I opened my eyes it was gone. But I heard a shuffling past my bed to the closet and saw my clothes moving like someone had run in there. Completely terrified, I started to say out loud that this is my space and it wasn't welcome. That I live here now and it won't get rid of me and I will not be scared or terrorised of it any longer. But after this incident, I didn't have any more paranormal experiences to this degree in the house, other than things moving or always feeling watched. A month or so ago, maybe a bit longer, I was in my bedroom asleep, when suddenly I woke up to the feeling that someone or something was in my room. I looked up the area beside my bed to see some dark figure standing within two feet of me. Its shape was very thin, and it was jet black and had a craggy outline. The best way I can describe it, it was like it was made of sharp rocks, but it had no real definitive texture. It stood maybe about five foot eight or so, based on where its head was in regard to where I saw it while lying down, and how tall I am. I was a little afraid, but I've had a bunch of experiences with things passing through my house or following me home. I feel like I've gotten used to it. In my tired, a bit ballsy state, I sat up in bed and brought my face within maybe six inches of this things. It had no features or anything, no eyes, but I could feel it was looking at me and it didn't feel like it was harmless. And I glared at it, telling, I'm not afraid of you, fuck off. As I reached behind me to turn on my light, as expected, when my light came on, there was nothing there. And after I shut the light back off, the figure stayed gone. 
I think I remember seeing a similar shadow figure at the bottom of my bed once sometime prior to this particular night's event, but I can't be completely sure about the timing. I want to say I believe it was the same entity both times, but nothing has come out of it since I had my little confrontation with it. I'll admit this may have been some kind of waking dream, but certainly not sleep paralysis, as I could and did move freely. I'm not entirely sure what to make of it, and interested to hear your opinions of it. I give ghost tours through a small haunted house attraction at my local theme park as part of a side job I have on weekends. And today I had some weird experiences. The place I work is notoriously haunted. Security guards report seeing orbs floating down the streets on security cameras at night. Friends have reported seeing a little ghost boy or being pushed by a man in another area of the park. And I myself have had one or two very minor instances at work experiencing the paranormal. But today it was a bit more than usual. Today, as I was waiting at the entrance, just hanging out waiting for guests, I heard whistling coming from inside the haunt. Nobody was in there, and there was nobody around since it was near opening time, and not many folks had come in yet. Later on, as I was finishing a tour, I heard the loud thumps of someone walking over a bridge farther back in the haunt, when nobody was back there. Because we closed the entrance behind us as we take tours through, my whole group was present and accounted for, and I was the only tour guide on staff at the time. Now, I've had senses go off around me, heard footsteps, and had a general feeling of being watched while alone in the haunt, but these occurrences that happened today were the most direct and obvious. And the distinct sound of someone walking over the bridge happened with other people around me. Weird stuff. But that's why I love working here. I live in a pretty old house that's been turned into a rental property. Ever since I moved in, things have been weird. It first began with noises, which I wrote off as old house noises. I've had company over, and they always feel very anxious when hearing the noises and ask me how I feel safe when I'm alone. I just tell them I'm used to it. Then I moved my cat in from my parents. Yes, I know that cats tend to have a weird personality, but mine began acting differently. She first started staring off into corners of the room, looking alarmed. I assumed it was weird cat behaviour, until she started waking me up over it. I tried to take a nap with her on the couch, and wake up to her meowing and staring behind me with a wild look. I want to preface this by saying I have had sleep paralysis, and I know what it's like. I was fully awake during both of these incidents, and I could move my body. The first one, my cat woke me up when I was trying to sleep for work the next morning. When I opened my eyes, I saw writing all over my walls. I kept blinking, but I couldn't make out what any of it said. Eventually it went away. I slept on the couch. This happened last night. I was awake because sometimes I have insomnia issues. Anyways, I was lying with my eyes closed trying to fall asleep, when I felt pressure on my bed by my foot. I immediately thought it was my cat hopping onto the bed to sleep, like she does. I looked down, but there was nothing there. I still felt it. I slid my leg under the spot of pressure, and I could slide my leg around with ease, like a hand was simply resting on the bed rather than pushing down. I slid my leg underneath and shook it. The pressure let off like someone lifted their hand. I want to add that I live with my significant other and they claim they haven't had any strange experiences. I believe it's because he's not paying attention. I'm a female living in Arizona, a place known for paranormal encounters, extraterrestrial experiences and all manner of weird hoodoo shit. Now admittedly, I love the paranormal and have had a few minor experiences up to this point in my life. But what I experienced just an hour ago takes the cake. If you've ever been to the Southwest, you know one thing about the nights. They're dark, pitch black. 
Anyway, it's about 11.30 at night and I've dropped my friend off at his house in the middle of nowhere after a day of hanging out, playing games and watching one of my favourite horror flicks. I guess I was a touch on edge, and the fact that it had rained all day and the sky was still shrouded by dark clouds that were blocking any and all natural moonlight from helping me see may not have made it much better. The lights on my truck are admittedly not the strongest, and with so little light and a slippery road, you've got to be aware of everything to be safe. So I'm driving down a fairly well-lit but deserted stretch of road, a few miles long to start heading back to civilization. All of a sudden, this chill, not really a chill, but a sensation of nope just licks at the back of my neck. And I'm coming up on this odd blue light that's hitting the street in front of me, which is already slightly jarring, given the sickly yellow colour of the street lights around it. The second I pass under the blue light, it goes out, and I see a huge shadow pass over the road silently in front of me. At this point, I'm getting nervous, because this is a bit too much for my already freaked out self. It doesn't get better from there either. I finally reach the highway, and I have the option to turn onto a back road that's under a ton of construction, or go down to the highway and get home from there. Naturally, an abandoned back road with heavy construction loses, and I turn onto the highway. About this time, a smaller truck starts really flooring it, like climbing up my bumper as I'm headed towards home. People drive like this in Arizona, constantly want to go 30 above the speed limit, and if not that, then getting so far up your ass you'd think they were a thong, so it wasn't particularly abnormal, at first. Basically, I'm driving down the highway and I see my turn off coming up, so I signal and the second I do, so does this dude behind me in the truck. No big deal. The next turn off comes up, this one's left, and wouldn't you believe it, the truck guy does the same a second or two I have to signal. Again, not too freaky. But then I emerge into the far right lane once I make the turn, and so does the truck guy. At this point it's getting weird, but I haven't given up hope. So I continue past the main entrance of the strip mall that's near my house, and the second I signal to turn again, and then merge into the far right lane once more, the truck guy does the same, staying very close on my tail, and always signalling just a moment after me. At this point, all my memories of hearing people saying they were followed kicks in, and I'm trying to think about how I can ensure I don't lead this creep right to my front door. So it hits me. Make three consecutive turns in the same direction, and if they're following you, you'll know. Because three turns leads you in a circle. So I think sure, there's a back entrance to the mall, so I pretend to turn in there. I turn towards the mall, stopping at the right turn lane, and the truck guy whizzes past me. I take a breath and go back up the road towards my house. I'm determined to get this guy's plates, just in case. I did, too. I repeated the numbers over and over in my head and out loud in the silence of the cab of my truck. This time, luckily, I was the one following, and it made me feel safer, more in control. I watch the truck guy turn onto a street, and once I see he's gone, I drive past and double-check in my rear view that the guy isn't back behind me again. Luckily, I don't see him. But right about now... I'm really starting to get the creeps. I'm only a mile or two from my house now and everything is starting to come to a calm. I make it home, looking around before I hop out of my truck and hold my keys close, my finger on the panic button. For those of you who don't know, a panic button on a car's fob can be crazy handy. Keep those keys in your hand when walking alone on a dark street or in a dark place. If someone gets close to you, hold that button down and the alarm will blare and every set of eyes in the area will be on you in a matter of minutes. And you can bet that whoever's trying to get close won't stick around with all the witnesses peeking out to see what the racket is. Finally, I get inside and I realise just as I'm getting to my bedroom, I forgot to take the trash cans to the curb. So it's midnight now and here I am, dragging a set of cans down my driveway in the pitch dark. Something again doesn't feel right. It's so quiet. No crickets, no birds, not even bats are flying around. Then, as I'm glancing around suspiciously, trying to see anything in the darkness, I spot it. Near the open desert at the end of my street, a tall, pale man is standing just outside of the glow of a neighbour's garage light. 
just standing there, staring. There were no discernible facial features, just an extremely tall, pale and lanky form. At this point, I've seen enough, and I sprint back into the house as my dog starts barking like crazy. I watch the garage door close and then ran right to my room. I've been hearing scratches on my bedroom window, but I'm too scared to open the blinds and peek out. What if whatever is scratching back is staring back when I do? I've got a blade right next to my bed. Not taking any more chances with the creepy shit tonight. Let's just hope I make it till morning with whatever this thing scratching my window is outside. A couple of years ago, I was working at a job with somebody who told me, pretty much from the point I met her, that she was psychic. Now, I'm a believer in the paranormal, in psychics, in energy, all that jazz. It wasn't a stretch for me to believe she might be telling the truth, but I can assure you now that I very much do believe that she is the real deal. When the activity started, it was just one very small thing. I had a little arctic fox plushie I kept on my bed, and at one point, I would come home to it being dead in the center of my bed. It was only ever this one plushie, always in the middle of my bed. I have a dog, and even though she had never moved any of my plushies around before, I kind of shrugged it off and decided it was probably her moving it each day while I was at work. For days in a row, I would come home to this little fox just sitting there. I'd move it back to its proper spot each day, only to find it in the middle of the bed yet again when I came home from work the next evening. It was weird, but again, I just shrugged it off as my dog doing these things. The next thing was a bit weirder. I would have vivid dreams, or at least I think they were dreams, where I would be laying in bed in the dark, and suddenly I'd feel spiders crawling on my exposed skin. Anything over my blanket would have the sensation of spiders running across it. I would jump out of bed, fully awake at that point, and turn on my light and investigate. I never found a single spider or bug anywhere. The third thing I experienced was the very last thing I could try to explain away. I was laying in bed one night, kind of drifting off as I listened to a horror narrator on YouTube, something I accredited to what I saw. As I was laying on my back, facing the ceiling and the top of my headboard, which is incredibly high as I have one of those combo bed dresser headboard things, it's hard to explain, but basically my headboard is a tall dresser with cabinets and drawers surrounding my actual mattress. And the part above my bed is the alcove with mirrors and two built-in lights that sit inside it, with the top of the headboard dresser being what the lights were fixed into. Anyway, I had a light on the headboard turned on, so as I was blinking in and out of sleep while listening to these stories, I opened my eyes only to see a small black shadow quickly duck behind the ridge at the top of my headboard. I blinked a few times, but I didn't see the shadow again. However, I passed it off by telling myself it was probably my imagination from being so tired, and I turned off my light and went to sleep. The fourth and final experience leading up to the end of the story is the one that made me stop denying something was definitely happening. One night, I was doing my routine of listening to scary stories and relaxing in bed, and went to plug in my cell phone. The place where I plug my phone in is right next to where I used to keep my chunky rubber bracelets. You know the ones you get from Hot Topic. So I go to plug my phone in, and as I turn over to put the charger in the outlet, I see not a foot from my face, one of my rubber bracelets move at least an inch to the right, directly in front of me. It didn't roll. It slid across the wooden surface. I sat up straight, surprised. I knew what I saw. There was no explaining that away. I just kind of sat there for a few minutes in a what the hell kind of shock and eventually plugged my phone in and went to bed. At this point in the story, I need to tell you that I have not once mentioned these experiences to anyone. Not my family, not my boyfriend, not my co-workers, nobody. This is important, because the next day after I saw that bracelet move, I went into work. As I sat down at the break room table, only one other person was in the room at the time. You guessed it, it was my psychic co-worker. The moment my butt hit the chair, she casually asked me, so what's going on in your room? Stunned, I took a moment to compose myself and then explained that I 
thought there was something, but I wasn't sure. She nodded and said, Oh yeah, you have a trickster in your room. It probably got in through your mirrors. I was shocked, because to my knowledge, she had never seen my bedroom. She never even saw pictures that I can remember. There's a chance looking back, I showed her a picture of my Halloween setup in my room before this, but I honestly can't remember. Either way, her words shocked me. I asked her what she thought I should do about it, and she told me to sage my room, especially my mirrors, and tell it to leave. When I went home that night, I did just that. I grow sage in my backyard, so I make bundles to smudge my house on occasion. I went around my room, smudging my closet, my whole room, and my mirrors, ending at the window I had open on the far side of my bedroom. As soon as I got to the window to finish my smudging, the whole frickin' thing just burst into flames. I had to immediately put the smudge stick out, because it was just frickin' ignited the second I got to the window. Immediately, I texted my co-worker and told her what happened, and she explained that the sage bursting into flames was the entity leaving, a final trick as it went away. I closed the window and put the sage away, and that was the end of that. I never had anything like what had occurred in the weeks prior happen again, but I have to say that after the whole thing was said and done, I got curious and looked up tricksters, and what came up kind of cemented that this was in fact very real for me. One of the ones listed was a spider trickster, and another was a fox. I'm not sure which one it was, but considering it kept moving my fox plushie, I figure maybe that's why. Last year, between five to seven months ago, I had a few experiences with something that seemed to have a penchant for messing with phones. A little side info to start the story off. I have a phone that requires a password in order to be shut completely off and it doesn't have my or anyone else's fingerprint as a password either. So the first thing that happened to start this off was that I woke up one day to my cell phone being unplugged from both my actual phone and the wall outlet itself, as well as being moved from the shelf I put it on when I went to sleep that night to a different nearby shelf. It didn't exactly scream paranormal, but it was weird, and so I didn't really think much of it. I figured I'd just moved it at some point during the night and didn't remember, even though I've never done anything like that before. The second thing that happened brings up to the preliminary info I gave about how my phone shuts off. It's a process, and you really can only shut the phone off after you've unlocked it, which is why this stuck me as much odder than the first occurrence. It's kind of my nightly routine to plug my phone in, turn on scary story narrations on YouTube, and leave it playing on a long video to help me fall asleep. I do this daily, and this isn't something that has happened before or since. Essentially, I went to bed following my normal nightly routine, and woke to my phone being completely shut off. I woke up, reached over to check the time on my phone, and noticed it was completely off. It was weird, but I figured for some reason my phone wasn't charging during the night and died, so I tried to turn it on expecting to get a no battery sign or whatever, only to find it at 100% once it booted up. It was weird, and I ended up joking to my family that a ghost turned my phone off. I didn't actually mean it, but I still decided better safe than sorry due to my previous trickster experience. I went to bed that night, and as I was sitting in my room, I spoke out to the room and said something along the lines of, hey, if there's anything in here, please don't mess with me or my dog, and please don't mess with my phone. I need it to wake up for work, and so it's very important you don't mess with any of my electronics, okay? You can stick around as long as you don't do anything to mess with me, my dog, or my stuff. And left it at that. After that, my phone didn't turn off, wasn't unplugged, and didn't move again. I kind of just shrugged it off after that, until one night I woke from a dead sleep in the middle of the night. Rolled over, opened my eyes for just a moment, and saw something. So here's the weird part. This thing I saw was cute. Like it wasn't a person. I can't even really describe it, but it just felt cute. I'm not sure what I believed it was, but it was little, like a little child. I got this weird vibe that it was just this cute little thing. It didn't feel scary or malicious at all. 
I distinctly remember that as soon as I blinked, it vanished. And I literally spoke out loud and said very clearly, if that was you, you are so cute. And then I fell back to sleep. A week or so later, my grandfather ended up having his work phone go missing around 20 minutes before he had to leave for work. He was searching everywhere around the house. I checked the couch, under the cushions, under the actual couch. I checked the closets. I helped him check under his bed, in his closet, everywhere. Eventually, while he, myself and my grandma were searching for his phone, I came up with the idea to go into my room and talk to the thing that had messed with my phone the weeks before. I told him that if he took his phone, he needed to return it right now. And it was very important that he had it, and that this entity couldn't mess with anyone's electronics in the house. Then, I checked the couch again. Suddenly, the phone was there, sitting under the middle of the couch in pretty plain sight. It wasn't there before, and I'm sure of it because I checked that exact spot before I talked to the thing I thought was hanging out in my room. A few days later, I decided to sage, not to get rid of what was messing with the phones, just as a routine I do every six to eight weeks to keep stuff that I don't want in my house away. I figured it wouldn't chase away the entity that I saw because it didn't feel bad and I only ask negative entities to leave. But I guess the entity decided it had overstayed its welcome because I haven't seen it again and none of our electronics or other belongings have been moved or played with since. So this happened just last week, and some events leading up to it came from my housemates' accounts of what they saw, heard and felt. It started with housemate T, who was the first to report something, out of all the people in the house, I'm the only one who really believes or gives much merit to the supernatural. But recently something happened that spooked my other two housemates pretty bad. One night, T was in bed. I don't know what time, he didn't mention. He swore he saw the lamp on his dresser move. He even went as far as to tell my other roommate, roommate K, about this. So K brushes it off, says it's probably nothing. He just imagined it as in the dark. Admittedly, it's not much, but I feel like it was the first step in what would come. A few nights later, I'm asleep with my dog and suddenly I wake up. My dog wasn't reacting, and I honestly wasn't sure she was awake at that moment. But I opened my eyes and glanced down at my bed and about two and a half, maybe three feet from me, was this dark shape. It didn't look human like a shadow person. It looked very inhuman. It was a shadow, but it seemed like it was craggy and very black. I only saw it for about two seconds before my bedroom door burst open. I literally yelled, what the fuck? Only to see my housemate Kay standing at my door, asking if I was okay. I told her, yeah, I was asleep. I didn't even think to mention what I had just seen. She told me she heard what sounded like someone retching or throwing up from her room. She didn't just hear it once, either. Kay said the first time she heard it, it woke her up, and she wasn't entirely sure she actually did hear it. Kay decided since she woke up to use the bathroom, and apparently while she was in there, she heard the noise again, clear as anything, which is why she came to check on me. She thought maybe I was really sick. I told her I was fine, it wasn't me, and I knew it wasn't my dog because I've heard she gets sick in the middle of the night and I always wake up when it happens. At this point, my dog is definitely awake, but not asking strange. She never does when stuff like this happens. Kay accepts what I say and goes back to bed. And as I'm laying on my bed in the dark, I just have this really unsettled feeling. But I manage to get back to sleep and think nothing of it the rest of the day. About a day or two later, however, I'm in the kitchen getting myself a drink or something and Kay and I are alone in the house. All of a sudden, Kay calls to me from the other side of the house, and I go over to see what she needs. I get to her room, and she tells me she feels like she needs me to see this, otherwise I wouldn't believe her. I give her a quizzical look and follow her into her room. A porcelain doll I had given her about three years ago had fallen about three feet away from its place on top of a curio Kay in her room, with other four or so porcelain dolls, all of which hadn't moved an inch. She gives me this wide-eyed look and says she was in the shower and nowhere near the doll. She didn't even hear it fall. But when she came out, the doll was on the floor. Nothing had bumped it, 
the doll hadn't been recently moved or anything. And because it sits in a position where its legs are folded under it, the doll itself should be pretty stable. She was pretty spooked, and I took the opportunity to explain what I thought I saw the other night before she came into my room. It felt unsafe to be talking about it in the house though, and Kay insisted we just leave for a little while and get out. Once we were in the car and driving away, it felt okay to talk about it, and I mentioned to Kay that feeling of hesitance I had at saying anything about it in the house, and Kay said she felt the same, scared to talk about it while we were in there. We got home after about two hours of staying out and away. We saged the whole place together, and since then, nothing else has happened. I don't know why, but it seems like we just randomly get these paranormal encounters every few months, especially if I haven't saged in a while. My family had just moved out of our very first house in Arizona, due to having a small space for us four siblings, two brothers, one sister, to a nice four bedroom home with a huge backyard and lots of living space for all the kids to have fun, have friends over, etc. I was eight or nine at the time, the day we moved in, so I wasn't much help for my parents carrying stuff from the moving truck. All I wanted to do was grab stuff for my room, because that's all I cared about at the time. My brothers, who were older than me, wanted to share a room, and my sister and I got our own rooms, which was so nice at first, because I was able to not be annoyed by my brothers while trying to sleep or having friends over. The first item I had brought into the house was a green silk slash mesh type lamp that I was in love with for some reason, so I wanted that in my room first before anything else to claim which room was mine. I quickly ran inside with my lamp and sprinted to the first room on the left of the hallway, and I knew it was the room for me. Perfect size room for activities with friends, or even to play with Legos and other toys. I quickly found an outlet in the corner of the room to plug in this magnificent lamp into the wall. As I'm plugging in the lamp, I hear someone whispering behind me, and I thought it was my brother, so I say back to him, hold on, I'm fixing my lamp. As I turn around, I see no one behind me, so I quickly get up and look down the hallway and through the rooms. No one to be found. I walk outside of the moving truck, and my whole family is out there sorting stuff around. I asked my brothers if they had come in and said something to me while I was in my room, and they both laughed and said no. I totally thought they were joking with me, so I left it alone, not thinking anything of it. A couple weeks pass by, and we're finally fully settled into our new home. Ah, what a relief, doing nothing except to make my room look awesome. I hadn't done any exploring of the house really, because I was too busy making my room perfect. It was finally time to see what cool features this house had for 8 or 9 year old me. The first thing I noticed was an extra bedroom wallpapers of Mickey Mouse and Disneyland with an old, old feel to it. It was a room attached to the carport we had on the other side of the house. A tool room connected to it also. My parents had put all the extra boxes and cleaning supplies in the old creepy looking room. I asked my parents, what did they, brothers, share a room if there's one right there? And they didn't give me an answer. They told me to not talk about the storage room and only to go in there to get the carport. I agreed and moved on. From the laundry room, there was the kitchen and the previous owners had extended the house out another 800 or 900 square feet with a massive game room next to the dining area and kitchen. From the gaming room was our outside area covering over a half an acre with a small little shed slash shack in the corner and a treehouse that seemed very, very old and run down. On the other side of the game room was a little room with a fireplace, great to hang around during the holidays. And next to that was the living room. Overall, it was a huge house for me at the time. I was so happy. I had a lot of room to run around and be a stupid little kid. A couple months passed by and the family is doing well. I had gone to a new school and met some good friends that actually lived in the same neighborhood as me, so we obviously became best friends, since we could easily have sleepovers and whatnot. One night on the weekend, my best friend had slept over. We started off by playing a video game in my room, and he had asked me what's wrong with my closet door, and we had investigated it, and turns out it had been off center on the slide, so I fixed it. 
But while I was in the closet, I had noticed a tiny little door that went into the bottom of my house. I noticed it was held in with nails, so I barely pulled it and it came right off. My friend had a mini flashlight he liked carrying around, so we used that to look inside. I could see where the bathroom was, because I could see the pipes and even the bathtub. It was dark and really, really creepy, and just had a bad feeling about opening up that little door. It made me get chills down my neck, because it just had a different type of atmosphere once I looked inside and used the flashlight to look around. I told my friend to help me put the little door back on, so we could get back to having fun playing times. Little did we know, we had just let something out. We had moved to the game room since we were being loud and didn't want to wake up my parents or siblings. We had a huge TV in the game room, so we were just having fun playing Halo and Call of Duty. Our game room had windows all around it, looking into our backyard. My friend and I were playing games and all of a sudden we heard tapping on the window. And at first, I thought it was my cat messing around with a hanging cord from the blinds. I ignored it. It happened again, but from a different window. My friend had asked me to go get my cat. When we turned around from my couch, my cat wasn't in the room with us. So we both got a weird feeling that something wasn't right. We ignored it once again. Finally, after hearing it for a third time, we'd go investigate the noise. My friend and I both got up and went to the back of the room to look outside the window through a small crack in the blinds. We had seen nothing at all except a tree and could maybe barely hit the window with a branch. We debated on whether it was the tree or not for a couple of minutes, but then all of a sudden, my friend froze. I asked him, what's wrong? He didn't answer. I kept asking and asking. He finally replied, look at your shed. And I looked. There, I saw two faint glowing eyes looking right over at us. We both dashed from the window and onto the couch. We were frightened, but didn't want to wake up my parents because we would have probably gotten into trouble doing so. We just started coming up with ideas of what it could have possibly been. We had so many, so eventually we let it go and played more games until we passed out. Another couple of months pass with no little to noise or creepy things happening to me. I felt normal for once. Until one night, I was going to sleep in my room, and I usually kept my door open just so my cat could get in, and he had walked right in, and I couldn't really see him because he was a black cat, and my room was obviously dark, so all I could do was hear him. I heard him walk in and look around like any other cat would do. Then I heard him do something to my closet door. At least I think it was him to this day. He had opened my closet door just enough to walk inside and then silence. I thought to myself, he's just exploring, it's fine. I slept it off. The next morning, I had woken up to my closet door being open almost halfway. I went to close it, but I noticed the little door in the corner of the closet had been taken off and put to the side, as if someone had placed it there. I went to ask my whole family if they had gone into my room last night or this morning. They all said no. I ignored it once again and tried coming up with dumb ideas as to what it could have been. I put the little door back on and went on with my day. The same thing happened the next night. Cat walks in, opens the closet and is silent. The morning, same thing with the little door in the closet, set up on the side of the wall with the blackness of the underground of the house completely visible. At this point, I knew it was my brothers messing with me or my parents working on the house or something. Both of them denied it was them. At this point, I was scared. I didn't know what was going on. No one else was having these things happen to them. I felt alone. My best friend had come over again, and this time, his mom had dropped him off instead of him walking. As they both stepped inside of the house, the mother had said, This feels very dark. I cannot be in this house. As she says this, her car, obviously in park, starts rolling down the little drive where we have. We all run after it and see that it's still in the park position. How could this even be possible? She instantly left and had never come back. That was the first time my parents had thought something that didn't sound right with the house. They obviously shook it off. The rest of the night felt normal and good since I had my friend over. Of course, all of the noises that I had heard up to this point were nonsense. I totally ignored everything, thinking it was all a lie. Well, 
I thought wrong. Another couple of weeks pass, and it feels darker and darker in my house. I no longer feel it's just my family in this home. I get scared all the time, and just feel like I have to be next to my parents all the time. I thought maybe I should have another friend come over. I'll try to have fun. So I invited a friend that was on my football team. He had been dropped off, and we watched movies and played games all night in the living room, because I knew he would get scared in the game room, knowing my experience. My brother was on the same team as us, so he was also friends with him. So we all hung out, having fun. It was becoming late in the night, so we all decided we would sleep in the living room together. My parents had brought out an air mattress for one of us to sleep on. I slept on the little couch closest to the kitchen slash walk-in area. My brother slept on the air mattress and our friend had slept on the larger couch on the other side of the room. The room itself was not too big, so we all basically were sleeping close to each other. My friend's couch touched mine, so there was a gap in the corner of the room with an empty space and the air mattress was touching both couches almost. It was late, around 11pm, when we decided to go to sleep. We finished up whatever movie we were watching and went to bed. My brother and my friend both fell asleep very quickly. About 30 to 45 minutes after we had gone to sleep, I called their names and both didn't answer, assuming they were asleep. I was wide awake and couldn't sleep. While laying there, I heard a little girl crying and saying, Dad, Dad. I thought it was my sister. She usually cried due to having nightmares. I ignored it and thought it would be resolved. Once again, a couple of minutes later, I heard it again, only to realise it was getting closer to the living room. I was scared, so I woke up my brother and told him to listen. Obviously, right when I wake him up, it stops. He got mad at me and went back to sleep. It happened a third time, and it was even closer. I thought I was going crazy, so I ignored it and thought of happy things. It kind of helped and made me fall asleep. Randomly, at 3am, I woke up, wide awake. The room should have been dark, but it was somewhat bright. Bright enough to where I could see my brother and my friend clear as day. And the weird part, they were both awake. I could see their eyes open. We had all woken up at 3am randomly, without waking each other up. They both were in front of me, so I could see them before they saw me. Eventually, they both realised they were awake and looked at me. They started crying for some reason. I thought, what the hell's going on with them? They were frozen and crying, looking over at me. I asked them, what are you guys doing? And my brother finally told me, don't move, but look in the corner of the couches slowly. I was already panicking and still get chills writing this today. I look in between the couches and there was a girl, probably around 5'1", in a white old dress. Brown hair, green eyes, cut up face, bruised neck and body, glowing and looking right at me. Eyes wide open and her nasty teeth were showing, just gazing at me with a grin on her face. I was frozen. I couldn't tell or scream or anything. I was in paralysis. It was the longest two minutes of my life. I would blink and she was still on the inside of my eyelids. I was so afraid. Eventually she disappeared and we all got up and woke my parents up. We had explained what had happened and the next morning we had a priest come and bless the house. After we had the priest bless our house, it felt lighter and just in a better mood. I had stopped hearing noises and feeling anxiety and nervousness all the time. I don't know exactly what I saw, but it's still the scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I still cannot explain some of the things I've seen and can't puzzle them together either. The one room the priest did not go into was the extra bedroom with the Mickey Mouse wallpaper. Was it on purpose? Could he feel that he couldn't bless that room due to the demonic presence that he couldn't handle? Was it the little girl's room? I never went through that room again. A couple years later, we moved out of that house. So I was about 16 years old and at that time very interested in ghosts and paranormal things etc. My mom is highly esoteric and can see things in or around other humans. So her being so sensitive for those things did wake my interest even more. 
So I went online and researched ways to communicate with energies or spirits and found out a way to do so. I invited my sister and two of our neighbor kids to help and watch. We waited for my mother to leave because she is specifically prohibited from ever communicating with the other world. We wrote letters and numbers and also yes and no on a paper, cropped them out and arranged them in a circle. We lowered the shutters in my room and lit candles and placed them in different places in my room. Me and my sister placed our hands on an upside down drinking glass and the neighbor kids watched from bed. The first few times they laughed and chuckled when we said phrases like, is someone here who wants to talk with us? Or if you want to communicate, please do that. After a few minutes, the candles started to flicker. I didn't think much of it because candles flicker usually. But after some time, some of them really started to freak me out. They started to look like someone was trying to blow them out. And the glass started moving. I looked at my sister and she looked at me, simultaneously asking if the other one was pushing it. We both got really freaked out. So we took our hands off the glass and that freaking thing moved on its own. I got a panic attack and we all screamed and ran to my door to get out. I pressed the handle of my door down, but that thing didn't move a bit. My sister and the neighbor kids started to help pressing it down. We leaned on it with all our body weight combined, but it didn't move an inch. The candle started to go out and we just screamed and screamed. Eventually it opened and we ran into the kitchen in the corner and just cried. From this day on, I didn't sleep well in my house because I felt watched all the time and my writing desk chair started moving on its own. My mom also noticed that my room didn't feel right, like something lurks inside of it and asked me if I did something stupid. Eventually I told her and she was furious, saying that I could have brought much more evil in our apartment than a spirit that amuses itself by disturbing us. She did a ritual in my room saying a few phrases, putting a protective circuit on it and smoking it out with sage and I was never disturbed by it again. Nonetheless, I'll never do that again. This is not my first time having something like this happen to me, but it's the first time it's happened to my girlfriend. It's 2.37 AM and I just got home from dropping my girlfriend off at her house. I've had the feeling of someone watching me since around noon yesterday. Then when I went to pick her up to go at Walmart around 9.45, when I got to her house, she lives in a really nice mobile park home. I was waiting for her in my car with the windows down for a few minutes. I was reading on my phone when I kind of saw someone walk by my car wearing dark clothing out of the corner of my eye. I didn't look up from reading until a few seconds later. I didn't see anyone in my rear view mirrors, but I could still hear footsteps on the pavement. I even turned around and saw no one there. They didn't go into another house because the two lots across the street are empty. I kind of got creeped out. Finally, a few minutes later, Emily came outside to let the dogs into the backyard before we left. So I got out of the car and had a cigarette with her. And while we were talking and waiting for the dogs to do their business, we heard this noise next door, like bricks falling. I may have screamed a little, but the bricks her neighbor has stacked up next to his flower bed had all fallen down. And his Virgin Mary statue had fallen and her head was broken off. We both walked over to look because it startled both of us. And we worried her neighbor may have fallen inside the mobile home and caused the bricks to shift. She went closer, I stayed on her driveway, and she got in front of his house and she looked up from where the bricks had fallen, and her neighbour was peeking out the window, right at her. He didn't know what the noise was and was looking out the window, and then saw her. He thought she made the noise. He came out and was like, what's going on? So we told him his bricks had fallen, and his Mary statue had broken, and he said he'd look into it in the morning. That's when I told her about the person walking by my car, right before she came out of the house. That freaked her out a bit. So we went to take the dogs inside. Her chihuahua, Squirt, basically jumped into my arms when I went to pet him and he was shaking. And her other dog wanted to get back in the house. Didn't even come to see me like he usually does. He was scared to death. I don't have any idea what happened. All I know is we got the dog settled in the house and we went to Walmart. On the way, she kept looking in my back seat and touching her neck and never letting go of my hand. 
I asked her what's up, and she said something touched her neck several times. Then she told me that she had a feeling like someone was watching her since she got home from work at 8.30pm. All I can think of is that my back seat is my tarot cards. I literally just cleaned them last week and haven't touched them since. Tonight, we're going to burn sage in her house when she gets home from work. My girlfriend lives in a nice trailer park about five minutes away from I live. We're in a suburb of St. Petersburg, Florida. Where she lives, there's a lot of old and elderly people and not a lot of people our age. And a few of the trailers in the park are not occupied because it's mainly snowbirds. I've been with my girlfriend Emily for just about six months. We just found out her mom, who lives in another state, was given six months to live. And of course, Emily was upset. So she asked me to come over and eat a late dinner with her. I got there around 1.30 a.m. on Friday. We have dinner, hang out, and talk, and I rub her back, etc. When she's ready to go to bed, I'm leaving, and we're hugging, and she gives me a really sweet kiss and thanks me for coming over to be with her. When she backs up, I see this old man standing in the yard, two doors down, where no one lives, giving us a look like he's disgusted with seeing PDA at 5.30 in the morning. So I say something along the lines of, We've been watched, babe. She turns around and I'm still looking at the old man. When she turned to look, he basically turned around and walked around the side of the house. But she should have seen him walking, but she just said, Are you sure? The guy that lived there died and his wife moved back to Maine a few months ago. See, she put it up for sale. And she pointed to the for sale sign in front. I swore up and down I saw the guy and she said she believes me. I described the man I saw and she confirmed that's what the man who passed away looked like, down to his khaki overalls and light blue plaid short sleeve button-up shirt and brown ball cap. It's not the first time I've seen people that she couldn't see, and she doesn't make fun of me. I've had two dreams since that night, and he's been in them in the background, staring like I saw him the other day. For about four years now, I've been having repeated dreams about a mysterious man who always looked the same and feels the same every time I dream about him. The thing is, I've never met or seen this person in real life. These dreams feel deeper than others I've had in the past. I usually have new dreams involving him every two weeks or so, and they're not usually back to back. I'm a young adult and very introverted, so I've never had any romantic relationships before and have never been romantic towards someone in my life. I'm not really into that stuff, to be honest. And yet, I can feel that this man in my dreams has such strong romantic feelings towards me, and I reciprocate these feelings towards him. It feels like a very deep connection, where we don't even need to speak to know the depth of love we have for each other. I've never felt anything like that in real life. He's very distinct looking, and his features are as such. Very big, bright green eyes once in a while wears black glasses, jet black hair, very tall, often wears a big green comfy sweater, and he looks and feels like a giant teddy bear. Someone very warm and soft, kind of sweet, that type of thing. Every time I look at him in the dream, he's always looking directly at me. He also never turns his back on me and never looks away from me. He's always facing towards me and looking at me first before I look at him in every dream. And the way he looks at me is, what I can only imagine, how someone in love would look at the person they love. He'll often just be around me and be nearby. He usually doesn't speak, just smiles and sits or stands close to me. He almost radiates this energy of love and content. It's a very peaceful feeling whenever he's around. The dreams are very symbolic too. I once had a dream where he and I were in a garden. I saw the exact same two blue monarch butterflies flying around each other like a pair. Monarch butterflies that are blue apparently don't exist in the real world upon doing some research. I put my hand out and one of them flew over to me and landed on my finger. I then showed the mysterious man and exclaimed, look, there's two of them. He then looked at it and smiled at me, then gestured towards an open door just behind him. 
I let the butterfly on my finger fly back to the other butterfly and took the man's hand to walk with him through the door. Then the dream ended. That dream is a couple of months old, but it still sticks with me to this day. All of this makes me wonder if this mysterious dream person exists out there somewhere, or if they're actually a ghost or spirit who visits me in my dreams. For about four years now, I've been having repeated dreams about a mysterious man who always looks the same and feels the same every time I dream about him. The thing is, I've never met or seen this person in real life. These dreams feel deeper than others I've had in the past. I'm a young adult and very introverted, so I've never had any romantic relationships before and I've never been romantic towards someone in my life. I'm not really into that stuff to be honest. Anyways, I had this dream with this man in it again. It was set in an enchanted forest surrounded by tall trees. We were also away from regular society where no one could find us. The colours in this dream were so crisp, clear and vivid. I was inside of a medieval modest cottage that was cosy with warm colours around. A warm bright fireplace, a comfy couch and a table with lots of books on top. With wood and stone walls and torches on those walls. It had a beautiful interior that felt safe and comfortable, homey. I was standing in the middle of the room in a medieval dress, just taking in my surroundings. Then in enters this mysterious man again. He entered from a white painted cottage door and then closed it. Upon seeing him, I somehow already knew that we were in a relationship and were living together. And he had just walked in from tending to the garden outside and doing yard work in the summer sun almost as if this was a routine for him. He saw me looking at him and then looked right back at me. Every time I look at him in a dream, he's always looking directly at me. But the way he looks at me is what I can only imagine how someone in love would look at the person they love. He had a lovely smile, the one where you can see the person's eyes squint because they're just so genuinely happy. I observed him and he was tall and stood firm, relaxed gentle and comfortable. He had long jet black hair that went slightly past his shoulders and was wearing black gardening gloves on his hands. He also wore Victorian black Wellington boots to avoid getting mud on his shoes. He approached me and I saw him up close. He had beautiful green eyes like he always does in every dream. He also always has black hair but it's usually shorter. Generally in dreams before or after this point, he'll often just be around me and be nearby. He usually doesn't speak, just smiles and sits or stands close to me. He almost radiates this energy of love and content. It's a very peaceful feeling whenever he's around. Anyways, he did end up speaking to me. He didn't say a word, but he spoke to me through my mind. The term being telepathy, I believe. He repeatedly said to me in my head, I'm a vampire, for about a minute straight. However, I wasn't afraid of him because he wasn't a monster to me. I felt such strong romantic feelings towards him and he reciprocates these feelings towards myself. It feels like a very deep connection where we don't even need to speak to how the depth of love we have for each other. I've never felt anything like that in real life. Then suddenly his eyes turned a different colour, or a mix of colours I should say. His eyes changed from green to bright orange. That orange colour was in the centre of his eye. Then he had a yellow colour that outlined the outer rim of his eye, and a red colour that outlined the inner rim of his eye. It was very strange, but I remember saying to him, I've never seen eyes like yours before, and just stared at him for a long time. He then proceeded to smile, and gave him a big hug and a quick kiss. That's when I woke up. So basically, I was in a happy committed relationship with a vampire. Not sure what it all means, but I thought it was pretty cool to share. I've recently moved back into my childhood home with my partner because my parents are now living in long-term care. I didn't have any strange experiences growing up, but for many years, my mom has seen a dark shadow figure hovering in a bed. 
For this reason, she started drinking alcohol every night to fall asleep in her late 60s and continued for nearly a decade until going into long-term care this year. I never believed these stories as mom was diagnosed with dementia around that time. But my partner and I had moved into the house with her around eight years while my parents had separated and each one of us has had weird experiences of that time. Mom was visiting family and he and I were alone in the house for a few weeks. I had been briefly locked in the basement by something holding the doorknob and my partner had the garden hose water tap turn off on him while holding it to water the garden. He was in sight of the tap in a fencing yard with no one else home. Fast forward eight years and he and I have moved into the house in July 2022. Strange things happened almost immediately. The house needs a complete renovation and we've been spending our leisure time in the backyard with one big inconvenience. There are no electrical plugs outside. So we ran extension cords and used flashlights. Since moving in, our flashlights are turning on by themselves almost daily and we're using a ton of batteries. This was causing many arguments in the beginning with both of us adamant we weren't leaving them on. My parents were basically hoarding flashlights and I don't even know how many we have, but they are of every size and style. So it's definitely not a defect or manufacturing problem. I figured out what was happening in mid August when different types of flashlights were turning on near me while my partner wasn't home. I started leaving different types of flashlights in my line of sight and checking them periodically. Sometimes they'd turn on four or five times during the span of an afternoon. Sometimes in the same one over and over and other times it's different ones turning on once. This even happened with our safety flashlight in the car while parked in the driveway. Up until this week, the flashlights were only doing the daytime thing with me, but I was on holiday and now that I'm back at work, it started happening to my partner. He's noticed multiple types of flashlight turning on while left untouched on shelves in the garage. Other strange things happening include water taps inside the house just being on when we walk in. Sometimes it's only cold or hot water, and sometimes it's both, but it's always on full blast and loud enough that you can't miss it or not notice leaving the water on because it's loud. When I'm alone, I keep seeing a shadow person in the corner of my eye, but no one's there when I look. Interestingly, this doesn't happen if my cat and or dog are near me. This happened three days after my mom passed away from sepsis, pneumonia and brain cancer. January 3rd, 2021. Sleep wasn't an easy thing to come by right after losing your mother and I finally must have started to fall asleep from exhaustion. You know that state between awake and asleep? I remember it feeling very similar to that. The difference was I felt really plugged into that state of being. Like all time had stopped and someone had paused the moment between being awake and asleep to visit me. I felt a familiar presence I immediately recognised as my mom's. And some of the more pressing feelings I remember from my mom's side was she didn't have a lot of time to talk. She knew I needed her and I could only ask yes or no questions. The conversation went something like, are you mad at me for how things turned out? No. Could I have done anything different to help save you? No. Is everything going to be okay? Yes. Then I felt like I couldn't waste this opportunity to just talk with her and began asking what I should do about my older sister. I remember feeling rushed like I had to say goodbye in three seconds. I felt like I broke the one rule in that state of being. The one thing that if you did, you would be sent back to your reality. I woke up and was more at peace with it. I ate for the first time and that night I slept a lot better. I still always try to make that connection, but it's been almost two years. And I haven't had any luck. When I was around seven, we had guests visiting, so my two brothers and I shared a big bedroom. There were two beds and one fold out cot. Everyone went to bed and all was normal. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, my brother woke me up, freaking out a little, and said, Something's not right and told me to look around. When I looked around the moonlit room, 
All the furniture was moved all over the place, including the bed I was sleeping in. I then got up, wandered around the room in awe, trying to figure out how my brothers could have moved all this heavy shit and me not waking up. I looked over and saw my older brother asleep on his bed, which was now on the other side of the room as well. Dressers were all off the wall and in the middle of the room. Basically, everything was in a new place that made no sense. I told my brother we need to wake up our other one and he didn't think we would go over well because he would freak the fuck out, so we decided not to. Now, I know what you're thinking at this point. Not rocket science, you got pranked, but this is where things get way weirder. My first thought after seeing the room was that we needed to turn the lights on. One problem with that, the switches were completely gone. Yes, as in they had disappeared. So now both of us are starting to freak out. Only light we had, which was actually pretty good, was moonlight. Coming in through the windows, as well as a street light that gave us decent visibility. Either way, this was the point I knew it wasn't a joke. But wait, it gets weirder. At this point, we just needed to get out of that room. Something was definitely wrong. We both looked for the door, searched all the walls and that was gone as well. We were now trapped and losing it at this point. Not only was the bedroom door gone, but the closets as well. This went on for about five minutes. We tried everything, pushed on walls, ran round in circles yelling, there was nothing we could do. At the point of almost giving up, totally perplexed and confused, I turned around and the actual door suddenly reappeared, on the wall that I just searched and ran my hands across. My brother took advantage of the opportunity and rushed into the hallway to the top of the stairs, screaming to our parents whose bedroom was downstairs. My mother rushed to the bottom asking why we're going crazy with guests in the house in the middle of the night. When we told her what was happening, she didn't believe us. We told her to come look, but when we both turned around and looked back in the room, everything was back in its original location, including my other brother still sleeping like a log on the cot. Anyways, today me and my brother are professionals and he chooses not to talk about it with anyone but me behind closed doors. When I bring it up, he gets uncomfortable sighs and shakes his head and doesn't really want to revisit it. 